touchscreen rich spaceship. I expect us to have a, a, a little bit of excitement going into the mission, but also tempered with a kind of an extreme focus on being able to execute the things that are in front of us. This is a big moment in time. It's been nine years since we've had this opportunity. Lift off. The since the space shuttle was retired in 2011, the U.S. has paid Russia to carry astronauts to the station. SpaceX, now the first private company to take over the job, as NASA refocuses on returning to the moon within four years. My son is, uh, is eight years old, and so he's never seen Americans launch from the United States ever. SpaceX founder Elon Musk tweeting this time lapse of the rocket sitting on pad 39A that also launched Apollo and space shuttle missions. At first, former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino did not think NASA should hand over such a challenging job to private companies. Now he's a believer. I was skeptical but I'm not any longer, and I wish him the best of luck, and we need him to be successful. While NASA has veto authority, this is a SpaceX mission run out of SpaceX Mission Control in California. Right now, the only threat to this launch, potential weather here in Florida. Philip? All right, Tom, thank you. Let's turn now to that breaking news out of Minnesota where protesters fill the streets. Hundreds gathered to voice their anger after a George Floyd, a black man, died while in police custody. And video surfaced of Floyd saying he couldn't breathe while an officer pinned him to the ground. Law enforcement confronted protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets overnight. Some windows were also damaged and a police car was vandalized. All of this outrage is over the deadly police detainment. The incident was caught on camera and the images are disturbing. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. The bystander cell phone video begins with police restraining a man on a Minneapolis street Monday night. An officer is pinning the man face down by pressing his knee into the man's neck. For at least three minutes on the video, the man pleads for help, saying he couldn't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive. Bystanders shout at the officers. Get off of him now! The man, identified as George Floyd by the lawyer representing his family, was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible. Completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The mayor says four officers involved in the incident have now been fired, adding this is the right call. In an initial press release, police said they'd arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. Before the officers were fired, the police union said now is not the time to rush to judgment, adding our officers are fully cooperating. The case is already drawing comparisons to the 2014 death of Eric Gardner in New York, who died after police placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare. And this has to stop. Something has to be done. In Minneapolis, protesters are demanding the now former officers involved be arrested. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. The FBI has now joined the case. Investigators are reviewing the officers' body cameras to see what led up to the incident. Philip. All right, Gabe, thank you. The family of 23-year-old Peter Manfredonia is pleading with him to surrender. The FBI has now joined the multi-state manhunt for Manfredonia, a University of Connecticut student who is suspected of killing two people. Officials have also revealed that he has been using stolen cars and ride shares to get around. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the latest on the investigation. After four days and across at least three states, University of Connecticut student Peter Manfredonia is still on the run, wanted in two murders. Peter, we've talked to your family. We've talked to your friends and your roommates. We know this is not who you are. Last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. The bag in the photo, they say, is filled with guns. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a black Hyundai just stolen from the area. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. He had this machete. This wasn't just like a knife. This wasn't some simple edged instrument. It was a machete. 
The next murder, police say, a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown, at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. The attorney for the family says recently the honors engineering student had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with mental health issues. Had things gotten worse? You know, he had suffered from uh, anxiety and uh, depression for a number of years. Uh, but no, there was no sign that things were, were getting worse. The parents issuing an urgent plea to their son. Turn yourself in. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. The lack of COVID concern by several communities is hard to reconcile as the nation is now on the precipice of 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. But after this weekend, officials in many communities are bracing for the consequences with a possible surge of infections in regions where large groups gathered. Here's Miguel Almaguer. Growing concern amid a grim milestone as the U.S. nears 100,000 COVID-related deaths. Will scenes like these fuel a new spike in infections? With many Americans choosing not to social distance amid massive holiday crowds, in St. Louis County, where health officials called these revelers reckless, there is now a 14-day self-quarantine for anyone who broke safety protocols at Lake of the Ozarks. You see no mask here. You see no fear. Um, we're all just embracing it. As many defy local mandates, the number of new coronavirus cases is rising in several states as more Americans are being tested. In Arkansas, the governor says they are experiencing a dangerous second peak. In Alabama, the outlook also worsening. 80% of our deaths. While the World Health Organization warns of a second peak of infections in countries where restrictions are eased too quickly, a return to the New York Stock Exchange, where stocks soared and fewer traders were on the floor taking precautions. In nearby New Rochelle, the first community to lock down is now beginning to reopen. But from coast to coast, many are growing uneasy, fatigued by the quarantine. Your dog can get groomed, but you can't get a haircut. I need my hair done. That's a problem. After long holiday lines at everything from airports to hiking trails, in Los Angeles, Dodger Stadium will be used to test up to 6,000 people a day for COVID-19. Not far away at a food processing plant that makes the iconic Dodger dog, 153 employees have tested positive for the virus, the latest outbreak for an industry struggling to contain the disease. But we don't want to keep applying Band-Aids and leaves. We want, in fact, people to be healthy because it's not just them that get infected. The fear amongst the workers, in fact, is even greater for going home and infecting their family and loved ones. With every state worried about new infections, there remains pressure to reopen the economy. Here in California, the governor said hair salons can reopen, but not in the state's biggest counties. Frustration, defiance, and now mounting concern. Has our nation done enough to prevent a second wave? Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. President Trump is waging war on his favorite social media platform this morning. Twitter is now fact-checking the president's tweets for the first time ever. The move comes after years of criticism that social media outlets have allowed misinformation to run rampant. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, Twitter has long grappled with how to deal with the president's tweets. Francis, yeah, the fact-checking actually started by Twitter yesterday after the president falsely claimed in a tweet that mail-in voting leads to fraud. That is not correct. It came after California's governor decided to expand mail-in voting, the president urging people to get the facts, but the facts uh, explained by Twitter were incorrect. Now, uh, President Trump responded uh, after Twitter included this link where you click and you can see why it's un substantiated. Uh, President Trump responded that Twitter is interfering in the 2020 presidential election and stifling free speech. Meantime, uh, the president also suggesting falsely that former Republican congressman and MSNBC anchor Joe Scarborough was involved in the 2001 death of one of his staff members. Authorities long ago determined uh, that the staff member lost consciousness due to an abnormal heart rhythm collapsing 
Jackson hit her head. Uh, her widower in a letter to Twitter is urging them to intervene, uh, saying that the president has taken something that doesn't belong to him, the memory of his dead wife, and perverted it for political gain. My wife deserves better. He condemned the president for uh, the debunked falsehood uh, that she was murdered by her boss. Francis. Mm, and we'll see and watch the president's Twitter feed even after this. Thank you, Tracy. All right, let's get a head up, heads up on our weather on this Wednesday with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We want SpaceX to launch this afternoon. It's such a unique opportunity to bring all Americans together and all eyes is on the weather. This morning, we're actually seeing kind of a lull in the weather pattern, dry conditions across Florida. But I do want to show you our future cast that launch at 4.33 p.m. And look at these storms are going to come very close to that area before they make their way offshore. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So San Antonio, the heat's going to continue to build, and we're also watching the potential for severe weather this afternoon into tonight across uh, West Texas. Going to watch that pretty closely. If you're in the Northeast, heating up back in the mid-70s. And out to the West, we have heat advisories and warnings. Talk about that coming up. All right. Sounds good. Talk to you then, Janessa. Thank you. And in today's quick hits, Chrissy Teigen posted this video uh, to Twitter of her coronavirus test. Her caption was, honestly, loved it. You can see her laughing. It was a precaution before she has surgery to remove her breast implants. Burger King wants you to have it your way and make others stay away. Franchises in Italy are debuting a social distancing whopper, which will have three times the raw onions piled on top. Nike and Ben and Jerry's partnered up to design a shoe called Chunky Donkey, inspired by Chunky Monkey ice cream. It dropped on Saturday for 100 bucks a pair, but it quickly sold out. Now the resale market has it at 1,700 bucks. Breaking news this morning, a manhunt is underway in Baltimore, Maryland, after a police officer was shot in the line of duty. Investigators say the officer was shot while responding to a suspected erratic driver who crashed into a parked car. Police say the suspect shot the officer during a foot chase. That officer was hit one time in the lower abdomen, but officials credit his bulletproof vest for saving his life. The officer suffered a non-life-threatening injury and is likely to be treated without surgery. Investigators believe the suspect, the suspect carjacked someone to make his escape. The Justice Department has dropped insider trading investigations of three senators who sold off stocks following early briefings on the coronavirus. Prosecutors alerted defense attorneys for Republicans Kelly Loeffler and James Inhofe, as well as Democrat Dianne Feinstein, that they are closing investigations into their trading. All three senators have previously denied any wrongdoing. However, a related investigation into Senator Richard Burr, who temporarily stepped aside as the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, is continuing. Some positive news now for hockey fans. The National Hockey League announced that it will hold a modified Stanley Cup playoffs consisting of 24 teams. Uh, the playoffs will have 12 teams from each conference ranked on points percentage when the league paused uh, back on March 12th. The tournament will be played in two hub cities, which have yet to be determined. The hubs will have hotel and practice facilities, along with daily COVID-19 testing. Training camps will not open until July 1st at the earliest, and no dates for the games have been announced. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban is looking for ways to restart the NBA season. In his plan, which he sent to the league, the top 10 teams from both the East and West would qualify for the playoffs. They would come after everyone plays five to seven regular season games. Cuban says all 30 teams need to play once games tip off, again, tip off again to fulfill TV contracts. Let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. No one wants to sweat back more than <laughs> this right. guy here. There's nothing I hate more than a liar. Well, there's no room for someone like that in this organization. <laughs> <laughs> Are you feeling all right, George? Huh? Fine. You look a little warm. It's a chicken. <laughs> You're a terrible liar, George. Look at you. You're a wreck. You're sweating bullets. It's the Kung Pao. Mm. George likes his chicken spicy. Did you Actor Richard Hurd, best known for playing Mr. Wilhelm on Seinfeld, has died after battling cancer. He also appeared on the cop drama T.J. Hooker. Richard Hurd was 87 years old.
Halsey says she is waddling like a penguin after fracturing her ankle and later breaking two toes. The singer revealed that she slammed her ankle bone against the metal door while loading dishes into the dishwasher. When a fan asked how she was doing a few days later, Halsey admitted to additionally breaking two toes on the other foot. She joked that she's only clumsy off stage. You know, what's going to happen, I guess, right now is the best time to recover from an injury. It's not like she's going to go touring. You're not right going to go right? anywhere, so might as well heal at home. Good morning, everyone. Who's ready for some record heat? It's going to be impacting the Midwest areas of the Northeast. Burlington, I see it 92 degrees for daytime highs today, about 20 degrees above average, and we still have excessive heat that's building across Southern California into the Southwest. Thanks. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. That is hot there. In today's top stories, a white woman has been fired from her job after a viral video shows her accusing a black man of harassing her in Central Park. The heated confrontation began when Christian Cooper, who describes himself as an avid bird watcher, asked Amy Cooper, no relation, to put her dog on a leash. At some point, she decided that, you know, oh, I'm going to play the race card, I guess. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Christian Cooper says he kept recording because he had no intentions of being intimidated, but stopped after the woman leashed her dog. And now Amy Cooper is apologizing and says she overreacted. I sincerely and humbly apologize to everyone, especially to that man, his, his family. Amy Cooper was later fired from her employer, Franklin Templeton, who says it does not tolerate racism. Police in Miramar, Florida, are searching for an unidentified man who they say broke into a high school and spent an entire day vandalizing the campus, causing upwards of $100,000 in damages. And they say he did it all while he was naked. Police say he broke computers, graffitied walls, and flooded areas of the school. A $3,000 reward is being offered for information on his identity. Not even trying to mask it, though, I guess. All right, a, a Cuban artist has, is paying homage to a Latino frontline worker in a giant way. This gentleman here is a hero, and he's one of many. In one of the most diverse communities of Queens, New York, artist Jorge Rodriguez Corrada is graft, crafting a masterpiece, uh, that massive mural there of a pediatrician who died from COVID-19. The artwork was created to pay homage to the doctor and to recognize the heroism of all frontline workers. How well, impressive to do that kind of work, but even more so for the reason why he's yeah. doing that too. All right, the impact of coronavirus is being felt globally, even under the sea. An environmentalist found the bottom of the French Riviera littered with that discarded masks and gloves, along with aluminum cans and other trash. He posted his findings on social media and said, quote, we'll soon have more masks than jellyfish in the Mediterranean. Sign of the times. All right. Uh, the Italian Air Force demonstration team, they painted the colors of the country's flag in the sky to celebrate a major national holiday. The flight team sent plumes of red, white and green smoke over the European skies as part of a week long celebration to mark Italy's Republic Day on June 2nd. Their usual parade was canceled due to the pandemic, but Italians are still celebrating in that spectacular way. Beautiful. Thank you for waking up with us. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, demonstrators surround Minneapolis police headquarters protesting the death of George Floyd while in police custody. Four officers involved have been fired. Brazil has become the world's epicenter where more people are dying each day from the virus than any other country in the world. Coronavirus infections are rising in at least 18 states, some drawing the correlation between that and the loosening of social distancing rules from two weeks ago around Mother's Day. Others now worry we could be headed for trouble. For the first time in a decade, the United States prepares to launch two American astronauts into space from Cape Canaveral. But Mother Nature may get the last word today. The head of the U.S. Senate says Congress will, quote, probably need to pass another coronavirus stimulus bill. We've got a preview. Early today starts right now. 
Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news from Minnesota, where hundreds of protesters poured into the streets. There is outrage in Minneapolis this morning over the death of a black man who was pinned to the ground by a police officer. The protests turned chaotic with police officers in riot gear using tear gas and rubber bullets against the crowd. Protesters vandalized a squad car. And the tension is in response to the deadly detainment of George Floyd. The incident was caught on camera, and the images are disturbing. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. Protests in Minneapolis began with outrage and turned violent. What do we want, Justin? Protesters also gathered in Chicago. And we stand in solidarity with all those people, and we just letting y'all know that this shit not finna keep happening. The anger sparked by the death of George Floyd, who died while in the custody of Minneapolis police. Please, please can't breathe. This video, shot Monday night by a bystander, shows an officer's knee pressing down on Floyd's neck. He eventually stopped moving, was transported to a hospital, and pronounced dead. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. A statement from police said officers arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress, and the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. When handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. We clearly um, have policies in place regarding um, um, placing someone under control and, and what are areas that could be of risk. Less than 24 hours after the incident, the Minneapolis mayor tweeted, Four responding MPD officers involved in the death of George Floyd have been terminated. This is the right call. Federal authorities have launched an investigation. A community's outrage has just started. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. The U.S. will soon cross a once unthinkable milestone in the pandemic. The nation now on the precipice of 100,000 deaths from coronavirus, less than three months after our first reports of fatalities. But restless weeks in quarantine have given way to packed pool parties and beaches brimming with revelers as the warm weather arrives. And the holiday weekend crowds mixed with more states reopening are spurring concerns of a second wave of cases. Meanwhile, President Trump is on the defense for his handling of the crisis. Our Alice Barr has more. As the U.S. death toll from coronavirus reaches closer to 100,000, the nation is grieving a collective tragedy, while families across the country mourn victims who were more than just numbers. It's just a tragedy that he's gone. President Trump tweeting, if he hadn't done his job well, we would have lost millions of people. But I think we would have had anywhere from 10 to 20 or 25 times the number of deaths if we didn't act the way we did while blaming China for not containing the spread. It comes as infection rates are rising in 18 states. Medical experts point to a correlation to many people beginning to loosen social distancing two weeks ago around Mother's Day. And they warn of dangerous consequences from the crowds of partiers over this past Memorial Day weekend. It won't be surprising to see those cases increasing, likely over the next several weeks. Images like these from Missouri's Lake of the Ozarks sparking a social media firestorm. Health officials now urging the throngs of people who were there to self-quarantine. Quarantine yourself. Do it for yourself. Do it for your grandma. At the same time, President Trump is calling for large crowds at the Republican National Convention in August. He's threatening to move the event out of North Carolina if the state's Democratic governor does not allow full attendance. We have to know that when the people come down, they're going to have the doors open. Now, if the governor can't tell us very soon, unfortunately, we'll have no choice. In stark contrast, the iconic New York Stock Exchange modeling social distancing when it reopened with a quarter of its traders wearing face masks, returning to the floor and a new normal. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. President Trump is waging war on his favorite social media platform this morning. Twitter is now fact-checking the president's tweets for the first time ever. The move comes after years of criticism that social media outlets have allowed misinformation to run rampant. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest, and Tracy Twitter has long grappled with how to handle the president's tweets. 
Right, Francis. Twitter started fact-checking the president yesterday after he claimed that people should get the facts on how mail-in voting leads to fraud. Not true, according to most experts. Uh, this came after California decided to expand mail-in voting, and the president criticized that on Twitter. So here's how it works. You click a link that's attached to the president's tweet, and that link explains why the claim is unsubstantiated. The president shooting back that Twitter is interfering with the 2020 presidential election and stifling free speech. Also false, the president claiming that MSNBC anchor and former Republican Congressman Joe Scarborough was involved in the death of a staff member back in 2001. Authorities have long debunked that, saying that the woman lost consciousness from an abnormal heart rhythm that she collapsed and hit her head. Her widower, in a letter to Twitter, is urging them to intervene, saying that the president is perverting the memory of his dead wife for perceived political gain and that she deserves better than this accusation that she was murdered by her boss. Again, long debunked by authorities. Francis. All right, Tracy Potts for us. Tracy, thanks. Today is the start of the White House's travel ban on Brazil. The country continues to be ravaged by the coronavirus and for the first time has surpassed the United States with the most reported coronavirus fatalities over a 24-hour period. Here's NBC's Bill Neely. Good morning, Philip. As of now, any non-American trying to get into the U.S. from Brazil will be denied entry. It's in response to the exploding crisis here. Brazil has now passed another new milestone. It's number one in the world for all the wrong reasons. Today, like every day, dozens of virus funerals in Rio. American Oscar Stearns was 64 and from Boston and lived here all his life. One of 800 victims in one day. Brazil now has the highest daily death toll in the world. One city with a high death toll and a shattered economy ended its lockdown. Tens of thousands poured onto the streets. The mayor of this city, who's had the virus, ordered it to open up. He doesn't support the lockdown. Across Brazil, the battle between saving the economy and saving lives is raging. One American already in financial trouble. I have a travel agency, and that travel agency I don't think is going to survive the next couple of months. Like the economy, hospitals are at breaking point. People too. Brazilians looking to come to the U.S. now unwelcome. Brazilians are braced for more pain, economic pain, but also more record death tolls because medical experts here believe that Brazil has not yet reached the peak of infections or deaths. Philip? It's a scary thought, Bill. Thank you. The FBI has joined the multi-state manhunt for a wanted University of Connecticut student. And now the parents of the suspect are speaking out in hopes of getting him to surrender. Speaking through their lawyer, the family of 23-year-old Peter Manfredonia urged him to turn himself into police. Manfredonia, who police consider to be armed and dangerous, is accused of killing two men in Connecticut last week. He was last spotted walking on Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania on Sunday. Police have also revealed that he has been using stolen cars and ride shares to get around. For the first time in almost a decade, American astronauts are preparing to launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Let's take a live look now. You're looking at images from Cape Canaveral, where if weather permits, veteran NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken will be lifting off on board a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket for a 19-hour trip to the space station. And if all goes as planned, it'll be the first manned flight in a U.S. spacecraft from U.S. soil since the end of the shuttle era. And just ahead, we'll speak to a reporter who's on the ground in Cocoa Beach. So it is crucial to find out what the weather is going to do. Let's check in with NBC meteorologist Janessa. Webb, who's watching it. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. As Philip said, this is such a wonderful opportunity to bring everyone together. I, all eyes are on the weather right now. And you saw that live shot. It's nice and dry. And that's what we're hoping for this afternoon. But with our future cast, it shows you very clearly we're going to see this sweep of storms make its way across uh, Cape Canaveral around 4 o'clock this afternoon. So the launch happens at 4.33. Hopefully, this starts to push offshore. Could have a, maybe a minor 
minor delay. It looks like we're going to see they make their way offshore, make its way to the north here. But this is a large storm system that's really going to be impacting that area. In the last three days, South Florida has had over a foot of rain, and it's going to continue this afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Dallas to San Antonio, we're also watching the severe weather threat this afternoon. We're back in the lower 90s, so that's going to spark up the storms. Watch for nocturnal uh, tornadoes this evening in that area as well. So this is going to be a very close call, and we're also watching the building heat in the West. Talk about that. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Some sad news this morning for Seinfeld fans. There's nothing I hate more than a liar. Well, there's no room for someone like that in this organization. <laughs> Are you feeling all right, George? Eh, fine. You look a little warm. It's a chicken. <laughs> You're a terrible liar, George. Look at you. You're a wreck. You're sweating bullets. It's the Kung Pao. Mm. George likes his chicken spicy. <laughs> Actor Richard Hurd, best known for playing Yankees executive Mr. Wilhelm, has died after a battle with cancer. Hurd also had recurring roles on the 80s cop drama T.J. Hooker and various Star Trek series. Richard Hurd was 87 years old. Nashville is getting back to its roots. As the city enters phase two of its reopening plan, live music is now allowed in restaurants after being down for 10 weeks due to the shutdown. NBC's Morgan Chesky has more. In Nashville, the sound of live music is back. After 10 weeks of closures, the home of country music is beginning phase two of its four-phase reopening. It feels so good and refreshing to be back down here at Tootsie's playing music for people that want to hear it. Nashville and the surrounding county hit hard with more than 4,800 reported coronavirus cases. The staggered reopening now permits limited live music performances, allowed only in restaurants and bars serving food. I think it's the first real sign of, okay, we're recovering. There's still some concern. Without question. Uh, we're concerned that a relapse, a resurgence will set us back even worse than we already are. The hit has been big, just our industry alone. I lost a billion dollars in these first 10 weeks. We have to do it right. That includes no more than two musicians up on the stage at any time, and no more than 25 people in the venue. The dance floor's still off limits. It's a first step to a city synonymous with song. I was nervous that nobody was gonna be here, but you know, there's people in here and everybody seems to be having a good time. Here on Nashville's main drag, their livelihood comes from nearly non-stop live music. And while you can hear some of it coming back, not everywhere is open just yet. Many small venues like the iconic Bluebird Cafe still remain closed. This room is tiny. <laughs> Our room and what we do is built on people being close together. And some artists and venues, like the Grand Ole Opry, keeping their music virtual for now. To stand here now and to hear that music. It's beautiful. But as streets begin to echo with tunes, it's music to the ears, helping to keep hope alive. We have music back on our streets, which is where it belongs. An optimistic return from the holiday weekend for Wall Street. Markets rallied the Dow, climbing over 500 points as more states moved to reopen the economy and continued hopes for a possible coronavirus vaccine. So the question, can Wall Street build on Tuesday's big start? And Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says Congress will probably need to pass another stimulus bill. CNBC's Karen Cho joins us live from London with the very latest. Karen, good morning. 
Good morning, Francis. Well, investors continue to focus on those positives, namely the reopening of the economy and potential hopes for a vaccine for COVID-19. But there are negatives, too, that investors are largely putting to one side, namely the escalation in U.S.-Chinese tensions. Now, President Trump has suggested there'll be a strong response to Hong Kong, this new national security law that's been proposed by China. That is, their market indices claim fresh levels that they haven't seen since March, 25,000 on the Dow and the S&P briefly getting above 3,000 at one stage. But uh, we We'll wait and see the response later on this week and whether investors change their tune. That said, there are growing hopes around a new stimulus plan as Republicans warm to the idea. So far, Democrats have approved a $3 trillion package. Republicans in the Senate continue to block it. But Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said Congress will probably have to pass another coronavirus relief package and that decision will be made in coming weeks. Philip and Francis, back to you. All right, Karen Cho for us. Karen, thank you. In today's quick hits in preparation for surgery to remove breast implants, Chrissy Teigen took a COVID-19 nasal test. She posted this video here to Twitter with the caption, honestly loved it. She said it tickled and as you can see, it made her laugh. <laughs> Just putting it all out there. All right. Burger King wants you to have it your way and make others stay away. Franchises in Italy are debuting a social distancing Whopper, which will have three times the raw onion piled on top. Last Saturday, Nike debuted a sneaker inspired by Ben & Jerry's Chunky Monkey ice cream. The shoe is called Chunky Donkey. It's got a cowhide pattern, blue skies, and that melting Nike swoosh. They're all sold out, so if you want them, you're going to have to check out the resale market. And expect to pay for it, too. <laughs> all right. right. Janessa's back to tell us about this heat wave. Good morning, Ben. Hey, good morning. Put on your walking shoes today. Get outside. Enjoy this heat that's going to continue to build for the Midwest all the way into the Pacific Northwest. Look at California today. Highs back 111 degrees from Springs. All right, Janessa, thank you. It is all systems go for today's SpaceX launch. We're taking a live look now. Those are images from Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the first American manned mission to space since the shuttle was retired in 2011 is set to launch this afternoon. And joining us now from Cape Canaveral, just miles away from the action, is Sarah Dolloff. Sarah, good morning. Oh, good morning, Philip. Due to the pandemic, people are actually being encouraged to watch the launch from home. Officials even closing popular viewing spots like this one to the public and hoping that the crowds and the weather cooperate. This morning, all eyes on the skies for the scheduled launch of a new era of U.S. space travel. Uh, truly an historic time from an historic pad. Astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Minkin will ride in SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule atop a Falcon 9 rocket, wearing sleek new spacesuits and using touchscreen controls. It's the first time in history a U.S. company will carry two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station, a mission complicated by the pandemic. About half of SpaceX's engineers have been working from home. Bankin and Hurley have been in isolation since March. We have been in quarantine probably longer than any other space uh, space crew has ever been in the history of the space program. The weather, another concern. The area is saturated by storms leading up to the launch. Watchers hopeful the skies will clear and everything will be a go. We have been praying. We have been crossing our fingers. Caleb Golden asked to come to the launch for his birthday. He wants to be an engineer on future missions. Because of how interesting it is and how the parts work and how everything fits together just perfectly where we can go to outer space. A journey back to the final frontier, inspiring a new generation. And if today's launch doesn't go as scheduled, the next window will be Saturday. Once the astronauts have liftoff, it'll take about 19 hours to reach the International Space Station. Philip and mm -hmm. Francis. All right. The whole thing is just fascinating. Sarah, thank you. Keeping our fingers crossed yeah. for the launch today. Paging Happy Gilmore, their alligators loose on the golf course again. Check out this video the golf club at Hilton Head posted last week. Oh. These two alligators were brawling for over two hours. They were at it on the 18th fairway. Can you imagine the divots this all caused? Right. Alligators are known to be aggressive during their mating period from April to June. But could you imagine everybody else there having to wait? 
you know, yeah. all these guys you can't battle really, it out. You can't really play through. So they were fighting over a woman there. All right. It's like a, yeah. like a nature episode of Jerry Springer <laughs> show or something. All right. I liked it. Thank you so much for waking up with us this morning. Uh, be safe out there. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera on the Today Show. It's the final countdown. Today is live from the Kennedy Space Center for that much anticipated launch that Sarah just told us about. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, a growing number of aggressive demonstrators surround Minneapolis police headquarters protesting the death of George Floyd while in police custody as four officers involved have been fired. The multi-state manhunt for a college student wanted in two murders grows more urgent with each passing hour. Overcrowding and letting their guard down, large gatherings are raising concerns that new outbreaks could begin to develop in the coming weeks, with several states reporting a rise in new cases right now. And history in the making as America readies for the first manned space launch in a decade. But will Mother Nature cooperate? It's Wednesday, May 27th. Early today starts right now. Good morning. Glad to be with you. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. We begin this morning with breaking news out of Minnesota, where hundreds of protesters poured into the streets. There's outrage in Minneapolis over the death of a black man who was pinned to the ground by a police officer. Those protests turned chaotic. Police officers in riot gear confronting the protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets. The tension is a response to the deadly detainment of George Floyd. The incident was caught on camera and the images are disturbing. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. Protests in Minneapolis began with outrage and turned violent. What do we want, Justin? Protesters also gathered in Chicago. And we stand in solidarity with all those people, and we just letting y'all know that this shit not finna keep happening. The anger sparked by the death of George Floyd, who died while in the custody of Minneapolis police. Please, 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 please. This video, shot Monday night by a bystander, shows an officer's knee pressing down on Floyd's neck. He eventually stopped moving, was transported to a hospital, and pronounced dead. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. A statement from police said officers arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress, and the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. When handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. We clearly um, have policies in place regarding um, um, placing someone under control and, and what are areas that could be of risk. Less than 24 hours after the incident, the Minneapolis mayor tweeted, four responding MPD officers involved in the death of George Floyd have been terminated. This is the right call. Federal authorities have launched an investigation. A community's outrage has just started. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. There are new developments in the manhunt for a wanted Yukon student suspected of murdering two people. The family of 23-year-old Peter Manfredonia is urging him to surrender. Police say he has been using stolen cars and ride shares to get around. Investigators have extended their multi-state manhunt for Manfredonia and consider him to be armed and dangerous. Here's NBC's Stephanie Gosk. After four days and across at least three states, University of Connecticut student Peter Manfredonia is still on the run, wanted in two murders. Peter, we've talked to your family. We've talked to your friends and your roommates. We know this is not who you are. Last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. The bag in the photo, they say, is filled with guns. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a black Hyundai just stolen from the area. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. He had this machete. This wasn't just like a knife. This wasn't some simple edged instrument. It was a machete. The next murder, police say, a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. 
The attorney for the family says recently the honors engineering student had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with mental health issues. Had things gotten worse? You know, he had suffered from uh, anxiety and uh, depression for a number of years. Uh, but no, there was no sign that things were, were getting worse. The parents issuing an urgent plea to their son. Turn yourself in. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. The U.S. will soon cross a once unthinkable milestone in the pandemic. The nation now on the precipice of 100,000 deaths from coronavirus, less than three months after our first reports of fatalities. But restless weeks in quarantine have given way to packed pool parties and beaches brimming with revelers as the warm weather arrives. And the holiday weekend crowds mixed with more states reopening are spurring concerns of a second wave of cases. And meanwhile, President Trump is on the defense for his handling of the crisis. Our Peter Alexander has more. As the U.S. approaches a tragic milestone, 100,000 dead, President Trump is defending his handling of the pandemic, casting it as a success that the number of lives lost is not in the millions. It comes as the president spent his Memorial Day weekend attending remembrances while honoring the virus's victims. As one nation, we mourn alongside every single family that has lost loved ones. But aside from that, the president's largely been focused elsewhere, playing two rounds of golf and firing off dozens of divisive tweets, amplifying posts that insult prominent Democratic women, accusing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of having a drinking problem and mocking former Georgia legislator Stacey Abrams about her appearance. President Trump on Memorial Day also attacking Democratic congressman and military veteran Connor Lamb as a, quote, American fraud. And just three months before the Republican National Convention is set to take place in Charlotte, President Trump's threatening to move it elsewhere. If North Carolina's Democratic governor is unable to guarantee that by August we will be allowed full attendance, that would mean more than 20,000 supporters shoulder to shoulder in this arena. Just last weekend, the state recorded its largest daily increase in positive COVID cases. And Governor Roy Cooper says he does not know what situation his state will be in in August. It's okay for political conventions to be political, but pandemic response cannot be. The president also taking a swipe at his Democratic opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden, who, unlike President Trump, wore a mask to his state's Memorial Monday. President Trump sharing this tweet, making fun of Biden's choice. He's a fool, an absolute fool to talk that way. And most stunningly from President Trump's latest tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers and should be investigated. Authorities determined years ago that Lori Klafsudis died after losing consciousness from an abnormal heart rhythm that caused her to collapse and hit her head. Her death, a tragic accident. But that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Her widower in a letter appealing directly to Twitter's CEO. I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the president of the United States is taking something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better, and condemning the president for repeating the debunked falsehood that Klaus Sudis was murdered by her boss. Scarborough's wife and co-anchor Mika Brzezinski reading from the letter on MSNBC. These conspiracy theorists, including most recently the president of the United States, continue to spread their bile and misinformation on your platform. The president saying he's read that letter but ignores the widower's words. Yeah, I have, but I'm sure that ultimately they want to get to the bottom of it. In that letter, the staffer's widower urges Twitter to delete the president's tweets. Twitter has not taken them down, but on Tuesday for the first time, Twitter posted fact checks beneath some of President Trump's tweets. Philip? Surreal when you think about it. Peter, thank you. For the first time in almost a decade, American astronauts are preparing to launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. With weather permitting, veteran NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin will be lifting off this afternoon. If all goes as planned, it'll be the first manned flight in a U.S. spacecraft from U.S. soil since the end of the shuttle era. Jay Gray is two miles from the launch pad with the latest. Secured next to pad 39A and along the edge of history. The Crew Dragon flight capsule atop the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket sits idle for now at Kennedy Space Center. Everything is is looking good. We are, as of right now, we are go for launch. 
after a static fire test and final walkthrough for the astronauts. You know, where there's a will, there's a way, and there's been will to make this happen, and we're just proud to be a part of it. Part of the first man launch from U.S. soil with American astronauts in an American spacecraft in almost nine years. This is a unique opportunity to bring all of America together. Together, during a time when much of the country has been kept apart. COVID-19 has had an impact on the mission. Half of the SpaceX engineers working from home, the astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Binken, testing repeatedly for the virus and in isolation since March. We have been in quarantine probably longer than any other space, uh, space crew has ever been in the history of the space program. Waiting for their chance at history that now could be less than a day away. Jay Gray, NBC News, Kennedy Space Center. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. First time in almost a decade. Yeah, keeping fingers crossed that everything works out. And again, weather permitting, let's see what <laughs> it's going to be like out there with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. Weather permitting is the big question. You know, forecasters in that area are forecasting a 60% go of that launch. Right now, things are dry across uh, Florida. But this is really going to be a close call. As I said yesterday, you guys know my sands. You can see the storm system making its way in around 4 o'clock. That launch is around 4.33, so these storms could push offshore fairly quickly. Going to definitely be very close. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. From San Antonio to New Orleans, daytime highs are still above average, and we're going to watch some severe storms this afternoon, still in the lower 90s. And look at this heat. It's starting to build for the northeast Philadelphia to New York, mid-70s. So right now, dry, but rest of the afternoon, looking pretty wet across the border. Guys. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Janessa. It is not quite a trip back to Hogwarts, but there is good news for Harry Potter fans this morning. J.K. Rowling has a new children's book online. The Ichabod is free for everyone, and new chapters are released each weekday. The story is set in a kingdom far away where an invisible monster prays. The website for the book also features a competition for budding artists to illustrate the characters. Leading the news, the U.S. military has accused Russia of deploying their fighter jets to Libya. According to a report in the New York Times, at least 14 fighter jets were sent to the capital of Tripoli to help fuel Russian mercenaries trying to overthrow the government. The jets were allegedly repainted at a base in Syria to camouflage their Russian colors. The U.S. has accused Moscow in the past of fueling a proxy war in Libya in order to secure access to the oil-rich country. The Russian Defense Committee has denied these accusations. A confrontation in Central Park goes viral after a white woman is caught on camera calling the police on a black man accusing him of threatening her and her dog. Christian Cooper says the heated encounter started when he was bird watching and simply asked Amy Cooper to put her dog on a leash as it is required in the park. But she refused. Amy Cooper was later fired from her employer, Franklin Templeton, who says it does not tolerate racism. And now she's issuing an apology. NBC's Morgan Radford has more. New details this morning of a Central Park confrontation gone viral. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please, Please don't go. come close to me. NBC News does not have the full video, its context unknown. But Christian Cooper, who describes himself as an avid bird watcher, tells NBC station WNBC he was in the park when he asked Amy Cooper, no relation, to put her dog on a leash. If the habitat is destroyed, we won't be able to go there to see birds, to enjoy the plantings. Cooper says she refused, and he then offered her dog a treat. At some point, she decided that, you know, oh, I'm going to play the race card, I guess. And that's when, he says, he began recording the incident. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. When Christian refused to stop recording her, the video shows Amy Cooper grabbing her dog's collar, moving away, and dialing 911. Please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I 
in Central Park. In the- Amy Cooper apologizing, also speaking exclusively to WNBC. It was unacceptable. Saying she overreacted and regrets calling the police. When I think about the police, I think of them as a protection agency. And unfortunately, this has caused me to realize that there are so many people in this country that don't have that luxury. And our thanks to Morgan Radford for that report. An optimistic return from the holiday weekend for Wall Street. Markets rallied, the Dow climbing over 500 points as more states moved to reopen the economy and continued hopes for a possible coronavirus vaccine. Futures pointing to another day in the green as investors look to build on that momentum. President Trump is waging war on his favorite social media platform. Yesterday, Twitter began adding links to fact check his post, first addressing the president's false claims that mail-in ballots promote widespread voter fraud. You click the link and it redirects you to a page explaining why the president's claims were unsubstantiated. Well, the president fired back at Twitter on Twitter, tweeting that the company is interfering in the 2020 presidential election and, quote, completely stifling free speech. After President Trump threatened to move the Republican National Convention out of North Carolina over coronavirus restrictions, several governors are offering up their own states as alternative locations, including the governor of Texas and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Florida would love to have the RNC. So the door's open. We want to have the conversation, whether it's RNC, DNC, whatever, because I think it would be good for the people of Florida. Meanwhile, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp posted this tweet asking the president to consider the peach state. Police in Texas are looking for a robbery suspect who used fire at the scene of the crime. The man walked into a hotel lobby and poured an accelerant onto the front desk and threatened to burn the clerk. Well, the employee picked up a phone and the would-be robber set the desk on fire. The hotel clerk was burned but not seriously injured. The suspect is still on the run and police are asking the public for any information. There is a sudden death playoff on the 18th hole. Look at this. This is the golf club at Hilton Head Lakes in South Carolina. Posted this video last week after a foursome found two alligators doing battle on the green. The club said the fight lasted over two hours. Alligator mating seasons last from April to June, during which animals tend to get very territorial. I want to see you won. We don't have time for that. Let's get to Janessa checking the heat wave out west. Yeah, I mean, those weren't small gators. Those are like huge gators. You know, scare you. Let's talk about the heat that's going to continue to build coast to coast. There's nothing I hate more than a liar. Well, there's no room for someone like that in this organization. <laughs> are you feeling all right, George? Huh? Fine. You look a little warm. It's a chicken. <laughs> you're a terrible liar, George. Look at you. You're a wreck. You're sweating bullets. It's the Kung Pao. Mm. George likes his chicken spicy. (laughs) Did you call some car? Actor Richard Hurd, best known for playing Yankees executive Mr. Wilhelm on Seinfeld, has died after a battle with cancer. Hurd also had recurring roles on the 80s cop drama T.J. Hooker in various Star Trek series. His movie credits included All the President's Men and The China Syndrome. Richard Hurd was 87 years old. Now to the story of an innocent man who spent nearly four decades in prison. But last night, he wowed millions with his singing voice on America's Got Talent. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. Frozen here, the voice of an angel on the ladders of my life. My name is Archie Williams. But for 37 years, Archie Williams was a prisoner in a cage, locked up in Louisiana for a murder he did not commit. I knew I was innocent. I didn't commit a crime. Freed just last year, after the celebrated Innocence Project dug into his case, discovering fingerprint evidence that exonerated him. I went to prison, but I never let my mind go to prison. Behind bars, he sang watching America's Got Talent, picturing himself on that stage. So what are you going to be doing today, Archie? All my pictures. His chosen song, to honor other inmates wrongly convicted, Elton John's moving, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. It's like the sun going down. Oh, 
course, Simon Cowell is now a spokesperson for the Innocence Project. I really pray and hope that this is going to be a turning point for people like Archie. Archie Williams lost his freedom, but he never lost hope or his voice. And Archie Williams says he'll continue to advocate for those wrongly convicted because he says there are many men and women just like him still in prison. Francis? Wow. Kevin Tibbles, thank you. What a turnaround and literally using his voice yeah, like, to make a difference. Like he said, you need to find out just how important the Innocence Project is there. You can't help but wonder how many people are sitting in jail wrongfully as we speak. What a turnaround he's had in yeah. his life since he got out. What a talent. Thanks for waking up with us today. Stay safe out there. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera on the Today Show, the final countdown. Today is live from the Kennedy Space Center for the first ever manned SpaceX NASA launch. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. History in the making. Today, a private spacecraft will launch two American astronauts from American soil into space for the first time in a decade. Outrage in Minnesota this morning as mass protests took place late into the night over the death of a black man pinned to the ground, later dying after a white officer kneeled on his neck as he was saying he couldn't breathe. A growing number ignoring social distancing as the U.S. quickly approaches 100,000 deaths from the coronavirus, while the president ratchets up his personal attacks on Twitter, even as several states are reporting rises in new cases. Caught on camera, a white woman in New York Central Park calls police on a black man claiming she and her dog were being harassed. But the video tells a very different story. Plus, the latest on the manhunt for a UConn student accused in two murders. A busy Wednesday ahead, and early today, starts right now. Good morning. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. It's all systems go for today's SpaceX launch. We are looking now live at a picture of Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the first American manned mission to space since the shuttle was retired in 2011 is set to launch this afternoon. Here's Tom Costello. Less than 24 hours now until American astronauts once again lift off from U.S. soil on an American rocket headed for the space station. On board the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, Doug Hurley and Bob Binkin, wearing new state-of-the-art spacesuits in a newly designed flat-screen rich spaceship. I expect us to have a, a little bit of excitement going into the mission, but also tempered with a kind of an extreme focus on being able to execute the things that are in front of us. This is a big moment in time. It's been nine years since we've had this opportunity. Lift off. The since the space shuttle was retired in 2011, the U.S. has paid Russia to carry astronauts to the station. SpaceX, now the first private company to take over the job, as NASA refocuses on returning to the moon within four years. My son is, uh, is eight years old, and so he's never seen Americans launch from the United States ever. SpaceX founder Elon Musk tweeting this time lapse of the rocket sitting on pad 39A that also launched Apollo and space shuttle missions. At first, former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino did not think NASA should hand over such a challenging job to private companies. Now he's a believer. I was skeptical but I'm not any longer, and I wish him the best of luck, and we need him to be successful. While NASA has veto authority, this is a SpaceX mission run out of SpaceX Mission Control in California. Right now, the only threat to this launch, potential weather here in Florida. Philip? All right, Tom, thank you. Let's turn now to that breaking news out of Minnesota where protesters fill the streets. Hundreds gathered to voice their anger after a George Floyd, a black man, died while in police custody. And video surfaced of Floyd saying he couldn't breathe while an officer pinned him to the ground. Law enforcement confronted protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets overnight. Some windows were also damaged and a police car was vandalized. All of this outrage is over the deadly police detainment. The incident was caught on camera and the images are disturbing. Here's NBC's Gig Gutierrez. The bystander cell phone video begins with police restraining a man on a Minneapolis street Monday night. An officer is pinning the man face down by pressing his knee into the man's neck. 
For at least three minutes on the video, the man pleads for help, saying he couldn't breathe at least a dozen times. I can't breathe. Then he becomes unresponsive. Bystanders shout at the officers. Get off of him now. The man, identified as George Floyd by the lawyer representing his family, was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible. Completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The mayor says four officers involved in the incident have now been fired, adding this is the right call. In an initial press release, police said they'd arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. Before the officers were fired, the police union said now is not the time to rush to judgment, adding our officers are fully cooperating. <laughs> the case is already drawing comparisons to the 2014 death of Eric Gardner in New York, who died after police placed him in a chokehold. I mean, it's like a, a reoccurring nightmare. And this has to stop. Something has to be done. In Minneapolis, protesters are demanding the now former officers involved be arrested. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. The FBI has now joined the case. Investigators are reviewing the officers' body cameras to see what led up to the incident. Philip. All right, Gabe, thank you. The family of 23-year-old Peter Manfredonia is pleading with him to surrender. The FBI has now joined the multi-state manhunt for Manfredonia, a University of Connecticut student who is suspected of killing two people. Officials have also revealed that he has been using stolen cars and ride shares to get around. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the latest on the investigation. After four days and across at least three states, University of Connecticut student Peter Manfredonia is still on the run, wanted in two murders. Peter, we've talked to your family. We've talked to your friends and your roommates. We know this is not who you are. Last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. The bag in the photo, they say, is filled with guns. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a black Hyundai just stolen from the area. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. He had this machete. This wasn't just like a knife. This wasn't some simple edged instrument. It was a machete. The next murder, police say, a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. The attorney for the family says recently the honors engineering student had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with mental health issues. Had things gotten worse? Uh, you know, he, he had suffered from uh, anxiety and uh, depression for a number of years. Uh, but no, there was no sign that things were, were getting worse. The parents issuing an urgent plea to their son, turn yourself in. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. The lack of COVID concern by several communities is hard to reconcile as the nation is now on the precipice of 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. But after this weekend, officials in many communities are bracing for the consequences with a possible surge of infections in regions where large groups gathered. Here's Miguel Almaguer. Growing concern amid a grim milestone. As the U.S. nears 100,000 COVID-related deaths, will scenes like these fuel a new spike in infections? With many Americans choosing not to social distance amid massive holiday crowds, in St. Louis County, where health officials called these revelers reckless, there is now a 14-day self-quarantine for anyone who broke safety protocols at Lake of the Ozarks. You see no mask here. You see no fear. Um, we're all just embracing it. As many defy local mandates, the number of new coronavirus cases is rising in several states as more Americans are being tested. In Arkansas, the governor says they are experiencing a dangerous second peak. In Alabama, the outlook also worsening. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in 
this month alone. While the World Health Organization warns of a second peak of infections in countries where restrictions are eased too quickly, a return to the New York Stock Exchange, where stocks soared and fewer traders were on the floor taking precautions. In nearby New Rochelle, the first community to lock down is now beginning to reopen. But from coast to coast, many are growing uneasy, fatigued by the quarantine. Your dog can get groomed, but you can't get a haircut? I need my hair done. That's a problem. After long holiday lines at everything from airports to hiking trails, in Los Angeles, Dodger Stadium will be used to test up to 6,000 people a day for COVID-19, not far away at a food processing plant that makes the iconic Dodger dog. 153 employees have tested positive for the virus, the latest outbreak for an industry struggling to contain the disease. But we don't want to keep applying Band-Aids and leaves. We want the fact people to be healthy because it's not just them that get infected. The fear amongst the workers, in fact, is even greater for going home and infecting their family and loved ones. With every state worried about new infections, there remains pressure to reopen the economy. Here in California, the governor said hair salons can reopen, but not in the state's biggest counties. Frustration, defiance, and now mounting concern. Has our nation done enough to prevent a second wave? Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. President Trump is waging war on his favorite social media platform this morning. Twitter is now fact-checking the president's tweets for the first time ever. The move comes after years of criticism that social media outlets have allowed misinformation to run rampant. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, Twitter has long grappled with how to deal with the president's tweets. Francis, yeah, the fact checking actually started by Twitter yesterday after the president falsely claimed in a tweet that mail in voting leads to fraud. That is not correct. It came after California's governor decided to expand mail in voting. The president urging people to get the facts, but the facts uh, explained by Twitter were incorrect. Now, uh, President Trump responded uh, after Twitter included this link where you click and you can see why it's un- substantiated. Uh, President Trump responded that Twitter is interfering in the 2020 presidential election and stifling free speech. Meantime, uh, the president also suggesting falsely that former Republican congressman and MSNBC anchor Joe Scarborough was involved in the 2001 death of one of his staff members. Authorities long ago determined uh, that the staff member lost consciousness due to an abnormal heart rhythm, collapsed and hit her head. Uh, Her widower in a letter to Twitter is urging them to intervene, uh, saying that the president has taken something that doesn't belong to him the memory of his dead wife and perverted it for political gain. My wife deserves better. He condemned the president for uh, the debunked falsehood uh, that she was murdered by her boss. Francis. And we'll see and watch the president's Twitter feed even after this. Thank you, Tracy. All right, let's get a head up, heads up on our weather on this Wednesday with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. We want SpaceX to launch this afternoon. It's such a unique opportunity to bring all Americans together and all eyes is on the weather. This morning, we're actually seeing kind of a lull in the weather pattern, dry conditions across Florida. But I do want to show you our future cast that launch at 4.33 p.m. And look at these storms. They're going to come very close to that area before they make their way offshore. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So San Antonio, the heat's going to continue to build, and we're also watching the potential for severe weather this afternoon into tonight across uh, West Texas. Going to watch that pretty closely. If you're in the Northeast, heating up back in the mid-70s. And out to the West, we have heat advisories and warnings. Talk about that coming up. All right. Sounds good. Talk to you then, Janessa. Thank you. And in today's Quick Hits, Chrissy Teigen posted this video uh, to Twitter of her coronavirus test. Her caption was, honestly, loved it. You can see her laughing. It was a precaution before she has surgery to remove her breast implants. Burger King wants you to have it your way and make others stay away. Franchises in Italy are debuting a social distancing whopper, which will have three times the raw onions piled on top. 
Nike and Ben and Jerry's partnered up to design a shoe called Chunky Dunky, inspired by Chunky Monkey ice cream. It dropped on Saturday for 100 bucks a pair, but it quickly sold out. Now the resale market has it at 1,700 bucks. Breaking news this morning, a manhunt is underway in Baltimore, Maryland after a police officer was shot in the line of duty. Investigators say the officer was shot while responding to a suspected erratic driver who crashed into a parked car. Police say the suspect shot the officer during a foot chase. That officer was hit one time in the lower abdomen, but officials credit his bulletproof vest for saving his life. The officer suffered a non-life-threatening injury and is likely to be treated without surgery. Investigators believe the suspect, the suspect carjacked someone to make his escape. The Justice Department has dropped insider trading investigations of three senators who sold off stocks following early briefings on the coronavirus. Prosecutors alerted defense attorneys for Republicans Kelly Loeffler and James Inhofe, as well as Democrat Dianne Feinstein, that they are closing investigations into their trading. All three senators have previously denied any wrongdoing. However, a related investigation into Senator Richard Burr, who temporarily stepped aside as the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, is continuing. Some positive news now for hockey fans. The National Hockey League announced that it will hold a modified Stanley Cup playoffs consisting of 24 teams. Uh, the playoffs will have 12 teams from each conference ranked on points percentage when the league paused uh, back on March 12th. The tournament will be played in two hub cities, which have yet to be determined. The hubs will have hotel and practice facilities, along with daily COVID-19 testing. Training camps will not open until July 1st at the earliest, and no dates for the games have been announced. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban is looking for ways to restart the NBA season. In his plan, which he sent to the league, the top 10 teams from both the East and West would qualify for the playoffs. They would come after everyone plays five to seven regular season games. Cuban says all 30 teams need to play once games tip off, again, tip off again to fulfill TV contracts. Let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. No one wants us back more than <laughs> this right. guy here. There's nothing I hate more than a liar. Well, there's no room for someone like that in this organization. <laughs> Are you feeling all right, George? Eh, fine. You look a little warm. It's a chicken. <laughs> You're a terrible liar, George. Look at you. You're a wreck. You're sweating bullets. It's the Kung Pao. Mm. George likes his chicken spicy. <laughs> Actor Richard Hurd, best known for playing Mr. Wilhelm on Seinfeld, has died after battling cancer. He also appeared on the cop drama T.J. Hooker. Richard Hurd was 87 years old. Halsey says she is waddling like a penguin after fracturing her ankle and later breaking two toes. The singer revealed that she slammed her ankle bone against the metal door while loading dishes into the dishwasher. When a fan asked how she was doing a few days later, Halsey admitted to additionally breaking two toes on the other foot. She joked that she's only clumsy off stage. You know, what's going to happen, I guess, right now is the best time to recover from an injury. It's not like she's going to go touring. You're not right going to go right? anywhere, so might as well heal at home. Good morning, everyone. Who's ready for some record heat? It's going to be impacting the Midwest areas of the Northeast. Burlington, I see, at 92 degrees for daytime highs today, about 20 degrees above average, and we still have excessive heat that's building across Southern California into the Southwest. Chris? All right, Janessa, thank you so much. That is hot there. In today's top stories, a white woman has been fired from her job after a viral video shows her accusing a black man of harassing her in Central Park. The heated confrontation began when Christian Cooper, who describes himself as an avid bird watcher, asked Amy Cooper, no relation, to put her dog on a leash. At some point, she decided that, you know, oh, I'm going to play the race card, I guess. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Christian Cooper says he kept recording because he had no intentions of being intimidated, but stopped after the woman leashed her dog. And now Amy Cooper is apologizing and says she overreacted. I sincerely and humbly apologize to everyone, especially to that man, his, his family. 
Amy Cooper was later fired from her employer, Franklin Templeton, who says it does not tolerate racism. Police in Miramar, Florida, are searching for an unidentified man who they say broke into a high school and spent an entire day vandalizing the campus, causing upwards of $100,000 in damages. And they say he did it all while he was naked. Police say he broke computers, graffitied walls, and flooded areas of the school. A $3,000 reward is being offered for information on his identity. Not even trying to mask it, though, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, a, a Cuban artist has, is paying homage to a Latino frontline worker in a giant way. This gentleman here is a hero, and he's one of many. In one of the most diverse communities of Queens, New York, artist Jorge Rodriguez Guerrada is graf crafting a masterpiece, uh, that massive mural there of a pediatrician who died from COVID-19. The artwork was created to pay homage to the doctor and to recognize the heroism of all frontline workers. Wow, impressive to do that kind of work, but even more so for the reason why he's yeah. doing that too. All right, the impact of coronavirus is being felt globally, even under the sea. An environmentalist found the bottom of the French Riviera littered with that discarded masks and gloves, along with aluminum cans and other trash. He posted his findings on social media and said, quote, we'll soon have more masks than jellyfish in the Mediterranean. Sign of the times. All right. Uh, the Italian Air Force demonstration team, they painted the colors of the country's flag in the sky to celebrate a major national holiday. The flight team sent plumes of red, white and green smoke over the European skies as part of a week long celebration to mark Italy's Republic Day on June 2nd. Their usual parade was canceled due to the pandemic, but Italians are still celebrating in that spectacular way. Beautiful. Thank you for waking up with us. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. History in the making. Today, a private spacecraft will launch two American astronauts from American soil into space for the first time in a decade. Outrage in Minnesota this morning as mass protests took place late into the night over the death of a black man pinned to the ground, later dying after a white officer kneeled on his neck as he was saying he couldn't breathe. A growing number ignoring social distancing as the U.S. quickly approaches 100,000 deaths from the coronavirus, while the president ratchets up his personal attacks on Twitter, even as several states are reporting rises in new cases. Caught on camera, a white woman in New York Central Park calls police on a black man claiming she and her dog were being harassed. But the video tells a very different story. Plus, the latest on the manhunt for a UConn student accused in two murders. A busy Wednesday ahead, and early today, starts right now. Good morning. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. It's all systems go for today's SpaceX launch. We are looking now live at a picture of Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the first American manned mission to space since the shuttle was retired in 2011 is set to launch this afternoon. Here's Tom Costello. Less than 24 hours now until American astronauts once again lift off from U.S. soil on an American rocket headed for the space station. On board the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, Doug Hurley and Bob Binken, wearing new state-of-the-art spacesuits in a newly designed flat-screen rich spaceship. I expect us to have a, a little bit of excitement going into the mission, but also tempered with a kind of an extreme focus on being able to execute the things that are in front of us. This is a big moment in time. It's been nine years since we've had this opportunity. Lift off. The since the space shuttle was retired in 2011, the U.S. has paid Russia to carry astronauts to the station. SpaceX, now the first private company to take over the job, as NASA refocuses on returning to the moon within four years. My son is, uh, is eight years old, and so he's never seen Americans launch from the United States ever. SpaceX founder Elon Musk tweeting this time lapse of the rocket sitting on pad 39A that also launched Apollo and space shuttle missions. At first, former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino did not think NASA should hand over such a challenging job to private companies. Now he's a believer. I was skeptical but I'm not any longer, and I wish him the best of luck, and we need him to be successful. While NASA has veto authority, this is a SpaceX mission run out of SpaceX Mission Control in California. Right now, the only threat to this launch, potential weather here in Florida. Philip? 
All right, Tom, thank you. Let's turn now to that breaking news out of Minnesota where protesters fill the streets. Hundreds gathered to voice their anger after a George Floyd, a black man, died while in police custody. And video surfaced of Floyd saying he couldn't breathe while an officer pinned him to the ground. Law enforcement confronted protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets overnight. Some windows were also damaged and a police car was vandalized. All of this outrage is over the deadly police detainment. The incident was caught on camera and the images are disturbing. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. The bystander cell phone video begins with police restraining a man on a Minneapolis street Monday night. An officer is pinning the man face down by pressing his knee into the man's neck. For at least three minutes on the video, the man pleads for help, saying he couldn't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive. Bystanders shout at the officers. Get off of him now. The man, identified as George Floyd by the lawyer representing his family, was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The mayor says four officers involved in the incident have now been fired, adding this is the right call. In an initial press release, police said they'd arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. Before the officers were fired, the police union said now is not the time to rush to judgment, adding our officers are fully cooperating. The case is already drawing comparisons to the 2014 death of Eric Gardner in New York, who died after police placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare. And this has to stop. Something has to be done. In Minneapolis, protesters are demanding the now former officers involved be arrested. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. The FBI has now joined the case. Investigators are reviewing the officers' body cameras to see what led up to the incident. Philip. All right, Gabe, thank you. The family of 23-year-old Peter Manfredonia is pleading with him to surrender. The FBI has now joined the multi-state manhunt for Manfredonia, a University of Connecticut student who is suspected of killing two people. Officials have also revealed that he has been using stolen cars and ride shares to get around. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the latest on the investigation. After four days and across at least three states, University of Connecticut student Peter Manfredonia is still on the run, wanted in two murders. Peter, we've talked to your family. We've talked to your friends and your roommates. We know this is not who you are. Last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. The bag in the photo, they say, is filled with guns. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a black Hyundai just stolen from the area. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. He had this machete. This wasn't just like a knife. This wasn't some simple edged instrument. It was a machete. The next murder, police say, a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. The attorney for the family says recently the honors engineering student had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with mental health issues. Had things gotten worse? Uh, you know, he had suffered from uh, anxiety and uh, depression for a number of years. Uh, but no, there's no sign that things were, were getting worse. The parents issuing an urgent plea to their son, turn yourself in. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. The lack of COVID concern by several communities is hard to reconcile as the nation is now on the precipice of 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. But after this weekend, officials in many communities are bracing for the consequences with a possible surge of infections in regions where large groups gathered. Here's Miguel Almaguer. 
growing concern amid a grim milestone as the U.S. nears 100,000 COVID-related deaths. Will scenes like these fuel a new spike in infections? With many Americans choosing not to social distance amid massive holiday crowds, in St. Louis County, where health officials called these revelers reckless, there is now a 14-day self-quarantine for anyone who broke safety protocols at Lake of the Ozarks. You see no mask here, you see no fear. Um, we're all just embracing it. As many defy local mandates, the number of new coronavirus cases is rising in several states as more Americans are being tested. In Arkansas, the governor says they are experiencing a dangerous second peak. In Alabama, the outlook also worsening. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. While the World Health Organization warns of a second peak of infections in countries where restrictions are eased too quickly, a return to the New York Stock Exchange, where stocks soared and fewer traders were on the floor taking precautions. In nearby New Rochelle, the first community to lock down is now beginning to reopen. But from coast to coast, many are growing uneasy, fatigued by the quarantine. Your dog can get groomed, but you can't get a haircut. I need my hair done. That's a problem. After long holiday lines at everything from airports to hiking trails, in Los Angeles, Dodger Stadium will be used to test up to 6,000 people a day for COVID-19. Not far away at a food processing plant that makes the iconic Dodger dog, 153 employees have tested positive for the virus, the latest outbreak for an industry struggling to contain the disease. But we don't want to keep applying Band-Aids and leaves we want them back people to be healthy because it's not just them that get infected. The fear amongst the workers, in fact, is even greater for going home and infecting their family and loved ones. With every state worried about new infections, there remains pressure to reopen the economy. Here in California, the governor said hair salons can reopen, but not in the state's biggest counties. Frustration, defiance, and now mounting concern. Has our nation done enough to prevent a second wave? Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. President Trump is waging war on his favorite social media platform this morning. Twitter is now fact-checking the president's tweets for the first time ever. The move comes after years of criticism that social media outlets have allowed misinformation to run rampant. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, Twitter has long grappled with how to deal with the president's tweets. Francis, yeah, the fact-checking actually started by Twitter yesterday after the president falsely claimed in a tweet that mail-in voting leads to fraud. That is not correct. It came after California's governor decided to expand mail-in voting, the president urging people to get the facts, but the facts uh, explained by Twitter were incorrect. Now, uh, President Trump responded uh, after Twitter included this link where you click and you can see why it's un substantiated. Uh, President Trump responded that Twitter is interfering in the 2020 presidential election and stifling free speech. Meantime, uh, the president also suggesting falsely that former Republican congressman and MSNBC anchor Joe Scarborough was involved in the 2001 death of one of his staff members. Authorities long ago determined uh, that the staff member lost consciousness due to an abnormal heart rhythm, collapsed and hit her head. Uh, her widower in a letter to Twitter is urging them to intervene, uh, saying that the president has taken something that doesn't belong to him the memory of his dead wife and perverted it for political gain. My wife deserves better. He condemned the president for uh, the debunked falsehood uh, that she was murdered by her boss. Francis. Right, and we'll see and watch the president's Twitter feed even after this. Thank you, Tracy. All right, let's get a head up, heads up on our weather on this Wednesday with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We want SpaceX to launch this afternoon. It's such a unique opportunity to bring all Americans together and all eyes is on the weather. This morning, we're actually seeing kind of a lull in the weather pattern, dry conditions across Florida. But I do want to show you our future cast that launch at 4.33 p.m. And look at these storms are going to come very close to that area before they make their way offshore. That's a look at the big weather story today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. 
So San Antonio, the heat's going to continue to build, and we're also watching the potential for severe weather this afternoon into tonight across uh, West Texas. Going to watch that pretty closely. If you're in the Northeast, heating up back in the mid 70s. And out to the West, we have heat advisories and warnings. Talk about that coming up. All right, sounds good. Talk to you then, Janessa. Thank you. And in today's quick hits, Chrissy Teigen posted this video uh, to Twitter of her coronavirus test. Her caption was, honestly, loved it. You can see her laughing. It was a precaution before she has surgery to remove her breast implants. Burger King wants you to have it your way and make others stay away. Franchises in Italy are debuting a social distancing whopper, which will have three times the raw onions piled on top. Nike and Ben and Jerry's partnered up to design a shoe called Chunky Dunky, inspired by Chunky Monkey ice cream. It dropped on Saturday for 100 bucks a pair, but it quickly sold out. Now the resale market has it at 1,700 bucks. Breaking news this morning, a manhunt is underway in Baltimore, Maryland, after a police officer was shot in the line of duty. Investigators say the officer was shot while responding to a suspected erratic driver who crashed into a parked car. Police say the suspect shot the officer during a foot chase. That officer was hit one time in the lower abdomen, but officials credit his bulletproof vest for saving his life. The officer suffered a non-life-threatening injury and is likely to be treated without surgery. Investigators believe the suspect, the suspect carjacked someone to make his escape. The Justice Department has dropped insider trading investigations of three senators who sold off stocks following early briefings on the coronavirus. Prosecutors alerted defense attorneys for Republicans Kelly Loeffler and James Inhofe, as well as Democrat Dianne Feinstein, that they are closing investigations into their trading. All three senators have previously denied any wrongdoing. However, a related investigation into Senator Richard Burr, who temporarily stepped aside as the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, is continuing. Some positive news now for hockey fans. The National Hockey League announced that it will hold a modified Stanley Cup playoffs consisting of 24 teams. Uh, the playoffs will have 12 teams from each conference ranked on points percentage when the league paused uh, back on March 12th. The tournament will be played in two hub cities, which have yet to be determined. The hubs will have hotel and practice facilities, along with daily COVID-19 testing. Training camps will not open until July 1st at the earliest, and no dates for the games have been announced. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban is looking for ways to restart the NBA season. In his plan, which he sent to the league, the top 10 teams from both the East and West would qualify for the playoffs. They would come after everyone plays five to seven regular season games. Cuban says all 30 teams need to play once games tip off, again, tip off again to fulfill TV contracts. Let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. No one wants to sweat back more than <laughs> this right. guy here. There's nothing I hate more than a liar. Well, there's no room for someone like that in this organization. <laughs> <laughs> Are you feeling all right, George? Uh, fine. You look a little warm. It's a chicken. <laughs> You're a terrible liar, George. Look at you. You're a wreck. You're sweating bullets. It's the Kung Pao. Mm. George likes his chicken spicy. <laughs> Actor Richard Hurd, best known for playing Mr. Wilhelm on Seinfeld, has died after battling cancer. He also appeared on the cop drama T.J. Hooker. Richard Hurd was 87 years old. Halsey says she is waddling like a penguin after fracturing her ankle and later breaking two toes. The singer revealed that she slammed her ankle bone against the metal door while loading dishes into the dishwasher. When a fan asked how she was doing a few days later, Halsey admitted to additionally breaking two toes on the other foot. She joked that she's only clumsy off stage. You know, what's going to happen, I guess, right now is the best time to recover from an injury. It's not like she's going to go touring. You're not right going to go right? anywhere, so might as well heal at home. All right. Good morning, everyone. Who's ready for some record heat? It's going to be impacting the Midwest areas of the Northeast. Burlington, I see in 92 degrees for daytime highs today, about 20 degrees above average, and we still have excessive heat that's building across Southern California into the Southwest. Chris. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. That is In today's top stories, a white woman has been fired from her job after a viral video shows her accusing a black man of harassing her in Central Park. The heated confrontation began when Christian Cooper, who describes himself as an avid bird watcher, asked Amy Cooper, no relation, to put her dog on a leash. 
at some point she decided that, you know, oh, I'm going to play the race card, I guess. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Christian Cooper says he kept recording because he had no intentions of being intimidated, but stopped after the woman leashed her dog. And now Amy Cooper is apologizing and says she overreacted. I sincerely and humbly apologize to everyone, especially to that man, his, his family. Amy Cooper was later fired from her employer, Franklin Templeton, who says it does not tolerate racism. Police in Miramar, Florida, are searching for an unidentified man who they say broke into a high school and spent an entire day vandalizing the campus, causing upwards of $100,000 in damages. And they say he did it all while he was naked. Police say he broke computers, graffitied walls, and flooded areas of the school. A $3,000 reward is being offered for information on his identity. Not even trying to mask it, though, I guess. All right, a, a Cuban artist has, is paying homage to a Latino frontline worker in a giant way. This gentleman here is a hero, and he's one of many. In one of the most diverse communities of Queens, New York, artist Jorge Rodriguez Guerrada is graf crafting a masterpiece, uh, that massive mural there of a pediatrician who died from COVID-19. The artwork was created to pay homage to the doctor and to recognize the heroism of all frontline workers. How well, impressive to do that kind of work, but even more so for the reason why he's yeah. doing that too. All right, the impact of coronavirus is being felt globally, even under the sea. An environmentalist found the bottom of the French Riviera littered with that discarded masks and gloves, along with aluminum cans and other trash. He posted his findings on social media and said, quote, we'll soon have more masks than jellyfish in the Mediterranean. Sign of the times. All right. Uh, the Italian Air Force demonstration team, they painted the colors of the country's flag in the sky to celebrate a major national holiday. The flight team sent plumes of red, white and green smoke over the European skies as part of a week long celebration to mark Italy's Republic Day on June 2nd. Their usual parade was canceled due to the pandemic, but Italians are still celebrating in that spectacular way. Beautiful. Thank you for waking up with us. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning. Breaking overnight, protests erupt. Demonstrators clashing with police in Minneapolis following the death of a black man pinned to the ground by an officer. Four officers involved fired. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. But this morning, the victim's family is demanding murder charges. His sister and her attorney join us for a live interview. Alarm bells, new cases of the coronavirus on the rise in 24 states. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. Just ahead, the fear those packed holiday crowds from coast to coast will only make things worse. And we go one on one with the governor of California. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. Will schools, camps and daycares open there soon? His answer straight ahead. Fact checked. For the first time, Twitter slaps a warning label on posts from President Trump. Just ahead, the controversial claims he made that finally forced the company's hand and how the president is responding this morning. On the run, the FBI joins the manhunt for a Connecticut college student suspected of two murders, an abduction and a home invasion. Investigators making a new plea for his surrender. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. The very latest on the ongoing search just ahead. Those stories plus three, two, one, liftoff. The historic launch years in the making just hours away now for the first time a private company taking NASA astronauts to space, ushering in a new era of exploration if the weather cooperates. Today, Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. 
Morning, everybody. Welcome today. It's a Wednesday morning. So nice to have you with us. And boy, what a day for NASA. It's a historic moment for the U.S. space program. And we're going to watch it unfold live later today. Yeah, all eyes on that and on Al Roker to see if the weather does cooperate. We're going to have a live report from the Kennedy Space Center just ahead. Also, we will have the latest on the coronavirus as the death toll in the U.S. is expected to surpass 100,000 today. Savannah. But we want to begin with that breaking news, those new protests erupting in Minneapolis overnight after George Floyd was pinned to the ground by police and later died. The incident was caught on camera and it sparked outrage around the country. It's led to the firing of four officers, but the victim's family says it cannot stop there. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us with the very latest now. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. You're right. The victim's family says the firing of those officers is not enough. State authorities and the FBI are now investigating, and a warning video of the incident is disturbing. Overnight chaos in Minneapolis. Crowds of protesters swarmed the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. Another demonstration in Chicago. This is a trauma that a lot of us African Americans have to deal with. A bystander's cell phone video captured the incident Monday night. A Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee into his neck. For at least three minutes on the video, Floyd pleads for help, saying he can't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive as onlookers shout at the officer. Get off of him now. Security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking him across the street. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance, but the mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The 46-year-old Floyd played basketball in college and lived most of his life in Texas, working as a truck driver and security guard. It's just heartbreaking when you watch how they killed him, how his knee was on his neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, but eight minutes. LeBron James posted this image on social media of the officer kneeling on Floyd with former quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeling in protest of police brutality, writing, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? The case is already drawing comparisons to another high profile police confrontation in 2014. When you look at that video, what goes through your head? Oh, I see another senseless killing. Gwen Carr is the mother of Eric Gardner, who died after police in New York placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare, and this has to stop. Something has to be done. And before the firings, the police union has said that there should not be a rush to judgment and that the officers were cooperating. Now, Floyd's family wants the officers arrested and charged. Hold on. Uh, Gabe, I'll catch that one. And by the way, we're going to have a lot more throughout the morning on this case, including our live interview with George Floyd's sister and her attorney. Six minutes after the hour, Hoda will send it up to you. All right, Savannah, thanks. Also this morning, there are mounting concerns over a potential second wave of the coronavirus. Now, in the past week, 24 states have reported an increase in new cases. And health officials fear those packed beaches and parks over the holiday weekend will only cause that number to rise. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is covering that story for us. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hoda, good morning. The governor here in California continues to ease restrictions, but like in many other states, some say it's not fast enough. Officials everywhere are trying to jumpstart the economy and keep people healthy, but some are no longer willing to wait. This morning, growing fallout from those holiday weekend crowds and serious concern over a fresh wave of coronavirus infections. This as the national death toll approaches a staggering 100,000.
USA Today putting a face on the devastating loss. This jam-packed pool party in Missouri prompting health officials in St. Louis County to issue a travel alert and a 14-day self-quarantine order for anyone who was there. Overnight, the owner of the bar where the event took place posting a message to Facebook saying in part that he stands by his decision to host the party and that no laws were broken. That post also referencing an earlier statement from the local sheriff saying it is the right and responsibility of each individual to make decisions about going out. Tyler Cranker was at that party and plans to take a COVID test today. I don't think personally that I will get really sick. But if I do, I have to live with the consequences of my actions. Now, with more Americans being tested, the number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in several states. And in Alabama, the situation is getting worse. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. The governor in Arkansas says they're experiencing a dangerous second peak, while in New Rochelle, New York, the first city in the nation to be locked down is now slowly reopening. You have to start somewhere. Now is the time. I don't think it's the greatest thing because um, there's a lot of people that, you know, are sick. Across the country in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, up to 6,000 people a day will be tested for the virus. Nearby at a food processing plant, 153 employees have tested positive. But the nation is showing new signs of life. The New York Stock Exchange reopening with a limited number of traders on the floor and new safety restrictions, promising signs of progress amid larger gatherings of concern. With the holiday weekend behind us, health officials say it'll take about two weeks to see if there truly was an impact from those large holiday crowds. Meantime, here in California, the governor says he will continue to slowly ease restrictions. Savannah. All right, Miguel, thank you. And still ahead, we do have an exclusive interview with the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, on his state's progress against the virus. What happens next as the country enters what he calls the unknown? But now to that headline-making move by Twitter overnight, adding the first fact-checked links to tweets from the president. And he has responded, where else, on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has got the very latest for us this morning. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. So far, Twitter has added those fact check labels on just two of President Trump's tweets where he complained about mail-in ballots and claimed that they would cause this November's election to be rigged. Still, this is a significant step after fierce criticism. The social media company had not done enough to push back against the president's misleading and inaccurate statements. The president's favorite social media megaphone, Twitter, for the first time, slapping a fact check label on some of President Trump's tweets. Twitter responding to two Trump tweets that claim mail in ballots will be substantially fraudulent. Now, beneath them, this message get the facts about mail in ballots and a link to articles about the unsubstantiated claim. The president immediately lashing out, accusing the company of interfering in the 2020 presidential election and completely stifling free speech, adding I as president will not allow it to happen. It comes as Twitter is under fire for another set of incendiary Trump tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and MSNBC Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that. And... Uh... Hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Authorities determined years ago that 28-year-old Lori Klesudis died after an abnormal heart rhythm caused her to collapse and hit her head in Scarborough's Florida office. Scarborough was in Washington at the time. But that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Timothy Klesudis, Lori's widower, appealing directly to Twitter's CEO, Jack Dorsey, to remove the tweets, writing, I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the President of the United States has taken something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better. Twitter has not taken down the tweets, but says it's working on policy changes it hopes to have in place shortly. What the Klesudis's the entire family have had to endure for 19 years. Um, it's, it's unspeakably cruel for what, whether it's the president 
or whether it's people following the president, it is unspeakably cruel. The president acknowledged Tuesday he's read that letter, but he ignored the widower's words. Ultimately, they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. Peter, meanwhile, there's a back and forth between President Trump and Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, having to do with wearing a mask out in public. What happened? Yes, yeah, Savannah, you'll remember, unlike President Trump, Joe Biden wore a mask during a Memorial Day event this week. And the president later shared a tweet that mocked Biden for that mask. Biden, who says he was following the Trump administration's recommended guidelines, fired back on CNN. He's a fool, an absolute fool to talk that way. I mean, every leading doc in the world is saying we should wear a mask when you're in a crowd. Late yesterday, the president said Biden can wear a mask, but that he thought it was very unusual that Biden had one on outside while with his wife. The president also criticized a reporter for keeping his mask on while asking a question yesterday, accusing that reporter in the Rose Garden of trying to be politically correct. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Hoda, up to you. All right, thank you. Also this morning, the multi-state manhunt for a Connecticut college student wanted in connection with a string of deadly crimes is expanding. NBC Stephanie Gosk has details. This morning, police have a message for suspected murderer Peter Manfredonia. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. We want you to be able to tell your story. After four days and across at least three states, the University of Connecticut student is still on the run, wanted in two murders. He was last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a stolen black Hyundai Santa Fe. When they finally released the information, we put two and two together and it was terrifying. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. Ted was the gentlest, most loving soul there was. He would do anything for everyone. Demers' sister-in-law believes the attack was premeditated. You don't just put a machete in your backpack and come to the end of a dirt road without a plan. The next murder, police say, a friend from high school. Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown, Connecticut, at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. This morning, NBC News has learned Manfredonia's father, Robert, was arrested in Newtown last month and charged with second-degree sexual assault, risk of injury to a minor, and giving alcohol to a minor. He was released on $50,000 bond. Connecticut police saying the charges against Robert have no relevance to the investigation into his son. Spoken to, While a family uh, attorney says the younger Manfredonia is an honors engineering student who had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with anxiety and depression, but no signs things were getting worse. The parents message right now to Peter. The parents and the family's message to Peter is, Peter, we love you. It's time to bring this to a safe conclusion for everybody before anybody else gets hurt. For today, Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. We'll continue to follow that case. There's much more to get to this morning, including the countdown. It's on to this afternoon's historic mission to space. Here's a live look at Kennedy Space Center this morning. And just hours from now, NASA and SpaceX will team up for the first crewed launch from U.S. soil since 2011. The final safety and weather checks are already underway, and the weather's a big question this morning. NBC's Tom Costello is there. Hi, Tom. Good morning. How's it looking? Yeah, the weather is the issue right now. We've already had a pretty good rain uh, squall move in here just a short time ago. That's going to be the issue throughout the day. But you're absolutely right. This is a history making flight. The first time ever that a private company is carrying astronauts to the space station, in this case, SpaceX. And so much is riding on this mission for NASA and for SpaceX. But most importantly, getting those two men up to the space station safely. 
With the clock ticking down, we're now just hours away from witnessing history once again at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley set to hitch a ride to the International Space Station from a private company aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon, propelled by its Falcon 9 rocket, a public-private partnership that NASA is banking on to launch a new era of space travel. It's all about commercialization of low Earth orbit so that we can use NASA's resources to do the things that have not yet been commercialized, like go to the moon and on to Mars. Today's mission, dubbed Demo 2, is a proof of concept that companies like SpaceX can serve as taxis for Americans and other nations to reach low Earth orbit destinations like the space station. If we can have other countries buy seats on these rockets. It drives down the cost for the United States of America taxpayers. Those seats will cost $55 million each. That may sound staggering, but NASA has been shelling out more than $80 million per seat for astronauts to ride on Russian rockets. SpaceX founder Elon Musk sharing this bird's eye view ahead of this critical test for the company. Also watching today's launch closely, Bankin and Hurley's wives, Megan MacArthur and Karen Nyberg, who are both also astronauts. Nyberg sharing this image with their son, inspecting dad's ride on the launch. Pad. The two-man crew set to load into that crew dragon just over two hours before blastoff, wearing specially designed spacesuits and using touchscreens. Minutes after launch, the Falcon 9 rocket will separate and, if all things go as planned, land upright on a SpaceX barge out on the ocean. The Crew Dragon continuing on to dock with a station where Bankin and Hurley will live and conduct research with the rest of the team for one to four months. I'm really looking forward to having a couple uh, crewmates here to help distribute the duties, but also to eat with and laugh with and joke around with. It'll be a great, great uh, adventure with them. So let's drill down on it, Tom, because weather is really uh, the spoiler potentially. So how is it looking for this afternoon? We've got a, a few hours for things to clear up. Yeah, and, and in some ways, this is more complicated than during the space shuttle because it's not just about how the weather is looking here. And right now, there's a 60% chance of go here at the Kennedy Space Center. But they also consider the weather and the ocean factors out in the Atlantic Ocean, all the way up the coast of Canada, and all the way out to Ireland. Why? Because if they have to abort, the spaceship would then parachute down into the Atlantic Ocean, and they would want to have that crew safe until rescue teams could arrive. And there's a rescue team on standby at Cape Canaveral. They would fly to the location of where the crew may have aborted and parachuted down. They themselves would parachute into the ocean and help rescue and stabilize the crew. So all of that is a big reason why it's not just the weather here, it's the weather out over the ocean as well. It's just so mind-blowingly complicated. We are anxious to see if they can pull it off, Tom. A big moment today. We will have live coverage of the launch right here on NBC. Hoda? All right, Savannah, what do you say we bring in the guy who's going to know more about the launch forecast than us? And also the West of the <laughs> National weather picture. Hey, Al, what do we got? Well, guys, uh, we are looking at, as you see, again, as Tom showed, it's cloudy out there. They've got showers. And in fact, as we look at the live radar, you'll see that we are looking at some pretty strong storms that are going to be pushing in. In fact, we already had one clear launch pad 39A. But look to the south. This is live radar right now. And we're going to be looking at this all day today as we move into the afternoon. And look at launch time, 433. There's some heavy showers and thunderstorms, a 60 percent chance of those storms. And besides that, to the north, we've got an invest area that may become a tropical system over the next five days already. Some buoys out in the Atlantic reporting tropical force winds. Today, this system moves up into the Appalachians. Virginia, North Carolina, look for strong storms. It weakens as it moves into western New York State, but brings strong storms tomorrow into the mid-Atlantic. And look at the heavy rain. Some areas along the southeastern Atlantic coast, four inches or more already on top of saturated ground. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Back now, 7.30 on this Wednesday morning, the 27th day of May. That's 2020. Look at this. Big news in the sports world. The NHL announcing its return to play plan, Craig. 
You're sharing some good news. You'll be talking to the commissioner coming up. We're going to talk to Gary Bettman next hour. He laid out that plan yesterday. More of a framework. No hard dates just yet. But it would be the first sports league in North America to announce their plan. So we're looking forward to that conversation and what it could mean for other team sports moving forward. Mm -hmm. Savannah? Yeah, we cannot wait. We'll be hanging on his every word. We'll hear about that coming up next hour. Tomorrow morning on today, guys, trying to get a hold of an RV for your family vacation this summer? Well, it might be a little bit tough. Guess what? This has become huge. RVs, well, they've become one of the huh. season's hottest tickets. Mm. People planning their getaways. They want to be in their own confined, safe space, but see stuff at the same time. So... We'll have more on the RV craze. Like that. All right. But let's turn now to our 730 headlines. New protests erupted in Minneapolis overnight after a black man died in police custody on Monday. Crowds of protesters swarmed the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. It all stems from an incident on Monday night. You can see a Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee to his neck. Floyd pleads repeatedly for help, saying he can't breathe. It happened at least a dozen times. He was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Four officers involved have been fired, and the FBI has joined the investigation. And joining us now is George Floyd's sister, Bridget, along with the Floyd family attorney, Benjamin Krupp. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Bridget, I know you haven't um, had the stomach to look at that video, and I don't blame you. It's really horrifying. But would you just tell us how you and your family are doing in this moment? Me and my family are taking this uh, very, very hard. Um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing to our peace. Uh, we're just doing the best that we can and um, making sure that we do the right thing, do what he would want us to do. And um, yes, it's very hard. It's very hard. I can see that, Bridget. I can see that. Yesterday, there was some action taken against those officers, four officers, all four were fired. And you have said repeatedly, that is not enough. What, what would be enough for you? I would like for those officers to be charged with murder because that's exactly what they did. They murdered my brother. He was crying for help. I don't need them to be suspended and able to work in another state or another county. Their license should be taken away, their job should be taken away, and they should be put in jail for murder. Um, let me bring in Ben for a second, Ben Crump. Um, I have a copy of the police report here, and this is what was submitted initially. And I'm going to read you a portion of it, and then I'm going to show you the video of what happened. They say here uh, that George Floyd was ordered to step, and this was all, by the way, over a forgery, a fake $20 bill. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect in handcuffs. Then this video emerged, Ben, that shows a different picture, doesn't it? Absolutely, Huda. And we have more video emerging, video from the businesses' surveillance cameras um, on social media, attorney Crump. We have people sending us new videos that have not been shown yet. And it shows, Huda, that, I mean, a nonviolent crime met with this kind of violent, lethal, excessive force. They were on his neck not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, not for five minutes, not for six minutes, not for seven minutes, not for eight minutes, but for nine minutes while he is begging to breathe, begging for life. It's a I can't breathe again case. Mm -hmm. It's 2020, and it's worse than Eric Gardner in many ways because you hear the people even pleading with them, please get your knee off his neck, have some humanity. This is a human being. And, and 
Ben, when you look also as the police report continues, and this is how the police report covers that part, they noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance where he died. If not for that video of him pleading, of the bystanders begging the officers to basically get off of him, what would have happened with this case? They would have gave a false narrative, Hoda, and they would have swept it under the rug. And we have this video, and they have terminated them, but they need to be arrested, as Bridget said, and charged with murder because how many more of these senseless, excessive force killings by the people who are supposed to protect us can we take in black America and all of America? Bridget, the, uh, the mayor later acknowledged that that police report was inaccurate. He said being black in America should not be a death sentence. The mayor also added that he should not have died. The governor called the lack of humanity in the video disturbing and sickening. He also said, made this statement, the governor said, we will get answers and seek justice. Do you have faith, Bridget, that justice will be done in this case? I have a lot of faith because I believe in the utmost powerful God. Faith is something that me and my brother always talked about because he was a God-fearing man, regardless of what he does. We all have our faults. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But I believe that justice will be served. I have enough faith to stand on it. And just one one final question for you, uh, Ben Crump. Um, LeBron James posted this picture that's been shown around a bit. It shows Colin Kaepernick kneeling and the police officer kneeling, and he basically says, um, do you understand now? Uh, do you think that this case may actually be the tipping point? I do, because when you think about nine minutes, if you can take your cell phone and sit it for nine minutes and just sit there, America, and try to imagine a knee on your neck suffocating you and you begging to breathe. That's why it has to be the tipping point that we have to say everybody deserves equal justice and we have to send a message with this case. We cannot allow those who are supposed to protect and serve us uh, do this. There can be two justice systems, one for black America and one for white America. We have to have equal justice for the United States of America. Well, Ben Crump, we appreciate you. Bridget, Bridget, we wish, wish the best to you and your family. And I know that your brother's a, a father of two. The youngest is six years old, and we wish her the best as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Well, we are back at 742 with a new normal as the world continues to cope with the coronavirus. Savannah. Yeah, a lot of folks are looking to South Korea. It is pushing ahead with its reopening, even as daily cases there are spiking again in some places. So what lessons does that hold for us? NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul for us this morning. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, today, health officials here are dealing with a new cluster. 36 people all at the same company have tested positive for coronavirus. But at the same time, schools and churches are filling up. At this church in Seoul this morning, a strange sight in a time of social distancing, more than 2,000 parishioners singing and praying under the same roof, the biggest turnout since the church reopened a month ago. Are you concerned about your parishioners getting the virus? So if we follow the government guideline closely, I, I think it will be safe. Thermal sensors, temperature checks, online bookings and QR codes, giving the church a list of contacts in case someone gets sick, and masks are mandatory. And what about 
holding prayer books or singing or talking to someone next to you? Can you uh, do those things? Uh, singing is okay, but that talk to the next person is prohibited. Schools in South Korea are filling up too. Almost half of all students are now back in class. Kindergartners and first graders together, but separated. And parents are still understandably nervous. This dad says he's a working parent and his child had to go back, but he's worried about the virus spreading when kids play. Across the country, health officials here are still battling small outbreaks and introducing new rules, like requiring masks on all public transportation, including subways, buses, and taxis. This animation shows how germs can spread when a person talks in a subway car. A large number of the people uh, in the presence uh, with a very closed environment. Uh, it can be also ideal space for the spreading of the virus. Today, another worry. 36 people at a warehouse for South Korea's largest e-commerce business have tested positive for coronavirus. But they're still pressing ahead with opening schools, doing it slowly, bringing uh, high school seniors back last week, younger kids this week, doing those social distancing uh, measures with tape on the ground, plastic dividers around desks. Even with all of that, Hoda, parents are still worried, in part because earlier this week, a six-year-old tested positive, and health officials think that six-year-old was infected by his art teacher at a private school. Hoda. Wow, so many things to take into consideration. All right, Kelly, uh, thank you. Shift in gears now. How about a how about a check of the weather there, Mr. Roker? All righty. Well, things awfully warm. We're talking from coast to coast. Temperatures nice and toasty. New records possible in New England. Boston's going to flirt with 90 degrees today, 84 in Buffalo, Cincinnati, 85. And then all the way out to the West Coast, look at these temperatures. Records possible today for Sacramento, uh, Bakersfield, Palm Springs, Vegas, Eli, Flagstaff. Toasty conditions and continues that way out west right on into the weekend for Albuquerque, triple digits, Palm Springs. Vegas, Sacramento, and Tucson. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight, outrage. Crowds of protesters clashed with police in Minneapolis following the death of a black man pinned to the ground by an officer. They murdered my brother. 
He was crying for help. This morning, four officers involved fired. So what happens next? We're live with the latest. On the rise, alarming new numbers showing coronavirus cases climbing in some states like Alabama. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. This is businesses open from coast to coast, and the NHL announces new plans to get players back on the ice this summer. And touching tribute, the special way country superstar Tim McGraw is honoring all the moms out there. We'll ask him about the new music video and what he's been up to today, Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. Waking up with today from Colonia, New Jersey. Yeah. From sunny Jacksonville, Florida. It's my 17th birthday. Woo! My name is Jackie. Today's my 93rd birthday. 18 years. Educating over 5,000 students. Mrs. Schneider is retired! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think she's happy about that? That's a lot to celebrate on a Wednesday morning. Special welcome to everybody just waking up with the coffee on. The day is starting. We're so happy to have you with us. We sure are. And the folks on My Today Plaza are pumped up, man. Okay, Yay! just let's let let's just look at them for a second. We got a couple of great things to go over here. We've got a hero mom. She's a nurse. She's got a milestone coming up. And someone's about to reveal for the first time some big news. So we want to welcome in our plaza. We can get, we do. We'll get to them in just a moment. First, though, coming up tomorrow on today, Caroline Kennedy and her son, Jack Schlossberg, they'll be joining us for an exclusive live interview to announce the very special way that they are going to celebrate the JFK Library Foundation's Profiles Encourage Award this year. Of course, this is something that they do every year, mm -hmm. uh, but this year they're going to do it just a little differently. So they're going to tell us all about that tomorrow, Savannah. All right, look forward to that. Let's get you caught up on the news here at 8 o'clock. And tensions are high in Minneapolis this morning after a chaotic night of protests over the death of George Floyd. He was a black man pinned to the ground on Monday by a police officer. Four officers have been fired over the incident. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us with the latest now. Gabe, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning. The victim's family now says that the firing of those four officers was not enough. The FBI and state authorities are now investigating. And overnight, crowds of protesters swarmed the streets of Minneapolis, facing off with officers in riot gear. The outrage mounting after cell phone video captured a disturbing incident Monday night and a warning. It is tough to watch. Now, the bystander cell phone video shows a Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee to his neck. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. But new security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking across the street. Floyd's family says it's clear he's not resisting. We've heard from his sister earlier on today. Me and my family are taking this uh, very, very hard. Um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing to our peace. Now, before the firings, the police union said that there should not be a rush to judgment, but the Minneapolis mayor called it wrong at every level. Hoda. All right, Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, thank you. Moving now to the coronavirus death toll in the U.S. It's approaching another grim milestone. Some states seeing an uptick in new cases. NBC White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the three things he is watching today. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning. This morning, as you noted, the national death toll now approaching that tragic milestone, 100,000 American lives lost. USA Today putting a face on these devastating times and describing the virus as the fastest killer in U.S. history. This all comes amid serious concerns that crowds of people, many of them gathering over the holiday weekend, could trigger a fresh wave of COVID infections after some ignore the warnings. You'll see that pool party, of course, in Missouri. Health officials in St. Louis County now issue to travel alert requiring anyone who was there to self quarantine for 14 days. And now with more Americans being tested, the president just tweeted that the country will surpass 15 million 
today. The number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in about a dozen states, bucking the national trend of staying steady or seeing decreases. And at least half of those states seeing more infections, places like Florida, South Carolina, and Tennessee among them were part of an early wave of reopenings. In Montgomery, Alabama specifically, the mayor there says 80% of their deaths have taken place this month alone. Still, there are important signs of progress. Los Angeles County announcing this week that it'll allow religious services, in-store shopping at low-risk retail stores, and drive-in movie theaters to reopen with restrictions. That would basically get the ball rolling for the county that's really been California's epicenter for the virus to open up faster than much of the state. Savannah. All right, Peter, thanks. And we'll pick it up right there with that cautious approach being taken in California. I spoke to Governor Gavin Newsom exclusively yesterday afternoon about the progress his state has made and what happens next as California and the rest of the country enters what he calls the unknown. We have just been through Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people saw that as a big test of social distancing. How are people handling the responsibility? Are they meeting those obligations of social distancing sufficiently? Yeah, I mean, I think overwhelmingly so, though obviously we've highlighted inappropriately uh, these exceptions. And we want to continue to remind people uh, to be vigilant. But the reality at the end of the day, I've been overwhelmed by 40 million Americans living in the state of California, the vast majority doing the right thing, recognizing uh, that this pandemic is not behind us. Uh, we're not into a second wave. Uh, we still haven't gotten through the first wave. You just this week released new guidelines concerning houses of worship. This has obviously become a flashpoint. The president talked about forcing governors to open houses of worship. Do you think your new guidelines will be the end of the issue? We're one of a few states, a handful of states, that's actually moved forward uh, to provide guidance to houses of worship. So I have deep respect uh, for those that want to practice their faith in person, not just virtually. But we have to do so safely. Uh, it's not a political issue for us. No one's immune from political pressure, but that won't be determinative in terms of our decision making. We'll do it on the basis of public health. Speaking of pressure, a lot of families are under a lot of pressure right now. They're not able to go back to work. And, and when they are able, they are going to have to put their kids somewhere. What are you expecting in terms of child care in the state, in terms of summer camps? I know guidelines are expected to be released very, very soon. Yeah, we made a lot of progress in child care. Our most precious resource, our children, uh, will be done very, very soberly, thoughtfully. Also recognizing we have to take care of the caregivers, meaning our teachers, uh, our bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the janitors as well. But I'm confident uh, in our ability to do this in a responsible way and to get kids back in the classroom uh, over the course of the next few months, again, responsibly. So do you think summer camps will be able to open, child care, school this fall? Do you expect it to be open? With deep modifications, limits, absolutely. Let's talk about the economy. California has been hit harder and worse than possibly any other state, whether you're talking about tourism, agriculture, ports, the film industry, the list goes on and on. How grave is the threat to California's economy? No, it's been profound. I mean, the reality is uh, we have 5 million people that have applied for unemployment insurance just since uh, March 12th, 5 million. Uh, just uh, shy of $12 billion has been distributed in unemployment insurance claims. I mean, these are just jaw-dropping numbers. And so we have our work cut out for us. That's why we need the support of the federal government, not as charity, but as social responsibility to help the American people in this state get moving again. We'll get through this, but it's a sobering time. Do you see an economic bounce back quickly? Some talk about a V-shaped recovery. In other words, we were up here, it dropped sharply and quickly, but it'll bounce back just as dramatically. Do you see it happening that way? I see it happening if public health is our primary focus. I don't see it happening if we look at public health as an annoyance or a nuisance that somehow gets in the way of our economic growth. We're a consumer-based economy. As demand increases, we'll start to see this economy begin to rev back up. But that won't increase until people feel confident and safe going back out and doing their activities that we're doing uh, prior to COVID-19. The president tweeted about you and your plan to send mail-in ballots to registered voters in the state. What do you say to the president's concerns about 
fraudulent ballots. Let's just stick with the facts, not opinions. The reality is mail-in uh, ballots, absentee ballots are well utilized all across the spectrum, all across this country and have been done so thoughtfully and safely uh, for a generation. Uh, I think the president himself has used mail-in ballot in the past. Our service members use them overseas very confidently and securely. Uh, there's been study after study. Don't take my word for it. Don't take the president's. Study after study uh, that just lays claim to no evidence whatsoever that there's widespread voter fraud. We want to prepare to keep people safe and allow them to have their constitutional rights protected, the constitutional right to vote without putting their health at risk. The Department of Justice just recently warned California, in particular the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, that extended shutdown orders may be illegal and violate the Constitution. Do you see a confrontation with the federal government coming? Was this a shot across the bow? I think we're entering in a political season. I think people are sharpening uh, their tongues, sharpening their knives to some degree, uh, figuratively. Uh, and certainly I expect more of this, not less. People will be really heartened to see businesses start to reopen, life start to return. At the same time, it's such a delicate balancing act. I was struck by something you said today, that we're heading into the unknown. How are you trying to balance those considerations as we go forward with those concerns about a potential second wave that could be worse? Well, we don't want to yield to the unknown. You've got to be driven by data, not political pressure, and not scoring political points. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. And we'll come out the other side more capable of not only weathering a second wave, but ultimately more resilient as a society and as a community, and more capable of meeting the economic conditions that will present themselves well into the future. Well. Such an interesting uh, situation facing California in particular. Uh, it, it is in free fall, hit so hard by the virus, but seeing some progress in terms of its spread. So we'll see how that develops. And it obviously has big implications for the rest of the country, yeah. guys. A lot of folks don't realize that California's economy, just the state's economy, mm -hmm. is larger than the economy of most countries. So as California yeah, goes, so exactly. goes the rest of America. All right, guys, we got our news covered. I got a morning boost for you. Ah. Even after decades of marriage, Jim and Lisa tally, they're like a couple of lovebirds. So Lisa did have to spend her birthday in the hospital after surgery. So here's what her hubby did. Jim wasn't allowed in because the pandemic. So he used a construction lift. No big deal. Raised him up to Lisa's <laughs> fourth floor hospital window. Happy birthday. I love you. I told you I'd go to the moon. I'm not leaving your side. Wow. I love you, babe. Happy birthday to you. In the snow and all, Jim joked that he was kind of glad she wasn't on the fifth floor. <laughs> he didn't want to go that high, but actually he said he'd go to the moon for her. That's love. Uh huh. That is so sweet. I'm, I'm mad at my husband and I don't know why. <laughs> Guys, okay, we have another one for you. Here's some neighborhood kids. They were just practicing their skateboarding moves on a small beginner's ramp. And guess who drove by? Oh, just Olympic legend Sean White. The kids <laughs> held up a sign asking oh, him to join them. So no. why not? You know, he's not just a snowboarder. Yep, he's a world-class skateboarder, too. Put on the mask, hit the ramp, did some maneuvers. But, and this is best of all, he mostly just let the kids show off their tricks for him. And White said he was stoked to put some smiles on the young faces during hard times. That's cool. Not sure it's a quote, but probably it is. <laughs> yes. He probably said stoked. That's cool. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. To that audition that we've been talking about on last night's season premiere of America's Got Talent that the world will never forget, Savannah. Yeah, and if you haven't heard this story, just wait. Archie Williams is a man who spent 36 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Well, he brought the house down with his singing last night and his powerful story. Natalie Morales had a chance to speak with him. And the judge, he has inspired greatly, Simon Cowell. Natalie, good morning. Hey, guys, you need a little uplift and joy this morning. Well, this story has it all. You know, the evidence clearly said 
Archie was innocent, but without money for a proper defense, he was sentenced to a lifetime of suffering. But as he told us, his mind was never imprisoned, and now he's making the most of his freedom. My name is Archie Williams. Tuesday night, Archie Williams took the stage on NBC's America's Got Talent and made an impression no one will soon forget. Don't let the sun go down on me. A show-stopping moment that he never could have imagined just last year. On March 21st, 2019, Archie Williams was released from Angola Prison in Louisiana, 37 years after being falsely accused and convicted of rape. Sweet right now. Archie was just 22 in 1983 when he was arrested and stood trial for the 1982 rape and stabbing of a white woman in her Baton Rouge home. Despite multiple alibis, fingerprints that didn't match his, and eyewitnesses saying Archie wasn't the guy, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Being innocent is, is, is a thing where you never give up on yourself. That kept Archie going, and in 1995, after having already served 12 years, he wrote to the Innocence Project. By the grace of God, I'm still holding on, hoping and praying someone will answer my letter. His case was screaming out that he was innocent. It took a new judge in 2019 to order the fingerprint test. Within eight hours, they'd found the real rapist. And within a week, Archie was free. What does freedom feel like, Archie? I don't think you can explain it. The fullness of freedom. For Archie, this is what freedom sounds like. Found your voice. Singing was my was my sport. That sport led him to an unusual place. I uh, I was just incarcerated for 37 years for somebody else crime. Ooh. 37 years of pain and suffering, and now joy in each note. But losing everything is like the sun. words that much more powerful coming from Archie. I, I would never ever listen to that song uh, in the same way ever again. One person influenced my life and that was Oprah. And I remember her saying to me, if you're in a position to make television shows, you have the ability to change people's lives. And because of Archie, he's become an ambassador for the Innocence Project. We're going to do something about this together because I believe that when enough people unite, great things happen. They say the truth will set you free. For Archie, it's done more than that. It's given him back his life, including a daughter he didn't know he had. To think of her going all those years without me. And a future with new dreams. I want to make up all the lost years. It's like the sun going down home. Brought the house down last night, standing ovation there. Now, Archie is living out a lifelong dream at the moment, but he says he's not going to truly feel free until, as he said, all his innocent brothers in Angola prison are freed just as he was, guys. Beautiful, Nat Mo. Wow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back 838 now with some exciting news for fans who are hungry for sports. On Tuesday, the National Hockey League became the first professional sports league in North America to announce an official format to return to play. We're going to unpack the specific details with Commissioner Gary Bettman in just a moment. But first, how the rest of the hockey season could play out. Strom peeled off. Nylander scores! Since March 12th, the National Hockey League has been dark. A full stop due to the coronavirus pandemic. But a new plan could have players back on the ice this summer. I am delighted to be with you today to announce the National Hockey League's plans for our resumption of play. In a press conference Tuesday, Commissioner Gary Bettman announced the league's plans to return to play for the postseason. 
24 of the league's teams will soon head to the playoffs to compete for the Stanley Cup. The news celebrated online by hockey and sports fans alike. It's not clear if any fans will be able to attend in person with new precautions in place because of the coronavirus. All games will be played in two yet-to-be-determined hub cities, one for the Eastern Conference teams and one for the Western. These hubs will have secure hotels, arenas, practice facilities, and transportation for players, and teams will be required to limit personnel and support staff. While nothing is without risk, Ensuring health and safety has been central to all of our planning so far and will remain so. Without committing to specific dates, the commission laid out a possible timeline beginning as early as June and based on guidance from medical professionals and government authorities. I know I join sports fans everywhere when we say we cannot wait for our players to hit the ice again. And NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman joins us live now. And uh, Gary, a lot of those fans are, are celebrating this morning, not even just fans of hockey, just sports fans in general. Uh, here's the thing. It sounds like it's more of a framework than, it, than it, a really a list of dates to circle on a calendar. When do you think that the first puck is going to drop, Gary? It will be at some point over the summer. By the way, good morning, and it's great to be with you. The The framework is intended to be a bit evolutionary. We're going to take things what's one step at a time because the health and safety of our players or all of our personnel and all of our communities is of paramount importance. So we've been in a self-isolation stage Early June, we're going to have our training facilities open because our players haven't been able to work out or skate, so they want to get back in shape. And then when we get the sense that they're ready and we get the sense as to how long we need for training camp, we'll move to the training camp phase, probably at some point in July. And once we're done with training camp, we're then going to execute the plan that you just described so well in two hub cities. We, we don't want to be pinned down to specific dates because, as everybody knows, things are changing almost daily. You, you did say yesterday that an essential component of this plan is going to be uh, what you describe as rigorous testing. Tell us a little bit more about, the, about this testing and, and how often that's going to happen. The, the medical people tell us that the, the safest way for us to do what we're planning to do is to be testing uh, personnel, particularly the players, if not daily, at least every other day. Uh, For the scope of the tournament, we're talking about probably between 25 and 30,000 tests. Uh, Putting aside the expense, we also understand that we can't be doing the testing if it's going to interfere at all with any medical needs of any communities that we might be considering going to. Although the medical people are telling us that by the summer that testing should be in such abundance that 25 to 30,000 tests, while it sounds like a big number, will will be infinitesimal uh, relative to what will be available. Gary, what happens when there's that that first positive test, whether it's a a player or a coach or some sort of someone affiliated with one of the teams? Are are you going to have to shut the, the whole thing down? The medical people are advising us that one test uh, should not result in that. You quarantine that person. But obviously, if there's an outbreak, uh, that would shut things down. Although uh, we're not going to make that decision. The medical people will tell us what to do under the circumstances. As as I think everybody knows, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we believe that having a framework and, and a timetable that we can adjust It's another step in the return to some degree of normalcy, and we think that's really important because sports has always been a catalyst for bringing people together and helping communities heal. And providing a much-needed escape during these times especially. Gary, one more question here. So many of your players, hundreds of players in the NHL, uh, they come from overseas. They come from Canada, Russia, uh, Finland, Sweden. And, of course, Sweden never enacted the kind of lockdown uh, that, that we've seen in our country. But what are you going to do about these, these hundreds of players who are, who are returning from other countries? We, we have about 44% roughly of our players are in the cities in which they play. And 83% of our players are in North America. But you're right, 17% of our players are coming from outside of North America. Uh, They're going to have to come back. They're going to have to self-isolate. They're going to be tested. We're going to have to make sure they're symptom-free. 
which is again why we're doing this in steps. We can use the, the individual training uh, phase, phase two as we call it, to do that and get everybody back together as a community. But once we go into training camp mode, uh, there'll be lots of testing, not quite as much as when we're actually playing in phase four, uh, but we're going to be monitoring everything very closely because we know we've got to bring back uh, a large group of people from all over, and we have to make sure as we're bringing them together, uh, we're not bringing COVID-19 with them. NHL Commissioner uh, Gary Bedman. Gary, I think you're going to pick up a lot of hockey fans over the next few months. Uh, thank you, sir. Good luck to you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Be well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Welcome back. Well, you guys, we can always count on country music legend Tim McGraw to entertain and inspire us. He's got some incredibly heartfelt songs. Well, here he goes again. He's got a brand new one, a new video. It's a powerful single. Get ready. It's called I Called Mama. Take a look. From the backseat wrote a song just for me. I sung it for the blue sky and a couple live old trees. I thought of home. Grab my phone from my pocket. And I call mama. Oh my god. I just want to watch, Tim, I, not, not, nothing against you. I just want to watch the whole video right now. But in a world where it's beautiful. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi. I'm well. How are you? Oh, my word. I was going to say the timing of this song. I know it's around Mother's Day and all that stuff. But given the fact that so many people haven't been able to hug their moms in so long, this, this video is right on target. Um, tell us how it came to be. Well, you know, the song, I was recording the song back earlier in the year, way before all this happened, and uh, and it was just a great song. It was a song I loved, and I, I, I you know, I love my mom like everybody loves their mom, and, and I really wanted to record it, and after I recorded it and we got it mixed, then, you know, the the, the virus came along and everybody was talking about it and, it and everybody went into isolation, so it really took on a bigger meaning and a deeper meaning to us, and um that's why we released it, and it just happened to be around Mother's Day. But, but the main reason was because it just it just felt like you know, well, like what, what I've been doing, everybody's been doing it, sitting around at home and having comfort food all the time. This this song felt like comfort food for yeah. your soul in a it lot sure of ways. Does. Well, yeah. speaking of speaking of moms, how's how's yours? How's Betty? Because I remember <laughs> I interviewed you when we were talking about your book, and I was so struck by how she was when you were just a little boy. What she was like as a mom. Tell us. Yeah. You, are you going to make me cry again, aren't you? <laughs> no, my mom's awesome. She, uh, they're down in Florida and they're they're staying self isolated. You know, just to, just to make sure that they're safe. But I, I talked to her quite a bit, and she's pretty happy about this video. She asked, uh, she sent me a message the other day and asked, does this mean she's a movie star now? <laughs> and, so, and then last night I talked to her. She wants a she wants a star on the Walk of Fame now <laughs> because of the video. But she's doing great. I mean, my mom was such an inspiration to us growing up because she went through a lot. And uh, it's sort of, certainly having me out of wedlock early in her life and, and um, cutting her high school, you know, short because of me. And, and um, she's always been there. She's always been the person to tell us to to think bigger than our circumstances and to chase your dreams. And, and with, without her saying that to us growing up and instilling in that in us growing up, I'm, I'm certainly sure that I wouldn't have pursued the career that I have. Well, what you've done with this video is you've connected with your mom and with all of our moms, with your fans. Your fans sent in pictures and video, and that helped make this beautiful. Yeah, um, we had tons of people send stuff in. We couldn't get everybody in, of course, but we, we tried to, to, to at least make it make it as, as 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 you can feel as much as you can and it even though your your mother may not have gotten in well i think it's cool because i know you had to cancel your concert and i think a lot of us yeah. are looking for connection and i was just thinking about you at home you've got your girls all of them wife and kids you have two graduates in your family who didn't get to go to graduation you had maggie who graduated college and audrey at high school is that right that's right. Um, we had a drive-through graduation for Audrey, and where they we drove through campus, which was really cool. Gracie's out in L.A. My my oldest daughter, and then Maggie graduated and didn't have a and didn't have a graduation as well. So it's it's a 
we, we were together a little bit. We haven't all been together during this time, but some of us have been together. Um, but, uh, boy, we, I feel for all the parents out there and all the kids who, who didn't have the graduation, but, but we try to make it as, as, uh, as fun for him as we could. Well, you did. And you, you gave a great uh, speech on iHeart uh, Radio, so I encourage people to go listen to it. And I encourage mm-hmm. people to download this song. Tim, it's another one of those. That, you know how you do that. I wish you wouldn't do that to <laughs> us, okay? I got, I got this right here for your songs whenever they come out. Oh, well. Well, we love you. you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for joining us, okay? Thank you so much. Good and, to see you. And Tim's going to come back and hang with me and Jenna in just a little bit. Carson! You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Good morning. Breaking overnight, protests erupt. Demonstrators clashing with police in Minneapolis following the death of a black man pinned to the ground by an officer. Four officers involved fired. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. But this morning, the victim's family is demanding murder charges. His sister and her attorney join us for a live interview. Alarm bells, new cases of the coronavirus on the rise in 24 states. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in 
this month alone. Just ahead, the fear those packed holiday crowds from coast to coast will only make things worse. And we go one on one with the governor of California. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. Will schools, camps and daycares open there soon? His answer straight ahead. Fact checked. For the first time, Twitter slaps a warning label on posts from President Trump. Just ahead, the controversial claims he made that finally forced the company's hand and how the president is responding this morning. On the run, the FBI joins the manhunt for a Connecticut college student suspected of two murders, an abduction and a home invasion. Investigators making a new plea for his surrender. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. The very latest on the ongoing search just ahead. Those stories plus three, two, one, liftoff. The historic launch years in the making just hours away now for the first time a private company taking NASA astronauts to space, ushering in a new era of exploration if the weather cooperates. Today, Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Morning, everybody. Welcome today. It's a Wednesday morning. So nice to have you with us. And boy, what a day for NASA. It's a historic moment for the U.S. space program. And we're going to watch it unfold live later today. Yeah, all eyes on that and on Al Roker to see if the weather does cooperate. We're going to have a live report from the Kennedy Space Center just ahead. Also, we will have the latest on the coronavirus as the death toll in the U.S. is expected to surpass 100,000 today. Savannah. But we want to begin with that breaking news, those new protests erupting in Minneapolis overnight. After George Floyd was pinned to the ground by police and later died, the incident was caught on camera and it sparked outrage around the country. It's led to the firing of four officers, but the victim's family says it cannot stop there. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us with the very latest now. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. You're right. The victim's family says the firing of those officers is not enough. State authorities and the FBI are now investigating in a warning. Video of the incident is disturbing. Overnight chaos in Minneapolis. Crowds of protesters swarmed the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. Another demonstration in Chicago. This is a trauma that a lot of us African Americans have to deal with. A bystander's cell phone video captured the incident Monday night. A Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee into his neck. For at least three minutes on the video, Floyd pleads for help, saying he can't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive as onlookers shout at the officer. Get off of him now. Security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking him across the street. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance, but the mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The 46-year-old Floyd played basketball in college and lived most of his life in Texas, working as a truck driver and security guard. It's just heartbreaking when you watch how they killed him, how his knee was on his neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, but eight minutes. LeBron James posted this image on social media of the officer kneeling on Floyd with former quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeling in protest of police brutality, writing, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? The case is already drawing comparisons to another high profile police confrontation in 2014. When you look at that video, what goes through your head? Oh, I see another senseless killing 
Gwen Carr is the mother of Eric Gardner, who died after police in New York placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare. And this has to stop. Something has to be done. And before the firings, the police union has said that there should not be a rush to judgment and that the officers were cooperating. Now, Floyd's family wants the officers arrested and charged. Hold on. Uh, Gabe, I'll catch that one. And by the way, we're going to have a lot more throughout the morning on this case, including our live interview with George Floyd's sister and her attorney. Six minutes after the hour, Hoda will send it up to you. All right, Savannah, thanks. Also this morning, there are mounting concerns over a potential second wave of the coronavirus. Now, in the past week, 24 states have reported an increase in new cases. And health officials fear those packed beaches and parks over the holiday weekend will only cause that number to rise. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is covering that story for us. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hoda, good morning. The governor here in California continues to ease restrictions, but like in many other states, some say it's not fast enough. Officials everywhere are trying to jumpstart the economy and keep people healthy, but some are no longer willing to wait. This morning, growing fallout from those holiday weekend crowds and serious concern over a fresh wave of coronavirus infections. This as the national death toll approaches a staggering 100,000. USA Today putting a face on the devastating loss. This jam-packed pool party in Missouri prompting health officials in St. Louis County to issue a travel alert and a 14-day self-quarantine order for anyone who was there. Overnight, the owner of the bar where the event took place posting a message to Facebook saying in part that he stands by his decision to host the party and that no laws were broken. That post also referencing an earlier statement from the local sheriff saying it is the right and responsibility of each individual to make decisions about going out. Tyler Cranker was at that party and plans to take a COVID test today. I don't think personally that I will get really sick. But if I do, I have to live with the consequences of my actions. Now, with more Americans being tested, the number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in several states. And in Alabama, the situation is getting worse. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. The governor in Arkansas says they're experiencing a dangerous second peak, while in New Rochelle, New York, the first city in the nation to be locked down is now slowly reopening. You have to start somewhere. Now is the time. I don't think it's the greatest thing because um, there's a lot of people that, you know, are sick. Across the country in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, up to 6,000 people a day will be tested for the virus. Nearby at a food processing plant, 153 employees have tested positive. But the nation is showing new signs of life. The New York Stock Exchange reopening with a limited number of traders on the floor and new safety restrictions, promising signs of progress amid larger gatherings of concern. With the holiday weekend behind us, health officials say it'll take about two weeks to see if there truly was an impact from those large holiday crowds. Meantime, here in California, the governor says he will continue to slowly ease restrictions. Savannah. All right, Miguel, thank you. And still ahead, we do have an exclusive interview with the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, on his state's progress against the virus. What happens next as the country enters what he calls the unknown? But now to that headline-making move by Twitter overnight, adding the first fact-checked links to tweets from the president. And he has responded, where else, on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has got the very latest for us this morning. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. So far, Twitter has added those fact check labels on just two of President Trump's tweets where he complained about mail-in ballots and claimed that they would cause this November's election to be rigged. Still, this is a significant step after fierce criticism. The social media company had not done enough to push back against the president's misleading and inaccurate statements. The president's favorite social media megaphone, Twitter, for the first time, slapping a fact check label on some of President Trump's tweets. Twitter responding to two Trump tweets that claim mail in ballots will be substantially fraudulent. Now, beneath them, this message get the facts about mail in ballots and a link to articles about the unsubstantiated claim. 
The president immediately lashing out, accusing the company of interfering in the 2020 presidential election and completely stifling free speech, adding I as president will not allow it to happen. It comes as Twitter is under fire for another set of incendiary Trump tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and MSNBC Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that, and uh, hopefully someday people are going to find out. Uh, Certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Authorities determined years ago that 28-year-old Lori Klesudis died after an abnormal heart rhythm caused her to collapse and hit her head in Scarborough's Florida office. Scarborough was in Washington at the time. But that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Timothy Klesudis, Lori's widower, appealing directly to Twitter's CEO, Jack Dorsey, to remove the tweets, writing, I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the President of the United States has taken something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better. Twitter has not taken down the tweets, but says it's working on policy changes it hopes to have in place shortly. What the Klesudises, the entire family, have had to endure for 19 years, um, it's, it's unspeakably cruel for what, whether it's the president or whether it's people following the president, it is unspeakably cruel. The president acknowledged Tuesday he's read that letter, but he ignored the widower's words. Ultimately, they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. Peter, meanwhile, there's a back and forth between President Trump and Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, having to do with wearing a mask out in public. What happened? Yes, Savannah, you'll remember, unlike President Trump, Joe Biden wore a mask during a Memorial Day event this week. And the president later shared a tweet that mocked Biden for that mask. Biden, who says he was following the Trump administration's recommended guidelines, fired back on CNN. He's a fool. An absolute fool to talk that way. I mean, every leading doc in the world is saying we should wear a mask when you're in a crowd. Late yesterday, the president said Biden can wear a mask, but that he thought it was very unusual that Biden had one on outside while with his wife. The president also criticized a reporter for keeping his mask on while asking a question yesterday, accusing that reporter in the Rose Garden of trying to be politically correct. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Hoda, up to you. All right, thank you. Also this morning, the multi-state manhunt for a Connecticut college student wanted in connection with a string of deadly crimes is expanding. NBC Stephanie Gosk has details. This morning, police have a message for suspected murderer Peter Manfredonia. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. We want you to be able to tell your story. After four days and across at least three states, the University of Connecticut student is still on the run, wanted in two murders. He was last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a stolen black Hyundai Santa Fe. When they finally released the information, we put two and two together and it was terrifying. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. Ted was the gentlest, most loving soul there was. He would do anything for everyone. Demers' sister-in-law believes the attack was premeditated. You don't just put a machete in your backpack and come to the end of a dirt road without a plan. The next murder, police say, a friend from high school. Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown, Connecticut, at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. This morning, NBC News has learned Manfredonia's father, Robert, was arrested in Newtown last month and charged with second-degree sexual assault, risk of injury to a minor, and giving alcohol to a minor. He was released on $50,000 bond. Connecticut police saying the charges against Robert have no relevance to the investigation into his son. 
spoken to. Well, a family uh, attorney says the younger Manfredonia is an honors engineering student who had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with anxiety and depression, but no signs things were getting worse. The parents message right now to Peter. The parents and the family's message to Peter is, Peter, we love you. It's time to bring this to a safe conclusion for everybody. Before anybody else gets hurt. For today, Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. And we'll continue to follow that case. There's much more to get to this morning, including the countdown. It's on to this afternoon's historic mission to space. Here's a live look at Kennedy Space Center this morning. And just hours from now, NASA and SpaceX will team up for the first crewed launch from U.S. soil since 2011. The final safety and weather checks are already underway, and the weather's a big question this morning. NBC's Tom Costello is there. Hi, Tom. Good morning. How's it looking? Yeah, the weather is the issue right now. We've already had a pretty good rain uh, squall move in here just a short time ago. That's going to be the issue throughout the day. But you're absolutely right. This is a history making flight. The first time ever that a private company is carrying astronauts to the space station, in this case, SpaceX. And so much is riding on this mission for NASA and for SpaceX. But most importantly, getting those two men up to the space station safely. With the clock ticking down, we're now just hours away from witnessing history once again at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley set to hitch a ride to the International Space Station from a private company aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon, propelled by its Falcon 9 rocket, a public-private partnership that NASA is banking on to launch a new era of space travel. It's all about commercialization of low Earth orbit so that we can use NASA's resources to do the things that have not yet been commercialized, like go to the moon and on to Mars. Today's mission, dubbed Demo 2, is a proof of concept that companies like SpaceX can serve as taxis for Americans and other nations to reach low Earth orbit destinations like the space station. If we can have other countries buy seats on these rockets. It drives down the cost for the United States of America taxpayers. Those seats will cost $55 million each. That may sound staggering, but NASA has been shelling out more than $80 million per seat for astronauts to ride on Russian rockets. SpaceX founder Elon Musk sharing this bird's eye view ahead of this critical test for the company. Also watching today's launch closely, Bankin and Hurley's wives, Megan MacArthur and Karen Nyberg, who are both also astronauts. Nyberg sharing this image with their son, inspecting dad's ride on the launch. Pad. The two man crew set to load into that crew dragon just over two hours before blastoff, wearing specially designed spacesuits and using touchscreens. Minutes after launch, the Falcon 9 rocket will separate and, if all things go as planned, land upright on a SpaceX barge out on the ocean. The Crew Dragon continuing on to dock with a station where Bankin and Hurley will live and conduct research with the rest of the team for one to four months. I'm really looking forward to having a couple uh, crewmates here to help distribute the duties, but also to eat with and laugh with and joke around with. It'll be a great, great uh, adventure with them. So let's drill down on it, Tom, because weather is really uh, the spoiler potentially. So how is it looking for this afternoon? We've got a, a few hours for things to clear up. Yeah, and, and in some ways, this is more complicated than during the space shuttle because it's not just about how the weather is looking here. And right now, there's a 60% chance of go here at the Kennedy Space Center. But they also consider the weather and the ocean factors out in the Atlantic Ocean, all the way up the coast of Canada, and all the way out to Ireland. Why? Because if they have to abort, the spaceship would then parachute down into the Atlantic Ocean, and they would want to have that crew safe until rescue teams could arrive. And there's a rescue team on standby at Cape Canaveral. They would fly to the location of where the crew may have aborted and parachuted down. They themselves would parachute into the ocean and help rescue and stabilize the crew. So all of that is a big reason why it's not just the weather here, it's the weather out over the ocean as well. It's just so mind-blowingly complicated. We are anxious to see if they can pull it off, Tom. A big moment today. We will have live coverage of the launch right here on NBC. Hoda? All right, Savannah, what do you say we bring in the guy who's going to know more about the launch forecast than us? And also the West of the <laughs> National Weather Picture. Hey, Al, what do we got? 
Well, guys, uh, we are looking at, as you see, again, as Tom showed, it's cloudy out there. They've got showers. And in fact, as we look at the live radar, you'll see that we are looking at some pretty strong storms that are going to be pushing in. In fact, we already had one clear launch pad 39A. But look to the south. This is live radar right now. And we're going to be looking at this all day today as we move into the afternoon and look at launch time. 433. There's some heavy showers and thunderstorms, a 60 percent chance of those storms. And besides that, to the north, we've got an invest area that may become a tropical system over the next five days already. Some buoys out in the Atlantic reporting tropical force winds. Today, this system moves up into the Appalachians. Virginia, North Carolina, look for strong storms. It weakens as it moves into western New York State, but brings strong storms tomorrow into the mid-Atlantic. And look at the heavy rain. Some areas along the southeastern Atlantic coast, four inches or more already on top of saturated ground. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Back now, 7.30 on this Wednesday morning, the 27th day of May. That's 2020. Look at this. Big news in the sports world. The NHL announcing its return to play plan, Craig. You're sharing some good news. You'll be talking to the commissioner coming up. We're going to talk to Gary Bettman next hour. He laid out that plan yesterday. More of a framework. No hard dates just yet. But it would be the first sports league in North America to announce their plan. So we're looking forward to that conversation and what it could mean for other team sports moving forward. Mm -hmm. Savannah? Yeah, we cannot wait. We'll be hanging on his every word. We'll hear about that coming up next hour. Tomorrow morning on today, guys, trying to get a hold of an RV for your family vacation this summer. Well, it might be a little bit tough. Guess what? This has become huge. RVs, well, they've become one of the huh. season's hottest tickets. Mm. People planning their getaways. They want to be in their own confined, safe space, but see stuff at the same time. So we'll have more on the RV craze. Like that. All right. But let's turn now to our 730 headlines. New protests erupted in Minneapolis overnight after a black man died in police custody on Monday. Crowds of protesters swarmed the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. It all stems from an incident on Monday night. You can see a Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee to his neck. Floyd pleads repeatedly for help, saying he can't breathe. It happened at least a dozen times. He was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Four officers involved have been fired, and the FBI has joined the investigation. And joining us now is George Floyd's sister, Bridget, along with the Floyd family attorney, Benjamin Krupp. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Bridget, I know you haven't um, had the stomach to look at that video, and I don't blame you. It's really horrifying. But would you just tell us how you and your family are doing in this moment? Me and my family are taking this uh, very, very hard. Um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing to our peace. Uh, we're just doing the best that we can and um, making sure that we do the right thing, do what he would want us to do. And um, yes, it's very hard. It's very hard. I can see that, Bridget. I can see that. Yesterday, there was some action taken against those officers, four officers, all four were fired. And you have said repeatedly, that is not enough. What, what would be enough for you? I would like for those officers to be charged with murder because that's exactly what they did. They murdered my brother. He was crying for help. I don't need them to be suspended and able to work in another state or another county. Their license should be taken away, their job should be taken away, and they should be put in jail for murder. Um, 
Let me bring in Ben for a second, Ben Crump. Um, I have a copy of the police report here, and this is what was submitted initially. And I'm going to read you a portion of it, and then I'm going to show you the video of what happened. They say here uh, that George Floyd was ordered to step, and this was all, by the way, over a forgery, a fake $20 bill. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect in handcuffs. Then this video emerged, Ben, that shows a different picture, doesn't it? Absolutely, Huda. And we have more video emerging, video from the businesses' surveillance cameras um, on social media at Attorney Crump. We have people sending us new videos that have not been shown yet. And it shows, Huda, that, I mean, a nonviolent crime met with this kind of violent, lethal, excessive force they were on his neck not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, not for five minutes, not for six minutes, not for seven minutes, not for eight minutes, but for nine minutes while he is begging to breathe, begging for life. It's a I can't breathe again case mm -hmm. in 2020, and it's worse than Eric Gardner in many ways because you hear the people even pleading with them, please get your knee off his neck, have some humanity. This is a human being. And, and Ben, when you look also as the police report continues, and this is how the police report covers that part, they noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance where he died. If not for that video of him pleading, of the bystanders begging the officers to basically get off of him, what would have happened with this case? They would have gave a false narrative, Hoda, and they would have swept it under the rug. And we have this video, and they have terminated them, but they need to be arrested, as Bridget said, and charged with murder, because how many more of these senseless, excessive force killings by the people who are supposed to protect us can we take in black America and all of America? Bridget, the, uh, the mayor later acknowledged that that police report was inaccurate. He said being black in America should not be a death sentence. The mayor also added that he should not have died. The governor called the lack of humanity in the video disturbing and sickening. He also said, made this statement, the governor said, we will get answers and seek justice. Do you have faith, Bridget, that justice will be done in this case? I have a lot of faith because I believe in the utmost powerful God. Faith is something that me and my brother always talked about because he was a God-fearing man, regardless of what he does. We all have our faults. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But I believe that justice will be served. I have enough faith to stand on it. And just one one final question for you, uh, Ben Crump. Um, LeBron James posted this picture that's been shown around a bit. It shows Colin Kaepernick kneeling and the police officer kneeling, and he basically says, um, do you understand now? Uh, do you think that this case may actually be the tipping point? I do, Hood, because when you think about nine minutes, if you can take your cell phone and sit it for nine minutes and just sit there, America, and try to imagine a knee on your neck suffocating you and you begging to breathe. That's why it has to be the tipping point that we have to say everybody deserves equal justice and we have to send a message with this case. We cannot allow those who are supposed to protect and serve us uh, do this. There can be two justice systems, one for black America and one for white America. We have to have equal justice for the United States of America. Well, Ben Crump, we appreciate you. Bridget, Bridget, we wish, wish the best to you and your family. And I know that your brother's a, a father of two. The youngest is six years old, and we wish her the best as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. You're watching.
watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Well, we are back at 742 with a new normal as the world continues to cope with the coronavirus, Savannah. Yeah, a lot of folks are looking to South Korea. It is pushing ahead with its reopening, even as daily cases there are spiking again in some places. So what lessons does that hold for us? NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul for us this morning. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, today, health officials here are dealing with a new cluster. 36 people all at the same company have tested positive for coronavirus. But at the same time, schools and churches are filling up. At this church in Seoul this morning, a strange sight in a time of social distancing, more than 2,000 parishioners singing and praying under the same roof, the biggest turnout since the church reopened a month ago. Are you concerned about your parishioners getting the virus? So if we follow the government guideline closely, I, I think we will be safe. Thermal sensors, temperature checks, online bookings and QR codes, giving the church a list of contacts in case someone gets sick, and masks are mandatory. And what about holding prayer books or singing or talking to someone next to you? Can you uh, do those things? Uh, singing is okay, but that talk to the next person is prohibited. Schools in South Korea are filling up too. Almost half of all students are now back in class. Kindergartners and first graders together, but separated. And parents are still understandably nervous. This dad says he's a working parent and his child had to go back, but he's worried about the virus spreading when kids play. Across the country, health officials here are still battling small outbreaks and introducing new rules, like requiring masks on all public transportation, including subways, buses, and taxis. This animation shows how germs can spread when a person talks in a subway car. A large number of the people uh, in the presence uh, with a very closed environment. Uh, it can be also ideal space for the spreading of the virus. Today, another worry. 36 people at a warehouse for South Korea's largest e-commerce business have tested positive for coronavirus. But they're still pressing ahead with opening schools, doing it slowly, bringing uh, high school seniors back last week, younger kids this week, doing those social distancing uh, measures with tape on the ground, plastic dividers around desks. Even with all of that, Hoda, parents are still worried, in part because earlier this week, a six-year-old tested positive, and health officials think that six-year-old was infected by his art teacher at a private school. Hoda. Wow, so many things to take into consideration. All right, Kelly, uh, thank you. Shift in gears now. How about a how about a check of the weather there, Mr. Roker? All righty. Well, things awfully warm. We're talking from coast to coast. Temperatures nice and toasty. New records possible in New England. Boston's going to flirt with 90 degrees today, 84 in Buffalo, Cincinnati, 85. And then all the way out to the West Coast, look at these temperatures. Records possible today for Sacramento, uh, Bakersfield, Palm Springs, Vegas, Eli, Flagstaff. Toasty conditions and continues that way out west right on into the weekend for Albuquerque, triple digits, Palm Springs. Vegas, Sacramento, and Tucson. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight outrage. Crowds of protesters clashed with police in Minneapolis following the death of a black man pinned to the ground by an officer. They murdered my brother. He was crying for help. This morning, four officers involved fired. So what happens next? We're live with the latest. On the rise, alarming new numbers showing coronavirus cases climbing in some states like Alabama. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. This is businesses open from coast to coast and the NHL announces new plans to get players back on the ice this summer. And touching tribute, the special way country superstar Tim McGraw is honoring all the moms out there. We'll ask him about the new music video and what he's been up to today, Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. Waking up with today from Colonia, New Jersey. Yeah. From sunny Jacksonville, Florida. It's my 17th birthday. Woo! My name is Jackie. Today's my 93rd birthday. 18 years educating over 5,000 students. Mrs. Schneider is retired. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think she's happy about that? That's a lot to celebrate on a Wednesday morning. Special welcome to everybody just waking up with the coffee on. The day is starting, and we're so happy to have you with us. We sure are, and the folks on My Today Plaza are pumped up, man. Okay, Yay! just let's let let's just look at them for a second. We got a couple of great things to go over here. We got a hero mom. She's a nurse. She's got a milestone coming up, and someone's about to reveal for the first time some big news. So we want to welcome in our plaza. Well, yeah, we do. We'll get to them in just a moment. First, though, coming. Up tomorrow on today, Caroline Kennedy and her son Jack Schlossberg, they'll be joining us for an exclusive live interview to announce the very special way that they are going to celebrate the JFK Library Foundation's Profiles Encourage Award this year. Of course, this is something that they do every year, mm -hmm. uh, but this year they're going to do it just a little differently. So they're going to tell us all about that tomorrow, Savannah. All right, look forward to that. Let's get you caught up on the news here at 8 o'clock. And tensions are high in Minneapolis this morning after a chaotic night of protests over the death of George Floyd. He was a black man pinned to the ground on Monday by a police officer. Four officers have been fired over the incident. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us with the latest now. Gabe, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning. The victim's family now says that the firing of those four officers was not enough. The FBI and state authorities are now investigating. And overnight, crowds of protesters swarmed the streets of Minneapolis, facing off with officers in riot gear. The outrage mounting after cell phone video captured a disturbing incident Monday night. And a warning, it is tough to watch. Now, the bystander cell phone video shows a Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee to his neck. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. But new security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking across the street. Floyd's family says it's clear he's not resisting. We've heard from his sister earlier on today. 
me and my family are taking this uh, very, very hard. Um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing to our peace. Now, before the firings, the police union said that there should not be a rush to judgment, but the Minneapolis mayor called it wrong at every level. Hoda. All right. Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, thank you. Moving now to the coronavirus death toll in the U.S. It's approaching another grim milestone. Some states seeing an uptick in new cases. NBC White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the three things he is watching today. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning. This morning, as you noted, the national death toll now approaching that tragic milestone, 100,000 American lives lost. USA Today putting a face on these devastating times and describing the virus as the fastest killer in U.S. history. This all comes amid serious concerns that crowds of people, many of them gathering over the holiday weekend, could trigger a fresh wave of COVID infections after some ignore the warnings. You'll see that pool party, of course, in Missouri. Health officials in St. Louis County now issue to travel alert requiring anyone who was there to self quarantine for 14 days. And now with more Americans being tested, the president just tweeted that the country will surpass 15 million today. The number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in about a dozen states, bucking the national trend of staying steady or seeing decreases. And at least half of those states seeing more infections, places like Florida, South Carolina, and Tennessee among them were part of an early wave of reopenings. In Montgomery, Alabama specifically, the mayor there says 80% of their deaths have taken place this month alone. Still, there are important signs of progress. Los Angeles County announcing this week that it'll allow religious services, in-store shopping at low-risk retail stores, and drive-in movie theaters to reopen with restrictions. That would basically get the ball rolling for the county that's really been California's epicenter for the virus to open up faster than much of the state. Savannah. All right, Peter, thanks. And we'll pick it up right there with that cautious approach being taken in California. I spoke to Governor Gavin Newsom exclusively yesterday afternoon about the progress his state has made and what happens next as California and the rest of the country enters what he calls the unknown. We have just been through Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people saw that as a big test of social distancing. How are people handling the responsibility? Are they meeting those obligations of social distancing sufficiently? Yeah, I mean, I think overwhelmingly so, though obviously we've highlighted inappropriately uh, these exceptions. And we want to continue to remind people uh, to be vigilant. But the reality at the end of the day, I've been overwhelmed by 40 million Americans living in the state of California, the vast majority doing the right thing, recognizing uh, that this pandemic is not behind us. Uh, we're not into a second wave. Uh, we still haven't gotten through the first wave. You just this week released new guidelines concerning houses of worship. This has obviously become a flashpoint. The president talked about forcing governors to open houses of worship. Do you think your new guidelines will be the end of the issue? We're one of a few states, a handful of states, that's actually moved forward uh, to provide guidance to houses of worship. So I have deep respect uh, for those that want to practice their faith in person, not just virtually. But we have to do so safely. Uh, it's not a political issue for us. No one's immune from political pressure, but that won't be determinative in terms of our decision making. We'll do it on the basis of public health. Speaking of pressure, a lot of families are under a lot of pressure right now. They're not able to go back to work. And, and when they are able, they are going to have to put their kids somewhere. What are you expecting in terms of child care in the state, in terms of summer camps? I know guidelines are expected to be released very, very soon. Yeah, we made a lot of progress in child care, our most precious resource, our children. Uh, it will be done very, very th soberly, thoughtfully, also recognizing we have to take care of the caregivers, meaning our teachers, uh, our bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the janitors as well. But I'm confident uh, in our ability to do this in a responsible way and to get kids back in the classroom uh, over the course of the next few months, again, responsibly. So do you think summer camps will be able to open, child care, school this fall? Do you expect it to be open? With deep modifications, limits, absolutely. Let's talk about the economy. California has been hit harder and worse than possibly any other state, whether you're talking about tourism, agriculture, ports, the film industry, the list goes on and on. How grave is the threat to California's economy? 
No, it's been profound. I mean, the reality is uh, we have 5 million people that have applied for unemployment insurance just since uh, March 12th, 5 million. Uh, just uh, shy of $12 billion has been distributed in unemployment insurance claims. I mean, these are just jaw-dropping numbers. And so we have our work cut out for us. That's why we need the support of the federal government, not as charity, but as social responsibility to help the American people in this state get moving again. We'll get through this, but it's a sobering time. Do you see an economic bounce back quickly? Some talk about a V-shaped recovery. In other words, we were up here, it dropped sharply and quickly, but it'll bounce back just as dramatically. Do you see it happening that way? I see it happening if public health is our primary focus. I don't see it happening if we look at public health as an annoyance or a nuisance that somehow gets in the way of our economic growth. We're a consumer-based economy. As demand increases, we'll start to see this economy begin to rev back up. But that won't increase until people feel confident and safe going back out and doing their activities that we're doing uh, prior to COVID-19. The president tweeted about you and your plan to send mail-in ballots to registered voters in the state. What do you say to the president's concerns about fraudulent ballots? Let's just stick with the facts, not opinions. The reality is mail-in uh, ballots, absentee ballots, are well utilized all across the spectrum, all across this country, and have been done so thoughtfully and safely uh, for a generation. Uh, I think the president himself has used mail-in ballot in the past. Our service members use them overseas very confidently and securely. Uh, there's been study after study, don't take my word for it, don't take the president's, study after study uh, that just lays claim to no no evidence whatsoever that there's widespread voter fraud. We want to prepare to keep people safe and allow them to have their constitutional rights protected, the constitutional right to vote without putting their health at risk. The Department of Justice just recently warned California, in particular the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, that extended shutdown orders may be illegal and violate the Constitution. Do you see a confrontation with the federal government coming? Was this a shot across the bow? I think we're entering in a political season. I think people are sharpening uh, their tongues, sharpening their knives to some degree, uh, figuratively. Uh, and certainly I expect more of this, not less. People will be really heartened to see businesses start to reopen, life start to return. At the same time, it's such a delicate balancing act. I was struck by something you said today, that we're heading into the unknown. How are you trying to balance those considerations as we go forward with those concerns about a potential second wave that could be worse? Well, we don't want to yield to the unknown. You've got to be driven by data, not political pressure, and not scoring political points. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. And we'll come out the other side more capable of not only weathering a second wave, but ultimately more resilient as a society and as a community, and more capable of meeting the economic conditions that will present themselves well into the future. Well. Such an interesting uh, situation facing California in particular. Uh, it, it is in free fall, hit so hard by the virus, but seeing some progress in terms of its spread. So we'll see how that develops. And it obviously has big implications for the rest of the country. Yeah. Guys. A lot of folks don't realize that California's economy, just the state's economy, mm -hmm. is larger than the economy of most countries. So as California yeah, goes, so exactly. goes the rest of America. All right, guys, we got our news covered. I got a morning boost for you. Ah. Even after decades of marriage, Jim and Lisa tally, they're like a couple of lovebirds. So Lisa did have to spend her birthday in the hospital after surgery. So here's what her hubby did. Jim wasn't allowed in because the pandemic. So he used a construction lift. No big deal. Raised him up to Lisa's <laughs> fourth floor hospital window. Happy birthday. I love you. I told you I'd go to the moon. I'm not leaving you. In the snow and all, Jim joked that he was kind of glad she wasn't on the fifth floor. <laughs> he didn't want to go that high, but actually he said he'd go to the moon for her. That's love. Uh-huh. That is so sweet. I'm, I'm mad at my husband, and I don't know why. <laughs> Guys, okay, we have another one for you. Here's some neighborhood kids. They were just practicing their skateboarding moves on a small beginner's ramp, and guess who drove by? Oh, 
just Olympic legend <laughs> Sean White. The kids <laughs> held up a sign asking oh, him to join them. So no. why not? You know, he's not just a snowboarder. Yep, he's a world-class skateboarder too. Put on the mask, hit the ramp, did some maneuvers, but, and this is best of all, he mostly just let the kids show off their tricks for him. And White said he was stoked to put some <laughs> smiles on the young faces during hard times. That's cool. Not sure it's a quote, but probably it is. <laughs> yes. He probably said stoked. Well, that's cool. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. To that audition that we've been talking about on last night's season premiere of America's Got Talent that the world will never forget, Savannah. Yeah, and if you haven't heard this story, just wait. Archie Williams is a man who spent 36 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Well, he brought the house down with his singing last night and his powerful story. Natalie Morales had a chance to speak with him. And the judge he has inspired greatly, Simon Cowell. Natalie, good morning. Hey, guys, you need a little uplift and joy this morning. Well, this story has it all. You know, the evidence clearly said Archie was innocent, but without money for a proper defense, he was sentenced to a lifetime of suffering. But as he told us, his mind was never imprisoned, and now he's making the most of his freedom. My name is Archie Williams. Tuesday night, Archie Williams took the stage on NBC's America's Got Talent and made an impression no one will soon forget. Don't let the sun go down on me. A show-stopping moment that he never could have imagined just last year. On March 21st, 2019, Archie Williams was released from Angola prison in Louisiana, 37 years after being falsely accused and convicted of rape. Sweet right now. Archie was just 22 in 1983 when he was arrested and stood trial for the 1982 rape and stabbing of a white woman in her Baton Rouge home. Despite multiple alibis, fingerprints that didn't match his, and eyewitnesses saying Archie wasn't the guy, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Being innocent is, is, is a thing where you never give up on yourself. That kept Archie going, and in 1995, after having already served 12 years, he wrote to the Innocence Project. By the grace of God, I'm still holding on, hoping and praying someone will answer my letter. His case was screaming out that he was innocent. It took a new judge in 2019 to order the fingerprint test. Within eight hours, they'd found the real rapist. And within a week, Archie was free. What does freedom feel like, Archie? I don't think you can explain it. The fullness of freedom. For Archie, this is what freedom sounds like. found your voice. Wow. Singing was my was my sport. That sport led him to an unusual place. I uh I was just incarcerated for 37 years for somebody else's crime. Ooh. 37 years of pain and suffering and now joy in each note. But losing everything is like the sun going down. words that much more powerful coming from Archie. I, I would never ever listen to that song uh, in the same way ever again. One person influenced my life and that was Oprah. And I remember her saying to me, if you're in a position to make television shows, you have the ability to change people's lives. And because of Archie, he's become an ambassador for the Innocence Project. We're going to do something about this together because I believe that when enough people unite, great things happen. They say the truth will set you free. For Archie, it's done more than that. It's given him back his life, including a daughter he didn't know he had. To think of her going all those years without me. And a future with new dreams. I want to make up all the lost years. It's like the sun going down. Brought 
the House down last night. Standing ovation there. Now, Archie is living out a lifelong dream at the moment, but he says he's not going to truly feel free until, as he said, all his innocent brothers in Angola prison are freed just as he was, guys. Beautiful, Nat Mo. Wow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back 838 now with some exciting news for fans who are hungry for sports. On Tuesday, the National Hockey League became the first professional sports league in North America to announce an official format to return to play. We're going to unpack the specific details with Commissioner Gary Bettman in just a moment. But first, how the rest of the hockey season could play out. Strom peeled off. Nylander scores! Since March 12th, the National Hockey League has been dark. A full stop due to the coronavirus pandemic. But a new plan could have players back on the ice this summer. I am delighted to be with you today to announce the National Hockey League's plans for our resumption of play. In a press conference Tuesday, Commissioner Gary Bettman announced the league's plans to return to play for the postseason. 24 of the league's teams will soon head to the playoffs to compete for the Stanley Cup. The news celebrated online by hockey and sports fans alike. It's not clear if any fans will be able to attend in person with new precautions in place because of the coronavirus. All games will be played in two yet-to-be-determined hub cities, one for the Eastern Conference teams and one for the Western. These hubs will have secure hotels, arenas, practice facilities, and transportation for players, and teams will be required to limit personnel and support staff. While nothing is without risk, Ensuring health and safety has been central to all of our planning so far and will remain so. Without committing to specific dates, the commission laid out a possible timeline beginning as early as June and based on guidance from medical professionals and government authorities. I know I join sports fans everywhere when we say we cannot wait for our players to hit the ice again. And NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman joins us live now. And, uh, Gary, a lot of those fans are are celebrating this morning, not even just fans of hockey, just sports fans in general. Uh, Here's the thing. It sounds like it's more of a framework than than really a list of dates to circle on a calendar. When do you think that the first puck is going to drop, Gary? It will be at some point over the summer. By the way, good morning, and it's great to be with you. The The framework is intended to be a bit evolutionary. We're going to take things what's one step at a time because the health and safety of our players or all of our personnel and all of our communities is of paramount importance. So we've been in a self-isolation stage Early June, we're going to have our training facilities open because our players haven't been able to work out or skate, so they want to get back in shape. And then when we get the sense that they're ready and we get the sense as to how long we need for training camp, we'll move to the training camp phase, probably at some point in July. And once we're done with training camp, we're then going to execute the plan that you just described so well in two hub cities. We, we don't want to be pinned down to specific dates because, as everybody knows, things are changing almost daily. You, you did say yesterday that an essential component of this plan is going to be uh, what you describe as rigorous testing. Tell us a little bit more about, the, about this testing and, and how often that's going to happen. The, the medical people tell us that the, the safest way for us to do what we're planning to do is to be testing uh, personnel, particularly the players, if not daily, at least every other day. Uh, For the scope of the tournament, we're talking about probably between 25 and 30,000 tests. Uh, Putting aside the expense, we also understand that we can't be doing the testing if it's going to interfere at all with any medical needs of any communities that we might be considering going to. Although the medical people are telling us that by the summer that testing should be in such abundance that 25 to 30,000 tests, while it sounds like a big number, will will be infinitesimal uh, relative to what will be available. Gary, what happens when there's that that first positive test, whether it's a, a player or a coach or some sort of someone affiliated with one of the teams? Are, are you going to have to shut the, the whole thing down? 
The medical people are advising us that one test uh, should not result in that. You quarantine that person. But obviously, if there's an outbreak, uh, that would shut things down. Although uh, we're not going to make that decision. The medical people will tell us what to do under the circumstances. As, as I think everybody knows, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we believe that having a framework and, and a timetable that we can adjust it's another step in the return to some degree of normalcy, and we think that's really important because sports has always been a catalyst for bringing people together and helping communities heal. And providing a much-needed escape during these times especially. Gary, one more question here. So many yes. of your players, hundreds of players in the NHL, uh, they come from overseas. They come from Canada, Russia, uh, Finland, Sweden. And, of course, Sweden never enacted the kind of lockdown uh, that, that we've seen in our country. But what are you going to do about these, these hundreds of players who are, who are returning from other countries? We, we have about 44 percent, roughly, of our players are in the cities in which they play. And 83% of our players are in North America, but you're right, 17% of our players are coming from outside of North America. Uh, they're going to have to come back. They're going to have to self-isolate. They're going to be tested. We're going to have to make sure they're symptom-free, which is, again, why we're doing this in steps. We can use the, the individual training uh, phase, phase two, as we call it, to do that and get everybody back together as a community. But once we go into training camp mode, uh, there'll be lots of testing, not quite as much as when we're actually playing in phase four. Uh, but we're going to be monitoring everything very closely because we know we've got to bring back uh, a large group of people from all over. And we have to make sure as we're bringing them together, uh, we're not bringing COVID-19 with them. NHL Commissioner uh, Gary Bedman. Gary, I think you're going to pick up a lot of hockey fans over the next few months. Uh, thank you, sir. Good luck to you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Be well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Welcome back. Well, you guys, we can always count on country music legend Tim McGraw to entertain and inspire us. He's got some incredibly heartfelt songs. Well, here he goes again. He's got a brand new one, a new video. It's a powerful single. Get ready. It's called I Called Mama. Take a look. From the backseat wrote a song just for me. I sung it for the blue sky and a couple live old trees. I thought of home. Grab my phone from my pocket. And I call mama. Oh my god. I just want to watch, Tim, I, not, not, nothing against you. I just want to watch the whole video right now. But in a world where it's beautiful. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi. I'm well. How are you? Oh, my word. I was going to say the timing of this song. I know it's around Mother's Day and all that stuff. But given the fact that so many people haven't been able to hug their moms in so long, this, this video is right on target. Um, tell us how it came to be. Well, you know, the song, I was recording the song back earlier in the year, way before all this happened, and uh, and it was just a great song. It was a song I loved, and I, I, I you know, I love my mom like everybody loves their mom, and, and I really wanted to record it, and after I recorded it and we got it mixed, then, you know, the the, the virus came along and everybody was talking about it, and, it, and everybody went into isolation, so it really took on a bigger meaning and a deeper meaning to us, and um that's why we released it, and it just happened to be around Mother's Day. But, but the main reason was because it just it just felt like you know, well, like what, what I've been doing, everybody's been doing it, sitting around at home and having comfort food all the time. This this song felt like comfort food for yeah. your soul in a it lot sure of ways. Does. Well, yeah. speaking of speaking of moms, how's how's yours? How's Betty? Because I remember <laughs> I interviewed you when we were talking about your book, and I was so struck by how she was when you were just a little boy. What she was like as a mom. Tell us. Yeah. You, are you going to make me cry again, aren't you? <laughs> no, my mom's awesome. She, uh, they're down in Florida and they're, they're staying self-isolated, you know, just, to, just to make sure that they're safe. But I, I talked to her quite a bit and she's pretty happy about this video. She asked, uh, she sent me a message the other day 
and ask, does this mean she's a movie star now? <laughs> and, so, and then last night I talked to her. She wants a she wants a star on the Walk of Fame now <laughs> because of the video. But she's doing great. I mean, my mom was such an inspiration to us growing up because she went through a lot, and uh, it's sort of certainly having me out of wedlock early in her life, and and um, cutting her high school, you know, short because of me. And and um, she's always been there. She's always been the person to tell us to to think bigger than our circumstances and to chase your dreams. And, and with, without her saying that to us growing up and instilling in that in us growing up, I'm, I'm certainly sure that I wouldn't have pursued the career that I have. Well, what you've done with this video is you've connected with your mom and with all of our moms, with your fans. Your fans sent in pictures and video, and that helped make this beautiful. Yeah, um, we had tons of people send stuff in. We couldn't get everybody in, of course, but we, we tried to, to, to at least make it, make it as as, as, a, as you can feel as much as you can well, in it, even though your your mother may not have gotten in. Well, I think it's cool because I knew you had to cancel your concert, and I think a lot of us yeah. are looking for connection. And I was just thinking about you at home. You've got your girls, all of them, wife and kids. You have two graduates in your family who didn't get to go to graduation. You had Maggie, who graduated college, and Audrey at high school. Is that right? That's right. Um, we had a drive-through graduation for Audrey where they we drove through campus, which was really cool. Gracie's out in LA, my my oldest daughter, and then Maggie graduated and didn't have a and didn't have a graduation as well. So it's it's a uh, we we were together a little bit. We haven't all been together during this time, but some of us have been together. Um, but uh, boy, we I feel for all the parents out there and all the kids who who didn't have the graduation. But but we try to make it as as a. Uh, as fun for him as we could. Well, you did, and you you gave a great uh, speech on iHeart uh, Radio. So I encourage people to go listen to it, and I encourage people to download this song. Tim, it's another one of those. That, you know how you do that. I wish you wouldn't do that to us. Okay, <laughs> I got I got this right here for your songs whenever they come out. Oh well. Well, we love you. you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you so much. Good and, to see you. And Tim's going to come back and hang with me and Jenna in just a little bit. Carson. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care.
If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Good morning. Breaking overnight, protests erupt. Demonstrators clashing with police in Minneapolis following the death of a black man pinned to the ground by an officer. Four officers involved fired. To the black community, to the family, I'm so sorry. But this morning, the victim's family is demanding murder charges. His sister and her attorney join us for a live interview. Alarm bells, new cases of the coronavirus on the rise in 24 states. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. Just ahead, the fear those packed holiday crowds from coast to coast will only make things worse. And we go one-on-one -on -one with the governor of California. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. Will schools, camps, and daycares open there soon? His answer straight ahead. Fact checked. For the first time, Twitter slaps a warning label on posts from President Trump. Just ahead, the controversial claims he made that finally forced the company's hand and how the president is responding this morning. On the run, the FBI joins the manhunt for a Connecticut college student suspected of two murders, an abduction and a home invasion. Investigators making a new plea for his surrender. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. The very latest on the ongoing search just ahead. Those stories plus three, two, one, liftoff. The historic launch years in the making just hours away now. For the first time, a private company taking NASA astronauts to space, ushering in a new era of exploration if the weather cooperates. Today, Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Morning, everybody. Welcome today. It's a Wednesday morning. So nice to have you with us. And boy, what a day for NASA. It's a historic moment for the U.S. space program. And we're going to watch it unfold live later today. Yeah, all eyes on that and on Al Roker to see if the weather does cooperate. We're going to have a live report from the Kennedy Space Center just ahead. Also, we will have the latest on the coronavirus as the death toll in the U.S. is expected to surpass 100,000 today. Savannah. But we want to begin with that breaking news, those new protests erupting in Minneapolis overnight after George Floyd was pinned to the ground by police and later died. The incident was caught on camera and it sparked outrage around the country. It's led to the firing of four officers, but the victim's family says it cannot stop there. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us with the very latest now. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. You're right. The victim's family says the firing of those officers is not enough. State authorities and the FBI are now investigating and a warning. Video of the incident is disturbing. Overnight chaos in Minneapolis. Crowds of protesters swarm the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. Another demonstration in Chicago. This is a trauma that a lot of us African Americans have to deal with. A bystander's cell phone video captured the incident Monday night. A Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee into his neck. For at least three minutes on the video, Floyd pleads for help, saying he can't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive as onlookers shout at the officer. Get off of him now! Security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking him across the street.
In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance, but the mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The 46-year-old Floyd played basketball in college and lived most of his life in Texas, working as a truck driver and security guard. It's just heartbreaking when you watch how they killed him, how his knee was on his neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, but eight minutes. LeBron James posted this image on social media of the officer kneeling on Floyd with former quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeling in protest of police brutality, writing, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? The case is already drawing comparisons to another high-profile police confrontation in 2014. When you look at that video, what goes through your head? Oh, I see another senseless killing. Gwen Carr is the mother of Eric Gardner, who died after police in New York placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare, and this has to stop. Something has to be done. And before the firings, the police union had said that there should not be a rush to judgment and that the officers were cooperating. Now, Floyd's family wants the officers arrested and charged. Hold up. Uh, Gabe, I'll catch that one. And by the way, we're going to have a lot more throughout the morning on this case, including our live interview with George Floyd's sister and her attorney. Six minutes after the hour, Hoda will send it up to you. All right, Savannah, thanks. Also this morning, there are mounting concerns over a potential second wave of the coronavirus. Now, in the past week, 24 states have reported an increase in new cases. And health officials fear those packed beaches and parks over the holiday weekend will only cause that number to rise. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is covering that story for us. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hoda, good morning. The governor here in California continues to ease restrictions, but like in many other states, some say it's not fast enough. Officials everywhere are trying to jumpstart the economy and keep people healthy, but some are no longer willing to wait. This morning, growing fallout from those holiday weekend crowds and serious concern over a fresh wave of coronavirus infections. This, as the national death toll, approaches a staggering 100,000. USA Today putting a face on the devastating loss. This jam-packed pool party in Missouri prompting health officials in St. Louis County to issue a travel alert and a 14-day self-quarantine order for anyone who was there. Overnight, the owner of the bar where the event took place posting a message to Facebook saying in part that he stands by his decision to host the party and that no laws were broken. That post also referencing an earlier statement from the local sheriff saying it is the right and responsibility of each individual to make decisions about going out. Tyler Cranker was at that party and plans to take a COVID test today. I don't think personally that I will get really sick. But if I do, I have to live with the consequences of my actions. Now, with more Americans being tested, the number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in several states. And in Alabama, the situation is getting worse. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. The governor in Arkansas says they're experiencing a dangerous second peak, while in New Rochelle, New York, the first city in the nation to be locked down is now slowly reopening. You have to start somewhere. Now is the time. I don't think it's the greatest thing because um, there's a lot of people that, you know, are sick. Across the country in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, up to 6,000 people a day will be tested for the virus. Nearby at a food processing plant, 153 employees have tested positive. But the nation is showing new signs of life. The New York Stock Exchange reopening with a limited number of traders on the floor and new safety restrictions, promising signs of progress amid larger gatherings of concern. With the holiday weekend behind us, health officials say it'll take about two weeks to see if there truly was an impact from those large holiday crowds. Meantime, here in California, the governor says he will continue to slowly ease restrictions. Savannah.
All right, Miguel, thank you. And still ahead, we do have an exclusive interview with the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, on his state's progress against the virus. What happens next as the country enters what he calls the unknown? But now to that headline-making move by Twitter overnight, adding the first fact-checked links to tweets from the president. And he has responded, where else, on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has got the very latest for us this morning. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. So far, Twitter has added those fact check labels on just two of President Trump's tweets where he complained about mail-in ballots and claimed that they would cause this November's election to be rigged. Still, this is a significant step after fierce criticism. The social media company had not done enough to push back against the president's misleading and inaccurate statements. The president's favorite social media megaphone, Twitter, for the first time, slapping a fact-check label on some of President Trump's tweets. Twitter responding to two Trump tweets that claim mail-in ballots will be substantially fraudulent. Now, beneath them, this message. Get the facts about mail-in ballots and a link to articles about the unsubstantiated claim. The president immediately lashing out, accusing the company of interfering in the 2020 presidential election and completely stifling free speech, adding I, as president, will not allow it to happen. It comes as Twitter is under fire for another set of incendiary Trump tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and MSNBC Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that, and... uh... Hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Authorities determined years ago that 28-year-old Lori Klesudis died after an abnormal heart rhythm caused her to collapse and hit her head in Scarborough's Florida office. Scarborough was in Washington at the time. But that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Timothy Klesudis, Lori's widower, appealing directly to Twitter's CEO, Jack Dorsey, to remove the tweets, writing, I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the President of the United States has taken something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better. Twitter has not taken down the tweets, but says it's working on policy changes it hopes to have in place shortly. What the Klesudis's the entire family have had to endure for 19 years. Um, it's, it's unspeakably cruel for what, whether it's the president or whether it's people following the president, it is unspeakably cruel. The president acknowledged Tuesday he's read that letter, but he ignored the widower's words. Ultimately, they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. Peter, meanwhile, there's a back and forth between President Trump and Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, having to do with wearing a mask out in public. What happened? Yes, Savannah, you'll remember, unlike President Trump, Joe Biden wore a mask during a Memorial Day event this week. And the president later shared a tweet that mocked Biden for that mask. Biden, who says he was following the Trump administration's recommended guidelines, fired back on CNN. He's a fool. An absolute fool to talk that way. I mean, every leading doc in the world is saying we should wear a mask when you're in a crowd. Late yesterday, the president said Biden can wear a mask, but that he thought it was very unusual that Biden had one on outside while with his wife. The president also criticized a reporter for keeping his mask on while asking a question yesterday, accusing that reporter in the Rose Garden of trying to be politically correct. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Hoda, up to you. All right, thank you. Also this morning, the multi-state manhunt for a Connecticut college student wanted in connection with a string of deadly crimes is expanding. NBC Stephanie Gosk has details. This morning, police have a message for suspected murderer Peter Manfredonia. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. We want you to be able to tell your story. After four days and across at least three states, the University of Connecticut student is still on the run, wanted in two murders. He was last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a stolen black Hyundai Santa Fe. When they finally released the information, we put two and two together and it was terrifying. 
On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. Ted was the gentlest, most loving soul there was. He would do anything for everyone. Demers' sister-in-law believes the attack was premeditated. You don't just put a machete in your backpack and come to the end of a dirt road without a plan. The next murder, police say a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown, Connecticut, at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. This morning, NBC News has learned Manfredonia's father, Robert, was arrested in Newtown last month and charged with second-degree sexual assault, risk of injury to a minor, and giving alcohol to a minor. He was released on $50,000 bond. Connecticut police saying the charges against Robert have no relevance to the investigation into his son. To, While a family uh, attorney says the younger Manfredonia is an honors engineering student who had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with anxiety and depression, but no signs things were getting worse. The parents' message right now to Peter. The parents and the family's message to Peter is, Peter, we love you. It's time to bring this to a safe conclusion for everybody. Before anybody else gets hurt. For today, Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. We'll continue to follow that case. There's much more to get to this morning, including the countdown. It's on to this afternoon's historic mission to space. Here's a live look at Kennedy Space Center this morning. And just hours from now, NASA and SpaceX will team up for the first crewed launch from U.S. soil since 2011. The final safety and weather checks are already underway, and the weather's a big question this morning. NBC's Tom Costello is there. Hi, Tom. Good morning. How's it looking? Yeah, the weather is the issue right now. We've already had a pretty good rain uh, squall move in here just a short time ago. That's going to be the issue throughout the day. But you're absolutely right. This is a history making flight. The first time ever that a private company is carrying astronauts to the space station, in this case, SpaceX. And so much is riding on this mission for NASA and for SpaceX. But most importantly, getting those two men up to the space station safely. With the clock ticking down, we're now just hours away from witnessing history once again at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley set to hitch a ride to the International Space Station from a private company aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon propelled by its Falcon 9 rocket, a public-private partnership that NASA is banking on to launch a new era of space travel. It's all about commercialization of low Earth orbit so that we can use NASA's resources to do the things that have not yet been commercialized, like go to the moon and on to Mars. Today's mission, dubbed Demo 2, is a proof of concept that companies like SpaceX can serve as taxis for Americans and other nations to reach low Earth orbit destinations like the space station. If we can have other countries buy seats on these rockets. It drives down the cost for the United States of America taxpayers. Those seats will cost $55 million each. That may sound staggering, but NASA has been shelling out more than $80 million per seat for astronauts to ride on Russian rockets. SpaceX founder Elon Musk sharing this bird's eye view ahead of this critical test for the company. Also watching today's launch closely, Bankin and Hurley's wives, Megan MacArthur and Karen Nyberg, who are both also astronauts. Nyberg sharing this image with their son, inspecting dad's ride on the launch. Launch pad. The two man crew set to load into that crew dragon just over two hours before blastoff, wearing specially designed spacesuits and using touch screens. Minutes after launch, the Falcon 9 rocket will separate and, if all things go as planned, land upright on a SpaceX barge out on the ocean. The Crew Dragon continuing on to dock with a station where Bankin and Hurley will live and conduct research with the rest of the team for one to four months. I'm really looking forward to having a couple uh, crewmates here to help distribute the duties, but also to eat with and laugh with and joke around with. It'll be a great, great uh, adventure with them. So let's drill down on it, Tom, because weather is really uh, the spoiler potentially. So how is it looking for this afternoon? We've got a, a few hours for things to clear up. Yeah, and, and in some ways, this is more complicated than during the space shuttle because it's not just about how the weather is looking here. And right now, there's a 60% chance of go 
here at the Kennedy Space Center. But they also consider the weather and the ocean factors out in the Atlantic Ocean, all the way up the coast of Canada, and all the way out to Ireland. Why? Because if they have to abort, the spaceship would then parachute down into the Atlantic Ocean, and they would want to have that crew safe until rescue teams could arrive. And there's a rescue team on standby at Cape Canaveral. They would fly to the location of where the crew may have aborted and parachuted down. They themselves would parachute into the ocean and help rescue and stabilize the crew. So all of that is a big reason why it's not just the weather here, it's the weather out over the ocean as well. It's just so mind-blowingly complicated. We are anxious to see if they can pull it off. Tom, a big moment today. We will have live coverage of the launch right here on NBC. Hoda? All right, Savannah, what do you say we bring in the guy who's going to know more about the launch forecast than us? And also the West of the National weather picture. Hey, Al, what do we got? Well, guys, uh, we are looking at, as you see, again, as Tom showed, it's cloudy out there. They've got showers. And in fact, as we look at the live radar, you'll see that we are looking at some pretty strong storms that are going to be pushing in. In fact, we already had one clear launch pad 39A. But look to the south. This is live radar right now. And we're going to be looking at this all day today as we move into the afternoon and look at launch time. 433. There's some heavy showers and thunderstorms, a 60 percent chance of those storms. And besides that, to the north, we've got an invest area that may become a tropical system over the next five days already. Some buoys out in the Atlantic reporting tropical force winds. Today, this system moves up into the Appalachians. Virginia, North Carolina, look for strong storms. It weakens as it moves into western New York State, but brings strong storms tomorrow into the mid-Atlantic. And look at the heavy rain. Some areas along the southeastern Atlantic coast, four inches or more already on top of saturated ground. Overnight, chaos in Minneapolis. Crowds of protesters swarm the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. Another demonstration in Chicago. This is a trauma that a lot of us African Americans have to deal with. A bystander's cell phone video captured the incident Monday night. A Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee into his neck. For at least three minutes on the video, Floyd pleads for help, saying he can't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive as onlookers shout at the officer. Get off of him now! Security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking him across the street. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. But the mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The 46-year-old Floyd played basketball in college and lived most of his life in Texas, working as a truck driver and security guard. It's just heartbreaking when you watch how they killed him, how his knee was on his neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, but eight minutes. LeBron James posted this image on social media of the officer kneeling on Floyd with former quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeling in protest of police brutality, writing, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? The case is already drawing comparisons to another high-profile police confrontation in 2014. When you look at that video, what goes through your head? Oh, I see another senseless killing. Gwen Carr is the mother of Eric Gardner, who died after police in New York placed him in a chokehold. It's like a, a reoccurring nightmare, and this has to stop. Something has to be done. It's new protests erupted in Minneapolis overnight after a black man died in police custody on Monday. Crowds of protesters swarmed the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. 
It all stems from an incident on Monday night. You can see a Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee to his neck. Floyd pleads repeatedly for help, saying he can't breathe. It happened at least a dozen times. He was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Four officers involved have been fired, and the FBI has joined the investigation. And joining us now is George Floyd's sister, Bridget, along with the Floyd family attorney, Benjamin Krupp. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Bridget, I know you haven't um, had the stomach to look at that video, and I don't blame you. It's really horrifying. But would you just tell us how you and your family are doing in this moment? Me and my family are taking this uh, very, very hard. Um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing to our peace. Uh, we're just doing the best that we can and um, making sure that we do the right thing, do what he would want us to do. And um, yes, it's very hard. It's very hard. I can see that, Bridget. I can see that. Yesterday, there was some action taken against those officers. Four officers, all four were fired. And you have said repeatedly, that is not enough. What, what would be enough for you? I would like for those officers to be charged with murder because that's exactly what they did. They murdered my brother. He was crying for help. I don't need them to be suspended and able to work in another state or another county. Their license should be taken away, their job should be taken away, and they should be put in jail for murder. Um, let me bring in Ben for a second, Ben Crump. Um, I have a copy of the police report here, and this is what was submitted initially. And I'm going to read you a portion of it, and then I'm going to show you the video of what happened. They say here uh, that George Floyd was ordered to step, and this was all, by the way, over a forgery, a fake $20 bill. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect in handcuffs. Then this video emerged, Ben that shows a different picture, doesn't it? Absolutely, Huda. And we have more video emerging, video from the businesses' surveillance cameras um, on social media at Attorney Crump. We have people sending us new videos that have not been shown yet. And it shows, Huda, that, I mean, a nonviolent crime met with this kind of violent, lethal, excessive force they were on his neck not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, not for five minutes, not for six minutes, not for seven minutes, not for eight minutes, but for nine minutes while he is begging to breathe, begging for life. It's a I can't breathe again case mm -hmm. in 2020, and it's worse than Eric Gardner in many ways because you hear the people even pleading with them, please get your knee off his neck, have some humanity. This is a human being. And, and Ben, when you look also as the police report continues, and this is how the police report covers that part, they noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance where he died. If not for that video of him pleading, of the bystanders begging the officers to basically get off of him, what would have happened with this case? They would have gave a false narrative, Hoda, and they would have swept it under the rug. And we have this video, and they have terminated them, but they need to be arrested, as Bridget said, and charged with murder, because how many more of these senseless, excessive force killings by the people who are supposed to protect us can we take in black America and all of America? 
Bridget, the uh, the mayor later acknowledged that that police report was inaccurate. He said being black in America should not be a death sentence. The mayor also added that he should not have died. The governor called the lack of humanity in the video disturbing and sickening. He also said, made this statement, the governor said, we will get answers and seek justice. Do you have faith, Bridget, that justice will be done in this case? I have a lot of faith because I believe in the utmost powerful God. Faith is something that me and my brother always talked about because he was a God-fearing man, regardless of what he did. We all have our faults. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But I believe that justice will be served. I have enough faith to stand on it. And just one one final question for you, uh, Ben Crump. Um, LeBron James posted this picture that's been shown around a bit. It shows Colin Kaepernick kneeling and the police officer kneeling, and he basically says, um, do you understand now? Uh, do you think that this case may actually be the tipping point? I do, because when you think about nine minutes, if you can take your cell phone and sit it for nine minutes and just sit there, America, and try to imagine a knee on your neck suffocating you and you begging to breathe. That's why it has to be the tipping point that we have to say everybody deserves equal justice and we have to send a message with this case. We cannot allow those who are supposed to protect and serve us uh, do this. There can be two justice systems, one for black America and one for white America. We have to have equal justice for the United States of America. Well, Ben Crump, we appreciate you. Bridget, Bridget, we wish, wish the best to you and your family. And I know that your brother's a, a father of two. The youngest is six years old, and we wish her the best as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. This morning, growing fallout from those holiday weekend crowds and serious concern over a fresh wave of coronavirus infections. This as the national death toll approaches a staggering 100,000. USA Today putting a face on the devastating loss. This jam-packed pool party in Missouri prompting health officials in St. Louis County to issue a travel alert and a 14-day self-quarantine order for anyone who was there. Overnight, the owner of the bar where the event took place posting a message to Facebook, saying in part that he stands by his decision to host the party and that no laws were broken. That post also referencing an earlier statement from the local sheriff, saying it is the right and responsibility of each individual to make decisions about going out. Tyler Cranker was at that party and plans to take a COVID test today. I don't think personally that I will get really sick. But if I do, I have to live with the consequences of my actions. Now with more Americans being tested, the number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in several states. And in Alabama, the situation is getting worse. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. The governor in Arkansas says they're experiencing a dangerous second peak, while in New Rochelle, New York, the first city in the nation to be locked down is now slowly reopening. You have to start somewhere. Now is the time. I don't think it's the greatest thing because um, there's a lot of people that, you know, are sick. Across the country in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, up to 6,000 people a day will be tested for the virus. Nearby at a food processing plant, 153 employees have tested positive. But the nation is showing new signs of life. The New York Stock Exchange reopening with a limited number of traders on the floor and new safety restrictions, promising signs of progress amid larger gatherings of concern. the president's favorite social media megaphone, Twitter, for the first time slapping a fact check label on some of President Trump's tweets. Twitter responding to two Trump tweets that claim mail-in ballots will be substantially fraudulent. Now beneath them, this message, get the facts about mail-in ballots and a link to articles about the unsubstantiated claim. 
The president immediately lashing out, accusing the company of interfering in the 2020 presidential election and completely stifling free speech, adding I as president will not allow it to happen. It comes as Twitter is under fire for another set of incendiary Trump tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and MSNBC Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that, and uh, hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Authorities determined years ago that 28-year-old Lori Klesudis died after an abnormal heart rhythm caused her to collapse and hit her head in Scarborough's Florida office. Scarborough was in Washington at the time. But that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Timothy Klesudis, Lori's widower, appealing directly to Twitter's CEO, Jack Dorsey, to remove the tweets, writing, I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the President of the United States has taken something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better. Twitter has not taken down the tweets, but says it's working on policy changes it hopes to have in place shortly. What the Klesudises, the entire family, have had to endure for 19 years, um, it's, it's unspeakably cruel for what, whether it's the president or whether it's people following the president, it is unspeakably cruel. The president acknowledged Tuesday he's read that letter, but he ignored the widower's words. Ultimately, they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. Peter, meanwhile, there's a back and forth between President Trump and Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, having to do with wearing a mask out in public. What happened? Yes, Savannah, you'll remember, unlike President Trump, Joe Biden wore a mask during a Memorial Day event this week. And the president later shared a tweet that mocked Biden for that mask. Biden, who says he was following the Trump administration's recommended guidelines, fired back on CNN. He's a fool, an absolute fool to talk that way. I mean, every leading doc in the world is saying we should wear a mask when you're in a crowd. Late yesterday, the president said Biden can wear a mask, but that he thought it was very unusual that Biden had one on outside while with his wife. The president also criticized a reporter for keeping his mask on while asking a question yesterday, accusing that reporter in the Rose Garden of trying to be politically correct. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. At this church in Seoul this morning, a strange sight in a time of social distancing, more than 2,000 parishioners singing and praying under the same roof, the biggest turnout since the church reopened a month ago. Are you concerned about your parishioners getting the virus? Oh, if we follow the government guideline closely, I, I think it will be safe. Thermal sensors, temperature checks, online bookings and QR codes, giving the church a list of contacts in case someone gets sick, and masks are mandatory. And what about holding prayer books or singing or talking to someone next to you? Can uh, you do those things? Uh, singing is okay, but that talk to the next person is prohibited. Schools in South Korea are filling up too. Almost half of all students are now back in class. Kindergartners and first graders together, but separated. And parents are still understandably nervous. This dad says he's a working parent and his child had to go back, but he's worried about the virus spreading when kids play. Across the country, health officials here are still battling small outbreaks and introducing new rules, like requiring masks on all public transportation, including subways, buses, and taxis. This animation shows how germs can spread when a person talks in a subway car. A large number of the people uh, in the presence uh, with a very close environment. Uh, it can be also ideal space for the spreading of the virus. Today, another worry. 36 people at a warehouse for South Korea's largest e-commerce business have tested positive for coronavirus. 
We have just been through Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people saw that as a big test of social distancing. How are people handling the responsibility? Are they meeting those obligations of social distancing sufficiently? Yeah, I mean, I think overwhelmingly so, though obviously we've highlighted inappropriately uh, these exceptions. And we want to continue to remind people uh, to be vigilant. But the reality at the end of the day, I've been overwhelmed by 40 million Americans living in the state of California, the vast majority doing the right thing, recognizing uh, that this pandemic is not behind us. Uh, we're not into a second wave. Uh, we still haven't gotten through the first wave. You just this week released new guidelines concerning houses of worship. This has obviously become a flashpoint. The president talked about forcing governors to open houses of worship. Do you think your new guidelines will be the end of the issue? We're one of a few states, a handful of states, that's actually moved forward uh, to provide guidance to houses of worship. So I have deep respect uh, for those that want to practice their faith in person, not just virtually. But we have to do so safely. Uh, it's not a political issue for us. No one's immune from political pressure, but that won't be determinative in terms of our decision making. We'll do it on the basis of public health. Speaking of pressure, a lot of families are under a lot of pressure right now. They're not able to go back to work. And, and when they are are able, then you're going to have to put their kids somewhere. What are you expecting in terms of child care in the state, in terms of summer camps? I know guidelines are expected to be released very, very soon. Yeah, we made a lot of progress in child care. Our most precious resource, our children, uh, will be done very, very th soberly, thoughtfully. Also recognizing we have to take care of the caregivers, meaning our teachers, uh, our bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the janitors as well. But I'm confident uh, in our ability to do this in a responsible way and to get kids back in the classroom uh, over the course of the next few months, again, responsibly. So do you think summer camps will be able to open, child care, school this fall? Do you expect it to be open? With deep modifications, limits, absolutely. Let's talk about the economy. California has been hit harder and worse than possibly any other state, whether you're talking about tourism, agriculture, ports, the film industry, the list goes on and on. How grave is the threat to California's economy? No, it's been profound. I mean, the reality is uh, we have 5 million people that have applied for unemployment insurance just since uh, March 12th, 5 million. Uh, just uh, shy of $12 billion has been distributed in unemployment insurance claims. I mean, these are just jaw-dropping numbers. And so we have our work cut out for us. That's why we need the support of the federal government, not as charity, but as social responsibility to help the American people in this state get moving again. We'll get through this, but it's a sobering time. Do you see an economic bounce back quickly? Some talk about a V-shaped recovery. In other words, we were up here, it dropped sharply and quickly, but it'll bounce back just just as dramatically. Do you see it happening that way? I see it happening if public health is our primary focus. I don't see it happening if we look at public health as an annoyance or a nuisance that somehow gets in the way of our economic growth. We're a consumer-based economy. As demand increases, we'll start to see this economy begin to rev back up. But that won't increase until people feel confident and safe going back out and doing their activities that we're doing uh, prior to COVID-19. The president tweeted about you and your plan to send mail-in ballots to registered voters in the state. What do you say to the president's concerns about fraudulent ballots? Let's just stick with the facts, not opinions. The reality is mail-in uh, ballots, absentee ballots, are well utilized all across the spectrum, all across this country, and have been done so thoughtfully and safely uh, for a generation. Uh, I think the president himself has used mail-in ballot in the past. Our service members use them overseas very confidently and securely. Uh, there's been study after study. Don't take my word for it. Don't take the president's. Study after study uh, that just lays claim to no evidence whatsoever that there's widespread voter fraud. We want to prepare to keep people safe and allow them to have their constitutional rights protected, the constitutional right to vote without putting their health at risk. The Department of Justice just recently warned California, in particular the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, that extended shutdown orders may be illegal and violate the Constitution. Do you see a confrontation with the federal government coming? Was this a shot across the bow? I think we're entering in a political season. I think people are sharpening uh, their tongues, sharpening their knives to some degree, uh, figuratively. Uh, and certainly I expect more of this, not less.
people will be really heartened to see businesses start to reopen, life start to return at the same time. It's such a delicate balancing act. I was struck by something you said today that we're heading into the unknown. How are you trying to balance those considerations as we go forward with those concerns about a potential second wave that could be worse? Well, we don't want to yield to the unknown. You've got to be driven by data, not political pressure, and not scoring political points. If we can get the health right, uh, we'll get the economic uh, uh, question uh, correct. And we'll come out the other side more capable of not only weathering a second wave, but ultimately more resilient as a society and as a community, and more capable of meeting the economic conditions that will present themselves well into the future. In fact, we're going to talk to a gentleman uh, who has volunteered to try and really help find the vaccine for COVID-19. Of course, finding that vaccine is a top priority. The government reporting now that there are 14 promising clinical trials. Norman Hume is taking part in one of those trials at Emory University. He's already received two doses of this investigative vaccine. There's a, a picture of him getting one of those doses. Uh, Norman, good morning to you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we should point out that Emory has, has actually teamed up with a biotech firm uh, named Moderna uh, for this trial. You've worked at Emory University for more than two decades. You jumped at the chance to be a part of this trial. Why? That's a great question. I mean, um, I've been there for 26 years and um, Back in March, um, I was sent home as non-essential. And um, like so many people, I wanted to help out. I mean, you look at the amazing work of first responders, uh, emergency room staff, and there I was at home. I mean, I was fortunate that I could uh, work from home, but I was also very fortunate that I could, uh, I worked at Emory University, which has an amazing uh, record for um, public health, medicine, um, not only locally, but uh, at the global level. And so they're, they've had a big involvement in the COVID-19 vaccine, but also just back to um, uh, bringing the first Ebola patients uh, to Atlanta, as well as before that HIV and, and anthrax. So when I saw a notice to uh, sign up to be considered for a possible participant in the COVID-19 vaccine trial, I really just jumped at it. I thought it'd be like one very small thing that I could do um, that could maybe help out and I could do from home yeah. um, and do my little piece for moving forward in, in this terrible pandemic. I mean, we should point out that, that during the, this 14 month study, you're not going to be injected uh, with the actual virus. But but what did they how did they explain how this is going to work? And are you experiencing any side effects so far? No side effects at, at all. I've been very fortunate. And um, one of the motivators, of course, was that this is really cutting edge science. And it, it was, it's kind of cool how this is, like as you just mentioned, does not involve a traditional vaccine with the, um, the watered down actual virus itself. So this is really cutting edge. And we've all seen the, the ball, the, va the virus with the spiky things. Well, the idea is to, um, to address the spiky things um, that have a specific protein, a spike protein, that it, once it enters your body, these will attach to your, your, your system. And so the idea is to train my body to look for just that one protein that the vaccine uses, uh, that the uh, virus uses to attach itself to me. So hopefully going forward, uh, this vaccine will um, work for you know, anyone who, who's ex exposed to COVID. You also volunteered to be injected with the anthrax vaccine after 9-11 <laughs> as well. This is kind of your thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny story. So I grew up in a, a very scientific household. My dad um, had a Ph.D. in clinical pharmacology. My, my mom was, uh, had an advanced degree in chemistry. And so when we were growing up, we were constantly told to wash our hands and cover our mouth when we coughed or sneezed and, you know, and so um, he actually designed and managed the first drug trials for the F first ever um, FDA-approved uh, oral treatment for endometriosis. And, I mean, he would even bring his work home. So when I, I remember when I was like uh, eight or nine years old, he brought home, uh, he was working on a project for ch children's chewable uh, aspirin. And so he brought home these different variations with different slight, different flavors of orange flavored aspirin. So he sat me down on the dining room table, pulled out his clipboard and said, okay, I want you to Eat, chew each one of these, and then rank them in, in your preference of, of favorites. So, I mean, they're all they were all terrible. But I, I you know, I just had a great admiration for really the process of yeah. science 
and hopefully, you know, moving better for better health care for, for everyone. Well, Norman, we, we're thankful for you. Thank you for your service. Good luck. Keep us posted as well. We want to check in with you periodically. Will do. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. In fact, we're going to talk to a gentleman uh, who has volunteered to try and really help find the vaccine for COVID-19. Of course, finding that vaccine is a top priority. The government reporting now that there are 14 promising clinical trials. Norman Hume is taking part in one of those trials at Emory University. He's already received two doses of this investigative vaccine. There's a a picture of him getting one of those doses. Uh, Norman, good morning to you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, We should point out that Emory has has actually teamed up with a biotech firm uh, named Moderna uh, for this trial. You've worked at Emory University for more than two decades. You jumped at the chance to be a part of this trial. Why? That's a great question. I mean, um, I've been there for 26 years and um, Back in March, um, I was sent home as non-essential, and um, like so many people, I wanted to help out. I mean, you look at the amazing work of first responders, uh, emergency room staff, and there I was at home. I mean, I was fortunate that I could uh, work from home, but I was also very fortunate that I could. Uh, I worked at Emory University, which has an amazing uh, record for um, public health, medicine, um, not only locally, but uh, at the global level. And so they're, they've got a big involvement in the COVID-19 vaccine, but it also goes back to um, uh, bringing the first Ebola patients uh, to Atlanta, as well as before that HIV and, and anthrax. So when I saw a notice to uh, sign up to be considered for a possible participant in the COVID-19 vaccine trial, I really just jumped at it. I thought it'd be like one very small thing that I could do um, that could maybe help out and I could do from home yeah. um, and do my little piece for moving forward in, in this terrible pandemic. I mean, we should point out that, that during the, this 14 month study, you're not going to be injected uh, with the actual virus. But but what did they how did they explain how this is going to work? And are you experiencing any side effects so far? No side effects at, at all. I've been very fortunate. And um, one of the motivators, of course, was that this is really cutting edge science. And it, it was, it's kind of cool how this is, like as you just mentioned, does not involve a traditional vaccine with the, um, the watered down actual virus itself. So this is really cutting edge. And we've all seen the, the ball, the, va- the virus with the spiky things. Well, the idea is to, um, to address the spiky things um, that have a specific protein, a spike protein, that it, once it enters your body, these will attach to your, your, your system. And so the idea is to train my body to look for just that one protein that the vaccine uses, uh, that the uh, virus uses to attach itself to me. So hopefully going forward, uh, this vaccine will um, work for you know, anyone who, who's ex- exposed to COVID. You also volunteered to be injected with the anthrax vaccine after <laughs> 9-11 as well. This is kind of your thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny story. So I grew up in a, a very scientific household. My dad um, had a Ph.D. in clinical pharmacology. My, my mom was, uh, had an advanced degree in chemistry. And so when we were growing up, we were constantly told to wash our hands and cover our mouth when we coughed or sneezed and, you know, and so um, he actually designed and managed the first drug trials for the F- first ever um, FDA-approved uh, oral treatment for endometriosis. And, I mean, he would even bring his work home. So when I, I remember when I was like uh, eight or nine years old, he brought home, uh, he was working on a project for children's chewable uh, aspirin. And so he brought home these different variations with different slight, different flavors of orange-flavored aspirin. So he sat me down on the dining room table, pulled out his clipboard and said, okay, I want you to eat, chew each one of these, and then rank them in, in your preference of, of favorites. So I mean, they're all, they were all terrible. But I, I, you know, I just had a great admiration for really the process of yeah. science and hopefully you know, moving better for better health care for, for everyone. Well, Norman, we, we're thankful for you. Thank you for your service. Good luck. Keep us posted as well. We want to check in with you periodically. Will do. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We've talked a lot on this show about the restaurant industry and that it's been struggling, and that includes Subway, of course, the company with the most fast food restaurants in the country. Subway adjusted how they did business during stay-at-home orders, but are now preparing for a reopening, of course, and for customers to eat inside of their shops. Joining us now is John Chitsey, CEO of Subway Restaurants. John, thank you so much for talking with us this morning. I know it's, it's a busy time. Thank you for having me. 
Uh, let's dig in here. Let's talk about how many Subway uh, restaurants temporarily closed during this time. And for those which remained open, how would you describe the foot traffic? You know, we lost about um, probably 17 to 18 percent of our restaurants here in the U.S. But, you know, most of those that closed actually were ones that were either in malls or colleges, universities, things, things of that nature. So ones that weren't forced to shut down, we lost you know, far fewer than that that actually um, temporarily closed. And in terms of traffic, as you know, Subway, um, while we do have dine in, a, a lot of Subway is takeout, delivery. Um, and then we worked hard to put in a, a curbside pickup program as well, so that there are quite a few ways you can now uh, get your meals or get your food from Subway that have nothing to do with dine-in. If we put all of this in perspective here, there are recent reports that have noted that your company, frankly, began to lay off hundreds of employees just ahead of the pandemic. And word on permanent restaurant closures starting uh, in 2002 had also made the rounds. Are you hopeful then that Subway will weather its challenges and remain you know, a fast food industry giant? Yes, yes, great question. Um, the people that we laid off, we had um, a, a new team basically came to Subway in the last year. And so we were already underway in sort of a restructuring, making the company more entrepreneurial, making it more efficient. So all the plans that we had really were laid well before coronavirus. Um, I will be honest, coronavirus uh, caused us really to move up one or two of our staged um, uh, moves, so to speak. But yeah, I think Subway will actually do quite well in this environment because we have such a smaller footprint uh, than our traditional QSR competitors. And because of that, uh, we can make money at a much lower sales level than a lot of our competitors. And I think, as you know, a Subway store restaurant has far fewer employees than a Wendy's or a McDonald's. So you've got lower labor costs. Generally speaking, you have a smaller footprint. So I actually think we'll do quite well uh, coming out of this environment. And I think it's of note, all 20,000 plus Subway restaurants in this country are 100% owned by franchisees. And you say you want to help them keep their doors open, obviously. Are you able to get uh, behind them with additional funding? I understand, you know, costs are high right now. Yes, another great, great question. Yeah, we are the ultimate mom and pop. So in our 25, 27,000 restaurants we have across the U.S., it's a little over 10,500 franchisees. So basically our entire system is built on people that have one or two restaurants. So we, we are the ultimate small business company. Um, and yes, Subway's injected uh, millions into the company either through uh, deferred royalties or waiving royalties in some cases. Our partners have stepped up, um, as have our suppliers. So we've been able to inject a fair amount of funding into the system to help franchisees restart, uh, which will certainly help them reorder food, uh, make some payments with rent. And then, of course, uh, the PPP program has also been a benefit for our franchisees. So together, sure. there's been a, a fair amount of liquidity. Finally, before I let you go, let's run down uh, the employee and customer safety. Talk about are masks mandatory? Are you limiting the number of people inside at one time? You know, what are you doing as far as the changes we'll see? Sure. I mean, I think the most important thing is to make sure that our crew, our sandwich artists feel safe. Um, so all, all of our uh, employees will be required to wear masks. They'll wear gloves. They'll have temperature checks when the shift begins. Um, we have added sanitation. All of our fresh food, which you know we make in front of you, will have uh, uh, plastic over the top of it, basically, wrap over the top of it. Um, and then we've got social distancing inside the restaurants should you want to eat in the restaurants. And that obviously depends really municipality by municipality. Um, so I think we've really doubled down or tripled down even in terms of safety. And we've thought long and hard, and I think we're really prepared and ready to go for this. Sounds good. Finally, let me ask you, John, there are concerns really, and it's not just with Subway, it's places all around the country, that people who are sick will be afraid not to go in because they need the paycheck. So what do you do if an employee feels sick? Are they, will they be confident to know that they'll still be able to get paid or how are you going to work that out? Yes, obviously, um, if an employee becomes sick, um, we will close the restaurant down. We will do a deep clean. Um, that employee will uh, definitely be taken care of, paid for while they um, get well and go through a quarantine. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's a fear. Again, we're very lucky because we have a much smaller number of employees in our restaurants than, than a traditional competitor, as I was saying. So it's really easy for an owner to keep their eye on the two or three people that are in there working those shifts. So I, I do think we'll have a pretty good grip on that. All right. Sounds good, John. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This morning, police have a message for suspected murderer Peter Manfredonia. This behavior is out of the ordinary for you. We know this is not who you are. We want you to be able to tell your story. 
After four days and across at least three states, the University of Connecticut student is still on the run, wanted in two murders. He was last seen walking in Pennsylvania on Sunday. Police warning the 23-year-old might be driving a stolen black Hyundai Santa Fe. When they finally released the information, we put two and two together and it was terrifying. On Friday, Manfredonia allegedly killed 62-year-old Theodore Demers, who had stopped to offer the young man a hand. Ted was the gentlest, most loving soul there was. He would do anything for everyone. Demers' sister-in-law believes the attack was premeditated. You don't just put a machete in your backpack and come to the end of a dirt road without a plan. The next murder, police say a friend from high school, Nicholas Isley. Manfredonia then allegedly kidnapped Isley's girlfriend. She was later discovered unharmed at a New Jersey truck stop. Manfredonia grew up in Newtown, Connecticut, at one point on the same street as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. This morning, NBC News has learned Manfredonia's father, Robert, was arrested in Newtown last month and charged with second-degree sexual assault, risk of injury to a minor, and giving alcohol to a minor. He was released on $50,000 bond. Connecticut police saying the charges against Robert have no relevance to the investigation into his son. To, While a family uh, attorney says the younger Manfredonia is an honors engineering student who had been living near UConn's campus, at times struggling with anxiety and depression, but no signs things were getting worse. The parents' message right now to Peter. The parents and the family's message to Peter is, Peter, we love you. It's time to bring this to a safe conclusion for everybody. Before anybody else gets hurt. For today, Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. With the clock ticking down, we're now just hours away from witnessing history once again at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley set to hitch a ride to the International Space Station from a private company aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon, propelled by its Falcon 9 rocket, a public-private partnership that NASA is banking on to launch a new era of space travel. It's all about commercialization of low Earth orbit so that we can use NASA's resources to do the things that have not yet been commercialized, like go to the moon and on to Mars. Today's mission, dubbed Demo 2, is a proof of concept that companies like SpaceX can serve as taxis for Americans and other nations to reach low Earth orbit destinations like the space station. If we can have other countries buy seats on these rockets. It drives down the cost for the United States of America taxpayers. Those seats will cost $55 million each. That may sound staggering, but NASA has been shelling out more than $80 million per seat for astronauts to ride on Russian rockets. SpaceX founder Elon Musk sharing this bird's eye view ahead of this critical test for the company. Also watching today's launch closely, Bankin and Hurley's wives, Megan MacArthur and Karen Nyberg, who are both also astronauts. Nyberg sharing this image with their son, inspecting dad's ride on the launch launch pad. The two-man crew set to load into that crew dragon just over two hours before blastoff, wearing specially designed spacesuits and using touchscreens. Minutes after launch, the Falcon 9 rocket will separate and, if all things go as planned, land upright on a SpaceX barge out on the ocean. The Crew Dragon continuing on to dock with a station where Bankin and Hurley will live and conduct research with the rest of the team for one to four months. I'm really looking forward to having a couple uh, crewmates here to help distribute the duties, but also to eat with and laugh with and joke around with. It'll be a great, great uh, adventure with them. So let's drill down on it, Tom, because weather is really uh, the spoiler potentially. So how is it looking for this afternoon? We've got a, a few hours for things to clear up. Yeah, and, and in some ways, this is more complicated than during the space shuttle because it's not just about how the weather is looking here. And right now, there's a 60% chance of go here at the Kennedy Space Center. But they also consider the weather and the ocean factors out in the Atlantic Ocean, all the way up the coast of Canada, and all the way out to Ireland. Why? Because if they have to abort, the spaceship would then parachute down into the Atlantic Ocean, and they would want to have that crew safe until rescue teams could arrive. And there's a rescue team on standby at Cape Canaveral. They would fly to the location of where the crew may have aborted and parachuted down. They themselves would parachute into the ocean 
and help rescue and stabilize the crew. So all of that is a big reason why it's not just the weather here, it's the weather out over the ocean as well. It's just so mind-blowingly complicated. We are anxious to see if they can pull it off, Tom. It's a big moment today. We will have live coverage of the launch right here on NBC. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Tonight, growing concern amid a grim milestone as the U.S. nears 100,000 COVID-related deaths. Will scenes like these fuel a new spike in infections? With many Americans choosing not to social distance amid massive holiday crowds, in St. Louis County, where health officials called these revelers reckless, there is now a 14-day self-quarantine for anyone who broke safety protocols at Lake of the Ozarks. You see no mask here. You see no fear. Um, we're all just embracing it. As many defy local mandates, the number of new coronavirus cases is rising in several states as more Americans are being tested. In Arkansas, the governor says they are experiencing a dangerous second peak. In Alabama, the outlook also worsening. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. While the World Health Organization warns of a second peak of infections in countries where restrictions are eased too quickly, today a return to the New York Stock Exchange, where stocks soared and fewer traders were on the floor taking precautions. In nearby New Rochelle, the first community to lock down is now beginning to reopen. But from coast to coast, many are growing uneasy, fatigued by the quarantine. Your dog can get groomed, but you can't get a haircut. I need my hair done. 
That's a problem. After long holiday lines at everything from airports to hiking trails, in Los Angeles, Dodger Stadium will be used to test up to 6,000 people a day for COVID-19. Not far away at a food processing plant that makes the iconic Dodger dog, 153 employees have tested positive for the virus, the latest outbreak for an industry struggling to contain the disease. But we don't want to keep applying Band-Aids and leaves we want to back people to be healthy because it's not just them that get infected. The fear amongst the workers, in fact, is even greater for going home and infecting their family and loved ones. With every state worried about new infections, there remains pressure to reopen the economy. Here in California, the governor said hair salons can reopen, but not in the state's biggest counties. Tonight, frustration, defiance, and now mounting concern. Has our nation done enough to prevent a second wave? Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. And I as the U.S. approaches a tragic milestone, 100,000 dead, President Trump tonight is defending his handling of the pandemic, casting it as a success that the number of lives lost is not in the millions. It comes as the president spent his Memorial Day weekend attending remembrances while honoring the virus's victims. As one nation, we mourn alongside every single family that has lost loved ones. But aside from that, the president's largely been focused elsewhere, playing two rounds of golf and firing off dozens of divisive tweets, amplifying posts that insult prominent Democratic women, accusing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of having a drinking problem and mocking former Georgia legislator Stacey Abrams about her appearance. President Trump on Memorial Day also attacking Democratic congressman and military veteran Connor Lamb as a, quote, American fraud. And just three months before the Republican National Convention is set to take place in Charlotte, President Trump's threatening to move it elsewhere. If North Carolina's Democratic governor is unable to guarantee that by August we will be allowed full attendance, that would mean more than 20,000 supporters shoulder to shoulder in this arena. Just last weekend, the state recorded its largest daily increase in positive COVID cases. And Governor Roy Cooper says he does not know what situation his state will be in in August. It's OK for political conventions to be political, but pandemic response cannot be. The president also taking a swipe at his Democratic opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden, who, unlike President Trump, wore a mask to his state's Memorial Monday. President Trump sharing this tweet, making fun of Biden's choice. He's a fool. An absolute fool to talk that way. And most stunningly from President Trump's latest tweets, falsely suggesting former Republican congressman and Morning Joe anchor Joe Scarborough may have been personally involved in the 2001 death of one of his staffers and should be investigated. Authorities determined years ago that Lori Klafsudis died after losing consciousness from an abnormal heart rhythm that caused her to collapse and hit her head. Her death a tragic accident, but that has not stopped the president from questioning whether Scarborough got away with murder. Her widower in a letter appealing directly to Twitter's CEO. I'm asking you to intervene in this instance because the president of the United States is taking something that does not belong to him, the memory of my dead wife, and perverted it for perceived political gain, adding, my wife deserves better, and condemning the president for repeating the debunked falsehood that Klaus Sudis was murdered by her boss. Scarborough's wife and co-anchor Mika Brzezinski reading from the letter this morning on MSNBC. These conspiracy theorists, including most recently the president of the United States, continue to spread their bile and misinformation on your platform. The president tonight saying he's read that letter but ignores the widower's words. Yeah, I have, but I'm sure that ultimately they want to get to the bottom of it. In that letter, the staffer's widower urges Twitter to delete the president's tweets. Twitter has not taken them down, but tonight, for the first time, Twitter has posted fact checks beneath some of President Trump's tweets. Today, like every day, dozens of virus funerals in Rio. American Oscar Stearns was 64 and from Boston and lived here all his life. One of 800 victims in one day. Brazil now has the highest daily death toll in the world. Today, one city with a high death toll and a shattered economy ended its lockdown. Tens of thousands poured onto the streets. The mayor of this city, who's had the virus, ordered it to open up. He doesn't support the lockdown. 
Across Brazil, the battle between saving the economy and saving lives is raging. One American already in financial trouble. I have a travel agency, and that travel agency I don't think is going to survive the next couple of months. Like the economy, hospitals are at breaking point, people too. Brazilians looking to come to the U.S. now unwelcome. President Trump's travel ban barring visitors to the U.S. from Brazil kicks in at midnight. It's like we're living the stages of grief all at once. Denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and perhaps even acceptance. Is it possible we've come to accept 100,000 deaths, or are we simply unable to process it? What, after all, is death on that scale supposed to look like? Is it the grim procession of covered stretchers carried to waiting hearses, or the precious cargo of caskets stacked in mortuaries? Funeral director Joe Ruggiero's world for the last two months. We're dealing with situations where, you know, one spouse dies and the other spouse is, is sick in the hospital and, and families don't even know which, which way to go with things. Do we, 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 you know, stay for mom or do we, you know, take care of dad's services? 100,000 names. So many names. Almost impossible to read. And so many faces a tear-stained fabric of crushing grief woven by 100,000 stories. We went on our first seat at 10 years old. My mom took us to the movies. Rob Weber was a fireman, Daniel Weber's husband of 21 years, a hands-on dad to his daughter Alexa, taken by COVID at 44. I don't really know what else to say. I lost the love of my life. Um, you know, I'll never get over it. I'll never know how to get past it. Their stories move us. Ron Golden, the truck driver and proud Native American Marine veteran. Adolf T.J. Mendez, father of six, who helped teach Sunday school. Gerda Gerbatsky, who barely escaped Nazi-occupied Austria. Detective Mary Lou Armour, who helps survivors of sexual assault. The toll has been compared to casualties of our modern wars. But they took years. This took weeks. And unlike wars, there are no stirring touchstones of grief, no arrivals of flag-draped coffins. But there are heroes, like Marilyn Howard, a school nurse, an immigrant from Guyana, who helped raise her five siblings after their mom died. She really was, there's no other way to say it, but being the glue that, that cemented us all together. What hold does, does Marilyn's passing leave in our, in our world? Well, I think... The world has lost uh, a nurse who would have been in the fight had she not gotten sick so early. I've lost a sister. Uh, uh, my family members have lost a godmother and an aunt and niece who uh, is irreplaceable. She was 53. This, of course, is not over, but we choose milestones to take stock, to remember to share our sorrows until, as a country, we can confront the depths of our collective pain face to face. Frozen here, the voice of an angel. On the ladders of my life. My name is Archie Williams. But for 37 years, Archie Williams was a prisoner in a cage, locked up in Louisiana for a murder he did not commit. I knew I was innocent. I didn't commit a crime. Freed just last year, after the celebrated Innocence Project dug into his case, discovering fingerprint evidence that exonerated him. I went to prison, but I never let my mind go to prison. Behind bars, he sang, watching America's Got Talent, picturing himself on that stage. Tonight, he will perform there for untold millions. So what are you going to be doing today, Archie? His chosen song, to honor other inmates wrongly convicted, Elton John's moving, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. It's like the sun going down on me. Host Simon Cowell is now a spokesperson for The Innocence Project. I really pray and hope that this is going to be a turning point for people like Archie. Archie Williams lost his freedom, but he never lost hope or his voice. Kevin Dibbles, 
NBC News. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. And the NHL commissioner, Gary Bettman, joins us live now. And uh, Gary, a lot of those fans are, are celebrating this morning, not even just fans of hockey, just sports fans in general. Here's the thing. It sounds like it's more of a framework than, it, than it, a really a list of dates to circle on a calendar. When do you think that the first puck is going to drop, Gary? It will be at some point over the summer. By the way, good morning, and it's great to be with you. The, the framework is intended to be a bit evolutionary. We're going to take things what's one step at a time because the health and safety of our players or all of our personnel and all of our communities is of paramount importance. So we've been in a self-isolation stage. Early June, we're going to have our training facilities open because our players haven't been able to work out or skate, so they want to get back in shape. And then when we get the sense that they're ready and we get the sense as to how long we need for training camp, We'll move to the training camp phase, probably at some point in July. And once we're done with training camp, we're then going to execute the plan that you just described so well in two hub cities. We, we don't want to be pinned down to specific dates because, as everybody knows, things are changing almost daily. You, you did say yesterday that an essential component of this plan is going to be uh, what you describe as rigorous testing. Tell us a little bit more about, the, about this testing and, and how often that's going to happen. The, the medical people tell us that the, the safest way for us to do what we're planning to do is to be testing uh, personnel, particularly the players, if not daily, at least every other day. Uh, for the scope of the tournament, we're talking about probably between 25 and 30,000 tests. Uh, putting aside the expense, we also understand that we can't be doing the testing if it's going to interfere at all with any medical needs of any communities that we might be considering going to. Although the medical people are telling us that by the summer that testing should be in such abundance that 25 to 30,000 tests, while it sounds like a big number, will, will be infinitesimal uh, relative to what will be available. Gary, what happens when there's that, that first positive test, whether it's a, a player or a coach or some sort of someone affiliated with one of the teams? Are, are you going to have to shut the, the whole thing down? The medical people are advising us that one test uh, should not result in that. You quarantine that person. But obviously, if there's an outbreak, uh, that would shut things down. Although, uh, 
we're not going to make that decision. The medical people will tell us what to do under the circumstances. As, as I think everybody knows, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we believe that having a framework and, and a timetable that we can adjust, it, it's another step in the return to some degree of normalcy. And we think that's really important because sports has always been a catalyst for bringing people together and helping communities heal. And providing a much needed escape during these times, especially. Gary, one more question here. So many of your players, hundreds of players in the NHL, uh, they come from overseas. They come from Canada, Russia, uh, Finland, Sweden. And, of course, Sweden never enacted the kind of lockdown uh, that, that we've seen in our country. But what are you going to do about these, these hundreds of players who are, who are returning from other countries? We, we have about 44 percent, roughly, of our players are in the cities in which they play. And 83% of our players are in North America, but you're right, 17% of our players are coming from outside of North America. Uh, they're going to have to come back. They're going to have to self-isolate. They're going to be tested. We're going to have to make sure they're symptom-free, which is, again, why we're doing this in steps. We can use the, the individual training uh, phase, phase two, as we call it, to do that and get everybody back together as a community. But once we go into training camp mode, uh, there'll be lots of testing, not quite as much as when we're actually playing in phase four, uh, but we're going to be monitoring everything very closely because we know we've got to bring back uh, a large group of people from all over, and we have to make sure as we're bringing them together, uh, we're not bringing COVID-19 with them. NHL Commissioner uh, Gary Bedman. Gary, I think you're going to pick up a lot of hockey fans over the next few months. Uh, thank you, sir. Good luck to you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Be well. A battle over who to blame for the coronavirus outbreak is being fought over the airwaves of the Middle East. Russian and Chinese state media, broadcasting in Arabic, are spreading the conspiracy that the virus is an American biological weapon. I'm Raf Sanchez with the NBC News Verification Unit. We've been investigating how Russian and Chinese state disinformation campaigns have been spreading in Arabic and we've spoken to a small group of young Arabic speakers who are taking a stand against that false news. Here's what we found. Russia Today Arabic and China Global Television Arabic are each funded by their respective governments. In the last few months, we've seen a similar storyline develop on both networks, the suggestion that the coronavirus started in a U.S. government lab. Take a look at this video from Russia Today, which we tracked and translated. It features a so-called biological weapons expert who says the virus came from a ring of U.S. facilities in Asia. لا أعتقد أنها مصادفة أعتقد أن هذا أنها خطة فحول الصين يوجد 25 مختبرا بيولوجيا أمريكيا تعمل صحيح حول حدوده في كازاخستان وكرغستان ولاوس وفيتنام وتايوان وكوريا الجنوبية to be clear, there's no evidence of a ring of U.S. labs encircling China, nor is there any evidence that the coronavirus started in an American facility. Here's similar footage from Chinese state television, again, broadcasting for an Arabic-speaking audience. The anchor claims Japanese tourists caught coronavirus last summer after visiting Hawaii and says a U.S. military lab mysteriously shut down just before the outbreak. There's no truth to the claim that Japanese tourists contracted the virus last year. And while a U.S. military lab in Maryland did temporarily close in 2019, it's since reopened. There's no evidence that closure was linked to the coronavirus. In fact, experts and intelligence agencies have concluded that the virus could not have been created in a lab. We took a look at this data very objectively. We even considered the possibility that it could have been uh, made in a laboratory or accidentally escaped from a laboratory somewhere, and we totally rejected that hypothesis. Uh, no human could have created this virus. The state actors spreading these conspiracies are giant channels with huge resources. But a few grassroots groups are pushing back against their falsehoods and other forms of coronavirus misinformation in the Middle East. There you go, exactly. Perfect. All right. Ideas Beyond Borders is the brainchild of Faisal Al-Muttar, 
an Iraqi refugee who came to the U.S. in 2013 and is now an American citizen living in New York. Ideas Beyond Borders' mission is to provide a positive alternative to extremism, authoritarianism, and censorship. And the way we do that is that we translate and we promote ideas that promote critical thinking, human rights, pluralism, science, and all of the other values that are not hardly accessible in the region in their own languages. Arabic is one of the world's most spoken languages, but the UN estimates just 3% of internet content is available in Arabic. The population of the Arab world is young, it's digitally savvy, and it's hungry for knowledge. But widespread censorship means it doesn't always have access to reliable sources of information. Since the start of the corona outbreak, teams of translators from Ideas Beyond Borders have been working around the clock. They've translated CDC health guidelines, Wikipedia articles on the virus's origins, and news of the global economic slowdown. They've done more than 90,000 words so far. Translation. Mm. Which, uh, which, uh, we caught up with six young translators in Syria to hear about their work. When uh, coronavirus first uh, started, we made a team of medical students and doctors. We were dense, and we agreed on the fact that we are going to stand against this whole uh, random information about vaccines and about local treatments and all this kind of conspiracy theories because it was making a very great damage, especially in our region. Faisal hopes his group's work will help spread reliable facts in Arabic across the internet, and that that will empower people in the region to fight disinformation coming from both home and abroad. Overnight, chaos in Minneapolis. Crowds of protesters swarm the streets, facing off with officers in riot gear who fired tear gas and rubber bullets. Another demonstration in Chicago. This is a trauma that a lot of us African Americans have to deal with. A bystander cell phone video captured the incident Monday night. A Minneapolis officer pinning George Floyd face down, pressing a knee into his neck. For at least three minutes on the video, Floyd pleads for help, saying he can't breathe at least a dozen times. Then he becomes unresponsive as onlookers shout at the officer. Get off of him now! Security footage from a nearby business obtained by NBC News shows what appears to be the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Officers are seen removing Floyd from a parked car and handcuffing him before walking him across the street. In an initial press release, police said they arrived at the scene for a reported forgery in progress and that the suspect appeared to be under the influence and physically resisted officers. Once the man was handcuffed, police said officers noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress and called for an ambulance. But the mayor called it wrong at every level. What we saw was horrible, completely and utterly messed up. This man's life matters. The 46-year-old Floyd played basketball in college and lived most of his life in Texas, working as a truck driver and security guard. It's just heartbreaking when you watch how they killed him, how his knee was on his neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not for three minutes, not for four minutes, but eight minutes. LeBron James posted this image on social media of the officer kneeling on Floyd with former quarterback Colin Kaepernick kneeling in protest of police brutality, writing, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? The case is already drawing comparisons to another high profile police confrontation in 2014. When you look at that video, what goes through your head? Oh, I see another senseless killing. Gwen Carr is the mother of Eric Gardner, who died after police in New York placed him in a chokehold. And it's like a, a reoccurring nightmare. And this has to stop. Something has to be done. In fact, we're going to talk to a gentleman uh, who has volunteered to try and really help find the vaccine for COVID-19. Of course, finding that vaccine is a top priority. The government reporting now that there are 14 promising clinical trials. Norman Hume is taking part in one of those trials at Emory University. He's already received 
two doses of this investigative vaccine. There's a, a picture of him getting one of those doses. Uh, Norman, good morning to you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we should point out that Emory has, has actually teamed up with a biotech firm uh, named Moderna uh, for this trial. You've worked at Emory University for more than two decades. You jumped at the chance to be a part of this trial. Why? That's a great question. I mean, um, I've been there for 26 years and um, Back in March, um, I was sent home as non-essential, and um, like so many people, I wanted to help out. I mean, you look at the amazing work of first responders, uh, emergency room staff, and there I was at home. I mean, I was fortunate that I could uh, work from home, but I was also very fortunate that I could. Uh, I worked at Emory University, which has an amazing uh, record for um, public health, medicine, um, not only locally, but uh, at the global level. And so they're, they've got a big involvement in the COVID-19 vaccine, but it also goes back to um, uh, bringing the first Ebola patients uh, to Atlanta, as well as before that HIV and, and anthrax. So when I saw a notice to uh, sign up to be considered for a possible participant in the COVID-19 vaccine trial, I really just jumped at it. I thought it'd be like one very small thing that I could do um, that could maybe help out and I could do from home yeah. um, and do my little piece for moving forward in, in this terrible pandemic. I mean, we should point out that, that during the, this 14 month study, you're not going to be injected uh, with the actual virus. But but what did they how did they explain how this is going to work? And are you experiencing any side effects so far? No side effects at, at all. I've been very fortunate. And um, one of the motivators, of course, was that this is really cutting edge science. And it, it was, it's kind of cool how this is, like as you just mentioned, does not involve a traditional vaccine with the, um, the watered down actual virus itself. So this is really cutting edge. And we've all seen the, the ball, the, va- the virus with the spiky things. Well, the idea is to, um, to address the spiky things um, that have a specific protein, a spike protein, that it, once it enters your body, these will attach to your, your, your system. And so the idea is to train my body to look for just that one protein that the vaccine uses, uh, that the uh, virus uses to attach itself to me. So hopefully going forward, uh, this vaccine will um, work for you know, anyone who, who's ex- exposed to COVID. You also volunteered to be injected with the anthrax vaccine after <laughs> 9-11 as well. This is kind of your thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny story. So I grew up in a, a very scientific household. My dad um, had a Ph.D. in clinical pharmacology. My, my mom was, uh, had an advanced degree in chemistry. And so when we were growing up, we were constantly told to wash our hands and cover our mouth when we coughed or sneezed and, you know, and so um, he actually designed and managed the first drug trials for the F- first ever um, FDA uh, approved oral treatment for endometriosis. And I mean, he would even bring his work home. So when I, I remember when I was like uh, eight or nine years old, he brought home, uh, he was working on a project for ch- children's chewable uh, aspirin. And so he brought home these different variations with different slight, different flavors of orange flavored aspirin. So he sat me down on the dining room table, pulled out his clipboard and said, okay, I want you to Eat, chew each one of these, and then rank them in, in your preference of, of favorites. So, I mean, they're all they were all terrible. But I, I, you know, I just had a great admiration for really the process of yeah. science, and hopefully, you know, moving better for better health care for, for everyone. Well, Norman, we we're thankful for you. Thank you for your service. Good luck. Keep us posted as well. We want to check in with you periodically. We'll do. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Graduation ceremonies might be canceled, but the stars are coming together to celebrate America's graduates with a commencement speech by President Barack Obama, Class of 2020. Let's graduate together tomorrow at 8 on NBC News Now.
fallout from those holiday weekend crowds and serious concern over a fresh wave of coronavirus infections. This as the national death toll approaches a staggering 100,000. USA Today putting a face on the devastating loss. This jam-packed pool party in Missouri prompting health officials in St. Louis County to issue a travel alert and a 14-day self-quarantine order for anyone who was there. Overnight, the owner of the bar where the event took place posting a message to Facebook, saying in part that he stands by his decision to host the party and that no laws were broken. That post also referencing an earlier statement from the local sheriff, saying it is the right and responsibility of each individual to make decisions about going out. Tyler Cranker was at that party and plans to take a COVID test today. I don't think personally that I will get really sick. But if I do, I have to live with the consequences of my actions. Now with more Americans being tested, the number of new coronavirus cases is climbing in several states. And in Alabama, the situation is getting worse. 80% of our deaths have taken place uh, just in this month alone. The governor in Arkansas says they're experiencing a dangerous second peak, while in New Rochelle, New York, the first city in the nation to be locked down is now slowly reopening. You have to start somewhere. Now is the time. I don't think it's the greatest thing because um, there's a lot of people that, you know, are sick. Across the country in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, up to 6,000 people a day will be tested for the virus. Nearby at a food processing plant, 153 employees have tested positive. But the nation is showing new signs of life. The New York Stock Exchange reopening with a limited number of traders on the floor and new safety restrictions, promising signs of progress amid larger gatherings of concern. the president's favorite social media megaphone, Twitter, for the first time, slapping a fact-check label on some of President Trump's tweets. Twitter responding to two Trump tweets that claim mail-in ballots will be substantially fraudulent. And there it is. You're looking at the American-made rocket and spacecraft that will return American astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle last flown nearly nine years ago. Today, with our partners at SpaceX, we mark a new first in NASA's storied history and usher in the commercial crew era of American spaceflight. At 4.33 Eastern Time this afternoon, two of NASA's finest, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken, will lift off from Pad 39A aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon 9 rocket. This will mark SpaceX's first flight with crew and the beginning of a new chapter in human spaceflight. Good afternoon and welcome to Kennedy Space Center. I'm Marie Lewis of NASA. And I'm Lauren Lyons, an engineer at SpaceX. And today we have special guest, retired astronaut Leland Melvin, who is here to provide a truly unique perspective on today's events. Maria and Lauren, thanks for having me here. And I am like so excited. I've got rocket fuel going through my veins. And you guys, I was out there 11 years ago on Pat 39A on STS-129. And this is really hollowed ground that we have here. And you think about the story legacy of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, and now this new era, SpaceX Crew Dragon. 
it's, a, it's an exciting, exciting time. Yeah, it's going to be awesome, and we're so excited to have you here uh, to go through it with us. We want to talk first, though, about the weather because that's the big story of the day right now, the headline. And teams from NASA and SpaceX are keeping an eye on the weather here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Meteorologists from the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron are predicting a 50-50 probability for launch, so keeping things exciting. A rain shower passed through the area just a moment before the start of our coverage, which delayed us by just a few minutes, and which is why we are indoors now. That weather is expected to pass, but teams will continue to monitor our flight rules, including flight through precipitation, as well as anvil and cumulus clouds around the launch pad. Teams look at more than just the weather around Kennedy, but also weather and sea states in the flight path of Crew Dragon. That's really important. All of those need to be favorable before launch. Now, Tropical Storm Bertha has been causing some weather that teams will continue to monitor to make sure it's okay for a rescue operations just in case that's needed. And the team will convene shortly to review the latest weather and wind trends around the flight path of the rocket and make a decision about proceeding. Now, if all is go, we will be tracking a 4.33 p.m. Eastern launch for the return of human spaceflight to the International Space Station from U.S. soil. And the team also will take another look at weather prior to propellant loading, which is scheduled to happen about 45 minutes prior to launch if we do, in fact, proceed. And we have teams all over the country covering the action from SpaceX headquarters in California, Mission Control in Houston, our social media desk in Washington, of course, right here in Florida. Today's mission marks Crew Dragon's second test flight and its first test with humans on board. We're about, uh, let's see, four hours and nine minutes away from liftoff, and Bob and Doug finished their lunch just recently, and now they're going through their final medical checks before NASA turns them over to the SpaceX team. Once the crew is handed over, there are a series of key milestones that the teams will need to complete as we count down to T0. The first one is suit up. The suit-up room is located in NASA's Operations and Checkout Building, or the ONC Building, as we'll sometimes refer to it today. This is where the SpaceX team will help astronauts put on their suits in preparation for their journey to the launch pad. From there, next up is what we call crew walkout. Once their suits, up, once suit-up is complete, the astronauts will leave the ONC for final goodbyes with friends and family that are gathered outside of the facility before they head out to pad 39A. And following final goodbyes, the crew will get in their Tesla and begin the roughly 20-minute drive to pad 39A. Now, once at the pad, the crew will ascend the fixed service structure in order to board the spacecraft in a process we call ingress. During ingress, the SpaceX team will run a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and vehicle interactions all are functioning properly. And after all vehicle and crew checkouts are completed, the SpaceX closeout team will close Dragon's Hatch with Bob and Doug safely inside. About 40 minutes before launch, the crew access arm, which is the long walkway that the astronauts use to board Dragon, it'll retract away, followed shortly thereafter by arming of the launch escape system. Once the arm is retracted and the escape system armed, propellant loading on Falcon 9 will begin. About five minutes before liftoff, Dragon will be configured for what we call terminal count. This is where Dragon's onboard computers take control of the vehicle. And at T0, just under four hours from now, we expect to see Crew Dragon atop Falcon 9 lift off from pad 39A, carrying astronauts Bob Banken and Doug Hurley. Roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from the Falcon 9 second stage, with Dragon officially taking over full responsibility for the remainder of the journey to the space station. And as I mentioned previously, Bob and Doug are just finishing up their launch, and we are currently awaiting their arrival to the suit-up room. And while we await that moment, you will notice over the course of this broadcast, we do not have crowds gathered here at Kennedy Space Center. And that, of course, is one of the protocols we've taken to protect each other and our teams. We would normally have tens of thousands of guests here at Kennedy Space Center to view the launch. But even though we couldn't host a lot of people here, you can still join us every historic mission from right where you are. And we have a team dedicated to social media. That's NASA's Tahira Allen. And she is in Washington right now leading that effort. Tahira? to those of you following along. Thanks, Marie. And hey, everyone, I'm Tahira Allen, here to bring you all the excitement happening across the nation today. This is a big day for both NASA and SpaceX, and we want to share it with you. You can join the conversation online by using the hashtag LaunchAmerica on NASA's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We'll be monitoring that hashtag, LaunchAmerica, don't forget, 
all day to share some of your questions, comments, and photos live on air. There will also be multiple opportunities for you to engage in a few social media polls during today's live broadcast, so head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast your votes. While you're counting down to liftoff, be sure to check out our custom Launch America Facebook and Instagram augmented reality filters. I promise you will not be disappointed. They transport you right to our launch viewing site at Kennedy Space Center where you can literally see the Falcon 9 rocket lift off in a pair of sunglasses. If you're looking for some behind the scenes action, I highly recommend check out NASA's Facebook page to join the first ever global NASA social. So in this group, you'll find tours of Kennedy Space Center. You'll get this awesome Launch America badge. We even have some social team members in there making custom badges where you can add your face in it, a little, pers little personalized touch. And you'll also just find a really great community of others pumped to witness this historic launch. So like I said, head on over to NASA's Facebook page to join this group. So to get, you, get everyone started today, we have a question for you out on Twitter. We'd like to know which of you watched the final space shuttle launch in 2011. So like I said, head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast your vote because we'll be sharing the results live on air. And with that, let's head back to Lauren at NASA Kennedy. Lauren. Thanks, Tahira. Wherever you are in the world, we are super excited to have you joining us today and experiencing these historic moments. The purpose of today's demonstration mission is to put Crew Dragon through the final operational paces that are necessary to officially certify the vehicle for human spaceflight. Both the SpaceX and NASA teams have put years of development, testing, and training into this effort, and we are now just hours away from seeing Falcon 9, Crew Dragon, and Bob and Doug lift off from the first time from the same launch pad that first sent humans to the moon more than 50 years ago. And we're just about three miles from Launch Complex 39A, where liftoff will happen in a little over four hours. Let's check in with the team at SpaceX Hawthorne, where NASA's Dan Hewitt and SpaceX's Jesse Anderson are keeping an ear on operations. Hi, guys. Thanks, Murray. And hello from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name's Dan Hewitt. Really excited to be here today for this historic launch. And Dan, we are so excited to have you here with us. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX. We are so honored to be NASA's partner in returning humans to space from the shores of Kennedy Space Center. Ten years ago, we sent the Dragon that's displayed right behind us on its first orbital demonstration flight. And I speak for all of us at SpaceX when I say we could not be more excited to finally be sending humans to the International Space Station. It's a great day. Today's mission is known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. It's going to be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people to the space station. Demo 2 is an end-to-end -end flight test from launch all the way to docking and ending with splashdown. And it's the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. Right now, SpaceX and NASA have teams working together around the country. On the SpaceX side, team at the Cape are performing final launch day checkouts and they're just gonna make sure Dragon is healthy and good to go. At the moment of liftoff, we will transfer authority over Dragon from our firing room in Florida to Mission Control here in Hawthorne. Mission Control will have insight and command of Dragon systems for the entirety of this upcoming mission. Since Dragon is a highly autonomous vehicle, our teams in Mission Control will be continuously monitoring the health and performance of the spacecraft through the entire duration of its journey, from liftoff all the way until Dragon splashes back down on Earth. And while there are a number of people on headset in Mission Control right behind us, the mission, the mission director is the one in charge. It's also where the SpaceX core, which stands for Crew Operations Responsible Engineer, essentially the voice talking to the astronauts, is going to reside. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. SpaceX has successfully completed 22 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, and that includes 21 trips to the International Space Station. To get us where we are today, not only have we conducted thousands of t hours of testing, but we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. And one of those most important safety features on Crew Dragon is the launch escape system. 
system. It's a huge advancement in the safety of human spaceflight. We were able to demonstrate this system in two important tests, first back in May 2015 with the Padabor test, and then again more recently just last January where SpaceX conducted the in-flight abort test. Dragon's launch escape system is outfitted with eight Super Draco engines that are integrated directly into the spacecraft body. This enables Dragon to separate from Falcon 9 and carry astronauts to safety in case of an emergency on the launch pad or all the way up to orbit. In addition to the launch escape system, SpaceX has completed over 80 parachute tests, which include nearly 30 tests of just the upgraded Mark III parachutes flying on today's vehicle. And this is to ensure a safe landing back on Earth, even in the unlikely event that one of those four main parachutes fails. And let's not forget the significance of our first demonstration mission, which took place just last year. And that was also an end-to-end -end flight test to and from the International Space Station. Just no humans on board that time. For now, though, let's turn it over to SpaceX's principal integration engineer, John Innsbrucker, for our first status update. John? Hello from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. As Dan said, I'm John Innsbrucker, and I'll be bringing you status updates throughout the countdown. We're currently coming up at T minus four hours and counting for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon to the space station. Listening right now to see if we get a status brief on the countdown net while we wait for that. Point out the major event that get us to this point so far was the static fire of the Falcon 9. That was five days ago. We rolled the Falcon 9 with the Dragon capsule to the launch pad and static fire was performed on the 22nd. Launch director, captain, at four hour We're going to wait a minute, briefing. listen to the Keep launch director, today. brief. 20 hours, 33 minutes and 35 seconds. That is 4.33.35 p.m. Eastern. Still awaiting the final conjunction analysis report. The crew has just arrived in the suit-up room following the weather brief, and suit-up and leak checks are currently underway. Tracking no open issues at this time, though launch weather remains a watch item. Upper-level winds currently look acceptable for flight. We have no constraints performing uh, a section of this procedure. A reminder, we will use procedure 52.911, crew contingency procedures, for any required crew contingency actions. One final reminder for handover CNLD that at T minus an hour, we'll ask that any personnel not intending to be in the room during propellant load and launch will need to clear out subsequent 15 minutes. We'll look for all personnel to be in their seats, settled, and remaining in their position through ascent. Dragon separation at T plus 12 minutes and two seconds. Now over to CE for Falcon 9 help. Falcon 9 is in good health. Uh, COPVs are at pressure. AFDS checkouts are complete, and uh, we have a clean alarm board. We are proceeding down. No concerns on our end. No questions. Back to LD. Thank you, CE, and MD for Dragon Health. Good morning, LD. Dragon is healthy. We're not tracking any issues here for the countdown. Dragon has completed its prop tank pressurization and is in a good configuration for crew ingress. Uh, that's the next item that we'll be waiting for, and uh, no issues at this time. Thank you, MD. Next step with the crew, I uh, expect a walkout in about 45 minutes to begin the transport out to pad 39A. This concludes the countdown briefing. Thank you. John Insparker back with you again at the webcast desk. That was SpaceX Launch Director Mike Taylor giving the situational briefing at T minus four hours. Everything sounded well. You can see the Falcon 9 on the pad. As I mentioned, we static fired last week. The vehicle's been on the pad since then. We did the review of static fire. Everything looked good. Now we are getting ready for the crew ingress coming up, as uh, the launch director said, a little bit later this morning. Now, most recently, activity on the Dragon late load cargo was put on a couple of days ago. Now we're ready for the crew to come out to the pad, down the access arm, and load into the capsule. Now at the same time, we are also watching the weather. You heard the launch director talk about the weather brief we got 15 minutes ago. The tropical storm has begun moving onshore. That's actually improving conditions, both downrange in emergency splashdown locations if needed for Dragon, as well as at the launch site. We do expect though, the probability of violating conditions is still 60%. The concerns at liftoff are gonna be flight through precipitation, the thick cumulus crowds, 
and the possibility of violating the lightning rule. But right now, everything is still go, so with everything looking good from Hawthorne, we're going to send you down to Houston, where Gary Jordan is with the uh, flight Captain control team, team at NASA's Johnson Space Center the in the Mission Control, control Houston. Platform. How are the teams looking down there, Gary? Thanks, John, and welcome everyone to Mission Control Houston. Today, I'm joined remotely by NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. From this room, we've been supporting humans aboard the International Space Station for nearly 20 years, nonstop, every single day. Crews from all over the globe have visited the orbiting station, but it's been almost nine years since they started their journey into space from American shores. And while the teams here may appear subdued and focused, there's definitely an excitement around the entire center to be returning launch operations to America. Is. And our astronauts are thrilled to be taking a new spacecraft into orbit. This will be the new first for us, flying to space on a commercial vehicle, and the entire astronaut corps will be watching. As with every first flight of a system, there are still things to be learned and proven out, but we believe this crew and this system is ready. You know, many people think of mission control when they think of Johnson Space Center, but this center is also home to world-class training facilities and thought leaders in spacecraft development. We have drawn from both of these disciplines and spent the last three years alongside the SpaceX team to make sure the Crew Dragon is the best spacecraft possible and that the astronauts are prepared for every scenario. And this mission comes at a critical time for the space station with only three crew members currently aboard, among them NASA's Chris Cassidy as the lone American. Now I'm told uh, we just had the formal handoff of the crew from the NASA team that has supported Hurley and Bacon in their two-week quarantine over to the SpaceX team that'll get them suited up. There will be a lot of firsts today, including a new suit for the crew to use during launch and entry. The crew quarters at, Spa at Kennedy Space Center has supported human spaceflight for five decades, and now a new chapter is being written. And it's exciting to witness it here today. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Let's go back to the Kennedy Space Center to watch Suit Up in action as we continue to count down to launch. Leland. Hey, thanks, Gary. Hey, Marie, this is amazing. We're in the Suit Up room. I mean, I remember this back in 2009 when I was sitting in Lazy Boys from back in the Apollo era, but they have these really cool new suits and new seats that they're, they're working in here, so. Yeah, it's so amazing to see this first live look in the room. There's astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley sitting in those seats, um, being helped by the suit technicians. Uh, this room was first used for the first Apollo mission, Apollo 7, um, that they suited up in there in 1968. And there they are uh, giving a thumbs up. That looks like Doug giving a thumbs up there. Of course, um, Bob was mission specialist on STS-123 um, and STS-130. Bob's a native of St. Anne, Missouri, so I'm sure folks in his hometown are watching. Lots of hometown pride going on right now. And same for Doug. Um, he was born in Endicott, New York, which happens to be my hometown, too. Oh, wow. Um, hey. But he considers Apple Lake in his hometown, so I know folks are watching there. And Doug was the pilot on STS-127, STS-135, which was the final shuttle flight. Um, so it's so cool to see them in there. Uh, Lauren and Leland, last time this room was used for this purpose that you see here was STS-135 in 2011, and Doug Hurley was one of the astronauts in there doing that. So this is really amazing to see. Wow, so the suits are actually much more than just garments. They actually connect directly into Dragon seats. As you can see there, those GSC seats or ground support equipment seats are essentially replicas of the seats that are inside of the Dragon spacecraft. And the seats provide communications uh, as through an umbilical, umbilical, but also the ability to pressurize the suit if necessary. So right now what the, the suit team is doing is they're doing communications checks as well as a pressure check to make sure that the, the spacesuit can hold pressure in the event of a cabin depressurization emergency. This is the last time that we're going to do this check prior to the crew boarding Dragon where we'll do it all again. So the way that that leak check will work is we will provide or essentially inflate the suit with air and hold that pressure for a few minutes, watch the depressurization rate, and make sure that it stays within bounds. 
And as we stay looking in the suit up room, you can see Doug Hurley there in the seat. He is the spacecraft commander for Demo 2. And while he continues with checkouts, we want to give you a closer look at the veteran Marine Corps fighter pilot and spaceflight pioneer. Very excited. Yeah, very excited. You still ready? You still pumped? Oh yeah, I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo 2 test. He is a Marine Corps colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavour and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. When the engine shut off and you go from, in the case of the shuttle, you go from three Gs to zero Gs instantaneously and things start floating. And, and I remember distinctly just thinking what just happened. To see a rocket launch in person is, uh, it's a pretty emotional event. I remember the first time I saw a shuttle launch and it's just, it was amazing. And then when I saw a shuttle launch with my wife on it, that is, that is quite the emotional experience. My name is Doug Hurley and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo 2 mission to the International Space Station. We are doing the first crewed flight for NASA and for SpaceX. So this is the test flight to prove end-to-end -end from launch to docking to ISS operations and then entry, descent, and landing. This will be the first time the Dragon had a crew on board and so there's a a, a myriad of objectives we want to achieve for this mission. SpaceX has been responsible for design and, and, and essentially making this vehicle what it is. What the astronauts bring to the table is the crew vehicle interface. What would work on orbit, what might not work on orbit, what would definitely work to be able to just have the entire integrated uh, team that's going to support us getting to and from space station, talking together, working through the challenges that simulators typically uh, throw at you. It was really neat being part of it. It's just been an incredible undertaking to see where we've come just in the last five years that, that Bob and I have been a part of this and to be, you know, shortly uh, flying to the International Space Station with the Crew Dragon. It overwhelms you to think about how many people have in some way, shape, or form touched this program and this and this vehicle to get us to this point. And you know, we are the lucky ones that get to fly it, but we certainly not for one second take for granted the amount of effort that so many other people had to put into this to make it successful. For Doug personally, he's he's worked so hard, I mean through his entire life, um, to get to where we are right now. As a test pilot, this would be the dream to fly a new vehicle. So it makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream has come true for that. It's been a long road in a lot of ways for not only us, but certainly for all the folks that work in the commercial crew program, as well as SpaceX, in our case, just working to get to this point. It's been a huge amount of sacrifice and, and time away from home, but the fruits of our labor are, are coming to uh, fruition. We are now getting closer to when we expect to see the crew complete their suit, trek, suit checks and walk out of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. And before they do, here's an introduction to the Joint Operations Commander for Demo 2 and former Air Force flight test engineer, astronaut Bob Benkin.
when you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's gonna take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and you know we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to you know, collect the data. We hear a sound. Okay, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light. Is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavor twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. And there's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board you feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know and then somebody of course that's a family member it's even multiplied more. For me personally as a spouse watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years um, the dedication that he's shown the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, I'm helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this. Now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's, it's been several decades. Now we're in a time when we've got multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire commercial crew program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles in the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. And we're back live in the room now with Bob Bankin on the left of your screen, Doug Hurley to the right. 
Uh, this is such a cool site here, Leland. I, this must bring back a lot of memories for you. Maria, it really does. I mean, I you know, looking at these new suits and these new seats, it, it's a little different than what I experienced uh, 11 years ago. But it's all the same. The suit, the, uh, the suit techs, the people around you that have been with you, getting you ready for this mission. It's just uh, an amazing moment, and they're getting excited. You can see, you know, these military guys don't really get that excited. They don't show their excitement like uh, <laughs> civilians do. But, um, but it's again, it's a, it's a moment of history and uh, we're getting ready for this momentous occasion. Yeah, and we're, uh, it was pretty cool. We heard that earlier this morning they, they stepped outside with a cup of coffee in hand. Oh, we've got some, some visitors in the room now. It looks like uh, SpaceX founder Elon Musk uh, to the right of your screen and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Of course, you see a, a partition there to keep them a safe distance from the crew, but they're in there to say hello, wish them well uh, before they depart the suit-up room. That's really cool to see there, and, and we can't hear what they're saying, but uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in there right now. Lauren, I wonder what Elon is saying. Oh, just probably telling them how, how honored he is to, to be able to give them a ride today. And I know the NASA administrator, he talked about this yesterday. I mean, he's met with the crew uh, before today even and said, you know, I've told Bob and Doug, it's not too late to call this off <laughs> if you have any second thoughts. And of course, they, they had none. Um, they're super pumped about this, ready to go. And right now, it's just, you know, we just need the weather to cooperate. Yeah, I try to think who could potentially be more excited than the SpaceXers? Bob and Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And you know, it's amazing how we have commercial and in government working together to send these two NASA astronauts to space safely. It's just uh, it's a great combination of what we can do when we put our minds to things and be creative and innovative and work together as one community. I, I totally agree, Leland. Um, you know, I, I see Bob and Doug walking around our headquarters in Hawthorne all the time. They're basically family members. They, they're in the cafeteria. They're getting a drink from the soda machine. Um, every now and then, they, there are times when the, the teams can have breakfast with them, which is really cool. And uh, we call them the dads. <laughs> <laughs> the dads. <laughs> they're well, they are dads. It's they fitting. are. And they're incredible human beings. They, they really are. They're, they're brilliant. They're, they're sharp. They are excellent to work with, but they're just great people. Yeah. No, I, I'm really um, inspired and honored to have known these two guys, and I, I can't wait to see them launch in space. And I was with you, uh, Lauren, out at SpaceX when we were doing a little tour, and I think you kind of snuck me back in to where they were training, and I got the chance to see them working and training. But when they came back out, I was having lunch, and everyone around was just like, hey, these are our team also. Yes, yeah. yes. It's really amazing. And Lauren, you said, I mean, you talked about what they're like, and they are just two of the most humble people, too. I mean, any every time I've seen them do an interview, they and, you know, they're they're getting asked questions about themselves. Right. Because they're the stars of the show. Um, right. They're the ones getting on the rocket. But they always bring it back to the people who made it possible for them. They're right. always talking about the, the NASA team, the SpaceX team working behind the scenes that have sacrificed so much to keep them safe and made sure that they are always vigilant. Um, and, and I know we've talked about this before too, but you know, if you're not looking for something wrong, you're not doing it right. So the, the teams, even now, they're always looking for any little thing that could go wrong to make sure that Bob and Doug are safe when they strap in and get going. Absolutely. Uh, around the office, we don't just say, oh, we're launching a rocket, we're, dro we're launching Dragon. We say, we're launching Bob and Doug. And that human element of this is essentially leveling SpaceX up in a major way today. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, all the technology, all the hardware means nothing if it's all about the people. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we see just a handful of folks in the room and we've acknowledged the, the distance that uh, Mr. Musk and Mr. Bridenstine are standing from the astronauts. And they, of course, they have masks on. This wouldn't really look that much different, though, even if we were not in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, Leland, you know very well how what it's like to live in quarantine, getting ready for a mission. And so this this coronavirus situation has just kind of underscored the importance of quarantine and keeping the astronauts protected. But can you speak a little bit about uh, what it's like to live in quarantine, getting ready for a mission? Yeah, we started in quarantine about a week before, you know, before we come down to the Cape to get ready for launch. And I think that everyone around you that comes to the crew dinners, they have to get checked by the doctors. And so we really make this a very serious thing, even without a, a camp pandemic going on. But I think once we get down here, like we have these, 
crew parties for our families and you know we can't go to the parties we have to FaceTime into the parties but you know that's a very serious thing and we only see our our, our spouses at the at the beach house and have a dinner and, and, and celebrate this momentous moment but it's uh, it's a very serious thing even without pandemics going on absolutely and obviously Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin are two of the best at what they do and it's starting to really sink in that the mission is on as you see them in their suits there it's getting real it's getting <laughs> real <laughs> So I remember the very first time that I saw Bob and Doug in these suits at a crew training event at SpaceX. Not only did they look really awesome, you know, astronauts tend to look pretty cool, um, but the suits looked like they were from the future. Um, our team designed the spacesuits to maximize safety and functionality with a little bit of style. And so here's Chris Trigg telling us how the SpaceX spacesuit came to be. I think one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, something that the crew just has to literally plug in when they sit down and then the, the suit kind of takes care of itself from there. So the suit is really kind of one part of the bigger Dragon system. It's really part of the vehicle. So um, we think of it as kind of a suit seat system. So the seat that the crew is in and the suit are in a lot of ways working together. And so it made sense that we were designing Dragon in-house to also design the suit. Our spacesuit is completely designed in-house. It's sealed here in Hawthorne, California, in the same building as the rocket and the capsule. The spacesuit is uh, custom made for each crew member, and that is to optimize the fit for the crew member. We definitely wanted to innovate and we wanted it to look inspiring, but first and foremost, we wanted it to be, be safe and reliable. The spacesuit's primary purpose is to protect the crew in the unlikely event that the cabin were to depressurize. But the suit does a number of additional things. It provides cooling and communication to the crew inside of the suit, it provides them hearing protection, and the outer layer of the suit is flame resistant, so it provides flame protection as well. When the crew gets in the capsule, they get in their seats and they plug the suit into the umbilical that's attached to the seat. And the umbilical is providing everything that the suit needs. So it provides um, the avionics or electronics for communications, it's providing the air to cool the suit, and then it also provides gas when needed to pressurize the suit. So it's really a single point that lets the suit do all the things that it needs to do. We designed the helmet in-house. The helmet serves a number of different functions. Obviously, it's protecting the crew's head and it's retaining gas like the rest of the suit, but it also houses the microphones as well as the valves that are uh, regulating pressure in the suit. We had to design the gloves so that they would work with the touchscreen, but the gloves also still had to do a number of other things like the rest of the suit. So all of those things had to come together uh, within the glove. It'll be obviously really amazing to see Bob and Doug in their flight suits. and. I think one of the things that's cool about the suit is it's not just a piece of hardware, it's not just a suit, it's a very personal thing. It's Bob's suit and it's Doug's suit. And so seeing the two of them in their, in their suits, using it in flight will be just a, a really amazing thing. Hey, now that you've had a look at the development of the spacesuit, we thought it'd be pretty cool to show you where our astronauts train to be able to fly on board Dragon. Yesterday, Dan and I had a chance to spend some time in our crew training facility here in Hawthorne. So let's take a look. So we are up in the crew training area. This is right where Bob and Doug have been training over the last several months and even years to get ready for this flight. There's a couple of things in the room that we're going to show you real quick. We're going to start off with the cockpit simulator. Now there are four seats inside of Dragon the way it's configured. The two in the middle or where the commander and the pilot's seat. So this is the commander's seat. This is where Doug Hurley is for this flight. And this is the pilot's seat. This is where Bob Bankin is. Once they're in their suits, they can plug them into the seats. They get communications, breathing air, pressurized gas for the suits themselves. Everything just integrated into Dragon systems. But most importantly, right in front of them, we have this set of three displays. And these are the touchscreen displays that give them access to Dragon. This is their window into their spacecraft. They're able to see all of the different systems. They're able to take control of Dragon. They're able to see where they are over the Earth or in relation to the space station. They're able to see even when thrusters are firing. Or, and if you keep your eye on... Budget Director of the State of New York. We're at the National Press Club today. It's a great organization, great part of Washington's uh, history and the legacy, and I want to thank Michael Friedman very much, who is the president of the National Press Club. Thank him for his hospitality and courtesy for having us here today. We are in Washington. I spent eight years in Washington during the Clinton administration. 
the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, came down at the beginning of the Clinton administration, stayed until the end, lived in Virginia. That's where I got my southern accent, really southern Queens, but, uh, and uh, we had good discussions today, and we'll be heading back, but we wanted to do our briefing from Washington so it was timely. And let's talk about some facts as to where we are. Number of hospitalizations in New York are dropping. The total change in hospitalizations is down and continuing to drop. The intubations are down, and that's a very good sign. Uh, it's rare that good things happen after an intubation. And the number of new cases is down, which is very encouraging news. These are the number of new cases that are walking through the door. In terms of number of New Yorkers that we have lost, 74 yesterday, uh, which is just about what it was the day before, which is uh, yesterday, the day before was an all-time low at 73. Uh, 74 is not as good as 73, but it is all headed in the right direction. Uh, again, only in this time of crisis would 74 deaths be uh, anything less than truly tragic news, but when you've gone through what we have gone through, um, it's, it's a sign that we're headed in the right direction. And we are, when you look at the curve in the state of New York, uh, we are down, we're on the other side of the mountain, as we say, and the decline is continuing. That's different than what we're seeing in some other parts of the nation, where you see the, na the curve either going up uh, or uh, just starting to flatten. So uh, we're pleased with the progress that we're making in New York, and we're ready to go to the next phase, open a new chapter. Memorial Day is often a time when uh, society transitions. Memorial Day, normally we're getting ready for the summer, and people are starting to think about summer vacations and summer activity. Uh, we have that on a moderated basis in New York, but it's also a time of transition for us, and we're transitioning to a new chapter on reopening, restarting the economy. Uh, this is all a situation that has never happened before, so this is a first case for all of us. And we're trying to learn as we go along, and we don't want to just reopen the economy, we want to have a really smart reopening. We want to watch those numbers as we go forward. And we want to reopen the economy to make it stronger than it ever was before. How do you learn from this? And that's the beginning of the new chapter that we're going to write. We started yesterday by reopening the stock exchange in New York, uh, where the stock exchange was actually had, had uh, people in the building rather than just electronically. Uh, we're doing it on the numbers. Numbers matter. Uh, this is not about politics. This is about science, right? We're fighting a virus. The virus is not a Democratic virus. It's not a Republican virus. It's a virus. And viruses respond to science. And science is about facts and about numbers. And that's how we're doing it. We're doing it on the metrics. We're looking at the hospitalization rate. We're looking at the death rate. Uh, how many new people are coming in the door into hospitals? How many hospital beds do we have available? How many ICU beds do we have available? Uh, do we have testing in place? And do we have tracing in place? Just take the politics out of it, right? Just do it on the facts and do it on the science. And that's what we're doing in New York. And then. Uh, you wouldn't reopen everything immediately. You would do it in phases, and you would phase it by the most important businesses, the most essential businesses that pose the lowest risk first, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and we then have several phases for the actual uh, business openings. Uh, but we're in Washington, and the the parameter is what should states be doing and what should the federal government be doing. I understand that states are responsible for the reopening. Uh, that's been the position of the states. It's also been the position of the federal government. 
So states are doing re reopening, states are responsible for testing, states are responsible for tracing, states are responsible for the healthcare system, states are responsible for the enforcement of uh, all the procedures around reopening. But at the same time, the federal government has a role to play, and the federal government has to do its part as we work our way through this crisis. And there cannot be a national recovery if the state and local governments are not funded. That is a fact. Uh, Washington is now debating their next bill that would aid in the reopening and the recovery. Prior bills have helped businesses, large businesses, small businesses, uh, hotels, airlines, all sorts of business interests. That's great. Uh, but you also have state and local governments, and state governments do things like fund schools and fund hospitals. Do you really want to cut schools now? Do you really want to cut hospitals now? After what we've just gone through, when we're talking about a possible second wave, when we're talking about a fall with possible more cases, do you really think we should starve state governments and cut hospitals? Would that be smart? Do you really want to cut local governments right now? That's cutting police, that's cutting fire. Is now the time to savage essential services? And don't you realize that if you do this, if you cut state and local governments and you cause chaos on the state and local level, how does that help a nation striving to recover economically. The COVID states, the states that, that bore the brunt of the COVID virus, they're one third of the national GDP. How can you tell one, heck of, one third of the country to go to heck and then think you're going to see an economic rebound? Also, state governments, state economies, local economies, that's what the national economy is made of. What is the national economy but for a function of the states? There is no nation without the states. Uh, they tend to forget that in this town, but it's the obvious fact. And we've made this mistake before. Again, look at history. If you don't learn from the mistakes, you're going to repeat the mistakes. It's that simple. And we have seen in the past what has happened when state and local governments were savaged and how it hurt the national recovery. Wall Street Journal, not exactly a liberal publication, makes the point that on the economy, cuts to employment and spending likely to weigh on growth for years. So even if, even if you believe the rhetoric, we're about reopening, we're about getting the economy back, great. Then if that's what you believe, you would provide funding to the state and local governments. The Federal Reserve Chairman Powell, very smart man, respected on both sides of the aisle, said, we have evidence the global financial crisis in the years afterwards where state and local government layoffs and lack of hiring weighed on economic growth. We want to reopen the economy. We want to get this national economy better than ever. Fine. Then act accordingly and act appropriately. This hyper-partisan Washington environment is toxic for this country. You have people saying, well, we don't want to pass a bill that helps democratic states. It would be a blue state bailout, is what some have said. Senator McConnell, stopping blue state bailouts. Senator Scott, we're supposed to go bail them out? That's not right. On Fox TV, Laffer, you want us to give our money to Cuomo in New York? Hello, not this week. First of all, this is really an ugly, 
ugly sentiment. It is an un-American response. We're still the United States of America. Those words meant something. United States of America. First of all, Mr. Federal Legislator, you're nothing without the states, and you represent the United States. Not only is it ugly, it is false. It is wholly untrue what they are saying. 100%. And there are facts. If you want to pose the question, which is, I think, uh, divisive at this period of time, but if you want to pose the question, what states give money and what states take money, right? There is a, there are, there is a financial equation that is the federal government. And you want to, if you want to ask what states give money to other states and what states take money from other states, that's a question that Senator McConnell and Senator Scott uh, and Mr. Laffer don't really want to ask. Because the truth, the truth is totally the opposite of what they're saying. You look at the states that give more money to the federal government than they get back. You know the top, what they call donor state? You know what one state pays in more to the pot than they take out of the federal pot than any other state in the United States? It's the state of New York. New York pays more every year, $29 billion more than they take back. You know the second state? New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, California. Every year, they contribute more to the federal pot. You know who takes out more than they put in from that pot? You know whose hand goes in deeper and takes out more than they put in? Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, Alabama, Florida. Those are the facts. Those are the numbers. The great irony is the conservatives want to argue against redistribution of wealth. Why should you take money from the rich and give it to the poor? That's exactly what you are doing. That is exactly what you have done every year. So it's only redistribution unless you wind up getting more money. Then it's fine. Then it's not redistribution. Take from the rich, give to the poor. That's redistribution. Yes, unless you're the poor. Senator McConnell, Senator Scott, because you are the ones who have your hand out. You are the ones who are taking more than others. Redistribution, you're against it. Except when the richer states give you more money every year. And then the great hypocrisy. They actually made the redistribution worse. When they passed three years ago a provision ending what's called state and local tax deductibility, that didn't level the playing field. What they did was they took the states that were already paying more money into the federal government, the quote unquote richer states, and they increased the money they were taking from the richer states. They took another 23 billion from California, another $14 billion from New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Illinois, Connecticut. The hypocrisy is so insulting because when you start to talk about numbers, there are still facts. And people can still add, and people can still subtract, and they know what they put in, and they know what they take out. And I know it's Washington, D.C., but the truth actually still matters. 
And Americans are smart. And they find out the truth, even in the fog and the blather of Washington, D.C. So my point to our friends in the Congress, stop abusing New York. Stop abusing New Jersey. Stop abusing Massachusetts and Illinois and Michigan and Pennsylvania. Stop abusing the states who bore the brunt of the COVID virus through no fault of their own. Why did New York have so many cases? It's nothing about New York. It's because the virus came from Europe and no one in this nation told us. We were told the virus is coming from China. It's coming from China. Look to the West. Yeah, well, they missed it. We were looking to the West. It came from the East. The virus left China, went to Europe. Three million Europeans come to New York, land in our airports, January, February, March, and bring the virus. And nobody knew. It was not New York's job. We don't do international global health. It didn't come from China. It came from Europe. And we bore the brunt of it. And now, you want to hold that against us? Because we bore the brunt of a national mistake? And because we had more people die, we lost more lives? You want to now double the insult and the injury by saying, well, why should we help those states? Those states had more COVID deaths. That's why you're supposed to help those states. Because they did have more COVID deaths. And this is the United States. And when one state has a problem, the other states help. I was in the federal government for eight years. When Los Angeles had earthquakes, we helped. When the Midwest had the Red River floods, we helped. When Florida had Hurricane Andrew, we helped. When Texas had floods, we helped. When Louisiana had Hurricane Katrina, we helped. We didn't say, well, that's Louisiana's fault. They had the hurricane. Well, that's Texas's fault. They had the floods. It was nobody's fault. And we were there to help because that's who we are. And that's what we believe. What happened to that American spirit? What happened to that concept of mutuality? You know, there is still, there is still a simple premise that you can't find in a book and Washington hasn't written regulations for called doing the right thing. There's still a right thing in life. The right thing you feel inside you. The right thing is a, is a calibration of your principle and your belief and your soul and your heart and your spirit. And we do the right thing in this country. Not because a law says do the right thing, but because we believe in doing the right thing. As individuals, as people, we believe doing right by each other, by living your life by a code where you believe you are living it in an honorable way, acting on principle, and you're doing the right thing. Why can't the government, why can't the Congress reflect the right thing principle that Americans live their life by. Pass a piece of legislation that is honorable and decent and does the right thing for all Americans. Why is that so hard? And if you want to talk about reopening the economy, then do it in a productive way. People think this economy is just going to bounce back. I don't think it's going to bounce back. I think it's going to bounce back for some, and I think there's going to be collateral damage of others. We already know 
that tens of thousands of small businesses closed and probably won't come back. We already know that the large corporations are going to lay off thousands and thousands of workers, and they're going to use this pandemic as an excuse to get lean, to restructure, and they're going to boost their profits by reducing their payroll. We know it. We've been there before. We saw this in the 2008 mortgage crisis, where the government bailed them out, the big banks that created the problem, and they used the money to pay themselves bonuses and they laid off their workers. They're going to do the same thing again. That's why I propose the Americans First legislation that said a corporation can't get a dime of government bailout unless they rehire the same number of workers they had pre-pandemic as post. Don't take a gift from the taxpayer and then lay off Americans who are going to then file for uninsurance paid for by the taxpayers. Don't do that again. And if you want to be smart, we know that there's work to do in this nation. We've known it for years. You can fill a library with a number of books on the infrastructure and the decay of our infrastructure and how many roads and bridges have to be repaired how this nation is grossly outpaced by nations across the world in terms of infrastructure and airports and development. Now is the time to stimulate the economy by doing that construction and doing that growth. You want to supercharge the reopening? That's how you do it. Then this nation was smart enough to do it before. We did it in the midst of the Great Depression. We created 8 million jobs. We built an infrastructure that we're still living on today. We're still living on the infrastructure built by our grandparents, not even our parents. What are we going to leave our children? And now is the time to do it. We have major infrastructure projects in New York that are ready to go, that are desperately needed, that were desperately needed 30 years ago. Build them now. Supercharge the reopening, grow the economy. That's what we would do if we were smart. You're not going to have a supercharged economy. You're not going to see this nation get up and start running again unless we do it together that states working with other states, that's a federal government that stands up and puts everything else aside. They were elected to provide good government. Nobody elected anyone to engage in partisan politics. There was a time when as a nation we were smart enough to say, you want to play politics? That's what a campaign is for. Run your campaign against your opponent, say all sorts of crazy things. That's crazy campaign time. But when government starts, stop the politics and do what's right and smart. Don't play your politics at the expense of the citizens you represent. There is no good government concept anymore. It's politics 365 days a year. From the moment they're elected to the moment they run again, it's all politics. And that is poison. We have to get to a point, if only for a moment, if only for a moment, if only for a moment in response to a national crisis, where we say it's not red and blue. It's red, white, and blue. It's the United States. And we're going to act that way. In New York, we say that by saying New York tough, but it's America tough, which is smart and united and disciplined and loving and loving. That's what makes America, America. Thank you for having me. Any questions? Uh, welcome to Washington. Uh, you met with the president, obviously, and I was wondering, you were talking about stopping the politics. There are obviously a lot of political issues between you and the president. 
in particular the Gateway Project or New Yorkers on Trusted Traveler. I was wondering if you spoke about that and what his reaction was to what you originally classified as politically motivated uh, actions. Yeah, there are political differences between myself and the president. Uh, he'll say it, I will say it. Uh, I don't even need to say it. You can go do a Google search and you can find 400 nasty tweets about political differences between myself and the president. Uh, I said to the president when this started, forget all that. We'll have political differences and there'll be a time to wear our political differences. Not now. This is about getting things done for the country and getting things done for New York. And uh, I have stayed 100 miles away from any political anything all through this. Personally, I went to great lengths to say to the people of my state, I'm not, I have no political agenda. Personally, I have no political agenda. I'm not running for anything else. I'm not going anywhere. I don't want to go to Washington. There's no personal agenda that you have to worry about and calibrate. Well, is he doing what's right or is he doing what's right for him? Does he have a self-interest? I have no interest. I'm doing nothing. I'm governor of New York. That's all I'm doing. Uh, just to take the politics out of it. I said to the president when this started, put the political stuff aside. Let's just figure out what we have to do, which is a heck of a mandate since nobody's ever done it before, and let's do it. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. At the meeting we just had, uh, it was in the, the same way. It was not about politics. Uh, it was not about any of that. It was about what, how do we supercharge the reopening, especially in New York, which has been hardest hit. How do we take some of these big infrastructure projects that have been sitting around for a long time, which if we were all smarter and better, we would have done 30 years ago, and actually get them up and running because we have to do this work anyway and because we need the jobs now uh, more than ever. The Cross Harbor tunnels, uh, not to get in the weeds, the Gateway Project is a larger project. It's a $30 billion project, has many different components. The essence of the project are two tunnels that go across the Hudson River that carry Amtrak trains, by the way. Federal government owns Amtrak. State has nothing to do with Amtrak. Uh, and these Amtrak trains come in through New York and serve the entire Northeast. And the trains go through two tunnels. Those two tunnels are old, they're dilapidate, dilapidated. If there's a problem in those tunnels, you stop train service to the entire Northeast United States. It would be devastating for the nation because while, while in Washington we have this fragmented view of the country, either the national economy works or none of it works. You cut out the Northeast. You're cutting your nose to spite your face. So those tunnels have to be replaced. Amtrak, federally owned, has a proposal to build two new tunnels so there's additional capacity. That's a project that New York and New Jersey said we'll pay 50% of just to be good partners. Uh, there's a project called the Second Avenue Subway in New York, which goes up Second Avenue, uh, hence the Second Avenue Subway. And uh, it's, it's uh, pending federal approval, and we could start building on that immediately. There's also a project which is the air train, which goes from LaGuardia Airport, where we're building a new airport, to Manhattan. That would cut down traffic, congestion. It would be a great advancement. People have been talking about that for 30 years. And it's pending an environmental review by the federal DOT. And uh, I asked if that could be accelerated uh, because we've already done an environmental review and nobody's more environmentally sensitive than our government. Uh, but can we get the bureaucracy to move faster so we can get that project done? And it was a good conversation. You know, the president is from New York, so he has a context for all the things we're talking about. Uh, I think the president also acknowledges and realizes that uh, New York, we're very uh, aggressive about getting these projects done and getting them done on time. This is not the typical government project. We actually get these things done. We're building the first new airport at LaGuardia in 25 years in this country. Uh, we built the largest infrastructure project in the United States, uh, which was a bridge that went across the Hudson River. 
now named the Mario Cuomo Bridge. It was the largest infrastructure project in the United States. We got it done on time, on budget. So if he gives us the green light, this is not going to be years of discussion. Uh, I have a shovel in the trunk of my car. We'll start this afternoon, right? So uh, it was a good discussion. He understood what we were talking about, understood what we need. And uh, he's going to be thinking about it, talk to his team. And he said, we'll talk next week. Trusted Traveler Program did not come up. Trusted Tra Traveler Program, uh, I believe, was arbitrary by the federal government. I believe it was uh, uh, actually retaliatory by uh, Department of Homeland Security. They want access to our driver's license data to give to ICE for purposes of deportation. Uh, we said we wouldn't give it to them. We would give it to the FBI for law enforcement, but not for deportation. And uh, they then turned around and ended this trusted traveler program, which is the exact opposite. These are people who get high level security clearance. So you don't have to stop at the border uh, check when you come in at an airport, you just show your card. It eases the burden at the airport. It's better for the officials at the airport. Uh, and the people who sit with uh, Homeland Security and give all the documentation and get this special clearance. But uh, they ended that, I believe, in retaliation. And uh, that's nowhere. You want to add something? Yeah, one thing I will say about the Trusted Traveler Program is that during this year's budget at the end of March, to the extent that there was a bona fide concern with federal access to the DMV database, specifically for those subset of people that the governor described who are applying to be a part of the Trusted Traveler Program, who are doing the sit-down interview, who are providing all of this documentation, we address that in the budget, and now the federal government actually does have access to the database for that specific purpose. So if that was really the reason that they were cutting us out of the Trouble Travel Trusted Traveler Program, I don't believe that that is a bona fide reason anymore, and I know it's currently in litigation, um, but it's something our council's office is discussing with them. Sir? Governor Cuomo, on the issue of state and local governments, uh, the House Pass Heroes Act did include some funding to address that issue. Uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're held up in the Republican-controlled Senate. I'm just curious your message on that to Republicans. I know you went over that a little bit, but can you expand on that? And then number two, uh, have you brought this up with President Trump, and what was the meeting like in terms of, uh, you know, the aid for state and local governments? Yeah. Look, uh, as I said, I was in Washington for eight years. I understand the politics, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've seen it. I get it. Uh, you're right. The House bill has funding for state and local government. Uh, and you heard my comments. I know what the Republican senators are saying. And first of all, it's a lie. It's a lie. I know that's a strong word. It's a lie. But it's, they're lying. When Senator McConnell says, uh, and Senator Scott says, and uh, Laffer says, why should we give New York, California more money? That's a lie. They know that they take more money. Senator McConnell has his hand out in the Senate. And he receives more money for his state than he puts in. He raised this topic, not me. He made it personal, not me. I represent the people of the state of New York. That's what I get paid to do. When he makes it personal to New York, when they make it personal to New York, and they're lying, I'm going to point it out. They get more money every year. Why should my state give a handout to Senator McConnell every year? Why should my state give a handout to Senator Scott every year? Why do they have their handout every year? They're against redistribution of wealth. That's what they'll all say. I'm against redistribution. <laughs> yeah, you're against redistribution unless you're taking money. Then it's fine. It's not redistribution when you're taking money. Yeah, I know how convenient that is, right? Second of all, second of all they say, 
why should we give states money to deal with COVID? What? Why should we give states money to deal with COVID? Why not? What better, what better national purpose? We're in the middle of a national pandemic. It's a global pandemic. You want to get the economy up and running. Take your blinders off, man. It's not just about your state. What, are you going to get the national economy running without New York, without California, without Illinois, without Connecticut, without Jersey? That, you're going to get the national economy running like that? Just your state, Senator? It makes no sense. And then in terms of spirit and principle and doing the right thing, if there was one time when that Congress actually acted like it represented the country, it was in times of an emergency. That's the one time you would see them come together and pass a bill and do it quickly. It was like, okay, no politics because this is an emergency. It's Hurricane Katrina. No politics. It's flooding in Texas. No politics. It's Midwest floods. Pass an emergency bill. No politics. You're talking about people's lives here. You're talking about states and neighbors who need real help. They lost their homes. No politics. Even now, even now, 100,000 people dead in this nation, you're going to play politics? For the House members, they did pass a bill that has state and local funding and has this repeal of SALT in it. If I am a congressperson from New York, I do not go home unless I have funding for New York State. I do not pass a bill that does not fund New York State and does not repeal SALT. If I'm a congressperson from California, I do not go home to California unless I have funding for California and I repeal SALT. If I'm a congressperson from Massachusetts, I'm not going home and standing up in front of my people who elected me, and I'm running for re-election, by the way, this year. If I'm Congressman R Richard Neal from Massachusetts, I'm not standing before my people, having passed the bill that didn't help them. If the California House members can't vote for it, and the Illinois House members can't vote for it, and the New York members can't vote for it, and Jersey can't vote for it, and Massachusetts can't vote for it, and Connecticut can't vote for it, they can't pass a bill. And if Washington doesn't pass a bill, I would say to all of them, don't bother going home, because you will not see a reopening that you expect. Uh, you will see a fizzle of an economic rebirth, and you will have really done a disservice to the fundamental premise of your office. Young lady. Thank you, Governor. Um, some of the projects that you mentioned mainly are in New York City. Granted, they have regional impact, but were there any other statewide projects from other regions, Long Island, upstate, that you brought to the president's attention? No, I didn't want to give him too long a list. I didn't want to seem too aggressive. I didn't want to seem like a for the other people in the room that he could, they could dismiss me as a quintessential New Yorker. Look how much he's asking for. He's asking for too much. So I kept it very limited. Was it because he's a New Yorker that you brought forward this project, maybe he's more familiar with Yeah, and these projects are regional in nature. You know, the, uh, what they call the uh, Cross Hudson Tunnels? That's not even New York. That's the whole Northeast. That's what's funny about these tunnels. It's, there are not, these are not New York trains. They go from New Jersey to New York. They carry Amtrak trains. Uh, we don't have any trains that go through those tunnels. It's important for the whole Northeast because that is the main train route. And if that goes down, you don't have any Amtrak service to the whole Northeast corridor. Yes. Uh, in New York, President Trump 
at least CDC guidelines. I'm wondering if you raised that issue with him today. Uh, no, but I never did that. I never did that. You said that anyone asking about nursing home deaths um, in New York and the state's policy should ask President Trump. No, what I said was this, yes. I said they want to play politics with this, right? And there are Republicans who are uh, trying to make political hay out of this, in my opinion. And what I said to the Republicans who were making this accusation, you have to find an accusation for it to work politically that you can make against a Democrat that is not a boomerang and comes back and affects the Republicans. The, on the nursing homes, the issue they raised, our State Department of Health followed the same guideline as the CDC, which is a federal agency issued. Uh, so it was my way of saying, thwarting the political attack, because you can't say, oh, bad Democrat. It's an issue that a Republican administration took the same position, which is guidance from the CDC and our State Department of Health. Uh, both of them said you can't discriminate against a COVID, a patient based on COVID. That's what they both said. Uh, but that was just on that specific. Uh, in general, you look at how New York did, we're in Washington, you look how New York did on nursing homes vis-a-vis -vis the nation, uh, we did better than 33 states in the nation per capita on nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes happen to be the place where this virus ravages, ravages. But if you look at, despite the fact that we had the greatest number of cases, and we were in the eye of the storm. You look at us vis-a-vis -vis the country, where we did better than 33 other states. Then those are just facts. But I never blamed him for anything. I was just saying to the Republicans, you can't, that's not a political attack when the Republican administration had the guidance that did the same thing. Is that factually correct? Yes, that's factually correct. The CDC and CMS put out guidelines on March 13th um, that DOH drew, drew directly from for the March 25th directive. So it's directly in line with the Center for Disease Control. And we believe that in the middle of a pandemic, you should be looking to the national experts for advice because as the governor said, no one has ever been here before. And this has been a national and international tragedy as it relates to group homes with nursing homes and everyone's trying to learn from it. Now that we've got the test, increased testing capacity, New York's leading the nation mandating two tests a week for all nursing home staff. There's actually a very strong theory out there that the, re the way that, um, knew that the virus got into these nursing homes is through staff members who are asymptomatic. We now know at least 35% of the public that has coronavirus is asymptomatic. Um, so while we did move to temperature checks very early in March and a lot of the country did that as well, as it turns out, it may not have made a difference because there are so many people walking around who had COVID who didn't know that they had COVID. Yeah. So. And the context for what I said was, I said it to a Post reporter, uh, because look, the, I can say all I want, stay away from politics. We're in an election year, and politics is in the air. Uh, and there are columnists who made this point at the Post, who are 100% supportive of Donald Trump, and that's fine, but then believe, you know, we have to kill all Democrats, you know? so uh, I get it, I understand it, and they're open in their support of the Trump administration, and I guess their attitude is to be pro-Donald Trump, you have to be anti-Democrat, which I don't really understand, be pro-Donald Trump. I just wanted to ask you, though, your, your government didn't follow CDC guidance on everything, so I'm wondering, as governor, would it have been within your power not to follow the CDC guideline, guidelines on putting infected people back into nursing homes? What didn't we follow CDC guidance on? Um, I'm just 
What did it be in your power? We didn't. There's nothing that we didn't follow CDC guidance on. Every step of the way in every aspect of this, we looked to the experts at the CDC for how to manage this crisis. And I believe that that's what the states should do. You look to the center of disease control. This is non-political. This is not partisan. This is public health. We deferred to our public health experts. They deferred to the national experts. And again, this is a national and international crisis as it relates to issues in group homes, especially where the elderly are. And everyone is doing their best to learn from what we've done so far, understanding there's likely another wave coming into the fall, and guard against it happening again. Yeah. No, when you said we haven't followed CDC guidance on other issues, I don't believe you're right. That's why I asked you what, like, what other issue? I'm just asking, Governor, if it's in your power to not follow the CDC guidelines on this, if you could have actually stopped putting infected patients back into nursing homes, would that have been within your power? The, I've always followed CDC guidance, and uh, I think it makes sense. And by the way, I think the rule that you can't discriminate against the COVID patient uh, is, is right. That doesn't mean the nursing home has to accept a COVID positive patient. They conflate those two things. I understand because politically facts don't matter, just you're making a you know, political argument. Uh, but because you can't discriminate doesn't mean you have to accept. Actually, the law is the opposite. You cannot accept a patient at a nursing home unless you can fully and adequately treat that patient. So you can't accept a COVID patient, COVID positive patient, unless you can isolate and quarantine and have the staff. Unless you can do all that, you cannot accept that person. And the nursing home, the obligation is on the nursing home to say, I can't take a COVID positive person. I'm too crowded, I'm too busy, I don't have enough PPE, whatever the answer is, doesn't even matter. It's if they say I can't take the person, they can't take the person. So that's, that's how it works. It doesn't mean they discriminate against the COVID positive person. They just say, I can't handle the person. I can't quarantine. I don't have a big enough facility. Whatever they want to say. Let's and take one more. Sorry, sir. Thank you, Governor. Griff Williams. No, no, Washington no. Post. Um, based on your conversation today with the president, would you say that he is aligned with Senators McConnell and Scott in seeing the idea of federal aid to states such as yours as a blue state bailout, or, or does he take a different view than they do? I think the president is focused on, uh, on the reopening, on stimulating the economy and getting the economy back. I think that's his focus. I think that's the correct focus. Uh, I think he understands that these are projects that need to be done. Look, when he ran for president, he spoke about a $1 trillion infrastructure program. That's what he spoke about. He's a builder. He's a developer, right? He gets it. Uh, and he, he believes in construction and development. It's been his career. And I think that's why he talked about it in the campaign. It just never happened. And he, it's not just him, by the way. Joe Biden talks about it, and President Clinton talked about it, and President Obama talked about it, and President Bush talked about it. None of them have gotten it done. Uh, so I think he gets it. He understands the projects we were talking about. The nice thing about these projects is it doesn't require any new legislation, doesn't require any, they've been in the pipeline forever, and his administration can just do it, and we can get it up and running. And to the extent that jump starts a larger conversation about infrastructure, which is something I think we need desperately. And look, here's my last point. You know you need to do large scale infrastructure. When is there going to be a better moment in history to do it? You're spending billions, if not trillions of dollars to handle COVID and bring back the economy at least build things that we can leave our children like our grandparents did for us. Thank you for the hospitality. Pleasure.
ABC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Into orbit on a mission to the International Space Station for the first time from U.S. soil since 2011. Bob Banken and Doug Hurley are those astronauts flying in Dragon. They're inside. That's uh, Doug Hurley really close to our screen and Bob Banken on the further seat away from us. And they are getting ready to lift off from pad 39A where Falcon 9 will lift off around or at 4.33 p.m. Eastern time. They already ascended the tall structure next to the rocket, which is called the fixed service structure, and walked down the corridor known as the crew arm. And now they're already boarded inside of Dragon. Yeah, right before they got in, we did see them pause for a moment and actually sign the wall. They were in the white room. And the white room is just literally that room at the end of the crew arm that has an opening into Dragon. It's the last place on planet Earth where Bob and Doug are standing before they get into Dragon for their ride to the space station. And the term the white room was first used during NASA Gemini missions where the room right before entering into the spaceship was painted white. So we've continued the tradition with painting ours white as well and also started a new tradition if you just saw they did sign the white room wall which is really really awesome it's a fairly small area that has room for the crew and a few ground support members to complete cargo load at t minus 24 hours and crew ingress at t minus 2 hours and 35 minutes and ingress is how we refer to the crew boarding dragon and inside the white room there's also a movable platform that just gets extended out to the capsule just in order to bridge that gap between the crew arm and the dragon side hatch just allowing easy entry into dragon and as you might expect the entire area is environmentally controlled just so the dragon side hatch can be kept open while we're keeping all of that dust dirt florida humidity out of the capsule making sure it's pristine for the crew there's also a big seal that's inflated and compressed against the capsule right now just to help maintain that clean environment. The White Room also has lots of tools in order to open the side hatch, complete crew ingress as they're doing right now, and prepare for any contingency or emergency that may be encountered. And so as we just heard from Lauren and Marie and the team, they're getting into this capsule now. They're getting their seats connected to their suits via that umbilical that's going to give them hard line connections into audio for their comm checks, which are going to be coming up shortly. And again, breathing gas and pressurized nitrox for those suit leak checks. So this will be the second time since getting suited up that they've done these leak checks. We're just kind of all about redundancy and constantly checking our systems as we continue to count down. But I mean, there they are right now. We're watching Bob and Doug getting into Dragon, getting strapped in. Uh, before they connected their suits to the actual seats, they did something called a foreign object debris check or a FOD check. And that just means that they actually get inspected for any substance or debris on their suit that could interfere with those systems on Dragon. And to help protect against debris, the crew has covers on their boots as well as their umbilical port on their suits that need to be removed before they can ingress. So they've already removed those. And as you can see, they are getting strapped in. And once the FOD check is complete, our commander, Doug Hurley, um, entered first and then Bob Bankin followed after him. And they're getting buckled in right now, as you can see on your screen, and attaching their umbilicals to their, their suits. The umbilicals allow the crew to have comms through their suit and air to help keep them cool, as well as delivers nitrox for suit pressurization. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. And just walking through the interior a little bit, there are four seats configured inside Dragon right now. They're numbered one to four from right to left when you're looking at the seats. So we've had a couple of camera views just from the hatchway. So in the right white room, if you're looking at that angle, you go from one to four right to left. Doug Hurley is in seat two or the commander seat. Bob Bankin is in seat three, which is on Crew Dragon is the pilot seat. And then obviously nobody is in seats one and four today. A Crew Dragon is designed to carry four astronauts on these future NASA missions. And we met two of the Crew One members um, and heard about their other two crew members a little bit earlier. 
Directly in front of both of our crew members today are three touchscreen displays that they're going to use throughout the flight, giving them insight into Dragon system, seeing any alerts or issues with the vehicle, and if required, taking control and manually flying Dragon. We can see Doug Hurley manipulating those displays right now. And coming up, the crew will do a comm check to make sure that they can hear mission control and their seats will be rotated into position for launch so that they can see those display panels right in front of them. So now let's check in with John Insprucker for the latest on the health of both vehicles. Over to you, John. We're at T-minus 2 hours, 36 minutes, 30 seconds in the countdown for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon to the space station. The Dragon Launch Ops team has completed their major activities to prepare the spacecraft for the astronauts. Checkouts are complete of major systems, including the escape system. And as you can see, ingress of the astronauts well underway. They're hooking their suits up to the various cabin systems. Right now on Dragon, there are no issues in work. Comm checks will be coming up shortly on the Dragon spacecraft with the crew. We might be able to hear some of that, and we'll bring it to you as it happens. Now currently the Falcon 9 team is preparing for their final checkouts and propellant load. Checkouts are due to begin at T-minus two hours. That's when the majority of the launch crew will actually get on console officially in Fire Room 4 at Kennedy Space Center. Currently on Falcon 9, all systems are go. The Air Force range continues to report no problems with air and sea space clearance. Everything's looking good. Roadblocks are up around the launch pads. The weather forecast continues to be acceptable, but something we're going to watch all the way through. We're not only looking at weather at the launch site, but we are looking around the world. We need to make sure conditions are acceptable if Dragon has to splash down in the Atlantic in case of an escape. We're also monitoring contingency splashdown locations if the crew had to come back to Earth before docking with the space station. Right now, those conditions are getting better as we go through the day at the launch pad Things continue to be a 60% probability of violating the conditions or 40% chance if you're an optimist of good weather. But right now, the clock is continuing to count down. All systems are go. We're just inside T minus two minutes, 35, two hours, 35 minutes. All right, now as Bob and Doug finish their ingress procedures and get comfortable inside Dragon, we're gonna to continue to listen for those comm checks. They should be coming up in just a little bit. But right now I'm joined now by SpaceX's Jessica Jensen and Lars Blackmore, just to discuss a little bit more about what make Dragon and Falcon 9 a 21st century launch vehicle. So first off, thank you so much for joining me today. Jessica, I'll start with you. Yeah. Walk me through kind of Dragon's life history and how we got to where we are today. Sure, so Dragon was designed from scratch 12 years ago by SpaceX. It was designed to carry cargo to and from the International Space Station. Um, and what that means is 12 years ago wasn't that long ago. So we got to use state-of-the-art materials, um, state-of-the-art you know, computer processors. So really Dragon to start off with is already a modern advanced spacecraft. But then there's two other parts of it also that really led to commercial crew. Um, one part of it was that we actually were able to man rate Cargo Dragon um, while it's in the vicinity of the space station and attached to the space station. So that was a huge learning curve for crew. That we human rated a spacecraft um, for a portion of the mission. And then for crew, you just have to obviously expand it for the whole mission. Um, and then the last part was Cargo Dragon has been this amazing test bed for commercial crew. And what that means is we were able to test out like heat shield materials and parachute materials on Cargo Dragon before they ever flew on Crew Dragon. Very cool. And that's just one part of the equation. Lars, walk us through, again, just the flight history of Falcon 9 from the humble beginnings to where we are today. Well, Falcon 9 first flew almost 10 years ago today. And even though the first version of that rocket couldn't carry humans, the fundamental design was made with that goal in mind. Over the course of 87 launches, we've steadily improved the rocket so that now it has twice the payload to orbit that we started out with. We can land and reuse the first stage in the fairing. And most importantly for today, we have the reliability that we need for humans. Now, what's interesting is that that reliability has come from steady upgrades and almost a decade of flight experience but it's actually quite hard to prove reliability. This is something that the commercial airline industry has been grappling with for decades. And just like them, we rely on lots and lots of testing. 
So for instance, if you take the Merlin 1D engine, that has to fly for about six minutes continuously to get to orbit. We took one of those and ran it for more than 250 minutes to get the statistical proof of reliability that we need. So it's that testing and lots and lots of analysis that gives us and NASA the confidence that Falcon is ready to fly humans for the first time. And obviously a lot of additional upgrades, a lot of additional testing had to go just to make sure that both of these vehicles were human rated. So walk us through some of the specific upgrades to Dragon to meet that criteria. So um, the first one's pretty obvious. You had a, we had a cargo dragon. It has lots of cargo cubbies. So we took all of those out, replaced it with astronaut seats, crew displays, and crew controls. But one thing that people may not know is on cargo dragon, we've actually been flying mice to and from the International Space Station for years. And what that meant was we had to design an environmental control and life support system for dragon years ago. Um, it provides oxygen, it scrubs carbon dioxide, and among other things, controls temperature and relative humidity. So even though that was done on a smaller scale for mice, it was a great learning curve on how to help man rate a spacecraft when you have to do it for humans. And then Lars, same question, what kind of specific upgrades had to go into it to certify Falcon 9 for this day? Well, I already mentioned the reliability upgrades. One upgrade that I think is particularly interesting is the launch abort trigger. So people probably know that Dragon has the ability in mid-flight to separate from Falcon and boost the astronauts away to safety in the case that there's some kind of emergency. And that could be triggered by the astronauts or by the ground crew. What people may not know is that Falcon itself has the ability to cause that trigger. And it will do that entirely autonomously using algorithms, software, and sensors. And that's particularly important SpaceX in the case Dragon. of a time critical fault where aborting quickly means aborting safely. And uh, in Probably some cases, Falcon that. can do Actually, this quicker than three tenths of a second, so Instant much faster than a human. Contract. And Lars, I'm gonna pause right there for a sec. We're getting some calm from the crew. And so coming up shortly, we're going to hear these communication checks. Bob and Doug are going to be talking to several positions down on the ground, and they're going to be using both communication speakers inside of Dragon and inside their suits in a series of communications checks. They're also going to be doing these checks over different satellites CDR, and ground stations. CDR, PLT, comm check, umbilical. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear, umbilical. Com check complete. Stand by for ground station com check. And you'll hear him refer to CDR as Doug Hurley. That's the commander, PLT pilot. That's Bob Bankin. And so that first one we heard was through the umbilical. So that communication linked directly into their suit. Now they're going to do a communication check over the ground stations. We'll also hear one over TDRS, that's the tracking and data relay satellites. Same satellites we use to talk to the International Space Station. That's what we'll be using to talk and track Dragon throughout its entire flight. So again, just waiting for a moment for the teams to continue configuring everything. They're gonna do these ground checkouts now, and you're gonna be hearing them talk directly to the core. It's the crew operations responsible engineer. That's essentially the Capcom, if you followed NASA missions in the past. It's a position right here in Hawthorne at SpaceX Mission Control, which is just a few feet away from us, where the team's gonna be watching over Bob and Doug for their entire flight. That's where the main person whose job it is to talk to them is going to be sitting. We'll also hear them do some checkouts with the launch director uh, down there at the Cape inside firing room four. And you'll be hearing those very characteristic beeps. SpaceX Dragon, weak but readable. Copy, we have you the same. Uh, stand by, we're still configuring for ground station contact. Dragon, copy.
And just to further explain some of those voice protocols that you're going to hear, uh, you might be used to hearing Houston Station or Houston Shuttle or Houston Endeavor back when we were flying those specific shuttles. You're going to hear SpaceX Dragon. That's the SpaceX team calling the Dragon team on orbit. And then Bob and Doug will be able to respond. And so they're going to continue to configure. We'll get these ground station checkouts momentarily. And just a reminder, you're going to hear that very very unique beeping sound that's called a quindar and that's been something that's been used throughout space to ground or air to ground communications throughout spaceflight history and that's really just for teams who are in mission control or supporting the launch know when you hear that sound it's time to listen dragon spacex com check ground station dragon has a loud and clear much better jet and core loud and clear ground station com check complete standby for tedris com check Dragon, SpaceX, Com check, Tedris. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Tedris, Com check, complete. Standby for checks with MV, LV in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one, Com check. Jason, we've got you loud and clear. How you doing? Doing great. How are you guys doing in there? Stand by for comm checks. Ready to launch a spaceship. Agree. And stand by for comm checks over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, comm check. Loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, launch director on countdown one, comm check. Mike, we've got you loud and clear. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Let me try on uh, Dragon to Ground 1. Dragon, SpaceX launch director on Dragon to Ground 1, comp check. Loud and clear. Have you the same? Dragon, SpaceX, launch configuration comp checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation for Section 2 of 4.100. SpaceX Dragon, we're ready for seat rotation. Copy, ready for seat rotation. We will report when initiating. All right, so that wraps up those communications checks. Everything going good with the spacecraft, Bob and Doug talking to the teams on the ground. Pretty soon they're going to get their seats rotated. Bringing you back inside Hawthorne real quick, I do want to thank Jessica and Lars for joining me real quick, giving us that great insight into Dragon and Falcon 9. Hope you guys got a good spot staked out to watch a launch today. Great to have you on. Absolutely. Super All right. excited. So we're going to throw it now down to Gary Jordan at Mission Control Houston, who I know is also following along. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, Dan. Great to hear good checks from Bob and Doug in the Dragon vehicle. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Zeb Scoville has pulled Space Station flight controllers and all systems are go for launch. Essentially, the station is prepared for Dragon to arrive 19 hours after launch. Flight controllers here will continue to monitor the countdown, but really it's up to the teams in Kennedy and Hawthorne to get us to lift off at this point. So we want to hear your comments as we continue to count down to launch. So let's go to the social desk now to hear it. Thanks, Gary. So taking a quick look, so taking a quick look at those numbers right now, there are now uh, 1 million people watching our coverage and Launch America is up to the number one trending hashtag on Twitter. So let's take a closer look at what's being said online. Okay, so right now we have Art Alexandria, and it looks like she's got a personal self-portrait 
cosmic for sure, in her NASA flight suit. And guys, this is what I'm loving seeing online with this hashtag, is how everyone around the nation is making this launch uniquely theirs. And I wanna point out one line in her post that says, I believe that no matter how far the future is, we are on our way towards it. And guys, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's what today represents. Let's take another look. Oh my goodness. Okay, so right now we have Jessica with her space pup getting ready for liftoff. And guys, I'm not gonna lie, we love to see it. So please, if you have any space pets, comment using hashtag Launch America. As you can see, everybody is thrilled to be a part of this launch today, and I know of one special guest in particular. I'm so pleased to welcome Diana Coart of Physics Girl. Diana, I hear you have a, very, have a burning question for Mission Control, so go for it. Hi, Tahira. Thank you so much for including me on this incredibly special day. I'm Diana from the YouTube channel Physics Girl, and I've always been so fascinated by space and especially space exploration because we bring together so many people for such a complicated task to send a rocket up into space. So my question is along the lines of what goes into a mission like that? What we all know, I think we're familiar with how much preparation and training astronauts have to do, but preparing for a mission like this and maybe preparing in the future for a mission to the moon or to Mars, what kinds of things do the, does the whole team have to do in order to prepare to launch a rocket? So Diana, that is such a great question because I mean, sometimes it, I think it does get overlooked what all goes into making a moment like this happen. So Gary, what has the team there in Mission Control been doing to prepare for this historic launch? Thanks Tahira and Diana, that's a fantastic question. Really, the operations here are not just starting today. There has been a lot of training and a lot of simulations that have been going into preparing for this moment. Uh, really preparing and getting everyone familiarized with every step of the mission, from launch all the way through docking, and throwing different scenarios them uh, at them just in case uh, something were to happen Every flight controller you see behind me will be prepared to respond effectively. Now, I do want to sh make a shout out that it's not just the flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston that have dedicated so much time to this launch. In fact, uh, I've been talking to Zeb Scoville, the flight director here in Mission Control Houston, who said that even before he was a flight director back in 2014, they were working on some of the operations for commercial crew missions. But really, this team expands across the country. You've already seen a lot of people working in Hawthorne, in Florida, in Houston, and really it takes an integrated and dedicated team to make a mission like this possible. Diana, thank you so much for the question. And really thanks to everyone sending in questions and for sharing in this historic mission today. Remember as you're posting to use the hashtag LaunchAmerica. I do want to make a shout out to uh, the flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston. In fact, uh, some traditional flowers have been sent to Mission Control Houston. Uh, this dates even uh, back before the shuttle days for every mission to uh, dedicate it to the operations and the controllers here who are working so closely uh, and, and are integrated in every part of the mission. Uh, but bef but now let's head over to Hawthorne for the latest status on the crew and on Dragon. Dan. All right, thank you, Gary. As you can see, Bob and Doug in a little bit different position now. Their suits have been rotated to the launch position. So this just puts their backs a little bit more horizontal with the ground itself or parallel with the ground itself and places those displays directly in front of them. We've also already moved into suit leak checks. So this is the second time they've had these leak checks done in their suit. So pressurized nitrox now flowing into those launch and entry suits that they're gonna be wearing throughout the dynamic phases of this mission. So right now we are under two, hour, two hours and 20 minutes from launch for about two hours and 18 minutes and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's going to be carrying our NASA crew members today, Doug Hurley and Bob Banken aboard SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. It's been a really exciting day so far. We're fighting against that weather, but we're continuing to press on for launch. The crew has been up since about 6 a.m. as they prepare to head to the International Space Station for part of this Demo 2 mission for NASA. And as you can see on your screen, it looks like they're just waiting and getting ready for this mission today. It's been such an exciting day so far. Again, as Dan said, their seats are rotated into launch position so that they can see those screens that you see there on the left side right in front of them. 
their suit leak checks have been complete, their comm checks are complete. So let's throw it over to Lauren in KSC. All right, uh, so Dragon Hatch Close is expected at T minus one hour and 55 minutes, and we are just pretty close to that. It's uh, getting really, really close. So this is one of the key, vis the final key visual milestones on that timeline to lift off, the closure of that hatch and locking Bob and Doug inside. Now, we have a couple of special guests joining us with Daryl at the OSB2 viewing location. That's NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein and SpaceX Chief Engineer Elon Musk. Daryl? That's right, Lauren. We're here on the fifth floor. We were supposed to be outside on the balcony overlooking uh, pad 39A, but we have come indoors due to the weather. But uh, we are here with two titans of space. And though it might look uh, like this is a reunion of a 90s boy band, it is not. <laughs> we are socially distanced uh, for, for good reason. Um, but we are here to talk about space. And I want to thank you both and tell you both it's a privilege and honor to be with you today. Um, we're going to start off with you, Jim, and ask you a couple questions here. I want to, I want to ask you first of all. It's been almost three years that you were sworn in as NASA administrator, and you knew from the very first day that you would be right here at the Kennedy Space Center in this moment when a commercial partner was ready to launch. Tell me what it's like to be leading NASA at this very moment. So I, I want to be clear. Um, I did not know that when I got sworn <laughs> in. Um, I, I will tell you. Um, uh, a lot of folks said it couldn't be done, um, but of course, uh, as soon as I got the job, Elon and I have had a number of conversations. Elon committed that, that this was something that SpaceX could achieve. Um, we've had challenges. We've had setbacks. Uh, we've seen catastrophic losses of capsules and challenges with parachutes. On What's that? On the ground. On the ground, <laughs> uncrewed. I want to be really clear. <laughs> Tests. Tests. But, but that's what's unique about SpaceX. Yeah. SpaceX can do things that NASA historically has not done. They test. They fail, they fix, they fly, they test, they fail, they fix, they fly, until the point where we are today, where not only is SpaceX comfortable, but NASA is comfortable, we, we are ready to go. Um, but if you would have told me even two years ago we'd be right here, um, I might have even been questioning it then. Um, but this is, a, this is a monumental achievement. It's a Herculean task uh, by the SpaceX team, which we're very grateful for, and also by the NASA team. Um, that has been working hand in glove with them to get to this point. And it's good we have Jim and Elon both here to fact check each other, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Elon, in 2002 when you started SpaceX, um, many in the aerospace industry didn't take SpaceX seriously. You remember what that felt like. Yet here you are, you just sent two astronauts in a car made by your car company to launch pad 39A with uh, a spacecraft made by your space company. And yeah. now they're launching the International Space Station. So I'm wondering for you, in this moment, do you just pinch yourself thinking, yes. is this really happening? This is a dream come true, I think, for me and everyone at, at SpaceX. This is uh, not something that I ever thought would actually happen. So when starting SpaceX in 2002, I really did not think I would, this day would occur. I, I, I expected. 90% chance we'd fail to even get to a low Earth orbit with a small rocket. So if somebody told me in 2002 that I'd be standing here with the NASA administrator, meeting the astronauts, and the, the, we've got a rocket and spacecraft on pad 39A, the best pad in the world, uh, which is it's an honor to be there, I would have thought, man, I don't know what you're smoking, but it's not. <laughs> like, like, no way. No way is that true. Uh, you know, and, and so it, it, it is. Say it's even a dream come true. I didn't even dream that this would come true. Let me put it that way. You right. know, um, but it is, I, I am incredibly excited to be here um, on, on behalf of the SpaceX team. Um, and uh, as, as Jeff said, I just, this really is the culmination of an, of, in, of an incredible amount of work by the SpaceX team, uh, by, by NASA, and by a number of, of other partners in, in the process of making this happen. It's really, you can look at this as the result of, of, of 100,000 people, roughly, when you add up all suppliers and everyone, working incredibly hard to get to, to make this day happen. So it's, uh, so it's hard, really hard to believe that this is real. And you're here, and yeah. it's amazing, and many of us have been amazed as we've watched you accomplish these things over the years. Uh, Jim, back to you. This is all about the commercialization of space. And so 
in the early going for commercial crew program. It wasn't something NASA was used to. Uh, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle. Uh, NASA gave the designs and the contractors went out there and built it. This is different. It is. They're, they're building it now. What were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome to get to this point? Well, I think getting people to recognize that when the government provides both the demand and the supply, um, you're limited in what you're able to do. Um, and of course, back when this program was initiated under uh, Charlie Bolden, General Charlie Bolden, astronaut Charlie Bolden, um, Congress was not, was not supportive um, and did not provide the proper funding. Um, and yet he, he, he persevered, he pushed forward. Um, and, and now I think everybody recognizes we have to commercialize space. We've had success now with commercial resupply of the International Space Station. Now we've got commercial crew to the International Space Station. Eventually we need commercial space stations. So what we're using the International Space Station for right now, we're proving that we can compound uh, pharmaceuticals in a way that you cannot do on Earth. We're able to create immunizations in a way you cannot do on Earth. We're printing human organs in 3D. Right now it's just tissue, but eventually we're going to print human organs in 3D using adult stem cells, your skin cells, your own DNA. It's going to transform how we do medicine here on Earth. We're, we're creating advanced materials that you can only create in the microgravity of space, things like a, an, an artificial retina for the human eye. So if you have macular degeneration, you don't have to lose your eyesight. Bottom line is this. These markets are the future. And, and when, they, when they materialize, and they are materializing because of the work of NASA, we're going to see capital investment, not just into launch, but also into habitation. Um, and that ultimately is what's going to be transformational for commercial space. Very good. And Elon, in getting all of that going, the ISS and all the activity that takes place on board, it's key that this Crew Dragon operate on a regular basis. As the chief engineer, yes. what were some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome to get your spacecraft ready to fly this mission? Well, the, the, the spacecraft and the rocket have gone through literally thousands and thousands of tests and reviews, uh, both uh, by SpaceX, by NASA, by third parties. Um, we've also, as Jim was alluding to, uh, we've, we've done a, a lot of flights. So uh, the, one, one of the things I think that's very helpful about this flight, about, about what we're about to do, is that the rocket has flown many times. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, even in this, uh, essentially this configuration, it's flown about 20 times. Mm -hmm. So that, that means we've, we really have, and I don't want to tempt fate, but a, a well-proven rocket. Um, and we've, we've flown uh, Crew Dragon to the space station once, successfully brought it back. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of testing on the ground. And when you do the testing on the ground, you always push the limits. Mm -hmm. So you want to try, th you, you push it way beyond what you'd expect in flight. So sometimes you actually, you'd break it because you kind of want to break it on the ground during testing to see what the limits are. Mm -hmm. So this is a result, like I said, of, of thousands of tests, of thousands of design hours, and, and a tremendous number of smart people working um, incredibly hard to make this day happen. Um, and you've got two astronauts on board now. Yes. Do, do you feel that responsibility? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I felt it, I, th I think, most strongly when I saw their, their family just before coming here. And did you say anything that you can share? So we've done everything we can to make sure your dad's come back OK. Thanks for sharing that with us. Jim, you had some words with uh, the astronauts. Uh, what was your take on how they were feeling? I, I will tell you, um, you know, Doug Hurley, uh, Marine Corps test pilot, of course, a veteran of multiple space shuttle missions. Bob Benkin, uh, flight test engineer, United States Air Force, again, veteran of multiple space shuttle missions. This is not new to these guys. Um, uh, you know, all I could do is convey to them how, how much all of America appreciates what they're doing. Um, that the entire world is watching, um, and just how grateful we are uh, as a nation. And um, I will tell you, their demeanor is loose. They are ready to go. They were joking around. They're talking, uh, talking about what they have cool for guys. breakfast and yeah. how it might come up later. It was uh, it shaking was, eggs. Yeah, yeah right, I saw that. Yeah. Right. So it was, uh, it was nice to see. They are, they are in their element, and, and we are just so grateful and proud of them. Well, that's good to hear. That gives you great confidence, I'm sure. Uh, and your positions as you as you hear that. We're going to go to a social media question, and we've got uh, this question coming from Brooklyn, and she wants to know, I noticed some changes in the crew spacesuits. They look much thinner and lighter. What changes in the space capsule allow to have these 
futuristic suits. <laughs> well, we spent a lot of time designing the, the spacesuit. I personally spent a lot of time uh, on the on the spacesuits. It took us uh, three, almost four years uh, to design suits that both look good and work well. Um, so you can see a, a spacesuit in the movie looks good, doesn't work, <laughs> and, and then you can make a spacesuit that works but doesn't doesn't look good, um, because fundamentally it's a pressure suit that's got to survive in vacuum. Right. So um, it's uh, you know so it tends to puff up you know when when it's under pressure and and it's got to withhold it's got to handle all that pressure. So uh, it took us many iterations to to get the get the suit to. We really wanted to to look great. Fundamentally, fundamentally what it's about is like we we, we want to inspire kids to say that that one day they want to wear that uniform, they want to want they want to wear that spacesuit, mm -hmm. um, and get them fired up about yeah I want to be an astronaut I want to be I want to work on aerospace engineering I want to advance space flight, and I think what this, what today is about is is reigniting the dream of space, and getting getting people fired up about the future and excited. It's just one of those things that I think everyone. Uh, of, of, you know, from all walks of life, from all parts of the political spectrum, in the United States and elsewhere, should be really excited that this is a thing that is made by humans, for humans, and it, it, it's just a, a great, exciting, inspiring day, and it's one of those, like I said, one of those things that makes you glad to wake up in the morning. Yeah, yeah. You know? Functional and inspiring, and there's one on a model right over there, and I'm, you, you got me so excited, I might run over there and put that thing on, Elon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're kind of custom tailored, by the way. So, oh, they are. So, so it's you, not I, I think you won't fit in that one, but we could make one that, that you would fit in. Well, I appreciate you, yeah, yeah. I appreciate you saying <laughs> that, yeah, because I'm six foot eight, so I, yeah, yeah. you're going to have to do a lot of sewing. Well, and the, 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 Dragon, the Dragon spacecraft is, uh -huh. uh, can, take, you can take someone who's six foot eight. My size. Yes. This commercial thing, I'm getting excited. Yes. Yeah. I'm ready to fly, Jim. Yeah. Sir. Um, we've got another social media question we're going to ask. Ashton Jay wants to know, how do you think that launching astronauts on American soil for the first time since 2011 will revolutionize future missions? Yeah, so what we're doing here is unlike we've, anything we've ever done before. We, we are not purchasing, owning, and operating the hardware. We are turning to commercial industry. We're, and, and going back to the spacesuits, it's the same for the capsule, it's the same for the rocket. We did not tell industry what to build. We gave them top level requirements. We said, here's the requirement for payload. Here's the requirement for safety. And then we let the innovators, commercial industry, American commercial industry, innovate. And they came up with solutions that had never been dreamed of before. Um, and that's the success of this program. Um, so we're really revolutionizing how we do space flight. Um, and, and I really think when we look into the future, we're going to see these models of doing business with public-private partnerships apply not just to low Earth orbit, which is what we're doing today, but we're taking this model to the moon and even on to Mars. And I hear something about Tom Cruise shooting a movie up at the International Space Station. Is that right? I'll tell you what I told Elon <laughs> just yesterday, and that is this. Um, people ask me about Tom Cruise all the time now, and the answer is yes. We would love Tom Cruise to fly to the International Space Station and make a movie. I'm all for that, and we're going to do what we can to make that happen. Um, but you should know this. There was a day when I was in elementary school and I saw the movie Top Gun. And from that day, I knew that I was going to be a Navy pilot. It's just the way it was. Um, the goal here, and this is what we're yeah, doing today, exactly. and, and, and Elon is all about this. Get, 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 get the kids fired up about to wanting to wear that, that space suit, That's exactly. wanting to fly that, you know, get, go to orbit, go to the moon, go to Mars, reigniting the, like I said, reigniting the dream of space and just get, getting, you know, people of all walks of life, young, old, excited about the future, excited. I think anyone who, who has within them the spirit of exploration should love what's going on today. And if we can Absolutely. get Tom Cruise to inspire an elementary kid to join the Navy and be a pilot. Why can't we get Tom Cruise to inspire the next Elon Musk? That's what we need. We need a new generation of many Elon Musks, and that's what this launch is about today. I want to say, speaking of this inspiration piece, it's not by chance that we have the Secretary of Education of the United States of America here. This is all about the next generation. Um, if, if we have great success in our generation, it's not enough. It has to continue. The challenge with the Apollo program is that it ended. What we're doing now is sustainable, and that's why we have the public-private partnerships and commercial, um, commercial capabilities that are coming online. Very good. And the good news for Tom Cruise is he does a lot of his own stunts. Yeah. So in not, so in Absolutely. zero gravity, he should get hurt a lot no, less. No, I, th right? I think it's going to be super cool. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, it's, yeah. It, and as as Joe said, it's like this is going to, you know, you want to capture the public imagination, um, have them see cool cool things happening in real orbit, you know, real space stations. 
Uh, it's like I think I'd want to watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And and it's, it's like it, like says so you think it was like this is like just this is really just the beginning because we want to go from from low Earth orbit. We want to go back to the moon, not and the moon to stay. Have a moon base like Moon Base Alpha. Um, and, and, and have a, you know, build a city on Mars and be a space-faring civilization out there among the stars. This is a super exciting future that I think, it, that's the kind of thing where you, you're like, yeah, let, let, can't wait for it to happen, you know? If you can't get excited after listening to you guys, I'd say you need to have your pulse checked. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk, SpaceX CEO and Chief Engineer, thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Bridenstein, we appreciate you leading NASA in this time, Administrator for the agency. And we're going to send it back to Marie. All right, thanks a lot, Daryl. We saw in the meantime, uh, while that interview was going on, the hatch actually closed. So that happened a few minutes earlier than we expected to. Um, our timeline has that happening at T minus an hour and 55 minutes. So a few minutes ahead of schedule uh, right now with hatch close. And you can see the pad teams there just working on things now. Yeah, right now it looks like what they're doing is Oh, what are they doing? So they perform a leak check. There is a mechanism there called a side hatch mechanism. That is what actually closes the hatch and seals it. And what we'll do is perform a leak check on that for a few minutes to make sure that that's nice and tight, that those O-rings are sealed really, really well. And uh, after that, we will install the, uh, yeah, you can see the leak check uh, ground support equipment there in the technician's hands there. And while we're watching this, Leland, I, I mean, we just heard uh, we just heard them talk a lot about inspiring the next generation. And you're a man of many talents. I, I know after um, your flights yourself, you used to head the head of NASA education. I mean, what did that stir up in you? You know, Marie, this what what Elon said about reigniting the dream of space is so important that we get our young kids thinking about themselves being in these seats. And I, I. When I first became an astronaut in 1998, I was riding on the back of a fire truck celebrating John Glenn's return to flight on a space shuttle. And I saw these two little kids. They had on orange pumpkin suits. And when their dad turned them around to point to look at me on the fire truck. And it was almost as though when they saw my face, they started launching into space with rocket fuel because they were inspired, because they saw someone who looked like them. And I think that if we can reignite this dream through SpaceX's launch, through the partnership with NASA, we can get so many more kids to believe in themselves and know that they can be just like Doug and Bob flying on the SpaceX Dragon. Absolutely. I mean, it's... Uh it's really just breathtaking to see them there in their suits now and uh, looking at the screens in front of them. Lauren, I know we, we've talked a lot about the spacecraft. We've heard about that. But for, for folks that maybe are just tuning in, uh, what are they looking at in front of them now? Yeah, so they have three different touch screens in front of them. Uh, overall, that whole uh, assembly there is called the control panel. So you'll have those three LCD touch screens in front of them where uh, they have the displays are showing them um, details on the vehicle's pressure, its temperature, uh, there's audio control. Um, that center screen has the procedures that they're going through today on day of launch. Um, you can also see the, the vehicle's attitude. You can see its velocity, its apogee, its perigee, its inclination, uh, details on the status of the hatch, the thermal control system loops, basically all the cool stuff that helps them have situational awareness of the vehicle. Um, that's displayed on those displays. Um, additionally, there are some actual buttons on that button panel that you see down below. And uh, that some of the things that that allowed them to do is if the crew ever needed to do any sort of manual overrides like that right in the middle right underneath that center lcd screen that's the crew's ability to initiate an abort it's called an abort handle and it's right in the middle where both crew members could use it if they needed to and the audio controls um, are also on those button panels when they're not in their suits uh, there's actually speakers that are coming off of the control panel that allow them to hear mission control, hear the core, hear ISS um, when they're not in their suits where the audio systems are integrated into that. And we see, we see them using the touch screens now. Leland, what's your take on this? Because this has got to look totally different from what you were looking at during shuttle. Touch screens. <laughs> we had these 
<laughs> these displays and these buttons and you know we we it was it was one of those moments when I'm looking at this now when I had knee boards that had procedures and things on there and the procedures are now all run in that middle screen and the malfunctions and the things that you do to mitigate problems with the uh, with the vehicle if something happens it's all controlled right there with the two of them and so it's a it's a radical departure from what we did with the shuttle but it's again ushering in this new era of space travel. For post ingress brief and a check on how that suit air feels about now. And we're going to listen now for an announcement ahead, we're ready. about hatch closer. Copy. Well, today we are not tracking any issues on Dragon and F9 currently. Um, for a weather update, the weather line that is overhead, which is what you saw when you were ingressing, is now moving offshore. The next radar return is a cell over Orlando, which is expected to be our decision gate for today, and that is currently eroding. That's uh, good news. Thank you. Copy. And then one additional item. Uh, the Cabo, the orbit site, uh, remains as briefed, so no change there. But I do want to make you aware that that is slightly west of Cabo for go weather. Um, so you just want to target the longitude if needed. Okay, Dragon copy, slightly west. Uh, we'll target the longitude, and uh, the uh, suit air has cooled off, so we appreciate that as well. Probably outstanding. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, and we'll keep you posted as the closeout team completes the leak check. Dragon copy. So what we actually heard was a little bit more discussion about the weather, uh, still looking at things, and it, we're about a minute away from an announcement about hatch close, closure. Excuse me. If you're just joining us, we're at T minus one hour, 55 minutes and counting, and we're expecting an announcement to confirm hatch closure in just a few seconds. Dragon SpaceX uh, for comm checks with Falcon 9. Go ahead. Okay, uh, we are ready for that at that time, uh, if you are ready. We are ready. All stations up on Countdown Net for Section 54.49, F9 Responsible Engineer, communication check with the crew. Start with the guidance, navigation, and control. Dragon GNC on countdown one, comm check. GNC Dragon, loud and clear. GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop Dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one. Comm check. Avionics, Dragon, we have good loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check with the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one. Comm check. Ground segment, Dragon, loud and clear. Ground segment loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control and countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, chief engineer on countdown one, comm check. Fala, Dragon has you loud and clear. 
Chief Engineer, loud and clear. This completes the F-9 responsible engineer comm checks. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to ground. Go ahead, sir. Oh, just uh, doing a comm check on this loop. Uh, good luck, guys, and buckle in. Thanks to you and the F-19, Bala. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Bala. So we just heard a series of comm checks there, and Lauren, um, I don't know if you want to describe a little bit more about why that's important, and, and we heard the acronym GNC. Um, they said guidance, navigation, and control really quickly, and then went back to the acronym GNC. Can you kind of explain to folks what that means? Yeah, uh, the launch chief engineer, Bala, as you heard them thanking him towards the end, initiated a comm check with all of the different subsystems that uh, those those engineers that are on console and those operators today and talking with the crew, making sure that um, they were able to communicate with them bidirectionally and just handing that check off from all of the different stations on console today. That was really, really cool. We obviously don't do that when there's a, a satellite on top of the rocket. So this is the first time for a real flight that we've done that operation. It's very awesome. And now that the hatch is closed, um, a lot of the a lot of the work of this team is is done, but I mean they're they're obviously not finished. They're not ready to leave the white room just yet. You were you were talking to some folks about what's going on in this room now. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, they should be completing the hatch leak check. Uh, that's you sort of pressurize that area between uh, there's two O-rings that are there and uh, we want to pressurize that area see if it holds pressure it's a very very uh, sensitive test very high um, criteria for passing and so once that leak check is shown to be okay and that the capsule or that those O-rings are able to hold pressure uh, what the team will do is they'll go back uh, into that area into that access panel and install what we call the SPEP which this which is the side pressure equalization plug um, once that is plugged you've really closed everything up and when the crew splashes down what they'll actually do is pull that plug to equalize pressure across the hatch so that you don't cause the hatch to buckle due to a pressure or sorry the hatch or the the capsule the weldment any of the vehicle to buckle due to a pressure different differential so they should be adding that plug and then they'll cover up that side hatch access panel with the TPS panel or thermal protection system panel close it up and that'll make sure it stays safe on ascent. And now, obviously, we're looking at a view from the outside of the top of Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. We can confirm a good side hatch leak check. Right. Dragon copies, good leak check. And we just heard confirmation of a good leak check. If you're just joining us, you're looking at the Falcon 9 rocket with Crew Dragon sitting on top. Inside that capsule on top are NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. And we are inside of two hours until liftoff, if the weather holds up. There's another stunning aerial view of the crew access arm extended out towards Crew Dragon. That is the final path that the astronauts took to climb aboard Dragon before they strapped into their seats and the hatch closed. And no doubt Bob and Doug are focused on the mission ahead, but you know, we, we also heard um, 
the administrator and Elon Musk talking about how they've been kind of jovial and joking around. And, and Leland, you, you kind of mentioned to me uh, during that segment that that's really important. It really is, Marie. When we were in the vehicle uh, after we got to this point when the hatch was closed, we were all <laughs> going back to those moments of our training, you know, when we were going through, you know, asset and entry training on the shuttle and just different phases of flight that we would be going through. And we would think about some of our instructors who got us there. You know, in our crew notebooks, we would have names of people that were very impactful in making sure that we were perfect in our in our training. And um, and that looks like a view of Air Force One flying near Launch Pad 39A for a special guest to have a special view of the astronauts on the launch pad. President Trump uh, on board making his way to Kennedy Space Center to hopefully view a launch at 4.33 this afternoon. And there they are in view of the launch pad. So no doubt he's looking at the window looking out the window at Bob and Doug on the pad. That's uh, got to be an amazing sight to see from on board Air Force One. And we are at T minus one hour, 46 minutes, 22 seconds and counting from launch. And guys, the last time we, we actually did a little bit of research when we found out uh, that the president was coming, the last president to witness a launch from here at Kennedy Space Center was Bill Clinton. That was back in October 1998 for STS-95. So it's been a minute. Okay, um, and we are about 56 seconds away from the, oh, no, we're not. We have an hour and 56 seconds away. Never mind. Instead, we are uh, one hour and 45 minutes away from launch. And Tahira, you are there with the social teams. I bet you are seeing some excitement on all the things we just saw on the screen there. Hey, Lauren. I mean, like you said, things are really ramping up on social media right now, especially seeing that hatch close and also just watching this flyover happen. We are up to 1.7 million viewers across all of our social media channels. And let's check out what people are saying on Twitter right now. So it looks like we've got more creativity still going on. Some people are crying with pride in Houston. Feel it. We even have Elizabeth Banks who from the Hunger Games, that's awesome. We have more just good luck and well wishes for Bob and Doug across the nation. This has been a constant online today, which is so great to see. More just future astronauts and kiddos getting excited. We even have the band Bastille tuning in for launch. This is awesome. And just looks like more people standing by to witness this historic launch today. And so, guys, on top of what's being said on social media, we've also got a lot of well wishes from everyone across our country showing us what today means in their creative way. So let's take a look at that video. I am so ready to launch America. Wow, I mean, guys, just look at everybody excited for today's launch. If that doesn't get you pumped, like, come on, let's go. We even got to see astronaut Snoopy in there, which is a personal favorite of mine. I actually have my lucky Snoopy pin here. You probably can't see it, but he is literally my spirit animal.
Anyways, guys, get excited. The time is almost here. And with that, let's toss back to Lauren at Kennedy. Lauren. Thanks, Tahira. Tahira likes the Snoopy. I like the little girl doing the worm. Leland, she wasn't doing the meatball. She was doing the worm. There's someone out there doing the meatball, I'm sure. (laughs) I want to know what that looks like. No, I I don't. I don't. (laughs) Clearly, this is capturing, capturing the attention of people all across the country and the world. So please continue to join the conversation by using the hashtag Launch America across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we've had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle the crew is sitting in right now, a lot about the crew themselves and the significance of today as the official return of human launch capability to American shores. And now we want to turn our attention to where the crew is going, the International Space Station. And for that, let's take you to Mission Control in Houston. Gary? Thank you, Marie. The International Space Station is an incredible facility whose construction, operation, and ongoing science, all these efforts have been made possible by an unprecedented international collaboration. So to tell us more about the space station, we have International Space Station Chief Scientist Kurt Costello with us. Kurt, welcome. Gary, thank you. It's an amazing day to be here to talk to you about this historic launch to the ISS. It really is. Now, many viewers may not realize that there is a laboratory that's the size of a football field 250 miles above the Earth, and that it's been there for nearly 20 years conducting revolutionary science. Can you share with us more about what the space station is and what it's accomplished so far? Sure, Gary. Over those 20 years, we've conducted over 3,100 experiments on board this space station. Those 3,100 experiments have been done by over 4,100 investigators and represent the work of over 108 regions and countries. The work going on on the space station is not only there to help us with our exploration goals for how to go further into space, but also to bring back benefits for Earth and to produce a commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. All three of these um, objectives, along with the international cooperation that it took to build such an amazing laboratory in space, are great examples of the objectives of the ISS program. Kurt, we know that today's mission is critical to providing us with a steady cadence of operational flights. But why is it so important for us to have this capability from a research perspective? That's a great question. Today's test flight brings us to the beginning of the commercial crew program, a commercial crew program which will raise our occupancy on the U.S. segment of the space station to four astronauts. And that fourth astronaut comes as a real premium to doing research on the space station. The tasks don't get particularly uh, more intensive to do systems and maintenance, so that fourth astronaut that time becomes dedicated to performing more science. In fact, enough time that it will essentially double the amount of crew time we have to perform experiments on board station. The return to U.S. soil also brings us the ability to return samples more quickly and get human samples back down to the ground more quickly as well. Kurt, you're talking about all this great research, you're talking about uh, scientific experiments, but what would you say to someone who's watching this and thinking, this isn't relevant to me, I'm never going to space, I don't do science, what do you say to those people? Well, again, one of the focuses is on the ISS benefits for humanity. And for all of us who've been stuck at home during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been wondering, wouldn't it be nice to have more bandwidth? Why does the internet slow down? Some of the research we're doing on board space station, particularly into Z-Bland optical fiber, is using the fact that we don't have sedimentation in a microgravity environment to develop new materials that'll help us build more uh, perfect fiber optic cables, which will allow us for better bandwidth and lower cost in implementing uh, networks here on Earth. And then if you're not really a tech geek, maybe your interests lie more in human health. And then we have multiple experiments going on to help us develop new drugs, new treatments on board the ISS. Pharmaceutical companies are uh, working on methods that allow us to crystallize uh, proteins in space in a more purified and more standardized method. And this could lead to monoclonal antibody suspensions that we can treat through injection instead of a painful infusion. 
We also are developing uh, studies into uh, our capability to produce tissues and uh, organs in space. Again, because you don't have sedimentation, there's a capability there to produce more uh, realistic tissues uh, that can someday possibly be used to prevent human disease. Now, Kurt, I know they have some cargo going up with them, but I understand they plan to bring some science back. That's right, Gary. A lot of their cargo going up with them are crew supplies and EVA supplies to support them if they have to do EVAs on board. But the cargo they'll be bringing down is science, and it comes from across the spectrum. We have uh, student experiments in seeds that will be returning with the, uh, the Crew Dragon. Uh, we'll, we also have a number of experiments that are dependent on their samples returning in frozen lockers on board the SpaceX Dragon uh, to be able to do the science there. Those include rodent research tissues from the National Lab Rodent Research 17 mission, and also our veggie experiments, which are experiments in growing plants in space that will be needed when we go to more distant uh, locations like the Moon and Mars. International Space Station Chief Scientist Kurt Costello, thank you so much for your time. Let's hear now from one of the next astronauts to fly to station on a Crew Dragon, talking with Marina Jerica. Marina. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be a part of today's momentous launch. My guest is no stranger to the International Space Station and will return there for the first time in nearly a decade for his third space flight with the Crew-1 launch expected later this year. Having logged 177 days in space from flights on the Space Shuttle Discovery to the Soyuz, JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi will have spent more time in space than any of his other crewmates. It is my pleasure to welcome Welcome him here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Soichi. Honjitsu wa arigato gozaimasu. Wow, that's wonderful. Marina, how are you doing? Thanks for having me today. This is uh, wonderful. Today we are celebrating the launch, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here with us. I am sure you have felt the excitement for today's launch, Soichi, and you will be on the next Crew Dragon flight after this one. Are you excited to launch from Kennedy Space Center again, and how are you preparing for this new vehicle? Yes, definitely we are excited to go back to Kennedy Space Center. My first space flight was from Kennedy Space Center on the Space Shuttle Discovery. That was 15 years ago, but my, my memory is still fresh. I still feel the vibration of the launch, the same launch pad of 39A that the demo to go up and the same launch pad that we will go up uh, as a crew one. And uh, our crew is getting ready for the final uh, training phase, which will come uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, the mood is really high and we are ready to go up. And as you know, the International Space Station and space exploration is an international effort. How do you feel representing the Japanese Space Agency once again on the ISS? Well, I think the, the strengths of the International Space Station is the diversity of the, all the participating countries. And adding a diversity is definitely gives a rigidity to the program. And the same applies to our crew, our crew one. Our crew one, uh, we have four of us, but uh, quite a different background, uh, quite a different uh, ethnicity, and uh, definitely the diversity is the key word of our success to the crew one. And I'm sure it will be very successful. What are you looking forward to once you get back to the ISS? Well, this will be my third uh, visit to the International Space Station. I'd like to see the things that my colleagues keep saying, hey, you got to visit the space, space Station again because it's getting more comfortable, more roomy, and uh, I cannot wait to go back to my sleep station after 10 years. And nothing beats that view, does it? Oh, definitely. Uh, my last flight, we actually installed a big window called the cupola, and uh, that was a big hit, obviously. This is uh, the number one uh, leisure time for astronauts, and um, I'm ready to shoot as many photos as I can this time as well. Amazing. I will look forward to seeing those photos. I'm sure you remember exactly what it feels like in these moments right before a launch. What do you think Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley are feeling right now as they prepare to head to the ISS? Well, uh, Doug and 
Bob's uh, special uh, veterans, they know the drill. They have they have launched, uh, they, they experienced the launch before. So I think they're pretty relaxed. And uh, so far uh, through my training, I learned that most of the, uh, the steps before the launch is quite similar to what we have in the space shuttle days. So, uh, you know, different suit, different vehicle, but uh, all the necessity steps uh, to to go up into the capsule should feel similar. So I'm pretty sure they are relaxed. Of course, they are very excited. I'm sure they are. Gokatsu yakuo, oinori shiteimasu. Konjitsu wa arigato gozaimashita. Thank you so much, Soichi, for joining us today. Oh, Marina, you are so good. Domo arigato. <laughs> and uh, we are both enjoyed the beautiful lunch today. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck with your launch later this year. And as the excitement builds towards launch, I will send it back to you. Thank you, Marina. I now have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the International Space Station, Christina Cook. Christina, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Dan. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the space station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? So much history indeed. Um, it is really just such a testament to NASA. Not only are we pushing the boundaries of knowledge and discovery and exploration, but we're pushing the boundaries on how we accomplish that mission. We're bringing in commercial partners. We're fostering a space economy. So we're making sure that we're always pushing forward, always taking that next step. I think it's such a privilege to be part of an organization that recognizes if we're not actually making steps and in innovating every single time we do this, then we're not truly answering humanity's call to explore and to push those boundaries. Christina, I know Bob and Doug are veterans themselves, but what advice do you have for Bob and Doug, given your experience as a long-duration station crew member? Well, being able to live on board the International Space Station and work there is just such a privilege. You know, you're a steward of this amazing laboratory that's bringing so many benefits down to Earth and also learning how we can push farther into the universe. So it is quite an honor, and I think that's the main thing about how it feels to be up there for a long duration. You know, in terms of advice, um, Bob and Doug have been great mentors for me. They've given me advice for so many years. It's strange to be the one who could be in a position to offer them anything. But I would say that as, you know, shuttle flyers, they used to participate in missions that were really, really intense, go, go, go all the time. Long duration space flight is more of a marathon than a sprint. So I would tell them to take that moment, enjoy it, and you know, really welcome the opportunity to have part of your mission be taking it all in and sharing that with the people that got you there. Thanks again, Christina. Always a pleasure to hear from you and fantastic words. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. My pleasure. So once again, Bob and Doug, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, um, They'll be greeted by astronaut Kiss Chris Cassidy, but before we do that, let's toss to a briefing. Hello everyone, I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. Together, we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. 
Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. With them, they flew an American flag, representing America's technical prowess. Thirty years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the first Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window, along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. And that was a very special message from NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy. Right now, the lone American aboard the International Space Station, so he will be ready and waiting to welcome Bob and Doug uh, when they arrive tomorrow, if liftoff happens today, uh, a little uh, later tomorrow morning. The countdown now stands at T minus one hour, 25 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting until launch. And we'd like to share with you just how much has happened here at Kennedy Space Center since the last time we had a crew on the pad launching from here. As you can imagine, the end of the shuttle era was a bittersweet moment for many people across this spaceport. But in the end, we knew we were striving for this day, and here we are. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center's Deputy Director, Janet Petro, on the comeback we've seen across Florida's Space Coast. She's with Daryl Nail now at OSB2. Daryl? Yeah, thank you, Marie. Janet, uh, you were just telling me you were there at the crew walkout. Um, tell me a little bit about what you saw between the astronauts and their families. So it was uh, very historic. It was very uh, emotional. So when Doug and Bob first came out of the uh, doors, you know, of course, a uh, cheer went up from everybody. You know, the vice president was there, Elon was there, uh, the crew families was there, and of course, uh, uh, Bob, myself, and the rest of uh, the center leadership was there to cheer them on. Um, but then, the, you know, when they came out and uh, then they went to the families and uh, Bob Benkin said virtual hug and he, he shouted out a virtual hug and he did this motion and of course his uh, his child also did that uh, virtual hug and so I guess that's the uh, tradition of doing a virtual hug with mm -hmm. the uh, families and then they um, uh, you know then they walked and got in the Tesla um, either side and the family walked right up to the uh, window of the Tesla and were talking you know having a private last moment with their um, with their father uh, hand on the window it was very emotional I had tears in my eyes I don't know how many other people had tears in their eyes, but it was it was really a special emotional moment, and everybody was of course wishing them well. Um, a lot of I love yous, a lot of uh, Godspeeds, a lot of Ad Astra, you know, take right. care, all of that. So it was very special. That, thank you so much for sharing that with us, and and in the context of why it's so important, Janet, you remember you've been here since 2007. Yep. You were here in 2011 when Shuttle Atlantis came to wheel stop. I've, I've talked to my uncle and father who worked out here. Uh, you know, layoff notices went out like the next day when the shuttle came to a stop. Um, it was a very sad time. Bob Cabana, the director here, called, called it depressing. Uh, 
tell me about that time and how far we've come. Yeah, so uh, as you as you note, it was the end of a very iconic program. You know, a lot of people had spent their entire career uh, working on the space shuttle program. So 135 flights, um, all of them launching from Launch Complex 39, many from 39A, where we're going to be launching from today, and then returning back. You know, at the shuttle landing facility, those two iconic sonic booms was something that all along the Space Coast, people really uh, resonated with, really felt in their hearts and looked forward to. So it was a it was a very sad time, but I will tell you that 30-year program we had planned for it. Um, the the workforce was incredible. You know, there was there was a lot of people who, as I said, spent their entire career here, and they wanted to safely fly that shuttle out, and then they retired. There was also another large uh, group of people that just wanted to put on their resume that they had been privileged to work on the space shuttle. So the the workforce I was a, incredibly proud of because they were um, resilient, they were dedicated, they were committed to safely flying out that shuttle. They didn't skip any steps. And regardless, as you said, that they knew they were getting their layoff notices. Uh, I think it landed on a Wednesday. They were getting their layoff notice on a Friday. They were in it till the end to make sure we safely flew it out. And of course, you know, we had 14,000 uh, workers out here then, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we have uh, a lot fewer here today. Um, and of course, our guest operations, you remember those last shuttle flights.
All stations come up for section 54.57, Chief Engineer and Technical Pole for launch escape arming and propellant loop.
Slot check on count.net. Close out team has departed the pad and the hazard area and is beyond the roadblocks. Field lead has started. Stage one, RP1 lead started. And stage two, RP1 lead started. Dragon, SpaceX for prop. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to equalize the pressures in the common manifolds just to raise them a little bit. So we will be momentarily cycling the tank isolation valves. I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know for awareness. 
Okay, we appreciate that, Jay. Dragon SpaceX valve cycling is complete, uh, expected behavior, and wanted to hear if you were able to hear those. We actually did, Jay. We were just uh, making a comment about that. I heard some clicking, and, uh, and Bob watched it on the uh, systems display, so absolutely. Copy all.
Dragon, SpaceX. We are at T-minus one hour. You are go for Section 6. When ready, we report go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, we'll put uh, Section 6 in work. Copy. SpaceX Dragon, Bob and I are go for launch. Copy, go for launch. Next up will be the go no go pull at T minus 45. We copy, we're holding in step six decimal five. Launch director in the countdown net. We're ready for pull for propellant load and launch. Please review your launch commit criteria. Again, this is uh, to review and confirm no violation of the launch commit criteria. We are tracking one issue with uh, weather still. And I think we'll need to track that all the way down to uh, launch to uh, clear that. This pulls also go for arming and launch escape system and a go for propellant load. And this is he on countdown, countdown net reporting that uh, the technical pull was completed. All systems are proceeding. Uh, We're monitoring the weather as LD briefed. We're also looking at a uh, watch item on a hydraulics QD rod ring. Uh, ring pressure will come up at minus 8 minutes 30 seconds and we'll be able to verify decay rate. No concerns at this time. Everything's reading nominal, uh, but watching that item. Uh, no other constraints on Falcon 9 or ground systems. Stage 2, RP-1 bleed is complete.
PCS transition to helium started. Yes, launch director in the countdown net. Pull is complete, and we have a go to proceed with propellant load. Launch control, proceed with swing in the crew arm. Arming crew arm movement for T minus 45 minutes. Thank you, launch control. A reminder in control room on hold and launch escape protocol for non-urgent no-go conditions, brief CE or LD, and it will approve aborting the launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. 
launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. Remainder on fire alarm instructions here in firing room four, in the event of a fire alarm, key operators previously briefed will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, we will evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. One final reminder, we'll be arming the launch escape system momentarily. Need all personnel, please stay in your seats from now through orbit insertion and dragon separation from the second stage. Rear access arm retract has started. And for the launch team, we're continuing to track three weather rule violations that are continuing to be evaluated by the launch weather officer, expecting those rules to clear at 2020 UTC or 20 minutes after the top of the hour. Crew arm in position for launch. Dragon SpaceX with the arm call. You are go for Section 7, close visors and arm launch escape system. Dragon captains go for Section 7. Stage one, field lead is complete. SpaceX Dragon in uh, seven decimal two, our visors are closed and we're arming the launch escape system. Copy. Launch escape system is verified armed. Service section per switching to GN2.
F9 tanks venting for propellant load. Propellant load has started.
stage one locks and RP1 flow rates are nominal. Stage one cryohelium load has started. Dragon SpaceX for a weather update. Go ahead, SpaceX. Yeah, we're currently just evaluating uh, one constraint, a constraint on the field mill rule, which looks at lightning energy dissipation. Um, we expect to have an update at about T minus 20, 
and uh, more information there on whether we would be able to continue into the prop load or, or scrub at that time. Okay, Jay, thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Copy. So I'll give you some more words in about six minutes. Dragon Captain. Stage two cryohelium load started.
Lock strong back trail started. Stage two, RP one load complete. And Dragon SpaceX on weather, uh, we're still not looking uh, good currently. Uh, LD is uh, still having some discussions. Uh, expect an update from LD uh, in a few minutes. Okay, Dragon, copy. launch director and a countdown net. We continue to violate a couple different weather rules that we now do not expect to clear in time to allow for a launch today. We'll go ahead and end uh, today's launch attempt. Launch control, if you would end the launch auto sequence and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence, please. Launch abort has started. Dragon SpaceX, unfortunately, um, we are not going to launch today. You are go for 5.100 launch scrub. 5.100, it was a good effort by the teams, and we understand, and we'll uh, meet you there. Copy all. Clarity, we are scrubbed for today's launch attempt. Dragon SpaceX for propellant offload status. 
Go ahead, Mike. Yes, sir. So we're at 75% on the uh, fuel tank for stage. LOX was up to 69%. On the second stage, we're at 97% for... Good. ...with two astronauts on board has just been scrubbed, postponed due to inclement weather around the Cape Canaveral launch site in Florida. Liftoff had been scheduled for 4.33 Eastern time, just moments from now. But storm clouds and lightning in the area has forced a delay the launch... Saturday. Tom Costello is at the Kennedy Space Center now with the very latest. Tom? Well, this just happened within the past 90 seconds or so. We were within 17 minutes of lifting off here on launch pad 39A, the historic launch pad that sent Apollo astronauts and space shuttle astronauts into space. The, the rocket fully fueled with two astronauts, Doug Bob Denkin and Doug Hurley, uh, both strapped in and ready to go. But the weather has been dicey all day today. And in fact, we've been dealing with squalls and high wind and rain and thunder and lightning. And it was lightning just literally minutes before that 17 marker lightning off to my left. That probably was the defining moment. They had to pull the plug on this. They have very strict weather parameters. They cannot violate these weather criteria because you're opening yourself up to any number of problems as the rocket is lifting off and headed for the space station. And so now out there on launch pad 39A, the astronauts are still strapped in and they're going through the very meticulous process of taking the fuel off of the rocket. That's going to take some time, as you know, to do that safely. And then eventually they will take uh, both of these astronauts off of the SpaceX rocket. That means now that the next attempt to launch is going to be on Saturday and then Sunday. And interestingly, the launch director said if we could just have 10 more minutes, we might be able to wait this out. The trouble is they have a very, very tight window. They have to launch at exactly that second so that they can eventually intersect uh, and, and, and head right up to the International Space Station. They had hoped to hit that at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow Eastern time, and now that's going to have to wait. By the way, this comes just as President Trump had pulled in behind the camera. There's a building. President Trump had just arrived to watch this watch, to watch this li uh, liftoff, and Vice President Pence is also here. So a disappointing day. You could almost predict it, though, Lester, because we've been dealing with volatile weather all day, and we're probably really in the best weather we've had all day. The lull of the day is right now, but lightning off to my left, and that's probably what ended up being the defining factor for canceling this liftoff today. Lester? Yeah, safety number one, of course. Uh, Tom, thank you. Al Roker has been following the weather at the launch site, and Al, it wasn't just the launch site. They've been watching weather up much of the East Coast uh, as an important factor in all this. That's right. We had a tropical storm this morning, tropical storm Bertha. But as Tom mentioned, and we've been talking about this all day, there was a 60 percent chance of these thunderstorms happening. And so 60 percent chance of this launch not happening right now. Take a look on the radar and you'll see uh, there's Bertha right now, uh, 65 miles north, northwest of Charleston, South Carolina. And as that system pushes off, here's the latest on the radar. As we look, you can see here they are. And look to the west. This is just past Orlando. We are watching this line of showers and thunderstorms starting to fire up. And in fact, here's the live radar. And we've been watching this line build up in the last 20, 30 minutes. So I don't know even if they had had the, another 10 or 15 minutes, Lester, whether they would have made it. This is very volatile. You see the lightning strikes out over the ocean and lightning strikes, by, strikes back to the west. It was dicey from this morning. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like now the weather caught up with them. But as you said, safety first. It's not worth risking uh, the lives of those astronauts and all the work that's gone into this launch. Lester? Yeah, space will still be there on Saturday. Joining us now from Houston is astronaut Michael Fink, a spaceflight veteran who has a, as a mission specialist aboard the shuttle Endeavour in May 2011 for the second to last ever shuttle mission. Uh, Colonel, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Tell me what it is like to, to sit there waiting for a launch that may be a go or no go right after the last few minutes. Hey, Lester, uh, good to see you again. And I uh, just wanted to say that, yeah, on STS-134, the second to last uh, shuttle flight, uh, we were halfway to the launch pad and we had to turn our, our uh, Astro van around because we scrubbed. So I know uh, Bob and Doug are disappointed. I know their families are a little disappointed, but everybody knows it's for the right thing. And uh, so they're going to wait uh, till um, a few things happen so they can safely exit the spacecraft and uh, they're going to go back into quarantine. 
We'll stay in quarantine and uh, looking for a launch on Saturday around 3.22 p.m. And uh, it's, sometimes it's uh, best just to uh, live to fight another day. Yeah, the, the defueling that's going on right now, if that's the right phrase, this is potentially a little dicey in itself, is it not? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, explosive fuels, right? And, uh, and uh, so, yes, but we've, um, we've practiced this. And SpaceX, a very nice thing with them and, and the Falcon 9 is they practiced this maneuver before. Uh, they load the propellant on typically very late compared to what we did with Space Shuttle and other uh, rockets. Uh, and they densify a little bit their, uh, their, so they make it almost slushy, their propellant, so it's extra cold. But they also uh, know how to uh, uh, get it back out and make it safe so that the crew can exit the spacecraft. This was one of the first things we asked them when they proposed their, uh, their plan for densified propellant, how we would handle scrubs. And today they're going to execute it uh, by the book. All right. Well, I know you were excited to see it. A lot of us are. But as I mentioned a moment ago, space will be there on Saturday. So we'll just wait for that moment. Colonel, thank you uh, for joining us. And to repeat, the launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with two astronauts aboard has been postponed due to bad weather. Another attempt expected this Saturday. I'll have complete details when we see you a bit later tonight on NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News. <laughs>Hey, Allison, sure. So we're starting off our headlines today with a grim update. The death toll in the United States from coronavirus has now reached the 100,000 mark. That's according to account by NBC News. Now, this milestone comes as states across the country are starting to reopen despite surges in new infections in states like California, Alabama and Virginia. Now, Disney has announced it is planning to reopen some of its parks starting in mid-July. That's the latest from NBC's Ahiza Garcia Hodges. The phased reopening will begin with parks in Orlando, Florida. Now, the Orange County Recovery Task Force has approved the plans, but Governor Ron DeSantis and the mayor of Orange County also need to sign off. There will be a number of new safety measures in place. Here's Disney CEO Bob Chapik on CNBC. Our capacity will be a function of the six-foot social distancing guidance that we have from the CDC. So the number of people we put in the park will be a function of that calculation. Uh, we're being very, very cautious with our cast members. As a matter of fact, our cast members have all been sent home, not only masks, but also personal temperature testing devices so they can take their own temperatures every morning. But then in addition to that, when they report to work, if they're guest facing, they will actually be tested again uh, at the workplace. Disney events that bring together large crowds like parades won't be available, nor will high contact activities like playgrounds. An ongoing federal remdesivir trial for a coronavirus treatment is entering its next phase. That's from NBC's Erica Edwards. The new phase will test the combination of the experimental drug with an anti-inflammatory pill. In the trial, all patients will receive remdesivir. Half will also receive the additional pill, while the other half will receive a placebo. Researchers are hoping to recruit 600 to 700 patients for the trial. Now from NBC's Lucy Bailey, Boeing will lay off nearly 7,000 employees as the coronavirus pandemic continues to tank the demand for travel. In a letter to employees, Boeing CEO David Calhoun cited the, quote, whipsawing of the coronavirus pandemic and wrote, quote, we have come to the unfortunate moment of having to start involuntary layoffs. Airline industry leaders have previously warned that it will take years for this sector to recover. Some news from South Korea. More than 2 million students are back in school as the country juggles education while the virus continues to spread. That's from NBC's Mahalia Hobson and Stella Kim. Kindergarten students and some middle school and high school students return to new environments with social distancing and face masks. Now, meanwhile, South Korea recorded its highest number of new infections in more than a month. Roughly 450 schools have chosen not to open their doors quite yet after a student and teacher tested positive. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back uh, a little later with more, Allison.
All right, Alexa, looking forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, you can visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We always have the latest updates there. More than 100,000 Americans are now dead from COVID-19 in just 12 weeks. Think of all those lives, all of their loved ones, their stories. NBC News correspondent Kevin Tibbles reports. A grim milestone, 100,000. Americans from all walks of life, across generations. The New York Times filled its front page with just a thousand of the grandfathers, grandmothers, husbands and wives, sons and daughters. 100,000 taken so fast by COVID-19, this country is still reeling in shock. Cody Lister of Colorado was a healthy 21-year-old kid. Cody just, he had the most the best smile in the world, and he would reach out and use that. Korean War vet James Mandeville was 83 years old when COVID took him from his family. Darianna Dyson was just 15. This hurts people. This this hurts people in ways that they'll never be able to come back from. In just a few short months, this pandemic sweeping the world has infected some 2 million here at home. Hospitals turned into battlefields. It is absolutely heartbreaking. From the young to the old, they are all very sick. Our new soldiers, the frontline workers, have fallen in service too. Chicago nurse Chris Guzman was a 35-year-old with three young children. Louisiana cop Mark Hall Sr. had 30 years on the force. Philip Dover, two decades driving a bus in New Jersey. And as we gingerly open up, perhaps wave from a safe distance, we have not had time to grieve. Somebody who passes away has, you know, touched many other people's lives and no one's here besides them but me. 100,000. The obituary names grow daily with no end in sight. Painful to learn of the hopes and dreams lost. And when we can't say goodbye in person, it hurts. I give them a moment of silence and respect them because um, we all have loved ones out there. We as survivors must remember, no one, no matter who they were, should leave this world alone. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Chicago. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo met with the president in Washington today to talk infrastructure and jumpstarting New York's economy. And there cannot be a national recovery if the state and local governments are not funded. That is a fact. Meanwhile, today, New York's Long Island enters phase one of reopening, the only place still closed in the state, New York City. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joining me now from Babylon, Long Island. And Ron, first, how did Governor Cuomo's meeting with the president go today? Well, I think we'll have to wait to see what the president has to say about that, because basically the governor was making some asks of him and Republicans in Congress as well. Uh, This is all about money. The governor has been consistently saying that the state is in a big hole as a result of this epidemic that he's been trying to deal with. He wanted the commitment from the president to support bills in, in the Senate and House that will provide money to the states and to localities. So far, Uh, There's been a reluctance, a strong opposition is probably a better way to describe it, to that. And you've heard all the the red and blue and the partisan back and forth about it, how some like the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and others have called it a a blue state bailout. Uh, uh, Cuomo was trying to cut through all that, but it's still it's still there. Uh, And the president uh, can perhaps help with that, but he didn't make any great commitment to doing that as well. So the other big thing is infrastructure, which the president has talked about that he's interested in doing. But. Obviously, months before uh, the election, he's only going to want to support that under the right conditions. And it's kind of hard to see how he offers a lot of support to that to help a governor in in a blue state. Because, again, Washington is so mired in all this partisanship and nothing seems to get done. Uh, So the governor said it was a good meeting and they agreed to talk again next week. Uh, But again, it's we have to see what President Trump has to say about that. And what he says consistently, of course, because he may say one thing and then say something else and so on and so forth. Allison. 
All right, Ron, Long Island reopening today. How are the business there, businesses there prepping? How are folks in Babylon getting ready? Well, Long Island is a big, big place. It's about 3 million people. It's as big as maybe 20, other, 20 states. So it's not, a, uh, it's not an insignificant place. Here, like yesterday in Westchester County and New Rochelle, everyone is being very cautious. The big things are construction and manufacturing. Uh, now some curbside retail as well. Uh, the, the concern on, in places like here in Babylon on Main Street are the small mom and pop shops who feel like they've already been put in a hole deeper because big real retailers like Target, others, um, have, have been able to open and, and sell things for the past couple of weeks, if not longer. And so now you have these small mom and pops that are trying to compete with those giants who already had an advantage, uh, an, an online advantage, certainly. Uh, so they're now trying to make up for that deficit as well. So today we see shop owners who are, in some cases, getting back to their premises for the first time in months, trying to figure out how to socially distance, uh, how many employees to call back, how much of their goods they're going to be able to sell, to see what kind of cash flow they're going to be able to generate, yeah. if any. Uh, there are some that won't open up at all because they've, it's already been too long, two months without any business. Um, so that's what we see, a mix of very cautiously getting into this, really hoping that this phase only lasts a, uh, two weeks or so, the minimum, and then they move to phase two, which is a wider opening up of the economy. Uh, but, it, but after two months of, of nothing to get the green light to begin something to start, uh, I think most people are, 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 set, are happy, uh, but leery, and of course concerned about a, a new spike in cases, yeah. which we've seen in, in different parts of the country in places that have reopened. Allison? Ron, New York City, the epicenter of the outbreak, of course, still shut down. What metrics does the city still need to hit for it to reopen? New York needs more hospital beds, uh, a, a bigger percentage of hospital beds available, and they need more contact tracers. Um, and today, the mayor, Mayor de Blasio, said that they had upped the number to uh, many thousands, and they're trying to hire, bring on more and more contact tracers, the people who will hopefully find where people uh, who got the disease, who they were in contact with, and we all know that process, um, key to reopening. What, what, what New York City is trying to do is, is focus more resources, more testing, and making uh, quarantine spaces, hotel rooms available to people in the hardest hit zip codes, the hardest hit neighborhoods, which tend to be minority neighborhoods in New York, in, in Brooklyn and Queens, those boroughs especially. Um, they're trying to trying to get a handle on things in that way so that when they open up, they can find out where the new cases are coming and quickly contain them. But, you know, as, as you can imagine, you live there, everybody opening up New York, 8 million people, um, it's just a massive undertaking. Yeah. And as much as uh, people want to get out, boy, you know, it's uh, still a lot of people I talk to who are not comfortable riding the subway, which is the lifeline of that city, or, or buses yeah. for that matter. To, to get anywhere. You know, there's right. uh, so much talk about um, major employers uh, in Midtown uh, letting their employees work uh, remotely at home because people are concerned about coming back into crowded office buildings. You know, how do you socially distance in these places? Right. So it's uh, the, the expectation is that in a week or two, the, the mayor has said, the governor has said the first two weeks of June, New York should, City should begin to get to phase one. But um, getting from phase one to two to three to four, which is the end of it all, um, that seems like a really difficult journey for New York City, but hopefully we'll get on it soon. <laughs> I live there, and we certainly like to see some progress and like to see um, <laughs> this virus contained and controlled Absolutely. as, as Absolutely. best as possible. So hey, hey, Ron, can, um, you know, get back to this mm -hmm. normal. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I'm a native Long Islander, and we are real, real proud of our beaches. And for folks who aren't from this area, it's super easy uh, in a typical summer to jump on the Long Island Railroad and head to Long Beach from New York City or take a bus to Jones Beach. Is there any concern uh, on Long Island that with the city, city still closed, uh, that a ton of folks will be trying to get out of the city coming to Long Island and then the beaches will be crowded and potentially closed? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge concern. It was a big concern over the Memorial Day weekend, which is why some communities yeah. imposed uh, restrictions that only residents could use the beaches because they're reducing the capacity by as much as 50 percent uh, in some places. So if you reduce it by 50 percent, there are all kinds of reports of beaches closing early, parking lots closing early in the day. And the last thing that 
people in Long Island want is for the beach to be closed because people from New York City came out. The other problem is that um, the mayor and others are just trying to discourage people from using the subways and buses because they want that uh, transit right. system reserved for essential employees who need to get where they're going. And there's a lot of essential employees uh, who are Absolutely. doing all kinds of jobs in the city, from grocery clerks to, of course, healthcare workers who need to use the subways and buses to get where they want to go. And they don't want that disrupted by people going to the beach or crowded by people going to the beach. So, uh, right. and it's getting warm out here. <laughs> and so uh, um, that's going to be an enduring <laughs> problem. It sure uh, is. New York City's beaches were closed. Yeah, New York City's beaches were closed. Whether they will open soon, you know, that I don't know. That's probably like phase two, maybe three. Um, I don't know exactly, but right. it's, it doesn't feel imminent, like next weekend. Right, right. And as you say, Ron, we're inching closer to beach weather on Long Island. Ron Allen in Babylon, thank you so much. President Trump fighting with Twitter on Twitter, of course, the president tweeting that Twitter is, quote, completely stifling free speech after Twitter put a fact check label on the president's tweets for the first time this week. In these particular tweets, the president said mail in ballots will be fraudulent. The president now threatening to close down or strongly regulate social media platforms that, quote, silence conservative voices. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward joining me from Twitter's headquarters in San Francisco. And Jake, for years, Twitter's let the president's controversial tweets slide. What pushed them to take action now? Allison, this seems to have crossed a line that people at social media companies have been trying to describe for years, which is that they think in general, speech is good. All speech is good, and especially the speech of public figures. But in this case, they said in a statement, these tweets contain potentially misleading information about voting processes. That's the key thing, Allison. And have been labeled to provide additional context around mail-in ballots. This decision is in line with the approach we shared earlier this month. Basically, once you get into disenfranchising the vote, in some way suppressing it, misinforming people about it, that seems to be where social media companies consider the line to be. And in this case, the president seems to have walked right over that, Alice. Jake, critics say Twitter's been too hands-off when it comes to misinformation spread by President Trump and other world leaders, for that matter. Uh, what is the company's stance there? Well, the stance really seems to be that as long as you and I have the right to vote someone out of office based on all the information that is made available to us on platforms like Twitter, then that's okay. how the system is supposed to work. Of course, this is tricky stuff. I mean, you know, how are you supposed to draw the line between something that the president says, you know, and, and that is an outright lie, where he lies over and over again on social media, and then the misinformation that here could be harmful to democracy? I mean, we saw last year, you know, the, the um, uh, Trump super fan, Cesar Sayok, uh, wound up in court on charges of attempted murder for sending explosives out to people that he had learned and considered were uh, Trump's enemies based on all of the tweeting Trump had been doing. I mean, this is complicated stuff. Are you supposed to, as Twitter, then say anything uh, he says uh, against someone else should be somehow amplified in some way or considered to be more dangerous than something else? I mean, it's such a complicated world. What they've tried to draw is this clear line about voting because without that of course uh, they say that the whole system right. falls apart and real and falsehoods can really change democracy fundamentally else Jake we've said the president is now threatening to regulate social media platforms does he have the authority to do that well, no. I mean, in a word, no, right? By fiat, the president cannot simply shut down a company he doesn't feel good about. And it would be ironic if in this fight about free speech, he were to shut down this company for, uh, right. you know, and, and its free speech uh, because it somehow infringed on his. You know, none of that is really there. You know, what is, of course, possible is that he could take his voice to a different platform, right? That's the ultimate uh, sort of punishment for a company like this. But this is the weird symbiotic relationship the president has with this company, right? He's fighting with them. He's He's decrying their moves here, and yet he's doing it all on Twitter. You know, he needs the 80 million followers he has on Twitter because he just l seems to love the, the open-ended broadcast potential of being able to speak across this platform to all these people in this unfiltered way. So shutting it down, no, he does not have that rule, uh, you know, that, that uh, power. But more importantly, he really just, it's not in his interest, Alison. Jake, what's the reaction been like in conservative circles? 
Well, I mean, this is the craziest part, is to watch the sort of machinery spin up. And I don't mean to suggest that it's orchestrated by any one person, but it is certainly a machine of trolls uh, that, that comes out of the woodwork in a circumstance like this. And it's not made better by the president's allies going on television and naming Twitter executives personally, attacking them personally. Whatever you may think about how this platform behaves or what rules it has created, attacking individuals for enacting the policies of their employer, you know, that seems to me a little bit beyond the pale. And so we've seen that sort of thing happening uh, all over the place. Meanwhile, you have people like Newt Gingrich going on Fox News and talking about, uh, you know, the need to, to take a different line if you're Twitter. Otherwise, they're going to go from being an open entrepreneurial uh, company to something that's going to have to be heavily regulated. I think all of us are realizing that these platforms have a huge influence on American public life and that they can have this, you know, in some ways devastating effect on the truth. But how we're going to regulate that, it seems that both sides are suddenly starting to think very, very harshly about that house. Jake, meanwhile, Twitter's under fire for refusing to take down another set of the president's tweets this week. Trump tweeted uh, baseless claims about MSNBC host Joe Scarborough, alleging that Scarborough was involved in the death of a staffer while he was a congressman. That late staffer's husband asked Twitter to take the tweets down. Twitter would not, and the president is still tweeting about it. Why is Twitter leaving those particular tweets up? This is that strange line that, that is drawn, right? You and I talking, you know, uh, like this might be able to agree together, you know, that's beyond the pale. Joe Scarborough, how could you possibly do that? How could you torture the, uh, this, this poor woman's family with all of this? You know, how could you keep all of that up, Twitter? Well, the way someone who works there thinks about it is instead thinking, okay, what is the ultimate line of free speech? Well, as long as we have the right to vote, and as long as there is the opportunity for Americans to come out in numbers against someone like the president who says something outrageous like that on a platform like this, well, then perhaps the system continues to work. As, but as soon as the president walks over the line and begins to change the vote and how it is offered to you and I, stating falsehoods about mail-in ballots, then they say, well, then wait a minute. Okay, that's beyond the pale. This is the weird world of social media, Allison, that, uh, that, that you know, insinuating yeah. this baseless claim against our colleague and then, uh, you know, talking about, you know, committing a falsehood that's pretty low, one might argue, on the rank of falsehoods that the president's put out over the years on Twitter, that those things are separated out is really the, the strange world that social media has created for all of us, Alice. It is complex and at times confusing. Jake Ward, thanks so much for explaining it to us. It's always great to see you. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Which part of America has the highest per capita rate of positive COVID-19 tests in the country? It's not New York or even Los Angeles or Chicago. It's the Navajo Nation, the country's largest Native American reservation. There are more than 4,000 cases and more than 150 deaths there. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hillier joining me now from Navajo County, Arizona. And Vaughn, why is there such a high infection rate on the reservation? Allison, if I could just kind of set everybody up here, because I think there's a good number of folks that have never driven through the Navajo Nation before. You can see its vastness behind me. To give you an idea, it is larger. The Navajo Nation is larger in, in, in land size than 10 U.S. states. There are 160,000 folks spread out across the Navajo Nation here. And you ask that question, why is there such a high rate of infection? Well, look at a lot of these more urban communities that do exist in the, in, in the nation. We were spent yesterday over in Chinle, which has about 5,000 folks more in that sort of inner city core. But then you have folks for miles. You know, they come in from hours, two hours away into Chinle. There's one grocery store, one Bashes. We're in Cayenta right now. The same situation, one Bashes. And so when folks are coming in, to one urban core, uh, you also have the reality that a lot of folks live in multi-generational homes here. So you have three or even four generations living in one home space together here. But the other issue that we need to talk about, Allison, is the fact that history has denied folks on the reservation of proper access to water, proper access to electricity, proper access to right. uh, broadband, you are dealing with, Allison, the reality that COVID has perhaps exposed a great part of this country to the realities that exist here. 40 to 80 percent of folks, when you talk to the Navajos, say that folks here live without water, without running water, Allison. That is no plumbing. You also have about half of the population without electricity. You have another 40, 50 percent without Internet. So, you know, while others around the country can tell their kids to zoom in with their teachers, that's not happening here. You know, you can say, go wash your hands, Allison. That's a little harder around here to right. do. You know, they are we are dealing with historical uh, disparities that right now it's no surprise that, you know, the highest covid positive rate is right here on the Navajo Nation. Just come and take a drive through here. I would encourage all others to. You know, I was talking with a young woman yesterday. She said she'd love to see some folks in Washington just try to come and spend a couple days here, live here, and just see what life is like and to at least better understand what folks here on the nation are going through. Vaughn, you know, they are things that we, we so take for granted. We think it's so simple to just wash our hands frequently uh, or, 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 like you said, to have the kids sit on the iPad and take a class from home. Uh, you really realize uh, what a privilege that is, uh, that, that so many people do not have that access. With such a high infection rate there, I would imagine nearly everyone has been impacted by the coronavirus in some way. Uh, what are the members of the Navajo Nation telling you? These are tight-knit communities, Allison, that go back generations. Uh, I just yeah. want to play part of an interview uh, just a few moments ago with uh, the mother and sister of Valentina Blackhorse, 28 years old. She has a one-and-a-half-year-old son named Poet. She lost her life. Take a listen to part of our interview with her mother and her sister. She used to tell us, Mom and Dad, be careful. Wear your mask, wear your gloves. This virus is awful, is what she used to tell us. Don't go to public where a lot of people are. Don't go there. In a way, I am angry. Because, you know, I see the young, some of the younger generation making fun of it. Making fun of people that passed on or the virus. And that angers me. Allison, you just heard Valentina, who passed away, took this seriously, urging her mother 
to not yeah. go to the grocery store, urging her mother to wear a mask and gloves. And the reality is, is that, you know, around the rest of the country, business may, may be opening, but the likes, the reality at the same time here is that in communities like this, they are continuing to go through this and the exposure is still real and the realities are still real in communities like this, Allison. Vaughn, I imagine the list of needs there is pretty long right now, but what is their biggest need? What would help Navajo Nation most right now? Resources, attention, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that this is more than COVID. Yeah. This is more than a pandemic that is impacting this community. You know, you look around this community, there may be no more resilient population in, Amer in American history. I should say, in fact, there is no more resilient population than the Native American community uh, in, in the U.S. mainland. Uh, you, we're going around here from Chinle to Cayenta. You see folks, locals, uh, Navajos that are organizing together, that are going and building water stations. I was talking with, uh, you know, w one woman, uh, uh, Cherish, who was delivering out about an hour outside of town, a water hand washing station to her old elementary school bus driver. Well, guess who built that hand washing station? Her husband, Anthony. Uh, you've also then got Charmaine Sosi, who started uh, helped start up this local organization in Chinle called uh, Chinle Planting Hope with a, a couple other local women. And they were out. We were out with them yesterday as they were going and delivering uh, flour and cornmeal. Uh, and more other non-perishable items and, and paper products and, and sanitizer uh, to the elders because they're encouraging these elders, don't come into town, stay at home. They are going out and mobilizing. You also have Johns Hopkins uh, Center for American Indian Health, which has had a footprint here for more than 40 years. They have more than two dozen folks on the ground across the nation. They are also helping organize. You have several uh, of these grassroots organizations. Uh, the Arizona National Guard has come in here to help Doctors uh, Without Borders. And so, yes, luckily there is attention being paid here. But again, the, where a lot of the frustration lies among the Navajo community is that it shouldn't take COVID-19 to draw attention to the disparities that exist here. And yes, it should be no surprise that they have the highest infection rate. Allison, actually, can we play that sound real fast? I wanted to give, give, give Charmaine a sound bite real fast if we could. Instead of being afraid, I got angry. I got angry at it, this virus. You're not gonna take any more of my people. You are not allowed here. And I'm gonna go out there and serve my people. I'm gonna help them and keep them home so they don't have to get out in the community and become vulnerable to this virus. Allison, that was Charmaine. Charmaine is one of those local moms. She does not even have running water herself, her and her own family. This is a tough time here. And the folks here want, to know, want the world to know that they are resilient. They're going to continue to fight and their voices should be heard. Allison? They sure are and they sure should. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much for sharing their stories. South Korea just recorded its highest number of new coronavirus infections in nearly a month, but that didn't stop more than 2 million students from going back to class. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul to show us how churches are reopening in South Korea, too. At this church in Seoul, a strange sight in the days of social distancing. More than 2,000 parishioners singing and praying under the same roof. The biggest turnout since this church reopened a month ago. Are you concerned about your parishioners getting the virus when they come to church? Uh, we, we worried about the uh, someone um, have the uh, virus, but uh, if we follow the government guideline closely, I, I think we will be safe. Like thermal scans, temperature checks, scanning in with a QR code so the church has a contact list in case someone gets sick. And most important of all, the pastor told me. Everybody must wear a mask to enter the service. That's very important for, for the church. You must wear a mask. Yeah, if you don't have the mask, 
you, you never get in the service. Back in February, South Korea had the most cases in the world outside of China, many of them tied to a controversial church. This outbreak sort of started in a cluster in the southeast with this religious sect, which is very secretive. Yet the country never went under a full lockdown. Offices, shops, restaurants stayed open. And the country's case count is still low. Just over 11,000 confirmed cases and less than 300 deaths. That's compared to countries in Europe or the U.S. that have seen tens of thousands, even 100,000 deaths. Dr. Hun Sang Lee is a public health professor. What's the danger mm -hmm. of, of having a church service? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you are having a large number of the uh, uh, people, congregations, in uh, enclosed environments, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. clapping and singing and maybe sh shouting in prayer. So all those kind of situation is quite uh, ideal for transmissions of the uh, coronavirus. At first, churches resisted calls to close, but relented in early March, only welcoming back worshipers with the government's blessing at the end of April with new rules in place. Hand sanitizer at the door, people sitting at least three feet apart, gradually increasing the number of people allowed inside at any one time. And what about holding prayer books or singing or talking to someone next to you? Can you uh, do those things? Uh, singing is okay, but uh, talk to the next person is prohibited. Health officials are still battling outbreaks. The latest at this warehouse for an e-commerce business, where 36 employees have tested positive for coronavirus. But no large clusters have been tied to reopened churches. This church now wants to be at full capacity, 14,000 worshipers by Sunday a true test of their new normal. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. A happy Wednesday to you. You've made it to the middle of the week. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is following the latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what have you got? Hey, Allison, lots of news in this hour, and we're starting with a numbers update here in the United States. At least 100,000 people in the U.S. have now died at the hands of coronavirus, according to a count by NBC News. Now, this comes as states across the country are starting to reopen and grappling with balancing public health concerns. Now, the nation's top disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, is warning states today of, quote, leapfrogging over reopening guidelines. In an interview with CNN, Dr. Fauci also discussed the likelihood of a second wave. Take a listen. It is not inevitable. If we do the kinds of things that we're putting in place now to have the workforce, the system, and the will to do the kinds of things that are the clear and effective identification, isolation, and contact tracing, we can prevent this second wave that we're talking about if we do it correctly. A new poll conducted by the Associated Press and the NORC Center for Public Affairs Research suggests only about half of Americans would get a coronavirus vaccine if it were available. This, of course, comes as the coronavirus pandemic has sparked a global race by scientists for preventative treatments. The survey found one in five Americans would refuse the vaccine and that 31 percent were not sure if they would get vaccinated. Now, the mayor of Minneapolis today called for charges to be filed against the officer who pinned his knee to George Floyd's neck before the man ultimately died. Take a listen to Mayor Frey. Why is the man who killed George Floyd not in jail? If you had done it or I had done it, we would be behind bars right now. And I cannot come up with a good answer to that question. Now, the county's attorney's office has not yet returned NBC News's request for comment. And lastly, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo notified Congress today that Hong Kong was no longer autonomous from China, a move that could threaten its trade relationship with the United States. That's the latest from CNBC's Tucker Higgins. This follows China's new proposed national security law impacting the territory. Now, in a statement, Pompeo called Beijing's decision, quote, disastrous and said, quote, no reasonable person can assert today that Hong Kong maintains a high degree of autonomy from China, given facts on the ground. 
Now, those are the latest headlines for this hour. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. And you can visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus anytime. We always have the latest updates there. The United States just passed a grim milestone. More than 100,000 people have died from the coronavirus, all gone within the last three months. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt has some of their stories. It's like we're living the stages of grief all at once. Denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and perhaps even acceptance. Is it possible we've come to accept 100,000 deaths? Or are we simply unable to process it? What, after all, is death on that scale supposed to look like? Is it the grim procession of covered stretchers carried to waiting hearses? Or the precious cargo of caskets stacked in mortuaries? Funeral director Joe Ruggiero's world for the last two months. We're dealing with situations where, you know, one spouse dies and the other spouse is, is sick in the hospital and, and families don't even know which, which way to go with things. Do we, 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 you know, stay for mom or do we, you know, take care of dad's services? 100,000 names. So many names. Almost impossible to read. And so many faces. A tear-stained fabric of crushing grief woven by 100,000 stories. We went on our first seat at 10 years old. My mom took us to the movies. Rob Weber was a fireman, Danielle Weber's husband of 21 years, a hands-on dad to his daughter Alexa, taken by COVID at 44. I don't really know what else to say. I lost the love of my life. Um, You know, I'll never get over it. I'll never know how to get past it. Their stories move us. Ron Golden, the truck driver and proud Native American Marine veteran. Adolph T.J. Mendez, father of six, who helped teach Sunday school. Gerda Gerbatsky, who barely escaped Nazi-occupied Austria. Detective Mary Lou Armour, who helps survivors of sexual assault. The toll has been compared to casualties of our modern wars. But they took years. This took weeks. And unlike wars, there are no stirring touchstones of grief, no arrivals of flag-draped coffins. But there are heroes, like Marilyn Howard, a school nurse, an immigrant from Guyana, who helped raise her five siblings after their mom died. She really was, there's no other way to say it, but but being the glue that that cemented us all together. What hold does does Marilyn's passing leave in in our world? Well, I think the world has lost uh, a nurse who would have been in the fight had she not gotten sick so early. I've lost a sister. Uh, uh, My family members have lost a godmother and an aunt and niece who uh, is irreplaceable. She was 53. This, of course, is not over, but we choose milestones to take stock, to remember, to share our sorrows until, as a country, we can confront the depths of our collective pain face to face. President Trump at Cape Canaveral today for the historic SpaceX launch. Postponed, though, because of the weather. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joining me now. And Shannon, the president had just gotten to the launch site when it was postponed. Has he commented at all since? No. And actually, Allison, we were expecting to hear remarks from the president at six o'clock today. And instead, shortly after this launch was scrapped, uh, the motorcade headed straight back to Air Force One. And uh, the president uh, should be in the air any minute now uh, if he hasn't departed already. So um, cutting short this trip uh, that the White House and the president had really hoped would, one, distract the national conversation from this issue, the issue of coronavirus, uh, and two, to project this image domestically and internationally of American strength and American ingenuity and fit into this narrative that the president has been trying to put out there of this great American comeback story, despite all the tragedy and deaths using the White House was hoping to use this as a moment uh, to portray some optimism and some, you know, American spirit to the country. So that obviously not going to happen today. So the president coming back from Washington early and we'll see what happens on Saturday when I, I guess this is rescheduled for. 
Shannon, uh, meanwhile today, the president has been in a Twitter war with Twitter, no less. Uh, Twitter put fact check labels on the president's tweets about mail-in voting fraud, claims that he's continuing to make. What else is President Trump saying about this today? Well, today he went on Twitter to accuse Twitter and other social media platforms of silencing conservatives and actually threatening to shut down social media platforms that he says are biased to conservative messaging. So this is something that he has threatened to certain extents in the past. Uh, there has been a recurring theme among the president and his allies saying that they are not treated fairly on Twitter and Facebook, um, you know, because of efforts by those organizations, those companies to try and crack down on misinformation and to try and, uh, you know, keep the keep the facts in some sort of order. So, but really escalating this now uh, with Twitter. And we haven't really heard anything from the president since then. And a big question I know that we will ask him and we all have is, you know, how can you actually shut down a private uh, business uh, because you don't like the way they treat um, certain people or certain uh, comments that are posted on their site? Shannon, it's been a jam-packed day. The president also met with New York Governor Andrew Cuomo earlier. What do we know about that meeting? Uh, well, we don't know that much yet, other than that the um, press secretary told reporters traveling with the president that uh, Cuomo was very complimentary of the president. Uh, we know one of the intentions going in, though, and that was for Governor Cuomo to try and get funding for infrastructure and try and get some funding for the states in a uh, aid package that Congress, uh, at least a lot of governors hope Congress, uh, is going to pass uh, to sort of another phase of funding. And right now, Republicans have been very resistant to putting additional money in there for the states. There has been talk about infrastructure in there, but the devil is always in the details when it comes to infrastructure. So even possible that there won't be infrastructure funding if there is a new round of funding, but something that Governor Cuomo and, and certainly other governors have been trying to push for. Shannon, a hot topic this week, masks. There are still growing calls for the president to wear one. Uh, one of his biggest supporters, Fox News Channel host Sean Hannity, even telling his viewers to wear them. In a short period of time, it's only temporary. You can't social distance. Please wear the mask. Do it for your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa. My humble advice is a way forward to be practical, productive, while protecting the most vulnerable and opening up the country. Shannon, how's the president responding to the pushback within his own party? Well, he continues to you know, double down on this issue of not wearing masks in public. He was not seen wearing a mask today when leaving the White House. He wasn't seen wearing one in Florida uh, um, when touring you know, touring um, the facilities down there. And within the White House, initially there was a memo that was sent out to all aides telling them, that is telling staffers that they had to wear a mask while they were in the West Wing. Uh, but that's really seemed to erode. And increasingly, we see when, in, you know, top staffers are in public, like today, those traveling with the president, you know, we're not wearing a mask, um, you know, even, even though they, you know, are with the public. And a lot of times officials have said, well, they get tested daily for coronavirus, the people at the White House House who are in close contact with the president, and the president is tested. And so that's why they don't feel a need to wear a mask. But of course, there have been now questions about the accuracy of uh, the testing. So the White House, though it did seem to be moving in the direction of masks at one point, um, does seem to be shifting away from that. Um, and today, we still saw no indication again that the president was going to be wearing a mask in public. All right, Shannon Petty Peace. It really was a busy day for the president today. Thanks so much for running us through it. Thank you. America was ready to enter a new era of space travel today, but Mother Nature had other plans. Two NASA astronauts were supposed to launch from U.S. soil for the first time in nearly nine years, but cloudy conditions forced NASA to call it off. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders joining us now from Cape Canaveral. And uh, Carrie, tell us more about the weather there and what pushed NASA to call off this launch. Well, it was such a disappointment, especially for the astronauts, everybody at SpaceX, the president who had flown down here, and then the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who had all gathered along the coast here to watch the liftoff. But it was all about weather. 
It was supposed to lift off from right over there, but what we had at the time was not only some rain and some horrific clouds in the area, but we had lightning, and that lightning became the problem. So about two miles over that direction to where the launch pad was, and then about two miles that direction is where we had the lightning. Bottom line, this is all about safety, and they had to make sure that it would be safe, and so they scrubbed it, and they'll be back again to try, to, try it at another date here. Allison. Yeah, so, Carrie, that's the big question. Uh, everyone wants to know when's the next attempt. It's probably going to be on Saturday. That's the current fallback plan. Okay. You know, a lot of this has to do with the way the Earth is rotating, where the space station is, and the exact time. You know, today's launch was at 4.33, not 4.34, not 4.32, yeah. because <laughs> it's imagine, imagine you're shooting a bow and arrow at a target but the ground is moving. Don't forget, the Earth is rotating, so they have to have it just right for when right. they fire off to go to the space station. And so at least this time, it wasn't going to happen. In fact, we have a former astronaut who explains some of this for us to understand. On STS-134, the second to last uh, shuttle flight, uh, we were halfway to the launch pad, and we had to turn our, our uh, astro van around because we scrubbed. So I know uh, Bob and Doug are disappointed. I know their families are a little disappointed, but everybody knows it's for the right thing. And of course, that is the most important thing, doing it for the right reasons. And you understand that even the political pressure had no role in this because the president was here, Allison. Yes, yeah, speaking of political pressure, uh, Carrie, do we know if the president uh, will be back for the launch on Saturday, if they're able to do it? Really good question. We don't know whether the president will be back. It certainly is possible. Uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement because remember, this is the first time that U.S. astronauts have launched from soil in the United States in nine years. We've been paying right. the Russians to get our astronauts up to space. You know, some of the folks, come with me, some of the folks who gathered out here were uh, Cassie and Zane. They're originally from uh, Indiana. You guys are out here first time. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, Disappointment? I mean, it's hard to be disappointed when it's so exciting and we have backup days. So we'll come again Saturday, and if not Saturday, we'll do Sunday. We had some idea of what we're getting into, so it was a, there was a chance it wasn't going to happen, but we're, we're happy to be here nonetheless. In the bigger picture, your sense of pride as an American to see that astronauts are now launching from U.S. soil from a private space vehicle, SpaceX. I, I mean, I think it's going to be a great step for us uh, as a space community. Uh, as a group that's going to be going to, to space in the future. I think it'll allow NASA an opportunity to focus on bigger items, like hopefully going to Mars soon. And I was really surprised that nobody was playing country music because that's it felt like 4th of July. Everybody was so excited. <laughs> well, next time bring your radio, OK? <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Uh, the real question now is, as we look over that direction, uh, whether Saturday will be the day. That, Allison, is the spot about two miles from here on that historic pad where so many shuttle missions and Apollo missions launched from. Oh, Carrie, fingers crossed. We hope they're able to pull it off Saturday, if not sometime very soon. Thank you so much. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says Congress will probably have to pass another coronavirus relief bill in the coming weeks. Earlier this month, House Democrats approved a $3 trillion package, but Senate Republicans said that was dead on arrival. Meanwhile, the House is proxy voting for the first time today, the vote on a bill to reauthorize FISA, that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. GOP leadership had filed a federal lawsuit to try to stop the proxy vote, calling it a power grab by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The Democrats are successful in allowing a proxy vote to make their own rules. What stops them from making a rule that only certain people can vote or certain members cannot have a full vote, a half vote? Nothing. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Hake is joining me now from Capitol Hill. And uh, Garrett, tell us more about this proxy vote the first time they're doing it. 
Sure, the idea here is that the House has declared a state of emergency for the next 45 days because of the coronavirus <laughs> pandemic. And during that time, members who don't want to travel back to D.C., maybe because they are themselves worried about getting sick, they're worried about getting their family members sick, can designate a proxy, another member who casts votes on their behalf following specific instructions. You hear the complaints there from Republicans. They're mostly slippery slope com complaints, not necessarily complaints complaining about what's being done here, arguing that perhaps the House could change the rules and make it so only people wearing blue shirts could vote. Uh, it's hard to see something like that happening, but the House has traditionally, like the Senate, given itself wide leeway to make and change its own rules. This is, however, one of, if not the biggest changes in how the House votes. And I asked Speaker Pelosi today whether or not the fact that D.C. is rolling back some of its lockdown orders come Friday will change her thinking about this. Here's what she told me. We're here, and for those who can't be here, we had the proxy voting. And it is there for 45 days starting today, right, Mr. Trump? Absolutely. It's starting today, 45 days. If we see a need at the end of the 45 days, uh, then we can extend that. Uh, but our uh, timing was predicated on the sergeant arms and uh, uh, giving us the signal uh, that we could put this forward. So far, Allison, the proxy voting has been used on a couple of smaller votes today. Roughly 70 members have designated somebody else to cast their vote on their behalf, most of those folks from the West Coast. All right, so Garrett, let's talk a little bit more specifically about the bill in question here. McCarthy is now asking the House to pull the FISA bill. What's going on? This thing is an absolute mess. This is the bill that has to be done to renew <laughs> FISA courts, foreign intelligence surveillance courts, and it's been caught up in a back and forth between the House and Senate. The House actually passed one version of this bill back in March. The Senate passed their version with an amendment earlier this month with 80 votes. Not a lot gets 80 votes in the Senate. Now it was coming back to the House. There had been some hope about adding yet another amendment to the House bill that would further protect the rights of people not to have their internet browser history caught up in this. Uh, then, late last night, not necessarily that late, but last night, uh, the president tweeted about this, saying he doesn't want to see this bill move ahead. He thinks there's continued abuse in the FISA system. We've heard this uh, coming from him since 2017, uh, and he doesn't want this to move forward now. Republicans started co essentially copying that line today, arguing that either they didn't like what was in the bill that many of them had already voted for, or they wanted to see more investigations into the president's complaints go forward before they would be in favor of this vote. Well, the speaker says this vote is still happening today, but as today bleeds into tonight, it's much less clear whether or not this bill will pass or if they're going to have to go back to the drawing board for something that the national security community, the intelligence community, very much wants to see get done uh, sooner rather than later. Garrett, it is a historic and an interesting day on Capitol Hill, to say the least. Thanks so much for explaining what's going on. You bet. The Department of Justice dropping its investigation into three U.S. senators over insider trading. The senators from both sides of the aisle were under investigation for selling off stocks after early briefings on the coronavirus. But the DOJ is continuing, continuing rather, its investigation into one other senator. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt has all the details. Allison, good to see you. That's right. The Department of Justice dropping investigations into three senators around their sales of stock because of the coronavirus. These three senators, Senator Loeffler of Georgia, a Republican, uh, Senator Feinstein of California, a Democrat, as well as Senator Inhofe, also a Republican, uh, they all were cleared in this investigation according to their offices. Now, the FBI had reached out to all of them to check and see uh, for documentation, evidence uh, as to whether whether or not they properly conducted trades that were pretty conveniently timed, that seemed to uh, potentially get them out of the stock market uh, in certain ways right before the market uh, tanked after the coronavirus news rippled across the country. But the reality here is that in each of those cases, the Department of Justice was never as interested in any of those three senators as they were in Senator Richard Burr, Republican from North Carolina, also until very recently was serving as the chairman of the Senate 
Intelligence Committee. So uh, Burr has stepped aside temporarily from that com that committee post while this investigation continues. And this is really where the Department of Justice is focused here. Now, why is that? If they've cleared these other senators, why still the focus on Senator Burr? The reality is the trades that he made were significant in terms of his own net worth. He traded between 600 and so thousand and $1.7 million worth of stock. He, that represents a significant portion of Burr's overall net worth. The other piece of this that's interesting uh, is that, of course, he he was serving as the Senate Intelligence Chairman. That means that he was privy to a lot more information, classified information, even than many other members of Congress, let alone uh, average everyday Americans. So some questions about how he may have used that knowledge. He also has admitted that the timing was related to the coronavirus, although he claims through his lawyer that he was operating simply off of public information, watching CNBC, other financial channels. But we should expect for that investigation to continue. They, of course, had, had seized uh, his cell phone as part of this investigation. They had also, at that time, or, or, or leading up uh, to that seizure of his phone, they had reached out to these other senators, asked for documentation, information. So uh, we know now, again, that those three have been cleared, but this investigation into Senator Burr uh, ongoing. So we'll keep you posted on any additional news from there. Allison. The manhunt for a Yukon student wanted for murder now in its sixth day. Peter Manfredonia is accused of killing two people in Connecticut. Police say he is considered armed and dangerous. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the story. Hey there, Allison. So there's another twist in this ongoing manhunt. According to police in Pennsylvania, there was a credible sighting of Peter Manfredonia last night, Tuesday night, in Pennsylvania. A fireman walked behind the fire station and saw him apparently crouching behind a dumpster. He then took off running and was carrying a large backpack. The last photo that police shared of Manfredonia was from Sunday afternoon, walking along train tracks with a large backpack that they say was filled with guns that he had stolen during a home invasion. This crime spree has now been going on for five days. It started on Friday. The 23-year-old senior from University of Connecticut, whose family says is an honor student studying engineering and finance, he killed, according to authorities, Theodore Demers, a 62-year-old whose family says he had picked up Manfredonia to give him some help and bring him back to a broken-down motorcycle. He then went on, according to police, to kill a former friend of his from high school, Nicholas Isley. He adopted Isley's girlfriend, according to police, and stole her car. She then appeared unharmed at a truck stop in New Jersey. There are multiple uh, home invasions as well, multiple car thefts, but still Manfredonia continues to elude police. We are learning a little bit more about his life. He grew up in Newtown, Connecticut, at one point living on the same street as Adam Lanza, who was the shooter from the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in 2012. He then, according to a charity after that shooting, went on to volunteer his time for that charity. We've also learned that his father was recently charged with second-degree sexual assault, among a number of charges. He's out on $50,000 bail, but the Connecticut police say that there's no relation between Peter Manfredonia's current crime spree and and those crimes. But right now, this 23-year-old continuing to elude authorities. They say he is armed and dangerous. They are telling people not to confront him, but to call 911. Allison, back to you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. country was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Universities across the country figuring out how they might bring students back on campus this fall. Some even suggesting that they could still have a football season. But the president of the University of Michigan does not share that optimism entirely, telling the Wall Street Journal he has, quote, some degree of doubt as to whether there will be college athletics anywhere, at least in the fall. University of Michigan president Dr. Mark Schlissel joins me now. He is also an immunologist by training. All right, Doc, let's start with football. My best friend, Michael went to you, Mish. We are Wolverines fans in this household. Go blue. Uh, football is such an important part of your university. How do you even start to think about opening up the big house for games? Oh, gosh, Allison. You know, um, our students are student athletes are also students. And our goal is to be able to find yeah. a way to bring students back to campus safely uh, I'm very confident that we'll be able to do that, although we're still working on the details and a, a final decisions yet to be made. But I can't imagine if you can't bring regular students back to campus for their studies, then you really can't bring student athletes back to campus for their competition. But as I said, I'm up, cautiously optimistic we'll be able to bring all our students back. Uh, I know that in the major leagues, athletes have unions that can advocate for them. College athletes don't have that. Do you plan on including your student athletes in the decision making process in any way? Yeah, you know, the student athletes are important and all of our students are important. You know, we've reached out to different student groups, asking them their thoughts about coming back to campus for the fall semester and talk to them about what such a semester would look like. Our athletic director and coaches speak to their student athletes all the time. I don't think anybody would be forced to participate in an athletic event if they didn't feel safe doing so. Uh, and also, we're part of the right. Big Ten, and the Big Ten as a group has put together a committee of uh, health representatives from each of the campuses who are working on a, a, um, a back-to-sports kind of blueprint for us to share. Uh, let's talk about academics, because you said this. I mean, how can you even think about uh, playing sports or, or the, the, having a football game at the big house if you're not ready uh, to bring students fully back to campus? Where are you in that decision-making process about potentially bringing uh, students back? And, and as an immunologist, what are the different health factors you're considering and thinking about as you try to figure out how to bring your students back safely? Yeah, you know, what's really influenced my decision making is the realization that we're going to have to learn to live with COVID-19. Uh, it's going to be with us for at yeah. least this full academic year. It won't go away till we have a vaccine. And even if we have a vaccine at the end of the year, or the beginning of the new year, it's going to take quite some time to vaccinate 300 million people 
uh, times two injections. So we're planning for the full year. And what it's going to take is the public health toolbox. It'll take social distancing, masks, the ability to test people for virus to see who's infected. Uh, it'll take um, uh, having larger classes be uh, happening online and smaller group experiences being done in person, labs being done in person, uh, uh, arts instruction being done in person. So it'll have to keep in mind the same concepts that we're being asked to, to use to keep us safe as um, regular residents of the state of Michigan. Then, of course, there's a the factor. I mean, it's. University of Michigan is an enormous school, and you have so many students coming from out of state, some coming from areas uh, that are potential hotspots. I, I just can't even imagine how you think about that entire student body uh, and how you you are, are sure that students coming in are safe, uh, that students coming uh, from places where they still may have uh, high instances of COVID-19. Uh, I know it just must be so much to, to evaluate, to factor. And they would be back, what, in a matter of a couple of months? Well, if we're able to bring students back, what we would do would ask them to isolate themselves for two weeks before they travel back to campus. Okay. And as soon as they arrive, we would intend to test them for COVID-19 to see whether they're infected or mm -hmm. not. Uh, and then get those results back. And then three weeks later, probably test them yet again. And that way, we could take yeah. folks that do have an infection and sequester them from the rest of the community so it doesn't spread. But if the incidence of uh, COVID-19 is still not low uh, by the time uh, September rolls around, uh, we won't be able to bring students back. This is presuming that we right. continue on the trajectory that Michigan's been for a, a number of weeks now of decreasing number of cases, decreasing numbers of deaths, uh, a really good positive result. Some students are suing their universities now to try to get some of their tuition back, saying that remote learning just isn't the same as being on campus. Are you considering lowering tuition if you can't bring students back on campus and into the classroom next year? Well, the region set the tuition for the university. And what I feel committed to do is to provide the very best education possible for University of Michigan students. Mm -hmm. And what defines very best is the context. But every one of the students that comes here and mm -hmm. graduates is going to have a full value University of Michigan degree and a great education that will give them all the advantages that graduating from college gives to our alumni. Uh, Dr. Schlissel, there have been a number of op-eds predicting that this pandemic will be a reckoning for higher education. How do you think that the coronavirus will change colleges and universities in America for years to come? Uh, I think we're still learning about that. You know, one thing we're learning is that you can do certain aspects of education remotely. Uh, you can do it online and you can do it well. And there are other aspects of education where you just can't replace a professor sitting around with a handful of students discussing a challenging topic. Uh, but I think being forced right. to go remote last spring got a lot of our faculty over the threshold of trying new modalities of teaching. And I'm sure that'll continue to influence uh, how they educate students in the years ahead after the pandemic is over. Uh, Dr. Mark Schlissel, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, while you make these difficult decisions for your university. And I will say it one more time for our producers in the back who are from Penn State. Go Blue. Go Blue. Thanks very much, Allison. Bye-bye. <laughs> Amazon's annual shareholder meeting virtual for the very first time. But that didn't stop shareholders from demanding more transparency about how Amazon is protecting its workers during this pandemic. NBC News business and technology correspondent Joe Ling Kent joining me now. And Joe, how did CEO Jeff Bezos address those questions about employee safety? Yeah, he says that they've been protecting safety as much as they can. In fact, I want to read you the quote. He says he's proud of the job that the team has done so far and that they've taken it seriously since the very beginning. So, of course, they have previously announced, Allison, as you know, that they're reinvesting their profits into the COVID-19 uh, battle plan, if you will, for safety for these employees. But he's sticking by what he's said, what his company has been telling us now for months, that they are doing everything they can to prioritize safety. Safety. 
Joe, several employees at Amazon say that they were fired for speaking out against the working conditions there. Did uh, Bezos address that? And what did he say? Yes, exactly. So that was brought up several times during the shareholder meeting. And Bezos said exactly that they, he supports every employee's right to criticize their employer's working conditions. But that also doesn't mean that they're allowed to not follow internal policies. And as you'll remember, uh, Chris Smalls, the employee that was let go and fired at JFK 8, that Staten Island facility where he'd also organized a demonstration against Amazon's safety precautions. Well, he was supposedly fired, according to Amazon, because he did not follow their health and safety policies. That's what they cite. But Chris Smalls has directly told me several times that he felt that he was let go and fired because he was agitating on the outside, something that he continues to do to this day, Allison. Uh, Joe, we know these meetings usually include proposals for the company, some of them from activists. Anything notable, unusual on the table this year? And did any of them pass? None of them passed in terms of outside shareholder proposals. Okay. But there was a recurring theme about climate change, about uh, issues of safety mm -hmm. and transparency. A lot of these shareholders want to learn more about what's going on inside the company. And they're not alone. They are certainly supported by a lot of shareholders out there. And some journalists want to see more, us included, about how these policies are actually put into place, how they're executed. You know, Amazon is a company, Allison, that does not disclose how many cases of COVID-19 they have that are positive or the fatalities yeah. that uh, they have, that their employees uh, uh, have that we've been counting. So we've been keeping our in, own independent count here, but it's, uh, it's a difficult mm -hmm. thing to uh, deal with when you're dealing with a company of this size that has effectively, Allison, become a utility for so many shoppers out there. Yeah, Joe, it sure has. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, if you said it a year ago, Joe, we never thought that the shareholder meeting would be done virtually, but these are the times. Thanks so much for letting mm -hmm. us know what went on there. Mm-hmm. COVID-19 antibody tests can be wrong up to 50% of the time. That's according to new guidance from the CDC. Experts say testing is a key part of reopening the country safely, but what happens when those tests aren't entirely accurate? Joining me now, Dr. Joseph Vinets, infectious disease specialist at Yale Medicine. Uh, Dr. Vinets, what do you make of this new guidance from the CDC? How can we get a handle on this pandemic if antibody tests just aren't accurate? Hi, Allison. Nice to see you again. Um, so antibody tests, first of all, are done for a couple of different reasons. So we have to know why we want to do them. Some people want to know, are they immune? Some people want to know, can they donate plasma? Um, but public health authorities might want to know what are the patterns of spread of the coronavirus. The CDC guidance notes that there are many tests out there, and it's not clear which tests are the good ones. And so uh, if anybody wants to get an antibody test or some public health authority wants to get an antibody test, it should be done in a reliable laboratory with highly validated tests that are available. There are a lot of charlatans out there still that put forth very bad tests that had poor accuracy that did either were false positive mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. false negative. And the best way to avoid that is using the tests that are done by either university laboratories or by Quest or LabCorp or National uh, uh, Mayo Clinic, ARUP, the laboratories that are reliable that have done extensive validation. Dr. Vinets, today the U.S. hit a tragic milestone, 100,000 deaths. Uh, the initial forecast for this outbreak was a range from 100 to 240,000 deaths. Now that we have hit this mark, what can we do? How do we avoid hitting that higher end of that forecast? Well, it's tragic, and we have a over a thousand deaths a day still. The number of cases seems to be going up. So as far as I can tell, there's no end in sight. It, it breaks my heart. It breaks all of our hearts. This is a terrible problem. And then we have 
from the very top of our political structure denial that this is even happening. Uh, it's bewildering to me. Uh, we know that vaccine research right now is moving at a record pace. Here is what Dr. Fauci said on CNN this morning. I still think that we have a good chance if all the things fall in the right place, that we might have a vaccine that would be deployable by the uh, by the end of the year, by December, November, okay. December. I believe we can. Yale Medicine is part of the vaccine efforts. How is this research able to happen so quickly? Uh, I know it can often take decades to come up with a vaccine. Well, the good thing is the coronavirus is a stupid virus that has not been able to mutate itself <laughs> to avoid our immune responses. We make powerful immune responses, and all of the vaccine strategies are focused on a single protein called the spike or the S protein. It's just different platforms have it presented to the immune system in a vaccine in different ways. So we know what the target is, and we just need to now deliver that vaccine uh, in a way that will be safe and effective. And really, the safety issues have to do with, um, first of all, is the shot itself safe? Does it cause terrible mm -hmm. side effects or not. And so far, those initial shots seem to be okay in the different phase one studies that have been done. The next step is what happens after somebody gets infected after getting the vaccine? And that's way down the line. Will there be an inadequate response to not protect people, or will the response be good to protect people, or could the response even be so much as to cause harm after a natural infection? And that's the second safety issue that we simply cannot test yet until a vaccine is deployed to large numbers of people and we can find out what the response is after a natural infection. And that is, that's a phase three trial. That is something that's going to happen far into the future because we have to have enough people either getting the vaccine or a placebo to be able to see if the, if the placebo group is more susceptible to infection than the vaccine group after a natural infection. That takes time. You can't rush that. We don't do yeah. experimental infections of humans with COVID-19 virus. That would be unethical at this point. Uh, Dr. Vanetz, I love hearing you say that this is a stupid virus. You're the first person to come on our air and say that. I love it because I know that that means, uh, as you said, that that is, it, it makes it easier uh, to eventually come up with a vaccine. Uh, I'd like to ask you one more question about a vaccine. A recent AP NORC poll says even when one becomes available, only half of Americans say they'll get it. How concerning is that? And how much of a hurdle uh, does that create, uh, if that is in fact true, for us as we try to get past this virus? Well, I don't think that I would rely on those numbers at this point. We really have to wait and okay. see uh, to when the vaccine may be available and to see if it's very effective and very safe, if people might make a different choice at right. that point. We just don't know. I think it's too early to say. Dr. Vanette, always great to have you on. Thanks for coming back again, uh, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks very much, Allison. Looking forward. Safety restrictions at hospitals mean patients with coronavirus have been dying alone without their loved ones in their final moments. But as NBC News correspondent Joe Fryer shows us, nurses are stepping in to fill some of that void. Inside the intensive care unit at Regents Hospital in St. Paul, there's a kind of care that needs no prescription. We're giving them hope. You know, that's that's one thing that I do with all my patients. Hope. Nurse Tiffany Wolfsberger has been dispensing it for 17 years now. Never has it been more in demand as patients battle coronavirus without their loved ones in the room because no visitors are allowed. Typically, we work with all these patients, you know, day in, day out. The families at the bedside, we get to talk to them. 
and you really become part of their family. With the families not being able to be there, I guess that makes your job even more important. You see the emptiness in each room and it has made me make a point to just take more time with them. That, that must mean a lot to them. <laughs> you know, it means more to me, it really does. It certainly meant a lot to Don Lydic. Last month, the 60-year-old Navy veteran spent two weeks on her floor on a ventilator. When it was clear he would not survive, Nurse Tiffany made a promise to Don's sister. She tearfully asked me, can you promise me that someone will be there with Don to hold his hand and pray with him? When the time finally came, Tiffany used a tablet to connect Don with his family one last time. Then... Over the next two hours, Tiffany kept her promise. I let them say their goodbyes, and I just sat silently. There's no words that can describe that. It was just like one of those moments where you can't explain and it will never leave me. In that moment, she says peace came over, Don. He was the first patient she lost to COVID-19, and not the last. We we lost two two days ago, like minutes apart. We gave them a, a nice exit out where the staff all lined the hallways as they uh, brought the morgue cart by, and so it was really somber. As things start to reopen, what is your message to everyone out there? that this is gonna be a long battle and this is real, this isn't a conspiracy, this isn't a hoax. I have a frontline view to what's happening and it, it is not okay. When you, when you sit there and hold somebody's hand while they die without a family member, without anything, you truly, you truly know it's, it's real. There's, there's no doubt. But by sharing Don's story with his family's permission, she hopes to remind all of us, patients are not alone. We tirelessly give them hope because it gives us hope. And that's, that's truly what, what we all need is hope. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. A grim new milestone in Brazil. It now has the second largest coronavirus outbreak in the world behind the U.S. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Bill Neely joining me from Rio de Janeiro. And Bill, have health officials or the government given any sort of insight into why this outbreak has gotten so bad there? Yeah, Alison, let me bring you right up to date with the numbers. Another 1,000 deaths, more than 1,000 in Brazil over the last 24 hours. Brazil now number one in the world for all the wrong reasons with the most daily deaths in the world, but as you say, behind the United States. And you can see it in small areas as well. The International Nurses Organization today saying that more nurses have died in Brazil, 157, than in any other country. And guess which country is number two? It's the U.S. with 146 deaths. And I think to your question, Alison, I'm afraid one reason is that old evil of poverty, whether it's in Alabama or a favela in Brazil. We were in the biggest favela in Brazil just a couple of days ago, and it was astonishing to me how many people came up and said, yeah, I know three people. One man said, I've got five close friends who've died, because in favelas like that, well, there's poverty. People have to go out to work. Social distancing is impossible. And they do live in cramped conditions, sometimes six or seven to a room. And running water, never mind soap, is an absolute luxury. Uh, on a broader national level, there's an underfunded health system here so that in an area like the Amazon, there are very few ICU beds to cover a massive, massive population. But, Alison, the third thing really is leadership. And I'm afraid in this country, uh, the leader, President Bolsonaro, right from the beginning, downplayed this uh, virus, looked away from it and told people that, you know, there wasn't much point in social distancing and lockdown was a joke and just get out to work. So I think all of those things play a part in Brazil having the highest daily death figures in the world. Uh, Bill, we know the U.S. has issued a travel ban for Brazil. What does that entail and how does it affect folks there? Yeah, well, it was meant to kick in Thursday and was brought forward for two days, by two days, and it's in effect now. So what it means is that if you're trying, if you're a, a foreigner, not, not an American, if you're a foreigner trying to go in to the United States from Brazil, forget it. In fact, if you've been in Brazil in the last 14 days, forget it as well. And I think the fact that the U.S. brought it forward by two days shows that the White House really is looking at the numbers here with deep concern. And one new U.S. study from the University of Washington has predicted that Brazil could have 125,000 deaths by the start of August if the current trends continue. So that really is a frightening figure, Alison. Bill, you have been reporting uh, all over the world, uh, particularly on this pandemic. Have you seen any common threads between the countries that are having the, the worst outbreaks and the worst trouble here? Well, that's a great question, Alison. Let me answer it a slightly different way. If you look at two South American neighbors, Brazil and Argentina, there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, Argentina has got off relatively lightly because they locked down hard and they locked down early. And Brazil did quite yeah. the opposite. I think when, hi when history is written, I think you can look at the countries that have done well, like Greece, like New Zealand, which is led by a very empathetic leader. And again, Jacinda Ardern locked down hard and locked down early. And then there are the countries that history will not be kind to, like the United States, like Britain, like Brazil, all led by leaders who downplayed this right from the beginning. Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, and Boris Johnson, they were slow on testing their record with PPE for their health workers, not good either. So I think there are common threads, and I think when history is written, I'm afraid those three countries in particular, possibly Italy, maybe France, Spain as well, 
uh, will not come out very well. Bill Neely in Brazil, thanks so much. A woman in Austria was so sick with the coronavirus that her lung had turned to concrete. Too sick to go on a ventilator, a lung transplant saved her life. NBC News global correspondent Helena Humphrey spoke with the doctor who oversaw the procedure about how this could save more lives around the world. Hi there, Alison. Great to be with you. And this certainly is a remarkable transplant story, one that will likely be used as a case study for other centres of excellence when it comes to lung treatment around the world, like the Royal Brompton Hospital here in London in the UK. Now, when it comes to this case of the 45-year-old woman, a patient in Austria, you have to know, Alison, she had no underlying health conditions whatsoever. And yet, coronavirus had ravaged her lungs to such an extent that her surgeon told us at NBC that that essentially her lungs were like two bags of cement. It was impossible to get any oxygen into them. And as such, she couldn't be treated on a traditional ventilator. You might be able to see that X-ray there of her lungs before and see that large white area that is essentially solid. Now contrast that to the X-ray of her new donor lungs that were flown in from the Netherlands. And you can see there's plenty of room to get oxygen flowing once again. But this was a very complex transplant procedure. The patient was flown in from Carinthia in rural Austria to the capital, Vienna, where she underwent that transplant. On top of that, everyone had to observe those extra precautions in light of coronavirus. And then she had to have antibodies removed from her bloodstream, antibodies that she had received as part of plasma therapy so that those antibodies didn't then attack the new donor lungs. But of course, they didn't. We are learning that she is in a stable and good condition and she is slowly waking up in hospital where she will recover in the months to come. And we spoke to her surgeon, Professor Walter Klepeko, and he suggested that this could offer a glimmer of hope for patients in a serious condition around the world. To be honest, uh, I'm surprised uh, that this has not been done more frequently before because in, in my expectation, there should be more patients out there in a similar situation. Of course, it's going to remain a very small minority of all COVID patients. But still, looking globally, I would say there, there must be quite a number of other patients there who are in a, such a situation where lung transplantation can then really get out. Professor Klepleko also told me that there are many centers of excellence in the United States to carry out this kind of transplant procedure in coronavirus patients. And although he said that these kinds of severe cases are rare at around 1%, when you think of all the millions of coronavirus cases around the world, that is a significant number of people who could certainly benefit from this kind of groundbreaking treatment. Hey, Juan, I'm Allison Mars. It is Wednesday and you're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She is following the very latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, happy Wednesday to you. How about an update? Hey, Allison, sure. So we're starting off our headlines today with a grim update. The death toll in the United States from coronavirus has now reached the 100,000 mark. That's according to a count by NBC News. Now, this milestone comes as states across the country are starting to reopen despite surges in new infections in states like California, Alabama and Virginia. Now, Disney has announced it is planning to reopen some of its parks starting in mid-July. That's the latest from NBC's Ahiza Garcia Hodges. The phased reopening will begin with parks in Orlando, Florida. Now, the Orange County Recovery Task Force has approved the plans, but Governor Ron DeSantis and the mayor of Orange County also need to sign off. There will be a number of new safety measures in place. Here's Disney CEO Bob Chapik on CNBC. Our capacity will be a function of the six-foot social distancing guidance that we have from the CDC. So the number of people we put in the park will be a function of that calculation. Uh, we're being very, very cautious with our cast members. As a matter of fact, our cast members have all been sent home, not only masks, but also personal temperature testing devices so they can take their own temperatures every morning. But then in addition to that, when they report to work, if they're guest facing, they will actually be tested again uh, at the workplace. 
Disney events that bring together large crowds like parades won't be available, nor will high contact activities like playgrounds. An ongoing federal remdesivir trial for a coronavirus treatment is entering its next phase. That's from NBC's Erica Edwards. The new phase will test the combination of the experimental drug with an anti-inflammatory pill. In the trial, all patients will receive remdesivir. Half will also receive the additional pill, while the other half will receive a placebo. Researchers are hoping to recruit 600 to 700 patients for the trial. Now from NBC's Lucy Bailey, Boeing will lay off nearly 7,000 employees as the coronavirus pandemic continues to tank the demand for travel. In a letter to employees, Boeing CEO David Calhoun cited the, quote, whipsawing of the coronavirus pandemic and wrote, quote, we have come to the unfortunate moment of having to start involuntary layoffs. Airline industry leaders have previously warned that it will take years for this sector to recover. Some news from South Korea, more than 2 million students are back in school as the country juggles education while the virus continues to spread. That's from NBC's Mahalia Hobson and Stella Kim. Kindergarten students and some middle school and high school students return to new environments with social distancing and face masks. Now, meanwhile, South Korea recorded its highest number of new infections in more than a month. Roughly 450 schools have chosen not to open their doors quite yet after a student and teacher tested positive. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back uh, a little later with more, Allison. All right, Alexa, looking forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, you can visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We always have the latest updates there. Bad weather postponed today's historic rocket launch from Cape Canaveral. NBC News transportation correspondent Tom Costello tells us what happened and what's next. Hey, Allison, good day to you. So it was literally right at about 4.15 or so Eastern time when they decided they had to pull the plug on the SpaceX launch here at the Kennedy Space Center. They had been really hoping all day that the weather would clear just enough to give them a window to launch the first private uh, spacecraft ever uh, into orbit with two NASA astronauts on board and the first manned mission off of American soil in nine years. But the weather has been dicey all day. We've been dealing with it since we got here more about 7 a.m. or so this morning. The weather rolled across with heavy rain and lightning and wind. And then it started to really calm down. We've been in the lull of this uh, weather pattern uh, since about 3.30, 3.15 or so this afternoon. And people thought, oh, maybe we'll make it. Maybe they'll be able to launch. But in fact, no, the trouble is they got low cloud cover uh, just off to my left over the Atlantic Ocean. That's the launch pad back there, by the way. And then lightning started popping up. And they have some very strict weather criteria here. They cannot violate these weather criteria. And if any kind of a weather pattern pops up, they simply are not going to take a risk with two people's lives on board that rocket, and they pull the plug. Next chance to launch will be on Saturday. After that, it would be on Sunday. Uh, a disappointing day, absolutely, with the president here, the vice president here, Elon Musk here, as you would expect, the founder of SpaceX. And, of course, the families of the astronauts are also here. And the world watching on social media, on cable channels all over the world, and on television all over the world. But the bottom line is, this weather pattern simply was not cooperating, and SpaceX Mission Control decided they simply were not going to take any chances. They were going to stick to their, their plan. Their plan is absolute and definitive, and it will not be violated because they don't want to risk lives. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, they are de, uh, we're, they're taking the fuel off of the rocket. That'll take a little bit of time. And then eventually, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, the two astronauts, will come off of the rocket. They'll remain in isolation. They don't want to take any chance of them give it, getting COVID-19. They'll remain in isolation and then give it another shot on Saturday and then on Sunday when they hope that they can yet again uh, aim that spaceship right for the International Space Station for a rendezvous about 19 hours later. Uh, so that's the latest from the Kennedy Space Center uh, here just outside of Cape Canaveral. Allison, back to you. More than 100,000 Americans are now dead from COVID-19 in just 12 weeks. Think of all those lives, all of their loved ones, their stories. NBC News correspondent Kevin Tibbles reports. A grim milestone, 100,000. Americans from all walks of life, across generations. The New York Times filled its front page with just a thousand of the grandfathers, grandmothers, husbands and wives, sons and daughters. 100,000 taken so fast by COVID-19, this country is still reeling in shock. 
Cody Lister of Colorado was a healthy 21-year-old kid. Cody just, he had the most, the best smile in the world. And he would reach out and use that. Korean War vet James Mandeville was 83 years old when COVID took him from his family. Darianna Dyson was just 15. This hurts people. This, this hurts people in ways that they'll never be able to come back from. In just a few short months, this pandemic sweeping the world has infected some 2 million here at home. Hospitals turned into battlefields. It is absolutely heartbreaking. From the young to the old, they are all very sick. Our new soldiers, the frontline workers, have fallen in service too. Chicago nurse Chris Guzman was a 35-year-old with three young children. Louisiana cop Mark Hall Sr. had 30 years on the force. Philip Dover, two decades driving a bus in New Jersey. And as we gingerly open up, perhaps wave from a safe distance, we have not had time to grieve. Somebody who passes away has, you know, touched many other people's lives and no one's here besides them but me. 100,000. The obituary names grow daily with no end in sight. Painful to learn of the hopes and dreams lost. And when we can't say goodbye in person, it hurts. I give them a moment of silence and respect them because um, we all have loved ones out there. We as survivors must remember, no one, no matter who they were, should leave this world alone. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Chicago. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo met with the president in Washington today to talk infrastructure and jumpstarting New York's economy. And there cannot be a national recovery if the state and local governments are not funded. That is a fact. Meanwhile, today, New York's Long Island enters phase one of reopening, the only place still closed in the state, New York City. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joining me now from Babylon, Long Island. And Ron, first, how did Governor Cuomo's meeting with the president go today? Well, I think we'll have to wait to see what the president has to say about that, because basically governor was, the governor was making some asks of him and Republicans in Congress as well. Uh, this is all about money. The governor has been consistently saying that the state is in a big hole as a result of this epidemic that he's been trying to deal with. He wanted the com a commitment from the president to support bills in, in the Senate and House that will provide money to the states and to localities. So far, uh, there's been a reluctance, a strong opposition, is probably a better way to describe it, to that. And you've heard all the, the red and blue and the partisan back and forth about it, how some, like the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and others, have called it a, a blue state bailout. Uh, uh, Cuomo was trying to cut through all that, but it's still, it's still there. Uh, and the president uh, can perhaps help with that, but he didn't make any great commitment to doing that as well. So the other big thing is infrastructure, which the president has talked about that he's interested in doing. But... Obviously, months before uh, the election, he's only going to want to support that under the right conditions. And it's kind of hard to see how he offers a lot of support to that to help a governor in, in a blue state. Because, again, Washington is so mired in all this partisanship and nothing seems to get done. Uh, so the governor said it was a good meeting and they agreed to talk again next week. Uh, but again, it's we have to see what President Trump has to say about that. And what he says consistently, of course, because he may say one thing and then say something else and so on and so forth. Allison. All right, Ron, Long Island reopening today. How are the business there, businesses there prepping? How are folks in Babylon getting ready? Well, Long Island is a big, big place. It's about three million people. It's as big as maybe 20 other 20 states. So it's not a uh, it's not an insignificant place. Here, like yesterday in Westchester County in New Rochelle, everyone is being very cautious. The big things are construction and manufacturing, uh, now some curbside retail as well. Uh, the, the concern on, in places like here in Babylon on Main Street are the small mom and pop shops who feel like they've already been put in a hole deeper because big real retailers like Target, others, um, have, have been able to open and, and sell things for the past couple of weeks, if not longer. 
And so now you have these small mom and pops that are trying to compete with those giants who already had an advantage, uh, an, an online advantage, certainly. Uh, so they're now trying to make up for that deficit as well. So today we see shop owners who are, in some cases, getting back to their premises for the first time in months, trying to figure out how to socially distance, uh, how many employees to call back, how much of their goods they're going to be able to sell, to see what kind of cash flow they're going to be able to generate, yeah. if any. Uh, there are some that won't open up at all because they've, it's already been too long, two months without any business. Um, so that's what we see, a mix of very cautiously getting into this, really hoping that this phase only lasts a, uh, two weeks or so, the minimum, and then they move to phase two, which is a wider opening up of the economy. Uh, but, it, but after two months of, of nothing to get the green light to begin something to start, uh, I think most people are, 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 set, are happy, uh, but leery, and of course concerned about a, a new spike in cases, yeah. which we've seen in, in different parts of the country in places that have reopened. Allison? Ron, New York City, the epicenter of the outbreak, of course, still shut down. What metrics does the city still need to hit for it to reopen? New York needs more hospital beds, uh, a, a bigger percentage of hospital beds available, and they need more contact tracers. Um, and today, the mayor, Mayor de Blasio, said that they had upped the number to as many thousands, and they're trying to hire, bring on more and more contact tracers, the people who will hopefully find where people uh, who got the disease, who they were in contact with, and we all know that process, um, key to reopening. What, what, what New York City is trying to do is, is focus more resources, more testing, and making uh, quarantine spaces, hotel rooms available to people in the hardest hit zip codes, the hardest hit neighborhoods, which tend to be minority neighborhoods in New York, in, in Brooklyn and Queens, those boroughs especially. Um, they're trying to trying to get a handle on things in that way so that when they open up, they can find out where the new cases are coming and quickly contain them. But, you know, as, as you can imagine, you live there, everybody opening up New York, 8 million people, um, it's just a massive undertaking. Yeah. And as much as uh, people want to get out, boy, you know, it's uh, you know, still a lot of people I talk to who are not comfortable riding the subway, which is the lifeline of that city or, or buses yeah. for that matter. To, to get anywhere. You know, there's right. uh, so much talk about um, major employers uh, in Midtown uh, letting their employees work uh, remotely at home because people are concerned about coming back into crowded office buildings. You know, how do you socially distance in these places? Right. So it's uh, the, the expectation is that in a week or two, the, the mayor has said, the governor has said the first two weeks of June, New York should, City should begin to get to phase one. But um, getting from phase one to two to three to four, which is the end of it all, um, that seems like a really difficult journey for New York City, but hopefully we'll get on it soon. <laughs> I live there, and we certainly like to see some progress and like to see um, <laughs> this virus contained and controlled. Um as Absolutely. best as possible. So hey, hey, Ron, can, um, you know, get back to this mm -hmm. uh, On the flip side, uh, I'm a native Long Islander, and we are real, real proud of our beaches. And for folks who aren't from this area, it's super easy. Uh, in a typical summer to jump on the Long Island Railroad and head to Long Beach from New York City or take a bus to Jones Beach. Is there any concern uh, on Long Island that with the city, city still closed, uh, that a ton of folks will be trying to get out of the city coming to Long Island and then the beaches will be crowded and potentially closed? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge concern. It was a big concern over the Memorial Day weekend, which is why some communities yeah. imposed uh, restrictions that only residents could use the beaches because they're reducing the capacity by as much as 50% uh, in some places. So if you reduce it by 50%, there are all kinds of reports of beaches closing early, parking lots closing early in the day. And the last thing that people in Long Island want is for the beach to be closed because people from New York City came out. The other problem is that um, the mayor and others are just trying to discourage people from using the subways and buses because they want that uh, transit right. system reserved for essential employees who need to get where they're going. And there's a lot of essential employees uh, who are Absolutely. doing all kinds of jobs in the city, from grocery clerks to, of course, healthcare workers who need to use the subways and buses to get where they want to go. And they don't want that disrupted by people going to the beach or crowded by people going to the beach. So, uh, right. and it's getting warm out here. <laughs> and so uh, um, that's going to be an enduring problem. <laughs> it sure uh, is. New York City's beaches were closed. Yeah, New York City's beaches were closed. Whether they will open soon, you know, that I don't know. That's probably like phase two, maybe three. Um, I don't know exactly, but right. it's, it doesn't feel imminent, like next weekend. 
Right, right. And as you say, Ron, we're inching closer to beach weather on Long Island. Ron Allen in Babylon, thank you so much. President Trump fighting with Twitter. On Twitter, of course, the president tweeting that Twitter is, quote, completely stifling free speech after Twitter put a fact check label on the president's tweets for the first time this week. In these particular tweets, the president said mail-in ballots will be fraudulent. The president now threatening to close down or strongly regulate social media platforms that, quote, silence conservative voices. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward joining me from Twitter's headquarters in San Francisco. And Jake, for years, Twitter's let the president's controversial tweet slide. What pushed them to take action now? Allison, this seems to have crossed a line that people at social media companies have been trying to describe for years, which is that they think, in general, speech is good, all speech is good, and especially the speech of public figures. But in this case, they said in a statement, these tweets contain potentially misleading information about voting processes. That's the key thing, Allison. And have been labeled to provide additional context around mail-in ballots. This decision is in line with the approach we shared earlier this month. Basically, once you get into disenfranchising the vote, in some way suppressing it, misinforming people about it, that seems to be where social media companies consider the line to be. And in this case, the president seems to have walked right over that, Alice. Jake, critics say Twitter's been too hands-off when it comes to misinformation spread by President Trump and other world leaders, for that matter. What is the company's stance there? Well, the stance really seems to be that as long as you and I have the right to vote someone out of office based on all the information that is made available to us on platforms like Twitter, then that's okay. how the system is supposed to work. Of course, this is tricky stuff. I mean, you know, how are you supposed to draw the line between uh, something that the president says, you know, and, and that is an outright lie, where he lies over and over again on social media, and then the misinformation that here could be harmful to democracy? I mean, we saw last year, you know, the, the um, uh, Trump super fan, Cezo Sayok, uh, wound up in court on charges of attempted murder for sending explosives out to people that he had learned and considered were uh, Trump's enemies based on all of the tweeting Trump had been doing. I mean, this is complicated stuff. Are you supposed to, as Twitter, then say anything uh, he says uh, against someone else should be somehow amplified in some way or considered to be more dangerous than something else? I mean, it's such a complicated world. What they've tried to draw is this clear line about voting, because without that, of course, uh, they say that the whole system right. falls apart and real and falsehoods can really change democracy fundamentally, Alison. Jake, we've said the president is now threatening to regulate social media platforms. Does he have the authority to do that? Well, no. I mean, in a word, no, right? By fiat, the president cannot simply shut down a company he doesn't feel good about. And it would be ironic if in this fight about free speech, he were to shut down this company for, uh, right. you know, and, and its free speech uh, because it somehow infringed on his. You know, none of that is really there. You know, what is, of course, possible is that he could take his voice to a different platform, right? That's the ultimate uh, sort of punishment for a company like this. But this is the weird symbiotic relationship the president has with this company, right? He's fighting with them. He's decrying their moves here, and yet he's doing it all on Twitter. You know, he needs the 80 million followers he has on Twitter because he just l seems to love the, the open-ended broadcast potential of being able to speak across this platform to all these people in this unfiltered way. So shutting it down, no, he does not have that rule, uh, you know, that, that uh, power. But more importantly, he really just, it's not in his interest, Allison. Jake, what's the reaction been like in conservative circles? Well, I mean, this is the craziest part, is to watch the sort of machinery spin up. And I don't mean to suggest that it's orchestrated by any one person, but it is certainly a machine of trolls uh, that, that comes out of the woodwork in a circumstance like this. And it's not made better by the president's allies going on television and naming Twitter executives personally, attacking them personally. Whatever you may think about how this platform behaves or what rules it has created, attacking individuals for enacting the policies of their employer, you know, that seems to me a little bit beyond the pale. And so we've seen that sort of thing happening uh, all over the place. Meanwhile, you have people like Newt Gingrich going on Fox News and talking about, uh, you know, the need to, to take a different line if you're Twitter. Otherwise, they're going to go from being an open entrepreneurial uh, company to something that's going to have to be heavily regulated. 
I think all of us are realizing that these platforms have a huge influence on American public life and that they can have this, you know, in some ways devastating effect on the truth. But how we're going to regulate that, it seems that both sides are suddenly starting to think very, very harshly about that else. Jake, meanwhile, Twitter's under fire for refusing to take down another set of the president's tweets this week. Trump tweeted uh, baseless claims about MSNBC host Joe Scarborough, alleging that Scarborough was involved in the death of a staffer while he was a congressman. That late staffer's husband asked Twitter to take the tweets down. Twitter would not. And the president is still tweeting about it. Why is Twitter leaving those particular tweets up? This is that strange line that, that is drawn, right? You and I talking, you know, uh, like this might be able to agree together, you know, that's beyond the pale. Joe Scarborough, how could you possibly do that? How could you torture the, uh, this, this poor woman's family with all of this? You know, how could you keep all of that up, Twitter? Well, the way someone who works there thinks about it is instead thinking, okay, what is the ultimate line of free speech? Well, as long as we have the right to vote, and as long as there is the opportunity for Americans to come out in numbers against someone like the president who says something outrageous like that on a platform like this, well, then perhaps the system continues to work. As, but as soon as the president walks over the line and begins to change the vote and how it is offered to you and I, stating falsehoods about mail-in ballots, then they say, well, then wait a minute. Okay, that's beyond the pale. This is the weird world of social media, Allison, that, uh, that, that you know, insinuating yeah. this baseless claim against our colleague and then, uh, you know, talking about, you know, committing a falsehood that's pretty low, one might argue, on the rank of falsehoods that the president's put out over the years on Twitter, that those things are separated out is really the, the strange world that social media has created for all of us, Alice. It is complex and at times confusing. Jake Ward, thanks so much for explaining it to us. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Hundreds of people took to the streets of Minneapolis last night. They were protesting at the intersection where George Floyd, an unarmed black man, was killed while detained by police. Those protests started off peacefully, but they ended in a confrontation with officers in riot gear outside a police station. Four police officers involved in the incident have been fired, but Floyd's sister, Bridget Clifford, says that is not enough. I would like for those officers to be charged with murder because that's exactly what they did. They murdered my brother. He was crying for help. I don't need them to be suspended and able to work in another state or another county. Their license should be taken away, their job should be taken away, and they should be put in jail for murder. NBC News reporter Shaq Brewster live now in Minneapolis. And Shaq, we know the protests got intense last night. What happened and, and what's it like in the city today? How are people feeling? That's right. They did get a little intense last night. And it's important to note that they started out very peacefully. I spoke to a congresswoman, actually the uh, not congresswoman, councilwoman, the vice president of the council here in Minneapolis, the city council. And she told me that these were among some of the largest protests that she's seen in terms of protests that the city has had in dealing with police and uh, community relations. The city has had protests like these and situations like this before. And they started out very peacefully. You had thousands of people over at the location where Mr. Floyd was uh, killed, where he had that neck. The officer put his knee, his knee to the neck of Mr. Floyd for several minutes at a time. There was a protest there, a gathering there. Then people made their way over to the police precinct behind me. It's about a two and a half mile march that many of them went on. And when the, the crowd got down here, that's when things got much more tense. Initially, it was calm, but that's when you had some protesters starting to throw rocks, starting to throw things, objects, water bottles at the police officers, smashing police cars uh, and writing graffiti, uh, vandalizing the police uh, precinct that you see behind me. And that's when the officers responded with rubber bullets. They responded with tear gas. You had some uh, uh, Elon Omar, Congresswoman Elon Omar, commented on that and said this is a situation where you had families involved and families, there are little kids here. And she criticized the police department for having that reaction. But you see now uh, behind me, barricades have now been erected so that these are higher barricades. So they're trying to protect 
uh, protect the property that's behind me. And there you, you get the sense that they're intense, anticipating some more protests as people continue to be upset about what they saw and continue to call for action against the officers involved in this. Allison. Shaq, we also now have security footage from a nearby business that shows Floyd being detained before the video where we saw Floyd yeah. pinned down by an officer saying, I can't breathe. Uh, what does this new video show us about what happened? Right. This is actually a surveillance footage from a business a couple of doors down from where the actual incident happened, where that first Facebook video came from. But in that surveillance footage, and we just obtained it, NBC News obtained it last night, so it's new to us. And what you see is officers getting mm-hmm. Mr. Floyd out of the car. He's handcuffed. He's walked over to the uh, wall. He's told to sit down. And you see them interacting and exchanging words. We know that officers were called out to the scene uh, to investigate a reported forgery. The report is that there was a, a fake $20 bill being used or attempted to be used at a convenience store there, and officers were sent out. You can see they're investigating that. But then the next footage that we see is when the officer is detaining and restraining Mr. Floyd with his knee to the neck. And that is the gap that we have right now. What we know can fill in that gap is that there was body camera footage. The officers, and according to the Minneapolis Police Department, officers had on their body cameras. The cameras were activated. If we see that body camera footage, that will fill in the gap to help Help us understand what happened from that position in which you see a very calm interaction between officers and Mr. Floyd and that escalation when they're on the floor and Mr. Floyd then uh, uh, is uh, detained and passes out uh, from the pressure to his neck. I'll also say that something that we uh, just got, the uh, fire department has released a report of what happened and what they, what they saw from their perspective when the EMS arrived. They say that Mr. Floyd was unresponsive and pulseless when they encountered him. That's important because what that suggests is that he, by the time he got to, uh, in the, in the ambulance and to the hospital where we know he was declared dead, that he didn't have a pulse even during that ride. That, that, uh, defends what, or that's more, uh, evidence for what you hear the family pointing to saying that the officer is the one who caused Mr. Floyd to lose his life. So that's the latest that we're having right now. But yes, we're looking for more video. We're looking for more body camera footage. The mayor earlier today said that he's calling and looking for ways to release that body camera footage to the public. Allison. All right. Jack Brewster with the latest from Minneapolis. Thank you so much. You got it. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt. And for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. 
It's opening day for most casinos in Oklahoma. Hundreds of people lined up to try their luck at two resorts, Choctaw and Windstar World. Both casinos have new safety restrictions, and they are not bringing all of their games back. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from the Windstar Casino Resort. All right, Morgan, uh, uh, roulette and jacks are better video poker are my casino favorites. Can you play those today? And what are the rules for gamblers and hotel guests right now? Yeah, Allison, a lot of changes here in place at the Windstar for their kind of official reopening post-COVID. Right now, all table games are no longer in operation uh, as they try to figure out a safe way to reopen. So uh, we do know that uh, any blackjack that's off the table, poker off the table, uh, off-track betting not happening. Uh, you might have a shot with uh, one of the video games, but expect to be seated uh, at a safe distance away from the nearest patron. So when people show up here today, they have to get their temperature checked before they 